president releasing a travel forecast, but Americans are expected to stay at home, with the CDC recommending against non-essential travel. The coronavirus pandemic has totally turned the travel industry upside down. Airlines have been hit especially hard, with a 90 percent drop in flyers since the beginning of March. But as some areas begin reopening, Americans are starting to show an interest in traveling again. We're seeing about over 40 percent of Americans planning to take a trip this summer. According to Hopper, users' activity on the app quadrupled in recent weeks. But experts warn to plan with caution. Hawaii, for example, requires a 14-day quarantine for visitors through June, with a possible $5,000 fine or year in prison for violators. If you're going to travel, you need to understand the rules and regulations of where you're traveling to. But the industry is eager to get back to business. Airports preparing for summer with new social distancing and sanitation procedures. We've taken aggressive measures to get the airport ready. All major U.S. airlines now require masks. And some will start temperature checks in June. I think we will be a smarter, safer traveling public when this is all said and done. Change is almost certain to mean rising costs and airfares. Liz McLaughlin, NBC News. The Fox Trail Senior Living Center in Virginia is allowing its residents to get bear hugs from their loved ones in costume. That is Linnea Bentz reuniting with her mother while dressed as a hippo in a tutu. But they do have options. Visitors can don a shark, unicorn, or minion costume. The facility is sanitizing the costumes after each use and will require guests to wear a mask and gloves underneath. (laughs) A smile, a hug, and a chuckle all at the same time. Janessa's back now with your midweek forecast. Good morning, Janessa. Absolutely love that story. (laughs) Memorial Day, you guys are going to be wondering where is summer because it's going to be a struggle across the central plains into the northeast. Look at all this rain with highs in the upper 60s. As restrictions ease across the country, cruise ships are in a much different situation. An estimated 100,000 crew members, including Americans, remain on board around the world, not allowed to disembark. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has the story. This morning, the nightmare at sea turning into a protest on the open ocean. The U.S. Coast Guard says at least 54,000 crew members remain aboard 85 ships in U.S. waters. But it's reported more than 100,000 crew members around the globe have been given no firm details on when they can disembark. I've been trying to get home for just over a month now. Canadian Chris Richardson says some of his colleagues spent weeks in tiny windowless rooms, no longer getting a paycheck, instead earning a fraction of their salary in so-called goodwill payments. It feels like they put money over our health and happiness. Before crew members can disembark in U.S. waters, the CDC says cruise ship operators must arrange transportation on private flights and cars and have no interaction with the public on their way home, among other regulations. The long list of requirements could sink some cruise lines who face an uncertain future. According to the Miami Herald, at least 578 crew members have tested positive since the coronavirus outbreak and seven have died. At least two others have lost their lives in apparent suicides. They are just completely stuck against their will, held on a cruise ship at sea. McKenna Madden, a dancer aboard the Royal Caribbean Freedom, says freedom was the last thing she had. She's now finally back home in Arizona after two months at sea. Definitely anxious, definitely uh, scared of the unknown and not knowing what's going to happen or when you're going to go home or how much longer I'm going to be stuck on the ship. You don't really know, so that's kind of scary. With some employees choosing to stay on board, major operators tell NBC News they are working to repatriate their crew members while navigating different and changing international regulations. But for many still stranded at sea, the ship has sailed on being patient. And our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that report. A Cincinnati Reds pitching prospect is finding some creative ways to stay sharp during the pandemic. Take a look at this. 20-year-old Hunter Green throws a pitch right through that open window of the moving car, right into the catcher's mitt. 
Not really sure how this is going to help him on the mound when the season begins, but his timing and accuracy definitely on point and hope to see him on the mound mm -hmm. in a real game yes. very soon. Fingers crossed. That's right. Thanks for watching today. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Have a great Wednesday. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, historic rains have caused two Michigan dams to breach, with the governor calling for thousands to evacuate. We'll have the latest. To the coronavirus and the promising new signs researchers are finding with patients who have recovered from COVID-19. It could be the cruelest cut of all. First-line responders at hospitals being furloughed because of mounting financial losses from the pandemic. Then to keeping your mouth healthy in the age of COVID, but how do dentists and hygienists stay safe when they're right in the line of fire? And then something to make you smile as we kick off your Wednesday, the perfect reflexes from this super goalie. We'll show you more a little later. Right now, early today starts. And we begin with breaking news this morning. I'm Philip Mena. Good to be together both with you. I'm Francis Rivera. Catastrophic flooding is forcing thousands of people out of their homes in the Midwest right now. The relentless rains ruptured two dams in central Michigan, and officials scrambled to evacuate about 10,000 residents in the town of Midland, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Overnight, the state's governor declared a state of emergency for the county. In the next 12 to 15 hours, downtown Midland could be under approximately nine feet of water. We are anticipating an historic high water level. To go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. But we are here, and to the best of our ability, we are going to navigate this together. Heavy rains have inundated much of the Great Lakes region, and more storms could be on the way. Let's turn to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, who's tracking that system. Good morning, Janessa. Good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. We have multiple dams that have failed across uh, central Michigan. We have record rain that continues to fall in that area. Also, the Rifle River hitting historic levels of 13.8 feet. And on top of that, more rain will be continuous for at least the next 24 to 36 hours. Across the upper Midwest to the Midwest, we have 186 uh, flood gauges that are under minor to moderate, even major flood stages. Now, the unfortunate situation is on top of the flooding that we're already seeing, an additional two to four inches is expected, guys. Well, what a tough go for them. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Let's turn now to new research on the coronavirus pandemic. We may be closer to learning more about what it means to have recovered from COVID-19. A study from South Korea is shedding light on the question of immunity and whether or not people can get the virus a second time. NBC's Tom Costello has this report. It's the kind of good news development that researchers have been hoping for. Preliminary findings from the South Korean Centers for Disease Control suggest patients who recovered from COVID-19 but then tested positive for the virus again were not infectious and were not spreading the virus to others. 447 South Koreans tested positive a second time, but those virus traces appear to be dead, not alive. Could it be an indication of immunity? I think it's a little too soon to take that and say that we know for sure that People have immunity, but we have seen that people do mount a pretty good immune response to this, and we haven't yet seen reinfection. So I think taken together, that is encouraging. It felt like what I thought was one of the worst flus I had ever had. Back in early February, Erin Kirk Evans, her kids and husband, all became very sick. Now, after recently testing positive for the antibodies, she knows it was COVID-19, which means she could have some protection. It just felt like this empowering feeling that I can no longer live in the fear of it and the uncertainty of what it's going to do to my body or my kids or my husband. In South Korea, the findings have convinced health experts to loosen some quarantine restrictions. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul. They're greeting this new report here with optimism. It means officials will no longer require recovered COVID patients to test negative before being released from quarantine. And it comes just as high school seniors are headed back to school for the first time in weeks. 
And it could be critical in hard-hit U.S. states since early testing suggests one in five New Yorkers has antibodies for COVID-19, but many never knew they were sick. Having the antibodies does not automatically guarantee immunity, but the South Korean report is further evidence that people who have recovered and do have antibodies may be able to return to work without fear of spreading the disease to others. Philip? All right, Tom, thank you. The White House is ramping up efforts to rapidly reopen the country this morning. A Trump campaign official has confirmed with NBC News that Republican operatives are recruiting pro-Trump doctors to publicly back efforts to revive the economy. For the latest, let's get to our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Paz. And Tracy, this move could contradict some of the president's own top health officials. Hi, Francis. Yeah, government health officials have said that the country needs to reopen carefully based on the numbers, but based on this Associated Press report that we have now confirmed, uh, the doctors being recruited would back the president's idea of reopening on a fast track, uh, the state by state uh, reopening that we've been seeing. Now, this is based on a leaked recording of a phone call that happened in May uh, with people who were supportive of this in a statement the campaign says all co coalitions support the president's policies. We also are following the reaction to President Trump declaring that he's taking the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. Uh, He reacted to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi suggesting maybe that's not such a good idea. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Oh, I don't, I don't respond to her. I think she's a waste of time. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. His words weigh a ton. To our cabinet meeting and every member the president met with his cabinet their first meeting uh, since last uh, fall at that meeting uh, the president said that the number of cases in the u.s now topping more than one and a half million he wears it quote as a badge of honor that testing is working francis right, tracy pots for us tracy thank you And Congress is debating what steps to take next to help support the nation's economy, which has been badly affected by the pandemic. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin faced questions from senators via video chat on Tuesday. They discussed the government's stimulus efforts like the Small Business Lending Program, part of the $2 trillion federal relief package that was approved in late March. Here's NBC's Chris Pallone. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin on the virtual hot seat testifying before the Senate Banking Committee. You're boosting your Wall Street buddies and you are leaving your people behind. It comes as Democrats and Republicans are increasingly divided on what comes next for the ailing economy. That you're pushing people back into the workplace. You're, there's been no national program to provide worker safety. Democrats accusing the Trump administration of pushing states to end coronavirus lockdowns and business closings. How many workers should give their lives to increase the GDP or the Dow Jones by a thousand points? You know, workers should give their lives to do that, Mr. Senator, and I think your characterization is unfair. The House last week passed a fourth economic aid bill calling for $3 trillion in new relief spending. Senate Republicans say it's a non-starter. Before we rush out and do another spending bill, we actually let some of this stuff go to work. Secretary Mnuchin and Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell testified that some government programs designed to distribute relief funds aren't up and running yet. Senators from both parties push them to speed up the process. And we need to make sure the dollars and program quickly find their mark. Fed Chair Powell has been clear in his belief more spending could help prevent the recession from getting worse. These are longer term problems uh, to deal with. I think for now, uh, you know, this very much calls on us to do what we can to support the economy. Mnuchin warned failure to reopen businesses soon could lead to permanent damage to the economy. He admitted unemployment numbers will likely get worse before rebounding. Chris Pallone, NBC News. The coronavirus pandemic has pushed the nation's health care system to the brink, but some medical workers across the country say they are taking pay cuts or being furloughed in the midst of the crisis when they are needed more than ever. NBC's Sarah Dalloff has the story. Cape Cod Healthcare would normally be gearing up for summer tourists needing care. Instead, 600 workers, including medical staff, are temporarily off the job. Furloughs nurse Shannon Sherman worries will hurt patients. These 
cuts are for direct care. These are people that are putting their hands on the patients. Cape Cod Healthcare isn't alone. According to a recent survey, 21 percent of doctors report being furloughed or having their pay cut during the pandemic as medical centers face unprecedented financial pressure. Frankly, uh, we're facing one of the biggest financial crises in our history. Um, it's an existential threat for a lot of organizations, and it may force hospitals to close. The American Hospital Association estimates a four-month financial impact of more than $200 billion to the country's hospitals and hospital systems. That includes the expense of treating COVID patients and halting elective procedures. It essentially means that uh, there is no revenue coming into the facilities, and uh, there is uh, very limited ways to um, make up for the fact that we have limited income. While procedures are now resuming in many states, it will take time and careful planning, experts say, as well as additional federal funding to get back up to speed. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. All right, Janessa Webb is back with us with the latest on that severe weather. Janessa. Yeah, we do have a lot of places across the Mid-Atlantic to the Ohio Valley, also watching Central Michigan very closely with flood watches and advisories currently in place for 14 million people. And I do think that will be extended throughout your afternoon to all the way to tomorrow. This is a very slow moving system that is going to be continuous into the weekend. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at the day ahead. For the deep south to the southeast, a daytime high is still well above average, and we're going to watch a few storms this afternoon. Also, the winds picking up from Bismarck to Minneapolis. Highs, they're still in the upper 70s to lower 80s. So we're going to continue to watch this flooding. Uh, guys, uh, this is going to get a lot worse with forecasting two to four more inches. Oh, wow. All right. Thank you, Janessa. When cat is scratching and clawing to be the best soccer goalie in the world, this is a little cat named after a German goalkeeper, <laughs> Miano Neuer, who's been stopping his owner's shots left and right using those cat-like reflexes. He's taken the Internet by storm with that impressive defense. I think I'm going to go on the Internet a little later and watch a little more. That's pretty cool. Today, Connecticut will become the last state to begin reopening. Restaurants, retail, and offices can all open their doors with restrictions. And in a controversial move, dental offices can now treat patients for non-emergency reasons. And that's sparking concerns from many hygienists. We get more now from NBC's Chris Jansing. Connecticut orthodontist Dr. Gary Open is back in business, fully reopening his office today. We do have quite a backlog. We have been closed for six weeks. The new normal means keeping patients safe in the age of COVID. We are wearing higher level masks, N95s. We are wearing face shields also, and we're wearing disposable gowns. He's overhauled his office, investing in a new air filtration system, significantly reducing the number of patients he'll see each day and revamping waiting room procedures. Their temperature will be checked. Once everything is deemed okay, we will escort the patient to the chair where we'll be working. Dental practices are by nature invasive, and preliminary research suggests the coronavirus survives airborne for hours. That's why some industry insiders like hygienist Megan Zadrowski worry dental offices are reopening before it's safe. Aerosols generated in the dental office are unavoidable, whether it's by dentist drills, whether it's by hygienist instruments, or even the patients themselves who may need to cough. The American Dental Association has issued national guidelines, including hygienists using hand tools instead of automated devices and limiting drills, suggestions that Zadrowski worries not all dentists will follow. Would you go to a dentist right now for a non-emergent problem? I would absolutely avoid going to the dental office with a non-emergent service. A recent national survey by the American Dental Association found three in 10 dentist offices didn't have any supply of N95 masks and nearly 18% had no face shields. Connecticut dentist Dr. David Fantarella says it has been a challenge. We do have what we need. It has not been easy. He's invested beyond the guidelines, including a fogger to clean rooms and a mobile UVC unit to reduce pathogens. You understand why people are nervous. For sure, I'm nervous, but I'm also nervous on the flip side of that. If we don't do anything, what about that patient? That they get really sick. That they get really sick. All dentists facing the new reality that being afraid of the dentist means something different now. 
I wanted to make sure my child was safe and comfortable in a setting outside the home. What are you looking forward to most when all this is uh, over? Well, getting my teeth straight, definitely. The challenge of reopening a business when it's anything but business as usual. And the Labor Department says dentist offices lost a half a million jobs just in April, more than a third of the total number of lost jobs throughout health care. Okay, you already see the humor in that. That's Will Ferrell. In a preview of Netflix's upcoming uh, comedy, Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga, is stars of Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Netflix also released a first look photos of Ferrell and McAdams in a series of these costumes for the movie. It will premiere on the streaming platform on June 26th. And this is really funny. The whole premise of it is, mm -hmm. you know, these aspiring musicians who want to make it big for their career. Demi Lovato is in it also. Is too. she? So great, great ad. I'm just yeah. laughing at that ponytail. <laughs> So great. All right. Who doesn't love Taco Tuesday? Actress Drew Barrymore does. She hosted a virtual taco night on Instagram Live on Tuesday night. She made shrimp tacos and she used McCormick Spices. The Hollywood star and the seasoning company, they partnered up to donate $1 million to No Kid Hungry. The charity is raising awareness about child hunger issues during the COVID-19 crisis. A lot of uh, celebrities are raising money for that particular charity. And if now you're craving some shrimp tacos because of it, hey, you're able to donate for that? Big. Even better. Win-win. A pair of twins from Milwaukee are proving that hard work pays off. The sisters named Ariel and Ariana Williams are achieving academic success together. Not only are they graduating at the top of their class, but they were accepted into 37 colleges and also received more than a million dollars dollars in scholarships. Well, the sisters have decided to attend Marquette University in Milwaukee to study nursing. They are also the first in their family to attend college, and parents got to be so excited and so proud that they're doing it together. Yeah, they're the competitive in the best yeah. possible way, relieving the parents of the mm -hmm. cost of, uh, of paying for college, and they'll be nurses. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I really want to bring you some bright news for your Memorial Day weekend, but we are currently stuck in a really damp pattern across the East Coast, even for the Pacific Northwest. It will be a soggy one. Hopefully things dry out if you're across the West by Saturday afternoon. We'll be right back. In today's top stories, the State Department Inspector General fired last week after launching an investigation into Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's alleged misuse of a staffer was also looking into lavish dinners the secretary threw for billionaire CEOs, Supreme Court justices, political heavyweights, and ambassadors on the government's dime. That's according to administration officials. An NBC News investigation found Pompeo and his wife held about two dozen so-called Madison dinners since he took over the post in 2018. A State Department spokeswoman defended them as, a, as quote, a world-class opportunity to discuss the mission of the State Department. Hundreds of McDonald's employees are expected to go on strike across 20 cities today. Labor organizers are claiming that not enough is being done to protect workers from COVID-19. McDonald's denies the allegations and says it has 50 new safety procedures that go well beyond masks and gloves. The strike comes the day before the company's annual shareholders meeting. After being effectively shuttered for months, Texas Governor Greg Abbott says bars in his state will be allowed to reopen Friday at 25 percent capacity. Bartenders rejoiced at the news that they would finally be able to return to work. Jacob Roscone from NBC affiliate KPRC has more. Bartending is life for Teresa Bernal for more than 20 years until the pandemic. I was just getting prepared to move in with family because I've depleted my savings. In fact, unable to pay rent, Teresa planned to move in with her youngest daughter, Jody. It's been pure hell. Some bars defied state orders and have already opened. Teresa's boss, Beverly Strain, was about to do the same. If we hadn't have gotten open this week or by Monday, I was opening up too and letting them come after my license, whatever. It was just getting to that point desperate. In Fort Bend County, the Sunrise Sports Bar will finish remodeling just in time. I was surprised. I really, I 
figured he'd wait at least till Monday. And then, of course, my phone started blowing up immediately. I want to make a reservation for Friday. While the owner is thrilled her employees will have work again, first and foremost, Jean Landry says, and tons of these. she wants her customers to be safe. I would feel horrible if somebody got sick in this bar. You know, it's, we'll do whatever we can to keep everybody safe. All right, thanks to Jacob Ruskin for that report. All right, a 21-pound chihuahua was abandoned and left disabled, locked inside a crate alongside of a major highway in northern New Jersey. Luckily, 8-year-old Stanley found a loving foster family that's nursing him back to health. They've already seen progress in his weight loss, and once he loses more, he'll get his own set of wheels. For now, his foster moms make sure to take him for stroller walks around town. She says he's affectionate despite everything he's been through. Thanks so much for waking up with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. We hope you have a great Wednesday, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Extreme weather overnight. Michigan's governor issues an emergency declaration as two dams have already been breached by historic rainfall. In the next 12 to 15 hours, downtown Midland could be under approximately nine feet of water. We've got the very latest straight ahead. Another child death from that mystery illness, the 15-year-old victim and her mother's message to other parents, plus the treatment being used by doctors with a 12-year-old girl making a full recovery. When will public schools reopen? What some states are planning as new findings raise concerns about classroom exposure. New details this morning and some promising new signs. If you've had the coronavirus and recovered, can you get it again or even give it to others? And Johnson & Johnson discontinuing a widely used type of baby powder amid claims it causes cancer. A busy Wednesday ahead. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. Glad to be together with you. I'm Francis Rivera. We began with the efforts all across the country to safely get back to some form of normal life amid this coronavirus pandemic. Los Angeles County has set a target date for reopening its economy. The county of nearly 10 million people hopes to lift stay-at-home restrictions by July 4th. Officials say this will only be possible if people continue to follow health guidelines. Meanwhile, long lines formed to get into the first casino to reopen in San Diego. Visitors had their temperatures checked, and once the building was at capacity, people could only enter as others left. Workers handed out water as the line stretched down the street. And in Texas, the governor announced that daycares can open immediately. Some centers were already open but could only serve essential workers. Children and staff who are sick must stay home, and drop-offs and pickups have to take place outside. Hundreds of McDonald's employees in 20 cities plan to go on strike today. Labor organizers are pressuring the fast food chain to improve protections for workers. McDonald's says that as they reopen dining rooms, the company is putting safety first. And another child has died from that inflammatory, uh, that inflammatory syndrome that hits some children after a COVID infection. Though rare, almost half of the states are now reporting cases. But the CDC briefed doctors Tuesday on what treatments are working to save young lives. Here's NBC's Kristen Dahlgren. Dariana Dyson was just 15 when she started complaining about stomach pain and a rash. It happened so fast. I never thought that taking my daughter in the hospital for stomach pain, I wouldn't be walking out of there with her. Within days, the Baltimore teen was dead, the latest victim of the newly discovered multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Dariana had tested positive for COVID antibodies. I hope that can save another child. People need to really understand that this kills people. The CDC held a briefing call with doctors on what it's learning about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and nine countries around the world. Cases seem to be peaking about a month behind COVID-19. Many of the children didn't know they had coronavirus, suggesting the illness comes from an overactive immune response. In New York City alone, there are now 147 cases. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. Long Island's Cohen's Children's Medical Center saw many of the early cases. Almost 80% had no underlying condition. 
Nearly all had gastrointestinal symptoms, and the hospital saw success with a plasma product called IVIG, which helps calm an overactive immune response. It's one of the things doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital, and at her latest checkup, showed no signs of permanent heart damage. They're saying that it looks pretty normal. She came in, in you know, really near death, and um, within a matter of days, um, we are able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own. It was one of those moments um, that you really want to celebrate. I'm just so happy that she has a bright future. That treatments can work if doctors can catch it in time. So the key really seems to be recognizing the symptoms and then getting the child in for this treatment as soon as possible. They do seem to be having some success with it. Francis? All right, we'll take that good news. Kristen, thank you. Thanks to new research, we could be closer to answering some important questions about immunity in COVID-19. A study from South Korea is shedding light on what it means to have recovered from the virus and whether or not you can get it a second time. NBC's Tom Costello has this report. It's the kind of good news development that researchers have been hoping for. Preliminary findings from the South Korean Centers for Disease Control suggest patients who recovered from COVID-19 but then tested positive for the virus again were not infectious and were not spreading the virus to others. 447 South Koreans tested positive a second time, but those virus traces appeared to be dead, not alive. Could it be an indication of immunity? I think it's a little too soon to take that and say that we know for sure that People have immunity, but we have seen that people do mount a pretty good immune response to this, and we haven't yet seen reinfection. So I think taken together, that is encouraging. It felt like what I thought was one of the worst flus I had ever had. Back in early February, Erin Kirk Evans, her kids and husband, all became very sick. Now, after recently testing positive for the antibodies, she knows it was COVID-19, which means she could have some protection. It just felt like this empowering feeling that I can no longer live in the fear of it and the uncertainty of what it's going to do to my body or my kids or my husband. In South Korea, the findings have convinced health experts to loosen some quarantine restrictions. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul. They're greeting this new report here with optimism. It means officials will no longer require recovered COVID patients to test negative before being released from quarantine. And it comes just as high school seniors are headed back to school for the first time in weeks. And it could be critical in hard-hit U.S. states since early testing suggests one in five New Yorkers has antibodies for COVID-19, but many never knew they were sick. Having the antibodies does not automatically guarantee immunity, but the South Korean report is further evidence that people who have recovered and do have antibodies may be able to return to work without fear of spreading the disease to others. Philip? That is some much-needed hope. Tom, thank you. The White House is ramping up efforts to rapidly reopen the country this morning. A Trump campaign official has confirmed with NBC News that Republican operatives are recruiting pro-Trump doctors to publicly back efforts to revive the economy. For the latest, let's get to our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Poss. And Tracy, this move could contradict some of the president's own top health officials. Yeah, Francis, government officials, health officials have uh, talked about reopening carefully and slowly based on the numbers. Uh, but a Trump administration, a Trump ca campaign official is now confirming uh, what the Associated Press first reported, that they're looking for doctors who will back the president's more aggressive efforts to reopen the country. In other words, to put it on a fast track, this campaign official saying that coalitions that work with the president uh, say things that are in line with what the president believes. We are also watching the back and forth between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president announcing that he is taking the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi thinking that's not such a good idea. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Oh, I don't, I don't respond to her. I think she's a waste of time. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. His words weigh a ton.
And at a cabinet meeting, the first he's called since last fall, President Trump touted the number of coronavirus cases in the United States now topping one and a half million, the president said. He looks at that as a badge of honor that testing is working. Francis? All right, Tracy Potts for us. Tracy, thanks. Obeying stay-at-home orders and practicing social distancing can help some countries slow the spread of coronavirus. But in places like Mexico, where working from home is impossible for many, it can be difficult due to its high population and overcrowding. Here's NBC's Richard Engel. Mexico City is the perfect COVID breeding ground, overcrowded with a health care system already overburdened. This week, the government began reopening many businesses, but with about half the population in poverty, for many, stopping work was never an option. I went to Mexico City's De Abasto Market, the COVID epicenter. Guards check temperature. Many people inside are wearing masks, but with a half a million people buying and selling here every day, social distancing is impossible. This market has never shut, and people told me it can't. It's the city's heart, soul, stomach, and wallet. Lorenzo works here seven days a week to feed his wife and three children. I asked him if he's worried about the virus. Yes, but fear is better than hunger, he said. But for thousands, the forced gamble with the virus does not end well. Officially, around 1,300 people have died from COVID in Mexico City. But critics say the real number could be three times that. And in Brazil, the undercounting may be even higher. NBC's Bill Neely is there. Coronavirus is spreading faster here than anywhere on Earth. But health officials believe the true number of infections could be worse, perhaps 15 times worse than the official figures. Back in Mexico, the president says reopening guidelines are recommendations. Regions ultimately decide. It's an acknowledgement, as many supporters say, that this country must work to survive even as coffins are now wrapped in plastic and graves dug in waiting rows. It is hard to know the full scale of the problem here because Mexico does very little testing. In fact, it has one of the lowest testing rates in all of Latin America. Philip. All right, Richard, thank you for that report. Catastrophic flooding is forcing thousands of people out of their homes in the Midwest right now. The relentless rains ruptured two dams in central Michigan, and officials scrambled to evacuate about 10,000 residents in the town of Midland, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Overnight, the state's governor declared a state of emergency for the county. In the next 12 to 15 hours, downtown Midland could be under approximately nine feet of water. We are anticipating an historic high water level. To go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. But we are here, and to the best of our ability, we are going to navigate this together. Heavy rains have inundated much of the Great Lakes region, and more storms could be on the way. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking that storm system for us. Hey, Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you too. This is just an unfortunate situation. We have multiple dams that have been breached across central Michigan, hitting record stages for those rivers. Uh, Rifle River hitting 13.8 feet. This is an unprecedented uh, event that currently is happening. Now, storms will continue to roll through the next 24 to 36 hours. We have over 186 gauges across the Midwest, upper Midwest, that are under moderate to minor flooding stages. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. From San Antonio all the way to New Orleans, we're above average and a few storms that are going to pop up this afternoon, watching that severe weather potential, even for Billings uh, to Omaha, above average in the lower 70s. And I wish I could say this is going to stop, but the possibility of another two to four inches in that area. Guys. God, that's okay. tough to hear. Uh, Janessa, mm -hmm. thank you so much. The pandemic has unearthed a troubling racial divide. A new report from ProPublica reveals why the virus is hitting communities of color so hard. NBC's Morgan Radford has more. Dr. Feluso Fakaridi is a cardiologist on a mission. 
work entails, um, you know, saving limbs and saving lives. He moved to the Mississippi Delta, one of the poorest areas in the country, to stop what he says are preventable surgeries, amputations resulting from diabetes, a condition both of his parents had. Some of these patients are given an option of an amputation first strategy, and that's what we're against. Research shows amputations happen more frequently among black patients with diabetes in the rural southeast, often three to four times the national average. 90 percent of the amputations that I see are preventable. It's a crisis, experts say, worsened by the coronavirus. Why are we seeing such a high prevalence of COVID-19 in African-American communities? Those high death rates have existed pre-COVID. COVID just expounded the problem and expose the problem to the rest of the country. ProPublica's Lizzie Presser spent more than a month covering the crisis in Mississippi. So what we're all seeing with COVID-19 is that the patients who are most likely to be killed by the disease and severely affected by the disease are Black patients and diabetics. That's the same population that's disproportionately affected by amputation. She says more needs to be done to educate patients about their options and by the government to care for the most vulnerable, like 85-year-old Susie Robinson, the pandemic leaving her son especially concerned. So I, I became more protective of her. Dr. Fakariti says patients like her deserve a chance. A chance to be taught how to eat right, how to live right, So knowledge is power. Morgan Radford, NBC News, New York. In today's Quick Hits, Pier 1 Imports plans to close all 540 of its locations three months after filing for bankruptcy. The retailer announced it is seeking court approval to liquidate its stores once they reopen after coronavirus lockdowns. The Belmont Stakes, one of horse racing's biggest events, will be held on June 20th this year without fans. It's traditionally the last leg in horse racing's triple crown, but this year it'll serve as the first. Johnson & Johnson will stop selling its talc-based baby powder in the U.S. In Canada, after facing thousands of lawsuits claiming it caused cancer, the company says demand has declined due to misinformation about the safety of the product. In January, U.S. government-led research found no strong evidence linking baby powder with ovarian cancer. There are new developments in the political battle over mail-in voting. A federal judge has ruled that Texas voters who are afraid of the coronavirus can cast their ballots by mail in upcoming elections. The state attorney general, Ken Paxton, argued that those ballots are reserved based on disability and the fear of the virus doesn't qualify. But the judge ruled that the pandemic has left the country, quote, fearfully disabled. Hi, everyone. We have a very unsettled weather pattern for your Memorial Day weekend. Not going to be feeling like summer across two thirds of the nation. A ton of rain from the central U.S. to the northeast for your Saturday, Sunday, all the way into Memorial Day, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. The governor of New Jersey says officials are wargaming what a return to school might look like next fall. Whether to reopen is one of the toughest decisions facing states right now, and parents are understandably nervous. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. Griselle Cardona is a single mom in the Bronx, and she's worried. It's stressful. There's times where I found myself having to close myself in the bathroom and cry. I feel like I'm living in a whole nightmare. When the pandemic hit, she quit her job to take care of her three kids. Two have special needs. For her, it's critical whether New York schools reopen this fall. What we're worried about, especially parents with students with disabilities, is regression. Across the country, the future of K-12 education is up in the air, especially with new reports out of France where dozens of new coronavirus cases have been linked to possible classroom exposure shortly after schools there reopen. Should schools reopen this fall? I think they should make an attempt to reopen schools, but this is all going to be dependent upon what happens in the summer and what September looks like. School districts in Minnesota and Texas will be allowed to reopen for in-person classes this summer. Kansas is planning to restart them in August. Katrina Pickens has been taking care of her three kids at home there. It's just very hard to put them into a schedule at home, you know, where there's all these other distractions. 
Some states are considering whether to start the fall semester early to catch kids up. One Maryland lawmaker is floating the idea of year-round schooling. Many districts are scrambling to answer unprecedented questions. I do socially distance on a bus. Uh, on a bus. What's it look like um, in gym class? What's a choir room look like? Hopefully not like this, say New York City authorities. This Brooklyn yeshiva has now been shut down after ignoring social distancing orders. New York City also just announced plans for a virtual summer school. About one in six students are being asked to take more online classes because many have fallen behind. Philip. All right, Gabe, thank you. An Italian designer had the idea to create some pandemic-safe swimwear, and the finished product went viral. It's called the Trichini. It's a three-piece set, complete with a bikini and matching face mask. The owner of Alexa Beachwear said the idea began in her house during quarantine while she took photos with her kids. They didn't think it could be this huge of a success, but it has since skyrocketed in Italy. And that's what you're seeing these days with masks matching all kinds of outfits, whether it's a bikini or Mm -hmm. regular clothes. Your patterns are cool. The tan lines, though, yeah. I'm not going to be able to hide those. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you have a great Wednesday. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Before we go, check out this amazing video here. A tour agency captured a super pod of dolphins off of the coast of Laguna Beach, California. See you tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. President Trump doubles down on his use of hydroxychloroquine while engaging in a war of words and personal insults with the House Speaker. Breaking overnight, evacuations ordered for thousands after two Michigan dams were breached. The governor laying out the frightening predictions. In the next 12 to 15 hours, downtown Midland could be under approximately nine feet of water. We are anticipating an historic high water level. Meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking the record rainfall. Another major university planning in-person classes for fall, as many colleges make plans now for the next semester. This morning, Johnson & Johnson discontinuing a widely used type of baby powder amid claims that it caused cancer. And with many already looking forward to Memorial Day, just what can you expect when you hit the road? It's Wednesday, May 20th. Early Today starts right now. Glad to both be together with you. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. As states across the country grapple with how to move forward during the coronavirus pandemic, Michigan is facing a new emergency. Thousands of people have been forced to leave their homes after two dams failed. The governor has suspended her coronavirus restriction orders for the communities facing that danger. And we'll have more on this developing situation coming up. About 60 miles south of that flooding, another protest is planned for Michigan's capital today. It's been called Operation Haircut. Free haircuts will be given out on the Capitol lawn. Organizers are asking people to socially distance and wear masks. Hundreds of McDonald's employees in 20 cities plan to go on strike today. Labor organizers are pressuring the fast food chain to improve protections for workers. McDonald's says that as they reopen dining rooms, the company is putting safety first. The Congressional Budget Office released a bleak outlook for America's economic growth, projecting a 38 percent drop in GDP in the second quarter as 26 million Americans remain unemployed. The White House is forging ahead with its push to rapidly reopen the country. This afternoon, President Trump will meet with the governors of Kansas and Arkansas to talk about their coronavirus response and reopening strategy. Meanwhile, the president is battling intense criticism over his decision to take hydroxychloroquine despite potential dangers. NBC's Alice Barr has more. President Trump venturing from the White House to Capitol Hill without wearing a mask to meet with Republican lawmakers. The president defending his decision to take the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine, despite FDA warnings of serious risks, including potentially fatal heart problems. President Trump saying he started taking it after his personal valet tested positive for coronavirus, followed by the vice president's press secretary. Mike had somebody very close to him, who I also see, who tested positive. So I think, I thought, you know, from my standpoint, not a bad time to take it. 
The White House doctor prescribed the drug at President Trump's request. Many medical experts harshly criticizing the move, saying the risks appear to outweigh the benefits. It sets an irresponsible example to the American people. The president asks, what is there to lose? Well, potentially your life, Mr. President. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi weighing in to say the president of the United States shouldn't be taking an unapproved medication. Especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. As Speaker Pelosi and Senate Republicans negotiate the next round of emergency aid, top economic officials testified before a Senate committee today defending how the Trump administration has used the trillions of dollars approved so far to try and get the economy moving again. There is the risk of permanent damage. And as I've said before, we're conscious of the health issues and we want to do this in a balanced and safe way. Also at the White House, President Trump focusing on the health of the nation's food chain, pledging $19 billion to help farmers and ranchers keep food on America's tables. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. With more and more states reopening across the nation and some businesses getting back up and running, some parents are wondering if schools are next. Two of the country's best-known schools, the University of Notre Dame and New York University, have announced their plans to open back up and resume on-campus classes in the fall. But what coronavirus safety measures will be put in place to protect students and staff? NBC's Kristen Dahlgren has the story. With all my friends right now, While virtual graduations are taking place across the country, students, parents, and professors are wondering what college campuses will look like this fall. I was planning on doing a research project my senior year, and that has to be, you know, in person. So that could affect whether I get into grad school, my future research, my future career. Just last week, California's state university system, the largest in the country, announced plans to move its fall semester online. We miss the vibrancy of campus life, but we we need to make sure that it's safe. So the intention is to plan for virtual in the fall and then plan to transition back to campus in the fall as soon as it's safe to do so. Harvard Medical School now telling its new students that classes will be held remotely. But there are some schools going forward with plans to bring students and faculty back on campus. The University of Arizona even developing its own coronavirus and antibody test. The university's president explained how it's going to work to Savannah earlier this month. Is it your intention then to test every single person who sets foot on that campus? So our intention is to uh, test uh, as many people as we can. Uh, It's going to be voluntary, but we hope that most of the 60,000 people who come to campus will be tested. And now Notre Dame is weighing in with its own unique plan, opening campus two weeks earlier than scheduled. And in an effort to limit the potential spread of COVID-19, students will go straight through with no breaks and end the semester before Thanksgiving. They're part of the 70% of U.S. colleges planning to resume in-person classes this fall. A new poll shows 65% of college students say they would attend if given the option. It is so important for me to be face-to-face with all my teachers and my peers because we're all learning off of each other. Kristen, thank you. In the Midwest this morning, catastrophic flooding is forcing thousands of people out of their homes. The relentless rains ruptured two dams in central Michigan, and officials scrambled to evacuate about 10,000 people to higher ground. NBC's Dan Sheneman has the latest. In central Michigan, the Edenville Dam burst, one of two dams to fail. Authorities called for immediate evacuations in vulnerable areas. Residents in Edenville and Sanford have been ordered to move out by local law enforcement. And if you are in those areas, you must evacuate as soon as possible. Please get somewhere safe now. The flooding after days of heavy rain saturated the Great Lakes region. Lake Erie overflowed its banks. The National Weather Service warned the eastern Michigan lakeshore could suffer significant flooding and erosion. Residents in Westerville, Ohio, a Columbus suburb, were ferried to safety after neighborhood streets turned into streams. It was very terrifying because, you know, you want to keep a positive face for the children, but inside you're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And more flooding near Cincinnati. Some 85 businesses were impacted by rising water. And the flooding may not be over. The forecast calls for even more rain.
Dan Sheneman, NBC News. And that's a tough part for him right there. More rain. Let's turn to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb with a look ahead. Janessa, good morning. Good morning, you two. We're also looking at the Rifle River that hit a historic record yesterday of 13.8 inches. And unfortunately for Central Michigan, up to two to three inches fell yesterday. So that's on top of the river flooding. And we're forecasting for the next 24 hours and an additional four to eight inches. Some spots could get up to 10 inches as this makes its way into the Ohio Valley. This is continuous uh, rain that we're seeing with flash flood warnings currently in place. 188 river gauges under minor to major flood stages across the upper Midwest to the Midwest. And unfortunately, that's going to uh, last for at least the next 24 to 36 hours. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So the heat continues to build across San Antonio into the deep south with daytime highs near a record of 95 degrees. Upper Midwest, that's going to spark up some storm and unfortunately more flooding in this area. So what we're really seeing is just more rain, at least eight inches in some of these spots. Unfortunate situation. Yeah, it's going to be really tough for them. All right, Janessa, thank you. In today's quick hits, Pier 1 Imports plans to close all 540 of its locations three months after filing for bankruptcy. The retailer announced it's seeking court approval to liquidate its stores once they reopen after those coronavirus lockdowns. The Belmont Stakes, one of horse racing's biggest events, will be held on June 20th this year without fans. It is traditionally the last leg in horse racing's Triple Crown, but this year it'll serve as the first. And Johnson & Johnson will stop selling its talc-based baby powder in the U.S. and in Canada after facing thousands of lawsuits claiming it caused cancer. The company said demand has declined due to misinformation around the safety of the product. In January, U.S. government-led research found no strong evidence linking baby powder with ovarian cancer. Sia has expanded her family and confirmed she's a mother of two teenage boys. The singer shared in an interview that she wanted to adopt the 18-year-old boys last year because they were aging out of the foster care system. The two are now 19, and though she didn't reveal their names, she says they're all together and getting through the pandemic as best they can and that she loves them. Now to a disturbing rise during the pandemic. As many people stay home to stay safe, that can be the worst place to be for victims of domestic violence. Here's NBC's Kate Snow. Like your heart has just, someone took a huge knife and just kept carving your heart out. The pain is still so raw for Lissa Weimelt and Bill Pugh, whose daughter Maria was murdered less than three weeks ago. They adopted Maria as a baby from Mexico and raised her in Minnesota. Both Bill and I thought we just won the parenting jackpot. <laughs> always smiling. She snowmobiled, she rode horses, she rode four-wheelers, she snowboarded, she skied, she was a cheerleader. She got married last year, a relationship her parents describe as controlling. I think it was, you know, pretty intense, really fast. And then coronavirus and orders to stay inside their house. You know, that was not a safe place for her to be. Do you think COVID-19 contributed to everything that happened? Oh, sure. I mean, it further isolated her. The criminal complaint says there was an argument on April 30th about Maria leaving. Her husband, Joshua Fury, eventually admitted killing her and burying her body in a small crawl space. Fury's lawyer declined to comment. You just think, why didn't I say all the things that I'm faulting myself for now? You know, run, my God, run. Why didn't I say that? <sighs> Home is not a safe place for victims, and now you're forced to stay inside because outside is scary. Phone calls to the Center for Women and Families in Louisville, Kentucky, have actually decreased, in part, experts say, because victims are trapped with their abusers. But the center is getting more emails or victims calling friends using a code word for help. What are you telling women about whether they can leave because of the coronavirus rules? Well, what we're telling them is do leave. Absolutely. One of the ways that perpetrators are um, manipulating, mentally abusing their victims is through the coronavirus, saying things like, if you walk out this door, you're going to get the coronavirus and die. NBC News reached out to 35 organizations in 19 states. In some places, hotline calls more than doubled, becoming shorter and more frantic. 
We know COVID-19 is a pandemic, but so is domestic violence. Lissa and Bill are starting a nonprofit called Maria's Voice to help victims find resources. There is something we can do. It's a call to action about domestic violence, and it's Maria's Voice. We're just parents who have a broken heart. Um, But we can do something, and we're going to do something to stop domestic violence. Hoping to stop a pandemic within the pandemic. Kate Snow, NBC News. If you or someone you know needs help, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at this number. It's 1-800-799-7233 or go to the hotline.org. The moment we've all been waiting for. Here we go. The winner of The Voice is... Todd Tillman, congratulations. <laughs> Todd Tillman of Team Blake has been crowned the season 18 champion of The Voice. Tillman was there surrounded by his wife and kids in Mississippi as host Carson Daly named him the winner. So a lot of celebrating going on in their household, at least still now. Yeah, it's a good place, surrounded by his family. That's awesome. All right, well, you know, this weekend, it is the unofficial start of the summer, but many traditional Memorial Day activities that we're all used to, they will be put on hold this year, including vacations. NBC's Liz McLaughlin has more on what we can expect this weekend and beyond. Normally, it's the kickstart to a busy summer travel season. But this Memorial Day weekend may be a quiet one. We actually expect to see a record low set for travel volume. It's the first time in two decades AAA isn't releasing a travel forecast. But Americans are expected to stay at home, with the CDC recommending against non-essential travel. The coronavirus pandemic has totally turned the travel industry upside down. Airlines have been hit especially hard, with a 90 percent drop in flyers since the beginning of March. But as some areas begin reopening, Americans are starting to show an interest in traveling again. We're seeing about over 40 percent of Americans planning to take a trip this summer. According to Hopper, users' activity on the app quadrupled in recent weeks. But experts warn to plan with caution. Hawaii, for example, requires a 14-day quarantine for visitors through June, with a possible $5,000 fine or year in prison for violators. If you're going to travel, you need to understand the rules and regulations of where you're traveling to. But the industry is eager to get back to business. Airports preparing for summer with new social distancing and sanitation procedures. We've taken aggressive measures to get the airport ready. All major U.S. airlines now require masks and some will start temperature checks in June. I think we will be a smarter, safer traveling public when this is all said and done. Change is almost certain to mean rising costs and airfares. Liz McLaughlin, NBC News. The Fox Trail Senior Living Center in Virginia is allowing its residents to get bear hugs from their loved ones in costume. That is Linnea Bentz reuniting with her mother while dressed as a hippo in a tutu. But they do have options. Visitors can don a shark, unicorn, or minion costume. The facility is sanitizing the costumes after each use and will require guests to wear a mask and gloves underneath. (laughs) A smile, a hug, and a chuckle all at the same time. Janessa's back now with your midweek forecast. Good morning, Janessa. Absolutely love that story. Memorial Day, you guys are going to be wondering where is summer because it's going to be a struggle across the central plains into the northeast. Look at all this rain with highs in the upper 60s. As restrictions ease across the country, cruise ships are in a much different situation. An estimated 100,000 crew members, including Americans, remain on board around the world, not allowed to disembark. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has the story. This morning, the nightmare at sea turning into a protest on the open ocean. The U.S. Coast Guard says at least 54,000 crew members remain aboard 85 ships in U.S. waters. But it's reported more than 100,000 crew members around the globe have been given no firm details on when they can disembark. I've been trying to get home for just over a month now. Canadian Chris Richardson says some of his colleagues spent weeks in tiny windowless rooms, no longer getting a paycheck, instead earning a fraction of their salary in so-called goodwill payments. It feels like they put money over our 
health and happiness. Before crew members can disembark in U.S. waters, the CDC says cruise ship operators must arrange transportation on private flights and cars and have no interaction with the public on their way home, among other regulations. The long list of requirements could sink some cruise lines who face an uncertain future. According to the Miami Herald, at least 578 crew members have tested positive since the coronavirus outbreak and seven have died. At least two others have lost their lives in apparent suicides. They are just completely stuck against their will, held on a cruise ship at sea. McKenna Madden, a dancer aboard the Royal Caribbean Freedom, says freedom was the last thing she had. She's now finally back home in Arizona after two months at sea. Definitely anxious, definitely uh, scared of the unknown and not knowing what's going to happen or when you're going to go home or how much longer I'm going to be stuck on the ship. You don't really know, so that's kind of scary. With some employees choosing to stay on board, major operators tell NBC News they are working to repatriate their crew members while navigating different and changing international regulations. But for many still stranded at sea, the ship has sailed on being patient. And our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that report. A Cincinnati Reds pitching prospect is finding some creative ways to stay sharp during the pandemic. Take a look at this. 20-year-old Hunter Green throws a pitch right through that open window of the moving car, right into the catcher's mitt. Not really sure how this is going to help him on the mound when the season begins, but his timing and accuracy definitely on point and hope to see him on the mound in a real game yes. very soon. Fingers crossed. That's right. Thanks for watching today. I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Francis Rivera. Have a great Wednesday. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, historic rains have caused two Michigan dams to breach, with the governor calling for thousands to evacuate. We'll have the latest. To the coronavirus and the promising new signs researchers are finding with patients who have recovered from COVID-19. It could be the cruelest cut of all. First-line responders at hospitals being furloughed because of mounting financial losses from the pandemic. Then to keeping your mouth healthy in the age of COVID, but how do dentists and hygienists stay safe when they're right in the line of fire? And then something to make you smile as we kick off your Wednesday, the perfect reflexes from this super goalie. We'll show you more a little later. Right now, early today starts. And we begin with breaking news this morning. I'm Philip Mena. Good to be together both with you. I'm Francis Rivera. Catastrophic flooding is forcing thousands of people out of their homes in the Midwest right now. The relentless rains ruptured two dams in central Michigan, and officials scrambled to evacuate about 10,000 residents in the town of Midland, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Overnight, the state's governor declared a state of emergency for the county. In the next 12 to 15 hours, downtown Midland could be under approximately nine feet of water. We are anticipating an historic high water level. To go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. But we are here, and to the best of our ability, we are going to navigate this together. Heavy rains have inundated much of the Great Lakes region, and more storms could be on the way. Let's turn to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, who's tracking that system. Good morning, Janessa. Good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. We have multiple dams that have failed across uh, central Michigan. We have record rain that continues to fall in that area. Also, the Rifle River hitting historic levels of 13.8 feet. And on top of that, more rain will be continuous for at least the next 24 to 36 hours. Across the upper Midwest to the Midwest, we have 186 uh, flood gauges that are under minor to moderate, even major flood stages. Now, the unfortunate situation is on top of the flooding that we're already seeing, an additional two to four inches is expected, guys. Well, a tough go for them. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Let's turn now to new research on the coronavirus pandemic. We may be closer to learning more about what it means to have recovered from COVID-19. A study from South Korea is shedding light on the question of immunity and whether or not people can get the virus a second time. NBC's Tom Costello has this report. It's the kind of good news development that researchers have been hoping for. 
Preliminary findings from the South Korean Centers for Disease Control suggest patients who recovered from COVID-19 but then tested positive for the virus again were not infectious and were not spreading the virus to others. 447 South Koreans tested positive a second time, but those virus traces appeared to be dead, not alive. Could it be an indication of immunity? I think it's a little too soon to take that and say that we know for sure that people have immunity, but we have seen that people do mount a pretty good immune response to this, and we haven't yet seen reinfection. So I think taken together, that is encouraging. It felt like what I thought was one of the worst flus I had ever had. Back in early February, Erin Kirk Evans, her kids and husband, all became very sick. Now, after recently testing positive for the antibodies, she knows it was COVID-19, which means she could have some protection. It just felt like this empowering feeling that I can no longer live in the fear of it and the uncertainty of what it's going to do to my body or my kids or my husband. In South Korea, the findings have convinced health experts to loosen some quarantine restrictions. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul. They're greeting this new report here with optimism. It means officials will no longer require recovered COVID patients to test negative before being released from quarantine. And it comes just as high school seniors are headed back to school for the first time in weeks. And it could be critical in hard-hit U.S. states since early testing suggests one in five New Yorkers has antibodies for COVID-19, but many never knew they were sick. Having the antibodies does not automatically guarantee immunity, but the South Korean report is further evidence that people who have recovered and do have antibodies may be able to return to work without fear of spreading the disease to others. Philip? All right, Tom, thank you. The White House is ramping up efforts to rapidly reopen the country this morning. A Trump campaign official has confirmed with NBC News that Republican operatives are recruiting pro-Trump doctors to publicly back efforts to revive the economy. For the latest, let's get to our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Paz. And Tracy, this move could contradict some of the president's own top health officials. Hi, Francis. Yeah, government health officials have said that the country needs to reopen carefully based on the numbers, but based on this Associated Press report that we have now confirmed, uh, the doctors being recruited would back the president's idea of reopening on a fast track, uh, the state by state uh, reopening that we've been seeing. Now, this is based on a leaked recording of a phone call that happened in May uh, with people who were supportive of this in a statement the campaign says all co coalitions support the president's policies. We also are following the reaction to President Trump declaring that he's taking the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. Uh, He reacted to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi suggesting maybe that's not such a good idea. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Oh, I don't, I don't respond to her. I think she's a waste of time. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. His words weigh a ton. To our cabinet meeting and every member the president met with his cabinet their first meeting since last fall at that meeting uh, the president said that the number of cases in the u.s now topping more than one and a half million he wears it quote as a badge of honor that testing is working francis All right, tracy pots for us tracy thank you And Congress is debating what steps to take next to help support the nation's economy, which has been badly affected by the pandemic. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin faced questions from senators via video chat on Tuesday. They discussed the government's stimulus efforts like the Small Business Lending Program, part of the $2 trillion federal relief package that was approved in late March. Here's NBC's Chris Pallone. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin on the virtual hot seat testifying before the Senate Banking Committee. You're boosting your Wall Street buddies and you are leaving your people behind. It comes as Democrats and Republicans are increasingly divided on what comes next for the ailing economy. That you're pushing people back into the workplace. There's been no national program to provide worker safety. Democrats accusing the Trump administration of pushing states to end coronavirus lockdowns and business closings. How many workers should give their lives to increase the GDP or the Dow Jones by a thousand points? 
You know, workers should give their lives to do that, Mr. Senator, and I think your characterization is unfair. The House last week passed a fourth economic aid bill calling for $3 trillion in new relief spending. Senate Republicans say it's a non-starter. Before we rush out and do another spending bill, we actually let some of this stuff go to work. Secretary Mnuchin and Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell testified that some government programs designed to distribute relief funds aren't up and running yet. Senators from both parties push them to speed up the process. And we need to make sure the dollars and program quickly find their mark. Fed Chair Powell has been clear in his belief more spending could help prevent the recession from getting worse. These are longer term problems uh, to deal with. I think for now, uh, you know, this very much calls on us to do what we can to support the economy. Mnuchin warned failure to reopen businesses soon could lead to permanent damage to the economy. He admitted unemployment numbers will likely get worse before rebounding. Chris Pallone, NBC News. The coronavirus pandemic has pushed the nation's health care system to the brink, but some medical workers across the country say they are taking pay cuts or being furloughed in the midst of the crisis when they are needed more than ever. NBC's Sarah Dalloff has the story. Cape Cod Healthcare would normally be gearing up for summer tourists needing care. Instead, 600 workers, including medical staff, are temporarily off the job. For Lowe's, nurse Shannon Sherman worries will hurt patients. These cuts are for direct care. These are people that are putting their hands on the patients. Cape Cod Healthcare isn't alone. According to a recent survey, 21% of doctors report being furloughed or having their pay cut during the pandemic, as medical centers face unprecedented financial pressure. Frankly, uh, we're facing one of the biggest financial crises in our history. Um, It's an existential threat for a lot of organizations, and it may force hospitals to close. The American Hospital Association estimates a four-month financial impact of more than $200 billion to the country's hospitals and hospital systems. That includes the expense of treating COVID patients and halting elective procedures. It essentially means that uh, there is no revenue coming into the facilities and uh, there is uh, very limited ways to um, make up for the fact that we have limited income. While procedures are now resuming in many states, it will take time and careful planning, experts say, as well as additional federal funding to get back up to speed. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. All right, Janessa Webb is back with us with the latest on that severe weather. Janessa. Yeah, we do have a lot of places across the Mid-Atlantic to the Ohio Valley, also watching Central Michigan very closely with flood watches and advisories currently in place for 14 million people. And I do think that will be extended throughout your afternoon all the way to tomorrow. This is a very slow-moving system that is going to be continuous into the weekend. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at the day ahead. For the deep south to the southeast, daytime highs still well above average, and we're going to watch a few storms this afternoon. Also, the winds picking up from Bismarck to Minneapolis. Highs, they're still in the upper 70s to lower 80s. So we're going to continue to watch this flooding. Uh, guys, uh, this is going to get a lot worse with forecasting two to four more inches. Oh, wow. All right. Thank you, Janessa. One cat is scratching and clawing to be the best soccer goalie in the world. This is a little cat named after a German goalkeeper, <laughs> Meow Note Neuer, who's been stopping his owner's shots left and right using those cat-like reflexes. He's taken the Internet by storm with that impressive defense. I think I'm going to go on the Internet a little later and watch a little more. That's pretty cool. Today, Connecticut will become the last state to begin reopening. Restaurants, retail, and offices can all open their doors with restrictions. And in a controversial move, dental offices can now treat patients for non-emergency reasons. And that's sparking concerns from many hygienists. We get more now from NBC's Chris Jansing. Connecticut orthodontist Dr. Gary Open is back in business, fully reopening his office today. We do have quite a backlog. We have been closed for six weeks. The new normal means keeping patients safe in the age of COVID. We are wearing higher level masks, N95s. We are wearing face shields also, and we're wearing disposable gowns. He's overhauled his office, investing in a new air filtration system, significantly reducing the number of patients he'll see each day and revamping waiting room procedures. 
their temperature will be checked. Once everything is deemed okay, we will escort the patient to the chair where we'll be working. Dental practices are by nature invasive, and preliminary research suggests the coronavirus survives airborne for hours. That's why some industry insiders like hygienist Megan Zadrowski worry dental offices are reopening before it's safe. Aerosols generated in the dental office are unavoidable, whether it's by dentist drills, whether it's by hygienist instruments, or even the patients themselves who may need to cough. The American Dental Association has issued national guidelines, including hygienists using hand tools instead of automated devices and limiting drills. Suggestions that Zadrowski worries not all dentists will follow. Would you go to a dentist right now for a non-emergent problem? I would absolutely avoid going to the dental office with a non-emergent service. A recent national survey by the American Dental Association found three in 10 dentist offices didn't have any supply of N95 masks and nearly 18% had no face shields. Connecticut dentist Dr. David Fantarella says it has been a challenge. We do have what we need. It has not been easy. He's invested beyond the guidelines, including a fogger to clean rooms and a mobile UVC unit to reduce pathogens. You understand why people are nervous. For sure, I'm nervous, but I'm also nervous on the flip side of that. If we don't do anything, what about that patient? That they get really sick. That they get really sick. All dentists facing the new reality that being afraid of the dentist means something different now. I wanted to make sure my child was safe and comfortable in a setting outside the home. What are you looking forward to most when all this is Uh, over? Well, getting my teeth straight, definitely. The challenge of reopening a business when it's anything but business as usual. And the Labor Department says dentist offices lost a half a million jobs just in April, more than a third of the total number of lost jobs throughout health care. On a mountain peak, there he stood, and he began to speak. Okay, you already see the humor in that. That's Will Ferrell. In a preview of Netflix's upcoming uh, comedy, Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga, it stars of Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Netflix also released a first look photos of Ferrell and McAdams in a series of these costumes for the movie. It will premiere on the streaming platform on June 26th. And this is really funny. The whole premise of it is, mm-hmm. you know, these aspiring musicians who want to make it big for their career. Demi Lovato is in it also. Is too. she? So great, great ad. I'm just yeah. laughing at that ponytail. <laughs> So great. All right. Who doesn't love Taco Tuesday? Actress Drew Barrymore does. She hosted a virtual taco night on Instagram Live on Tuesday night. She made shrimp tacos and she used McCormick Spices. The Hollywood star and the seasoning company, they partnered up to donate $1 million to No Kid Hungry. The charity is raising awareness about child hunger issues during the COVID-19 crisis. A lot of uh, celebrities are raising money for that particular charity. And if now you're craving some shrimp tacos because of it, hey, and you're able to donate for that, Big. even better. Win-win. A pair of twins from Milwaukee are proving that hard work pays off. The sisters named Ariel and Ariana Williams are achieving academic success together. Not only are they graduating at the top of their class, but they were accepted into 37 colleges and also received more than a million dollars in scholarships. Well, the sisters have decided to attend Marquette University in Milwaukee to study nursing. They are also the first in their family to attend college, and parents got to be so excited and so proud that they're doing it together yeah, in the same place. Competitive in the best yeah. possible way, relieving the parents of the mm-hmm. cost of of, uh, of paying for college, and they'll be nurses. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I really want to bring you some bright news for your Memorial Day weekend, but we are currently stuck in a really a damp pattern across the East Coast, even for the Pacific Northwest. It will be a soggy one. Hopefully things dry out if you're across the West by Saturday afternoon. We'll be right back. In today's top stories, the State Department Inspector General fired last week after launching an investigation into Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's alleged misuse of a staffer was also looking into lavish dinners the secretary threw for billionaire CEOs, Supreme Court justices, political heavyweights, and ambassadors on the government's dime. That's according to administration officials. An NBC News investigation found Pompeo and his wife held about two dozen so-called Madison dinners since he took over the post in 2018. A 
State Department spokeswoman defended them as, a, as quote, a world-class opportunity to discuss the mission of the State Department. Hundreds of McDonald's employees are expected to go on strike across 20 cities today. Labor organizers are claiming that not enough is being done to protect workers from COVID-19. McDonald's denies the allegations and says it has 50 new safety procedures that go well beyond masks and gloves. The strike comes the day before the company's annual shareholders meeting. After being effectively shuttered for months, Texas Governor Greg Abbott says bars in his state will be allowed to reopen Friday at 25 percent capacity. Bartenders rejoiced at the news that they would finally be able to return to work. Jacob Roscone from NBC affiliate KPRC has more. Bartending is life for Teresa Bernal for more than 20 years until the pandemic. I was just getting prepared to move in with family because I've depleted my savings. In fact, unable to pay rent, Teresa planned to move in with her youngest daughter, Jody. It's been pure hell. Some bars defied state orders and have already opened. Teresa's boss, Beverly Strain, was about to do the same. If we hadn't have gotten open this week, or by Monday, I was opening up too and letting them come after my license, whatever. It was just getting to that point, desperate. In Fort Bend County, the Sunrise Sports Bar will finish remodeling just in time. I was surprised. I really, I figured he'd wait at least till Monday. And then, of course, my phone started blowing up immediately. I want to make a reservation for Friday. While the owner is thrilled her employees will have work again, first and foremost, Jean Landry says, and tons of these. she wants her customers to be safe. I would feel horrible if somebody got sick in this bar. You know, it's, we'll do whatever we can to keep everybody safe. Our thanks to Jacob Roscoe for that report. Right, a 21-pound chihuahua was abandoned and left disabled, locked inside a crate alongside a major highway in northern New Jersey. Luckily, 8-year-old Stanley found a loving foster family that's nursing him back to health. They've already seen progress in his weight loss, and once he loses more, he'll get his own set of wheels. For now, his foster moms make sure to take him for stroller walks around town. She says he's affectionate despite everything he's been through. Thanks so much for waking up with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. We hope you have a great Wednesday, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Breaking overnight, historic rains have caused two Michigan dams to breach, with the governor calling for thousands to evacuate. We'll have the latest. To the coronavirus and the promising new signs researchers are finding with patients who have recovered from COVID-19. It could be the cruelest cut of all. First-line responders at hospitals being furloughed because of mounting financial losses from the pandemic. Then to keeping your mouth healthy in the age of COVID, but how do dentists and hygienists stay safe when they're right in the line of fire? And then something to make you smile as we kick off your Wednesday, the perfect reflexes from this super goalie. We'll show you more a little later. Right now, early today starts. And we begin with breaking news this morning. I'm Philip Mena. Good to be together both with you. I'm Francis Rivera. Catastrophic flooding is forcing thousands of people out of their homes in the Midwest right now. The relentless rains ruptured two dams in central Michigan, and officials scrambled to evacuate about 10,000 residents in the town of Midland, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Overnight, the state's governor declared a state of emergency for the county. In the next 12 to 15 hours, downtown Midland could be under approximately nine feet of water. We are anticipating an historic high water level. To go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. But we are here, and to the best of our ability, we are going to navigate this together. Heavy rains have inundated much of the Great Lakes region, and more storms could be on the way. Let's turn to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, who's tracking that system. Good morning, Janessa. Good morning, you too. Good morning, everyone. We have multiple dams that have failed across uh, central Michigan. We have record rain that continues to fall in that area. Also, the Rifle River hitting historic levels of 13.8 feet. And on top of that, more rain will be continuous for at least the next 24 to 36 hours. Across the upper Midwest to the Midwest, we have 186 uh, flood gauges that are under minor to moderate, even major flood stages. 
Now, the unfortunate situation is on top of the flooding that we're already seeing, an additional two to four inches is expected, guys. Well, with a tough go for them. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Let's turn now to new research on the coronavirus pandemic. We may be closer to learning more about what it means to have recovered from COVID-19. A study from South Korea is shedding light on the question of immunity and whether or not people can get the virus a second time. NBC's Tom Costello has this report. It's the kind of good news development that researchers have been hoping for. Preliminary findings from the South Korean Centers for Disease Control suggest patients who recovered from COVID-19 but then tested positive for the virus again were not infectious and were not spreading the virus to others. 447 South Koreans tested positive a second time, but those virus traces appear to be dead, not alive. Could it be an indication of immunity? I think it's a little too soon to take that and say that we know for sure that people have immunity, but we have seen that people do mount a pretty good immune response to this, and we haven't yet seen reinfection. So I think taken together, that is encouraging. It felt like what I thought was one of the worst flus I'd ever had. Back in early February, Erin Kirk Evans, her kids and husband, all became very sick. Now, after recently testing positive for the antibodies, she knows it was COVID-19, which means she could have some protection. It just felt like this empowering feeling that I can no longer live in the fear of it and the uncertainty of what it's going to do to my body or my kids or my husband. In South Korea, the findings have convinced health experts to loosen some quarantine restrictions. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul. They're greeting this new report here with optimism. It means officials will no longer require recovered COVID patients to test negative before being released from quarantine. And it comes just as high school seniors are headed back to school for the first time in weeks. And it could be critical in hard-hit U.S. states since early testing suggests one in five New Yorkers has antibodies for COVID-19, but many never knew they were sick. Having the antibodies does not automatically guarantee immunity, but the South Korean report is further evidence that people who have recovered and do have antibodies may be able to return to work without fear of spreading the disease to others. Philip? All right, Tom, thank you. The White House is ramping up efforts to rapidly reopen the country this morning. A Trump campaign official has confirmed with NBC News that Republican operatives are recruiting pro-Trump doctors to publicly back efforts to revive the economy. For the latest, let's get to our Capitol Hill correspondent, Tracy Paz. And Tracy, this move could contradict some of the president's own top health officials. Hi, Francis. Yeah, government health officials have said that the country needs to reopen carefully based on the numbers, but based on this Associated Press report that we have now confirmed, uh, the doctors being recruited would back the president's idea of reopening on a fast track, uh, the state by state uh, reopening that we've been seeing. Now, this is based on a leaked recording of a phone call that happened in May uh, with people who were supportive of this in a statement the campaign says all coalitions support the president's policies. We also are following the reaction to President Trump declaring that he's taking the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. Uh, He reacted to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi suggesting maybe that's not such a good idea. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Oh, I don't, I don't respond to her. I think she's a waste of time. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. His words weigh a ton. To our cabinet meeting and every member the president met with his cabinet their first meeting since last fall at that meeting uh, the president said that the number of cases in the u.s now topping more than one and a half million he wears it quote as a badge of honor that testing is working francis All right, tracy potts for us tracy thank you And Congress is debating what steps to take next to help support the nation's economy, which has been badly affected by the pandemic. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin faced questions from senators via video chat on Tuesday. They discussed the government's stimulus efforts like the Small Business Lending Program, part of the $2 trillion federal relief package that was approved in late March. Here's NBC's Chris Pallone. 
Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin on the virtual hot seat testifying before the Senate Banking Committee. You're boosting your Wall Street buddies and you are leaving your people behind. It comes as Democrats and Republicans are increasingly divided on what comes next for the ailing economy. That you're pushing people back into the workplace. You're, there's been no national program to provide worker safety. Democrats accusing the Trump administration of pushing states to end coronavirus lockdowns and business closings. How many workers should give their lives to increase the GDP or the Dow Jones by a thousand points? You know, workers should give their lives to do that, Mr. Senator, and I think your characterization is unfair. The House last week passed a fourth economic aid bill calling for $3 trillion in new relief spending. Senate Republicans say it's a non-starter. Before we rush out and do another spending bill, we actually let some of this stuff go to work. Secretary Mnuchin and Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell testified that some government programs designed to distribute relief funds aren't up and running yet. Senators from both parties push them to speed up the process. And we need to make sure the dollars and program quickly find their mark. Fed Chair Powell has been clear in his belief more spending could help prevent the recession from getting worse. These are longer term problems uh, to deal with. I think for now, uh, you know, this very much calls on us to do what we can to support the economy. Mnuchin warned failure to reopen businesses soon could lead to permanent damage to the economy. He admitted unemployment numbers will likely get worse before rebounding. Chris Pallone, NBC News. The coronavirus pandemic has pushed the nation's health care system to the brink, but some medical workers across the country say they are taking pay cuts or being furloughed in the midst of the crisis when they are needed more than ever. NBC's Sarah Dalloff has the story. Cape Cod Healthcare would normally be gearing up for summer tourists needing care. Instead, 600 workers, including medical staff, are temporarily off the job. For Lowe's, nurse Shannon Sherman worries will hurt patients. These cuts are for direct care. These are people that are putting their hands on the patients. Cape Cod Healthcare isn't alone. According to a recent survey, 21% of doctors report being furloughed or having their pay cut during the pandemic, as medical centers face unprecedented financial pressure. Frankly, uh, we're facing one of the biggest financial crises in our history. Um, it's an existential threat for a lot of organizations, and it may force hospitals to close. The American Hospital Association estimates a four-month financial impact of more than $200 billion to the country's hospitals and hospital systems. That includes the expense of treating COVID patients and halting elective procedures. It essentially means that uh, there is no revenue coming into the facilities and uh, there is uh, very limited ways to um, make up for the fact that we have limited income. While procedures are now resuming in many states, it will take time and careful planning, experts say, as well as additional federal funding to get back up to speed. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. All right, Janessa Webb is back with us with the latest on that severe weather. Janessa. Yeah, we do have a lot of places across the Mid-Atlantic to the Ohio Valley, also watching Central Michigan very closely with flood watches and advisories currently in place for 14 million people. And I do think that will be extended throughout your afternoon to all the way to tomorrow. This is a very slow-moving system that is going to be continuous into the weekend. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at the day ahead. For the deep south to the southeast, a daytime highs still well above average, and we're going to watch a few storms this afternoon. Also, the winds picking up from Bismarck to Minneapolis. Highs, they're still in the upper 70s to lower 80s. So going to continue to watch this flooding. Uh, guys, uh, this is going to get a lot worse with forecasting two to four more inches. Oh, wow. All right. Thank you, Janessa. When cat is scratching and clawing to be the best soccer goalie in the world, this is a little cat named after a German goalkeeper, <laughs> Miano Neuer, who's been stopping his owner's shots left and right using those cat-like reflexes. He's taken the Internet by storm with that impressive defense. I think I'm going to go on the Internet a little later and watch a little more. That's pretty cool. Today, Connecticut will become the last state to begin reopening. Restaurants, retail, and offices can all open their doors with restrictions. And in a controversial move, dental offices can now treat patients for non-emergency reasons. And that's sparking concerns from many hygienists. We get more now from NBC's Chris Jansing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Connecticut orthodontist Dr. Gary Open is back in business, fully reopening his office today. We do have quite a backlog. We have been closed for six weeks. The new normal means keeping patients safe in the age of COVID. We are wearing higher level masks, N95s. We are wearing face shields also, and we're wearing disposable gowns. He's overhauled his office, investing in a new air filtration system, significantly reducing the number of patients he'll see each day and revamping waiting room procedures. Their temperature will be checked. Once everything is deemed okay, we will escort the patient to the chair where we'll be working. Dental practices are by nature invasive, and preliminary research suggests the coronavirus survives airborne for hours. That's why some industry insiders like hygienist Megan Zadrowski worry dental offices are reopening before it's safe. Aerosols generated in the dental office are unavoidable, whether it's by dentist drills, whether it's by hygienist instruments, or even the patients themselves who may need to cough. The American Dental Association has issued national guidelines, including hygienists using hand tools instead of automated devices and limiting drills, suggestions that Zadrowski worries not all dentists will follow. Would you go to a dentist right now for a non-emergent problem? I would absolutely avoid going to the dental office with a non-emergent service. A recent national survey by the American Dental Association found three in 10 dentist offices didn't have any supply of N95 masks and nearly 18% had no face shields. Connecticut dentist Dr. David Fantarella says it has been a challenge. We do have what we need. It has not been easy. He's invested beyond the guidelines, including a fogger to clean rooms and a mobile UVC unit to reduce pathogens. You understand why people are nervous. For sure, I'm nervous, but I'm also nervous on the flip side of that. If we don't do anything, what about that patient? That they get really sick. That they get really sick. All dentists facing the new reality that being afraid of the dentist means something different now. I wanted to make sure my child was safe and comfortable in a setting outside the home. What are you looking forward to most when all this is Uh, over? Well, getting my teeth straight, definitely. The challenge of reopening a business when it's anything but business as usual. And the Labor Department says dentist offices lost a half a million jobs just in April, more than a third of the total number of lost jobs throughout health care. On a mountain peak, there he stood, and he began to speak. Okay, you already see the humor in that. That's Will Ferrell. In a preview of Netflix's upcoming uh, comedy, Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga, is stars of Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Netflix also released a first look photos of Ferrell and McAdams in a series of these costumes for the movie. It will premiere on the streaming platform on June 26th. And this is really funny. The whole premise of it is, Mm -hmm. you know, these aspiring musicians who want to make it big for their career. Demi Lovato is in it also. Is she? So great, great ad. I'm just laughing at that ponytail. (laughs) So great. All right. Who doesn't love Taco Tuesday? Actress Drew Barrymore does. She hosted a virtual taco night on Instagram Live on Tuesday night. She made shrimp tacos and she used McCormick Spices. The Hollywood star and the seasoning company, they partnered up to donate $1 million to No Kid Hungry. The charity is raising awareness about child hunger issues during the COVID-19 crisis. A lot of uh, celebrities are raising money for that particular charity. And if now you're craving some shrimp tacos because of it, hey, you're able to donate for that? Big. Even better. Win-win. A pair of twins from Milwaukee are proving that hard work pays off. The sisters named Ariel and Ariana Williams are achieving academic success together. Not only are they graduating at the top of their class, but they were accepted into 37 colleges and also received more than a million dollars dollars in scholarships. Well, the sisters have decided to attend Marquette University in Milwaukee to study nursing. They are also the first in their family to attend college, and parents got to be so excited and so proud that they're doing it together yeah, in the same place. Competitive in the best yeah. possible way, relieving the parents of the mm-hmm. cost of, uh, of paying for college, and they'll be nurses. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I really want to bring you some bright news for your Memorial Day weekend, but we are currently stuck in a really damp pattern across the East Coast, even for the Pacific Northwest. It will be a soggy one. Hopefully things dry out if you're across the West by Saturday afternoon. We'll be right back. 
In today's top stories, the State Department Inspector General fired last week after launching an investigation into Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's alleged misuse of a staffer was also looking into lavish dinners the secretary threw for billionaire CEOs, Supreme Court justices, political heavyweights, and ambassadors on the government's dime. That's according to administration officials. An NBC News investigation found Pompeo and his wife held about two dozen so-called Madison dinners since he took over the post in 2018. A State Department spokeswoman defended them as, a, as quote, a world-class opportunity to discuss the mission of the State Department. Hundreds of McDonald's employees are expected to go on strike across 20 cities today. Labor organizers are claiming that not enough is being done to protect workers from COVID-19. McDonald's denies the allegations and says it has 50 new safety procedures that go well beyond masks and gloves. The strike comes the day before the company's annual shareholders meeting. After being effectively shuttered for months, Texas Governor Greg Abbott says bars in his state will be allowed to reopen Friday at 25 percent capacity. Bartenders rejoiced at the news that they would finally be able to return to work. Jacob Roscone from NBC affiliate KPRC has more. Bartending is life for Teresa Bernal for more than 20 years until the pandemic. I was just getting prepared to move in with family because I've depleted my savings. In fact, unable to pay rent, Teresa planned to move in with her youngest daughter, Jody. It's been pure hell. Some bars defied state orders and have already opened. Teresa's boss, Beverly Strain, was about to do the same. If we hadn't have gotten open this week, or by Monday, I was opening up too and letting them come after my license, whatever. It was just getting to that point desperate. In Fort Bend County, the Sunrise Sports Bar will finish remodeling just in time. I was surprised. I really, I figured he'd wait at least till Monday. And then, of course, my phone started blowing up immediately. I want to make a reservation for Friday. While the owner is thrilled her employees will have work again, first and foremost, Jean Landry says, and tons of these. She wants her customers to be safe. I would feel horrible if somebody got sick in this bar. You know, it's, we'll do whatever we can to keep everybody safe. Our thanks to Jacob Ruskin for that report. Right, a 21-pound chihuahua was abandoned and left disabled, locked inside a crate alongside of a major highway in northern New Jersey. Luckily, 8-year-old Stanley found a loving foster family that's nursing him back to health. They've already seen progress in his weight loss, and once he loses more, he'll get his own set of wheels. For now, his foster moms make sure to take him for stroller walks around town. She says he's affectionate despite everything he's been through. Thanks so much for waking up with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. We hope you have a great Wednesday, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Good morning. Breaking news. Flood emergency. Two dams in Michigan collapse overnight after days of heavy rain. The governor calling for mass evacuations. 10,000 forced to flee. To go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. One town warned it could soon be under nine feet of water. We'll have the very latest. State of play as Memorial Day approaches. All 50 states now open, at least partially. But experts warn of rising cases as Americans head out of their houses. And at the White House, the president doubles down on his decision to take a potentially dangerous malaria drug. On alert, the government expands its warning about that mysterious COVID-linked illness in children. Nearly half the states in the U.S. now reporting cases. Just ahead, the CDC's emergency call with doctors around the world and the treatments that appear to be working. Discontinued, Johnson & Johnson announces it will stop selling talc-based baby powder in the U.S. and Canada. Why the abrupt shift after years of lawsuits claiming it causes cancer? Those stories, plus the winner is... Todd Tillman, congratulations. The Voice crowns a new champion after an incredible opening number from the contestants and coaches past and present. Let my love open the door. And Carson's up early to take us inside that special night. Today, Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today. 
with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. It's a Wednesday morning public service announcement. We're glad you're with us. And maybe you were up late watching The Voice last night. I can't believe they pulled it off, Hoda. That was incredible. They sure did. I don't know who was screaming louder, Todd Tillman, who won the thing, or Blake, his coach, because Blake was celebrating. He hadn't won since, I think, 2017. Apparently, Gwen planted a big one on Blake after he won. So it was a big celebration. We're going to get to all of that coming up in just a bit. But we will begin, though, with that break. Breaking news, a really dangerous situation unfolding in Michigan, major flooding and dam failures leading to the overnight evacuation of thousands of residents. NBC's Tom Costello joins us now with the very latest. Hey, Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Two dams have failed, a flash flood emergency across much of the state. In fact, they're talking about some areas under nine feet of water today. Schools open now for evacuees, and we can tell you dozens of roads across the state are closed. This is serious, and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. Governor Gretchen Whitmer overnight declaring a state of emergency after heavy rainfall ruptured two dams Tuesday in central Michigan, about 140 miles north of Detroit, rising waters forcing the evacuation of nearly 10,000 people. Today, the Edenville and Sanford dams in Midland County breached. If you have a relative or a friend somewhere else in the state that you can go and stay with, please go to their homes. If you don't, go to one of the many shelters that have been set up. The evacuations following days of heavy rains in parts of the Midwest that also brought flooding to parts of Illinois, Ohio, and other states. Katrina Conley evacuated with her family to a hotel in Bay City, Michigan. We quickly packed our two dogs a couple changes of clothes and ourselves. We had to do what we had to do as far as finding a place to stay. Otherwise, we would be sleeping in our vehicles. The devastating flooding complicated by the coronavirus. Evacuate the area. Authorities working to get residents out of harm's way, leaving many heading to emergency shelters to balance their safety with social distancing. We're still under the like stay home, stay safe order, but then um, it also feels like get out, stay safe. So it's like this weird, um, really weird uh, conflict. So do the coronavirus rules still apply or like what? what's the right way to be responding? This morning, families living along two lakes and a river forced to flee from one of the worst flood disasters currently hitting mid-Michigan. We're going to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis and we're going to help people get out. Yeah, real dangerous situation with rising waters. There is good news. They're going to get a bit of a reprieve today because the uh, forecast is for sunny and about 70 degrees today and tomorrow. But then after that, more rain may be coming. Savannah, back to you. Uh, to be going through all of that in the middle of this other crisis with the yeah. coronavirus. Tom, thank you very much on that breaking news. And let's turn now to the latest on the virus. All 50 states have now partially reopened, but this morning health officials remain vigilant, out looking out for new cases. President Trump, meanwhile, is on defense over the controversial drug he says he is taking as a precaution against the virus. NBC's White House correspondent Kristen Welker joins us now. Kristen, good morning. Hi, Savannah. Good morning to you. This morning, the president is increasingly defiant about his stated use of the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. It sparked a backlash and also a bitter back and forth between the president and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, raising the question, can Washington work together in this next phase of the crisis? This morning, the tensions are escalating between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president's use of hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. The president firing back at Pelosi after she criticized his decision to take the anti-malaria drug to protect against coronavirus, with no evidence yet that it prevents COVID-19. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. 
Mr. Trump is increasingly on defense about his decision to take the drug, claiming it has been used by workers on the front lines of the pandemic. Many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. But the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing those workers are taking the drug. Former President Joe Biden slamming the president overnight, comparing this to the moment Mr. Trump questioned whether disinfectants could be a treatment, a statement the president later called sarcastic. It's like saying maybe if you injected Clorox into your blood, you know, it may cure you. Come on, man. What is he doing? What in God's name is he doing? The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which uses data from patients at veterans medical centers, found more deaths among those treated with hydroxychloroquine than those treated with standard care. Researchers also reported finding no benefit to its use. The president taking aim. If you look at the one survey, the only bad survey, they were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a, a Trump enemy statement. Now, as for the president's claim that thousands of frontline workers are taking hydroxychloroquine preventatively, while the nation's largest medical association says it's unaware of data supporting that, overnight the White House pointed to about 12 known trials that are underway to study whether the drug can be effective in preventing the spread in frontline workers. It's worth noting those trials are in their preliminary stages. Meanwhile, Vice President Pence says he is not taking the drug even after his press secretary tested positive for the virus. Pence told Fox News his physician hasn't recommended it, but he wouldn't hesitate to take it if his doctor did. Hoda. All right, Kristen Welker for us at the White House. Kristen, thank you. Also this morning, we do have new information on that mysterious illness in children linked to the coronavirus with cases on the rise. The CDC held a worldwide call with doctors to address the dangers and what seems to be helping some patients recover. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren is following that story for us. Hey, Kristen, good morning. Good morning, Hoda. Yeah, a couple of big takeaways from that call. Doctors say that kids showing symptoms of this inflammatory syndrome need to seek help right away, and they likely need to be hospitalized. That's so important, though, because they are seeing success with treating this if it's caught in time. The CDC call outlined what they've learned about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and 10 countries around the world. According to the briefing, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID-19. Many of those children never showing any symptoms caused directly by the virus. But weeks later, a majority of cases are presenting with a fever and gastrointestinal symptoms, believed to be caused by an abnormal immune response to the virus. 15-year-old Dariana Dyson developed stomach pain and a rash around Mother's Day. She tested positive for COVID antibodies. A few days later, she was dead. Now one of four children to die here in the U.S. People need to really understand that this kills people. In New York City alone, there are now 147 suspected cases. I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. But this morning, there is also hope. The CDC says hospitals are having success with some treatments, including immunotherapy and steroids used to calm an overactive immune response. It's what doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. How dramatic was Juliet's turnaround? She came in, in you know, really near death. Um, within a matter of days, um, we were able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own, get her out of the hospital within 10 days. Her family now hoping Juliet's story can help pave the way for others. So most children do go home after a short time in the hospital. What they still don't know, though, is which children might be at risk for this. That's why they say it is so important for all doctors and parents to know what to look out for. Back to you. All right, Kristen, thank you. And now to a bombshell announcement 
from Johnson and Johnson after facing thousands of lawsuits questioning its safety. The company now says it will stop selling its talc based baby powder in North America. NBC's Morgan Radford has more on that. Hi, Morgan. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. That's right. Johnson & Johnson's baby powder has been used by generations of people, but in recent years, they've come under attack, the target of several lawsuits by customers who believe it gave them cancer. Overnight, Johnson & Johnson announcing a major change to one of its iconic products. Pure Johnson's baby powder from Johnson & Johnson. It's a feeling you never outgrow. The pharmaceutical giant saying it will no longer use talc in its baby powder products sold in the U.S. and Canada. In a statement, the company blaming declining sales, fueled by misinformation around the safety of the product and a constant barrage of litigation advertising. According to the American Cancer Society, talc, a mineral known for its softness, can contain asbestos, a substance known to cause cancer. While Johnson & Johnson has long touted the safety of its talc-based products, the company has faced thousands of lawsuits from customers linking them to cancer. Among them, 63-year-old Dean Berg, the first to take on Johnson & Johnson in trial, alleging its talc-based baby powders led her to stage 3 ovarian cancer. I am 100% certain that it caused my cancer. In 2013, a federal jury in South Dakota sided with Berg and found Johnson & Johnson negligent but did not award her any damages. In 2018, Reuters published a report saying that from at least 1971 to the early 2000s, the company's raw talc and finished powders sometimes tested positive for small amounts of asbestos. Information Johnson & Johnson reportedly failed to disclose to the public. The company denied the report's allegations, but months later revealed it was at the center of several federal investigations over whether its talcum powders were linked to cancer-causing asbestos. In October, the company voluntarily recalled 33,000 bottles of baby powder in the U.S. after the FDA found trace amount of asbestos in samples from a bottle purchased online. Johnson & Johnson points out in a statement that all verdicts against the company that have been through the appeals process have been overturned, adding that science is on their side, vowing to vigorously defend the safety of their product and the unfounded allegations against it as it starts to wind down production. This is what I wanted from the very beginning. No further people are going to be exposed to this. So while that talc-based baby powder will be discontinued here in North America, it will continue to be sold in other parts of the world. Savannah? All right, Morgan, thank you. This morning, former Today Show anchor Matt Lauer is speaking out about what he calls flawed reporting by Ronan Farrow. Lauer presenting his own fact check on Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, as the best-selling author and former NBC News reporter comes under new scrutiny in a New York Times report this week. Here's NBC's Stephanie Gosk. Ronan Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, has sold millions. Now seven months after its release, one of his targets, former Today Show host Matt Lauer, is firing back, launching an attack on Farrow's reporting in an op-ed published on the website Mediaite. Among Lauer's accusations, Farrow abandoned common sense and true fact-checking in favor of salacious and deeply flawed material. He also says Farrow failed to confirm stories and used misleading language to manipulate readers. Catch and Kill accuses NBC News and NBC Universal of ignoring sexual harassment allegations against prominent men in the company, including Lauer, for years, and of deliberately burying Farrow's story on Harvey Weinstein to protect Lauer. NBC Universal has repeatedly denied both allegations. In Catch and Kill, Brooke Nevels, the woman whose allegations led to Lauer's firing, publicly accused him of raping her at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Lauer, who says the two had a consensual affair, again vigorously denied the rape allegation. He says Nevels didn't ever use the words assault or rape when she brought her claim to NBC in 2017. Lauer says Farrow took his accusers at their word and says he tracked down four people the author never interviewed. Their accounts, according to Lauer, cast doubt on some of the book's claims. In the book, Farrow writes that Nevels informed her former boss at Peacock Productions about Lauer. But Lauer says that supervisor was never contacted by Farrow. And another woman who ran the company at the time told Lauer, Nevels in no way conveyed the seriousness of what she now claims. There was never a mention of assault or rape. 
In a statement to NBC News, Farrow writes, we called dozens of corroborators around the Lauer allegations described in the book and more than a dozen around Brooke Neville's specifically. Neville's tweeting her response, an acronym for how abusers sometimes respond to accusations. Deny, attack, reverse, victim and offender. Lauer says he wanted to publish his article last fall after the book's release, but held it for personal reasons. The former morning show host says a recent article in the New York Times, critical of Ronan Farrow's reporting, prompted him to release it now. Among the criticisms in the Times article, that Farrow does not always follow the typical journalistic imperatives of corroboration and rigorous disclosure, or he suggests conspiracies that are tantalizing, but he cannot prove. In a statement to the Times, Farrow says he brings caution, rigor, and nuance to each of his stories. This morning, the publisher of Catch and Kill is standing by the book, writing in part, his commitment to the rights of victims and his impeccable attention to detail make us proud to be his publisher. NBC News has offered no comment on the Lauer piece. For Lauer's part, he says the examples of shoddy journalism I've explored here are the tip of the iceberg. For today, Stephanie Gosk, New York. All right. It is now 717. We have a lot more to get to. A New Jersey couple was supposed to get married this past weekend, but they had to postpone it. So instead of a celebration of love, they turned it into a day of a show of support for their community. Take a look at this. The couple organized a campaign called With This Ring, You'll Be Fed. Friends and family, all the people who would have been guests at their wedding, they showed up at the house. They donated non-perishable items that the couple will donate to the New Jersey Food Bank and all. They collected 600 pounds of food. And by the way, the couple says they're going to reschedule that wedding and they're doing it mm. in October. So they turned kind of a crummy situation uh. into a pretty fantastic one, Savannah. You know what I say? That hmm. is love. Yeah. Right. yeah. Loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Time for our first check of the weather. And for that, we go to our friend, Mr. Roker, looking like a sunny day in your neck of the woods. We can't hear him. <laughs> So it's as oh, basic no. But I as think that. We, it is sunny. We know that. We know it's a sunny <laughs> we day. we saw the map. <laughs> yes, we, we, yeah, we caught a quick glimpse of it. It's not as good as seeing Al. Yeah. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Come on, we're back, 7.30. What an impressive start to the season finale of The Voice. <clears throat> Current coaches, a few former ones, including Shakira and CeeLo, joining this year's contestants for a cover of the Pete Townsend hit, Let My Love Open the Door. Big night for Team Blake. Craig, I know you popped the popcorn. You're a fan of this show. We watched. We watched for a little bit. Our, our guy didn't win, but uh, it was another big win for Team Blake last night. Todd Tillman. Yeah. There he is. Uh, we're going to talk to Carson about all of that mm -hmm. last night. But again, it was quite the mm -hmm. feat to, to, to watch them pull that off from a technical standpoint. I know. I shouldn't say this, but they should get an Emmy for that. I really <laughs> think so. Uh, it's incredible, the technical feat. Let's uh, get started, guys. It's 730. Here are the headlines. U.S. birth rates fell again last year. The latest numbers were released just this morning by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There were just over 3.7 million births in 2019. That is the lowest number recorded in 35 years. The report reveals that teen mothers are having fewer babies. And the birth rate for women in their early 40s has gone up. And we got some big news for horse racing fans. The Belmont Stakes will serve as the first leg of the Triple Crown this year. Normally, it's the final leg. That event scheduled for June 20th. But Belmont will look a little different this year. The race will be three-eighths of a mile shorter than usual. The Kentucky Derby and the Preakness have been rescheduled for September and October. And, of course, all of this is because of the coronavirus. 
And now to the potential impact of the virus on Memorial Day plans. The weekend coming up, it's the unofficial start of summer, just days away now. And while beaches are traditionally packed with families, this year many states are taking precautions to ensure that doesn't happen. NBC's Sam Brock joins us from Florida's Delray Beach this morning. Hi, Sam. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. The Memorial Day weekend holiday obviously presents a very big test here in Florida. We've already seen beaches open and then close almost immediately because people were not practicing social distancing here at Delray Beach. Some tight restrictions, no sunbathing on the sand here. Some of tough new rules that we're seeing play out right now across the country. It's one of the surest signs of summer. This is freedom. I haven't had such a full, happy heart this whole time. Fresh sand under your feet and the ocean breeze in your hair. I just needed for my mental health to sit out here and look at the ocean and just kind of breathe. This Memorial Day holiday, many beachgoers seeking a break from coronavirus lockdowns. I don't feel like you're going to be as exposed to the corona as much as you would be in a confined space like a grocery store. But with officials keeping a keen eye on social distancing, on Florida's Delray Beach, swimming, walking, and jogging are allowed. Sunbathing and surfing are not. How do you stop people from flooding from South Florida into your neck of the woods? Well, I think that it's going to be less attractive to come to a beach when there are other beaches um, that allow all activities. We're looking at hopefully keeping the numbers and the crowds down uh, initially. Crowds already gathering elsewhere in the country. On the popular Jersey Shore, anticipation for the holiday palpable. We need this fresh air. We need to have a beach. We need to have a life. On New York's Coney Island, barricades along the boardwalk, though people can still jog and walk on the sand for now. New York's governor just announcing state beaches will open for the holiday with restrictions. Only 50% capacity, no active sports, picnic areas and playgrounds closed. It feels good, you know, it just feels like, it's like a relief. In Southern California, families finding solace in the newly opened Golden Coast. But this is what Manhattan and Newport beaches looked like before the holiday, stoking fears of more COVID-19 spread. Different counties reopening with different restrictions, from bans on chairs and canopies in LA to no building sandcastles in Orange County. Recognition some summer traditions will be broken. Any and all restrictions right now that um, prevent people from getting sick and spreading the, the disease are necessary. This year, celebrating the holiday with sunscreen and a dose of social distancing. And Sam, what about masks? I mean, are some beaches requiring masks to be worn as well? Yes, yeah, Savannah, it varies a lot. On this beach here in Delray Beach, masks are strongly recommended but not required. That is not the case in places like Los Angeles where it's a must. The county posting on its Instagram page, Beachbound, BYOM, bring your own mask. Also the case in places like Cape Cod, Massachusetts as well. Guys, back to you. All right, Sam, thank you so much. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Well, we're back 739 on this Wednesday morning with the search for solutions. Researchers in South Korea say they have found people who tested positive for coronavirus a second time after recovering were not infectious and have antibodies. They also found that people have antibodies after recovery. Yeah, those findings are boosting confidence that some people have some level of immunity and they are not likely to spread the disease. Of course, we've heard tons about this antibody testing and its importance for the reopening of America. But a lot of questions do remain. So we had NBC's investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn take a closer look. Vicki, what'd you find? Good morning, Hoda and Craig. Between antibody testing, diagnostic tests, and now new antigen tests, a lot of folks could be having coronavirus testing confusion. So this morning, we are taking a closer look at each of these tests and which one you may need to take. We had a team of NBC producers literally put their blood and sweat into finding out. This morning, Reuters reporting new plans for a nationwide study of more than 300,000 Americans to try and track the spread of the coronavirus. The CDC will test samples from blood donors in 25 cities looking for antibodies, which are created by the immune system after it fights off the virus.
about to take the antibody testing. We first gave you an inside look at what it's like to take an antibody test last month. There's a huge line outside. Three NBC News producers, David, Michelle and Lauren, all had different symptoms of COVID-19 over the last three months. Cough, fever, body aches, even nausea and loss of smell. But they never got a diagnostic test. If it's positive, it could mean I had the coronavirus back in March. So they volunteered to take an antibody test after they recovered. The results, Michelle and Lauren positive, David negative. But with more than 150 of these tests now on the market, many not authorized by the FDA, health officials have sounded the alarm on their accuracy. So our producers volunteered to roll up their sleeves again to see how the tests compare. Let's see what Quest Laboratories finds in my blood. They offer direct-to-consumer antibody testing. Simply sign up online and make an appointment with the lab. You just sign up on your own. You don't even need to go see a doctor. Then they used telemedicine. Um, so I had heard today that you guys were now going to be doing antibody tests. This time, the producers had a five-minute video visit with a doctor online who ordered the test through LabCorp. Last, they went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Let's head on in. Which developed its own test, available for healthcare workers, first responders, and people, like our producers, interested in donating their plasma for research. So we'll see if these test results are similar to the other ones. All of the tests involved a blood draw, and the results back in about 24 hours. For all four tests, the results were consistent. Lauren and Michelle, positive. David, negative. What do you take away from that? The fact that our producers took four different antibody tests and got the same results each and every time. Yeah, that's great. I think that hopefully over time we'll see which of these tests perform the best. There are a few that are FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations to be able to be used and those tend to be more reliable, up to 100% reliability. Before taking any antibody test, check the FDA's website to see which ones are authorized and make sure you ask the lab or doctor which one they use before you go. Is there anything someone should do differently if they know that they developed the antibody for this virus? We're really recommending that people proceed with caution, continue all the recommended things that everybody needs to do right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your surfaces. It's ideal to take an antibody test three to four weeks after feeling symptoms. While you're sick is a different test, now becoming more widely available. It's diagnostic. You take that test before or during symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo taking a diagnostic test on live TV. This one involves a very large swab that takes a sample from deep in the back of the throat. That's it. Some newer versions use saliva samples. The reliability of the diagnostic test depends on which test you're getting. The FDA says molecular or PCR tests are the most reliable and can take up to a week for results. Also, a new type of diagnostic test called an antigen test can diagnose COVID-19 in less than an hour. The FDA approved it for emergency use, but also warns it may not be accurate every time. It still can have false negatives, which means that they tell you you're negative when in fact you actually have the disease. And that's one of the concerning things. Because you could be spreading it to others unknowingly. Exactly. Remember, diagnostic tests are important to know whether you are infected right away so that you can isolate yourself and prevent spreading that virus. Antibody tests tell you whether you may be immune from being reinfected, but that has not been proven definitively yet. And by the way, the cost for these antibody tests can be all over the place, some ranging from a dollar out of pocket all the way up to $300 wow. for a test. These antibody tests, I'm sure they give people peace of mind. It's good to know that they are consistent, like in your report. Yes. But m I guess more importantly, too, businesses need this info when they talk about reopening. These antibody tests and the results are such an important piece of the puzzle, according to pu public health officials, knowing who has been infected and who has as antibodies will show what areas are lower risk of community spread. And if the data continues to show some sort of immunity when you have the antibodies, then it can also help us decide who can get back out into the community at a lower risk. All of this crucial information for officials as yeah. they decide who goes back to work and how do we reopen. But even if you do have those antibodies, like she said, you got to wear the mask, yep. you got to do all the same things. You want to still be careful yeah. at this point. Make sure the test is FDA approved. That's my yes. What about these Authorized. places? What about these places where the tests are being conducted? Are they all the 
the same? They sort of run the gamut. Our producers told us some were really observing the social distancing guidelines, sanitizing one patient in, one patient out. Others were a little less, mm -hmm. uh, were a little more lax on mm -hmm. those regulations. So definitely bring your hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. wear your mask. Thank you, win. We'll see you next hour, by the way. Okay. How about we switch gears here at 746 now? Mr. Roker standing by for a check of the forecast. How are we looking, buddy? Well, looking okay. And in fact, this cooler weather in the eastern half of the country has been good news for tornadoes in that we've had so many fewer. The typical May pattern that's favorable for tornadoes brings a jet stream up from the southwest, warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico. Well, what we've had this May has been a jet stream down to the south, allowing cold Arctic air in an unseasonably cool pattern this month. And that Gulf warming has, has really stalled. And you look at we some states that normally see a decent amount of tornadoes, nothing so far this month. We like that because as you look at the averages, anywhere from 11 in Iowa to 43 in Texas, May is the most typically active month for tornadoes. We're not seeing those. Sunshine in the northeast today, a fire risk in the southwest, severe storms developing in the western plains, and heavy rain continues in the Appalachians and the mid-Atlantic states. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, state of emergency. 10,000 people forced to evacuate after two dams collapse overnight in Michigan following days of heavy rain. This is serious and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. More storms on the way today. How bad could it get? We're live with the latest. Plus, coronavirus and summer safety. From renting a beach house to hitting the pool to that backyard barbecue, what's safe and what's not in this new normal? We've gathered our team of experts to answer your questions. And let's all go to the movies. How drive-in movie theaters are making a big comeback in the time of coronavirus. Are you excited about tonight's feature films? <laughs> sure. I mean... We're just kind of excited to get out. Harry cool. Smith has your ticket to the hottest show in town today, Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. So I sing a song for the hustlers. Back to Saturday! Greetings from the Hustlers. 
from Spartanburg, South Carolina. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary on the Today Show. Love you too. Morning, everybody. Welcome back to you today. It is Wednesday morning. It is nice to have you with us. We're always looking for silver linings, right, guys? Here's one. A lot of people are waking up later, setting the alarm a little later. Maybe they've thrown the alarm clock out all together. Wouldn't that be a nice thought? And, like and, a, and look at that. We know there's one group that's really excited to be up early. There they are. Our friends in today's virtual plaza. In fact, it's become so big, so hot, so huge. This morning we've gone international. One of the families on the screen from Australia. We can't wait to chat with all of them. Maybe 10 p.m. at night uh, over there, but they're up with us. Uh, First, though, we guys want to tell you about something we have for you tomorrow. Ben Stiller, he's going to join us live to celebrate the life and legacy of his late father, Jerry, a comedy legend in his own right, who we lost last week. We are so looking forward to talking about Ben with about the special relationship that those two shared. That's going to be a great conversation. Yeah, looking forward to talking to Ben. Let's get to your news at 8 o'clock now. Thousands of people in Michigan were evacuated overnight after a pair of dams ruptured and sent floodwaters toward towns. NBC's Tom Costello joins us with the very latest on this breaking situation. Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Pretty dangerous situation. We're talking about central Michigan. Two dams have now failed. And in fact, we have uh, flash flood emergencies across much of that area right now, about 140 miles north of Detroit, specifically in Midland County. The governor has declared a state of emergency uh, and warnings that we could have some areas there under nine feet of water today. Nine feet. Police have been ordering 10,000 people to evacuate, many going to area schools. That is a real challenge right now, of course, in trying to maintain social distancing during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, However, the good news, if there is any, as the flood waters rise, is that we're expecting sunshine today and tomorrow, highs of about 70 degrees, and then the potential for rain returns later in the week. Hold it back to you. All right, Tom Costello. Tom, thank you. This morning, all 50 states have eased their lockdown restrictions, and we're getting important new information about that mystery illness that's affecting mostly children. NBC's Kristen Welker has a look at what we're watching today. Hey, Kristen, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. The first big thing we are watching is just that, that all 50 states are now partially reopened, despite many not meeting federal benchmarks for reopening. With Memorial Day approaching, this weekend is going to be a big test. All eyes are going to be on beaches in Florida and other parts of the country. Important to point out, there are tough new rules in place as the country starts to slowly reopen. Also this morning, the CDC has outlined what it has learned about a COVID-related illness impacting children. Children now found in at least 24 states and 10 countries all around the world. According to the briefing by the CDC, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID. Many of those children never showing any symptoms caused directly by the virus. And finally, as Michigan is coping with heavy rain that's caused 10,000 to evacuate their homes, as Tom was just talking about, the president is threatening to withhold funds to the state over absentee ballots, tweeting, quote, Michigan sends absentee ballots to 7.7 million people ahead of primaries in the general election. This was done illegally and without authorization by a rogue secretary of state. I will ask to hold up funding to Michigan if they want to go down this voter fraud path. Important to point out, no evidence of that. The debate over vote by mail, though, is shaping up to be a hot button issue ahead of the November election. Craig? Kristen, welcome from the White House. Kristen, thank you. South Korea has reached a milestone as it emerges from its strict coronavirus lockdown. Schools there are starting to reopen, but new flare ups of COVID-19 are keeping health officials on guard. NBC's Kelly Kobiea joins us from Seoul, South Korea this morning. Kelly, good morning to you. Craig, good morning. The government here is really being cautious about this, bringing uh, kids back in stages according to age groups, even closing some schools today after two students tested positive. But the vast majority of high school seniors were back at their desks today. This morning in South Korea, a whole new way of going to school. 
This long line you see here is because of temperature checks. Every student, every staff member is getting a temperature check and a squirt of hand sanitizer. High school seniors are the first group back in a slow, staged return to classrooms. Are you happy to be back? Yes. Inside, they've sprayed down rooms, spaced desks farther apart, installed plastic dividers in the cafeteria. The private school for foreigners in Seoul, opening for the youngest students, too. American Paul Rader is the athletics director. Are you comfortable bringing your kids back to school? Knowing how Korea has handled it, knowing how important um, and actually significant protocols like mask wearing and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, etc., makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. Schools were supposed to start reopening last week, but that was delayed after a coronavirus outbreak linked to nightclubs in Seoul. Nearly 200 cases now linked to that cluster, and clubgoers are now facing public backlash, accused of being irresponsible. A member of the K-pop band BTS publicly apologizing for going against government advice to stay home. Zainab missed crossing paths with the infected clubber by an hour. And the clubs, when you enter, they take the time that you went in, your name, your, uh, if you had an asthma, your temperature, everything they check. We're not showing her face because of public anger. She tested negative, but still had to self-quarantine. A crucial piece of South Korea's strategy, which we experienced firsthand after flying in from London. Our 15-day quarantine finally ended on Monday. We feel really confident now that we're leaving that we're virus-free. But this morning, a new battle for health officials after nurses at one of the country's biggest hospitals tested positive for COVID-19. But also another positive sign, a sign of progress today. U.S. troops here in South Korea can now go to restaurants and go shopping off base for the first time since February. The commander here in South Korea calling South Korea's response to the virus exceptional. Savannah? All right, Kelly Covier, I know you're happy to be out and about. Thank you. Annie Glenn, the longtime wife of astronaut and Senator John Glenn, has died at the age of 100 from COVID-19 complications. She and Senator Glenn were married for more than 70 years. And in her lifetime, Annie Glenn overcame a significant speech impediment and went on to advocate for others dealing with similar struggles. NBC's Ann Thompson looks back at her remarkable life. Annie Glenn was every bit as heroic as her space pioneer husband, just more quiet, as was her way. I stuttered ever since I was, that I can remember. It was her speech impediment that would make Annie shun the spotlight, even as John Glenn embraced it, celebrated as the first American to orbit the Earth. Godspeed, John Glenn. The Glens going so far as to decline a visit to their home by then Vice President Johnson to protect Annie's privacy. The couple's bond so strong that neither war nor fame nor politics could weaken it. I have known my husband since I was two, and he and I were in love when we were in the eighth grade. And he promised me that life would never be dull. Watching the Today Show in 1973, they found a treatment that would help Annie overcome her stutter. When she finished the therapeutic program, Annie picked up the telephone she once feared. I called John. He cried. That was very emotional for me because I know what it was like for her before. Annie would use her voice to help her husband win four terms in the U.S. Senate, representing their native Ohio. Is there Annie, <laughs> come here. They told me to get lost. They want to see you. <laughs> and in an ill-fated campaign for the presidency. But it is the work she did as an advocate for those with speech disorders that defines her legacy, lifting up those all too often ignored or ridiculed as she once was. I tell more people that I, I feel like a butterfly that has been let out of a cocoon, and uh, it's just completely, completely changed my life. A year older than he, Annie's marriage to John lasted 73 years. They raised two children, David and Lynn, and together made history in their own way, each with the right stuff. For today, Ann Thompson, NBC News. Wow.
Wow. She found her voice Incredible. later in life Incredible and, and life. used it to do a, a whole lot of good, it would seem, right? Wow. That was terrific. All right, guys, what do you say we move on to our morning boosts, plural? I got a baby girl named Libby. She's almost a year old, but because of a hearing impairment, she'd never known the sound of her mom's voice, so all that changed recently when Libby's new cochlear implant was turned on. Libby. Lib. Libby girl. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear mama? Can you hear mama? Hi Libby. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> There's that smile. There's that smile. Wow, Libby. Boy, she's just captivated by that sound. Um, mom is over the moon. I mean, can you imagine getting to tell your baby I love you and know she can hear it for the first time? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Your little smile says it all. I don't know how I'm supposed to go forward, but okay, here we go. This is a funny one. Here's a British dad who really went all in on a lockdown prank for his daughters. He turned their entire home into a giant ball pit. Yeah. <laughs> He got a truckload, wow. a truckload of those plastic balls, those little plastic balls, hauled and dumped them in every room. 250,000 <laughs> people counting. And when his girls walked in, magic. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I think you saw there, yep, it's a surprise to mom too. But she quickly joined in the fun. I mean... Wow. I'm, I'm kind of just blown away by the whole yeah. thing. It's incredible. That's next level. But can you imagine picking up 250,000 balls? I was just thinking the same the thing. The other end. Like that yeah. cleanup, that's, that's going to be a yeah. nightmare. Not so much fun. Yeah. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Time to launch our countdown to summer because Memorial Day weekend is just a couple of days away. Of course, things will look and feel different this year. So when you're making your plans, you're probably wondering what is safe, what isn't. Well, we got our team of experts standing by to help you navigate the new normal. We're going to start with our medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres, we've got a question for you. This is from Becky on our Facebook page. Take a listen. If the virus is presumed to be transferred through the eyes, nose, and mouth, how safe is it to be in a pool or at the beach for me and my granddaughters? Big question. And Hoda, you're more likely to catch coronavirus from all the other people at the pool than you are from the water. It's a respiratory virus, doesn't live well in the water, so don't worry too much about that. But you need to do the things that you need to do to stay safe from all the other people there, meaning if they're outside your circle of trust, social distancing will be important. On top of that, don't share towels, don't share water bottles, don't share sunscreens, because if somebody had coronavirus and used them, they could transmit it to you. But again, the water itself, the risk is very, very low. So at the lake, at the beach, in the pool, Mm -hmm. Go ahead and enjoy the water. Masks, you say yes or no when you're outside at the beach or the pool? If you, if you can't social distance, you should wear masks. Okay. Uh, so people want to go to a barbecue. And I think some people might go and wonder, like, A, is the food going to be okay? Is that something they should be worried about? Not too much from the food because the food itself, the virus doesn't live well in meat, doesn't live well in the vegetables, but the person that prepared it, if they're sick, then there is a risk of them transmitting it. So make sure whoever's preparing the food, number one, is not sick. They're wearing a mask, they're wearing gloves, or at least washing their hands. But on top of that, just follow basic food safety handling tips. That means keeping the meat separate from the vegetables. And when you rinse the vegetables and the salad, just rinse them with water. You don't need any special cleaning products or okay. soap because that could get you, your stomach upset. Just regular rinsing. All right, and be careful of touching the ketchup bottle and the mustard bottle. All right, we're going to move on to Vicki Wynn, exactly. our investigative and consumer correspondent. Vic, a lot of people have put money down on vacation rentals, okay? And maybe, maybe they've heard, well, it's okay to come, but if you want to cancel, is that, is that cool? Can you do that? 
this is the thing. You can always cancel. But the big question is, how much is it going to cost you? Do you have to forfeit your security deposit? Did you pay in advance? But think about it. Take a step back. What's making you nervous? Are you worried about the cleaning? Just reach out to the leasing company. Ask them to email you in writing. What are their cleaning protocols? Maybe once you get that information about how they're disinfecting, you'll feel calmer and safer. Airbnb is actually instituting a policy where it's asking some hosts to wait 72 hours before uh, between guests, which helps to limit uh, the spread of the infection. And if you want if you want extra cleaning, you can ask for that. You can always yeah. ask for it. It's really going to be up to the owner whether or not they do it. But when you talk about the big home share companies like Verbo and Airbnb, they've already announced they're going to enhance their cleaning policies. Okay. We're planning to get out at some point this summer. We're going to bring our own wipes, wipe down those high-touch surfaces, the remote controls, the light switches, the doorknobs. That'll give you some peace of mind, too. Sometimes there's stuff to rent, like a kayak or a jet ski. Would you say yes or no to that? Yeah, this is a great time. I mean, Memorial Day weekend is sort of the unofficial kickoff to the boating season. So the things you need to consider here, practice social distancing. This is not a time to get on a small boat with people right. you haven't been isolated with. So I hope you're not sick of your family because you're going to be <laughs> stuck with them for the rest of the summer. But if you have got a yacht and you can, you know, do yeah. a six foot, then you do you. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I want you to consider is the rental shack. Keep your mask on when you're in those small enclosed yeah. areas and ask what the company is doing between users of the paddle boards, the kayaks, the handles. Are they wiping those things down? Can you bring wipes and wipe them down? All right, Vicki, thank you. Last but definitely not least, let's bring in Stephanie Rule. She's NBC's senior business correspondent. All right, Steph, a lot of people are making plans to travel and Sherry from New Jersey has a big question for you. If I decide to fly this summer and I get on the flight and I see that it's overcrowded or that people are not wearing masks, am I allowed to get off the flight and get a refund or get a free rebooking? Good question, Steph. All right, we are seeing airlines change their policies every day to get closer to this. You know now they're requiring masks, but at the same time, you've seen the viral photos, packed planes, people not wearing masks. Well, United has changed their policy. If you're expecting to get on a packed flight, they're now allowing you to rebook on a different flight or get a credit. And across the board, most airlines are enhancing their cancellation policies to help people who've got trips planned. Speaking of, of refunds, Steph, if you've been paying, let's say, your gym membership or a pool membership and your gym isn't operational or your pool isn't, are you eligible for a refund? It completely depends. We're, we're seeing this the most is people who live in buildings that have these uh. amenities. And in Washington, D.C., for example, they're now trying to push a bill where landlords will have to force uh, that landlords will have to refund mm -hmm. part of the rent to those tenants. You paid up for that fancy building. And if you don't get to use the amenities, other suggestions to those landlords, can you offer possibly free internet or other amenities? Because these things are expensive. Yeah, they sure are. Steph, before I let you go, I have to let you know that you're a viral sensation, okay? <laughs> there is a video of you and your cute son. I don't know if you all have seen this, but just look at it for a second. <laughs> Stephanie may be the hardest working woman in television, and the hashtag Mama Gets It Done is so on point for you, Steph. <laughs> Your son is calm. I mean, that thing has like three million hits. Gaming names like MGM. It, it, you know what? He was sitting next to me. He was preparing to answer some questions about economics for uh, Nightly News Kids, and I didn't realize the ca uh, it was my time to go, and it was too late for me to just push him off his seat. <laughs> I just laid him down. <laughs> by the way, very calming. It's a beautiful sight, by the way. And a bunch of moms were online giving you two thumbs up. So thank you so much, Steph. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back with Harry Smith goes to, and this time Harry goes to an old school form of entertainment that's suddenly become quite popular again. Yeah, with families all cooped up and hoping for a little bit of an escape. Drive-in movie theaters, they're seeing a resurgence, and Harry paid a visit to one over the weekend. Hey, Harry. Morning, kids. I got, I got to you know, think back in the ancient times four months ago when we were all worried about screen time, especially for our kids. Well, that all went away. Now there's a big screen that is just the thing. You got to see this. Friday night, Amenia, New York. The four brothers drive in. You could sense the collective sigh 
coming from each car. A night out. Yes, a night out. So when you said, we're going to the drive-in, what was the reaction? They were extremely excited. My son, who's over there, woke up this morning and kept asking all day long, when can we go, when can we go? He was just so over the moon excited. Cheryl DeGroat and her family and her neighbors in the next car got here plenty early. We got here, oh gosh, probably about a quarter after six. <laughs> We've been here for a little while. It's not going to start for another hour and a half. I know, we don't care. And it mattered little what was showing, even to teenagers, Will and Ellie Poon. Are you excited about tonight's feature films? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're just kind of excited to get out. I hear Trolls is... Top notch. Top notch. <laughs> we stopped by earlier in the week to talk to the two brothers who run Four Brothers Drive-In, Paul and John Stephanopoulos. When you guys heard you were good to go to open up again, what was your reaction? True excitement. Bottled, uh, open up the bottle of champagne and <laughs> seriously jumping up and down, jumping up and down. Oh, up yeah, and yeah. down. We were, we were, we're, excited, we're crazy excited. about it. It's kind of like letting everybody back into a little bit of normal. We'd like to think the heyday of drive in movies was decades ago. <laughs> but with built in social distancing, drive ins provide both a way back to the future and a great escape. Food you can pick up or get delivered. And frankly, what's better than a pizza party? in the back of a station wagon. Here's the number one thing. How's the pizza? Good. Meet the Jordans, Emma, Mackenzie, Allison, Dad Kevin, and Mom Erica. They got to say goodbye to their teachers today. Yeah. So it's, it's a, he decided it's gotta be a positive, yep. not a negative. Yep. No crying, we're gonna go out and have a great day. So we had McDonald's for lunch, driving for the first time for dinner yeah. and for a movie. Erica is a stay-at-home mom who's in charge of the girls' studies, while Kevin works from their bedroom. And... He's the phys ed teacher and the principal, so he so comes we down We gave ourselves for... titles. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing their best to manage the COVID close down. We do a lot with them throughout the day. They're out on their bikes, so it's not like that they're not getting up. And, truth be told... More for Erica and I, this is what we probably needed more than they needed tonight. Built-in social distancing, getting out of the house, big screen entertainment. But we wondered, what about the restrooms? We recommend that you hold yeah. it in. <laughs> what did you say? We recommend that you hold it in. <laughs> Perhaps the real heroine of the night, Faviola Fernandez, a dozen years with the company, who tidies up after every visitor. You want me to funny first? The two brothers at Four Brothers Drive-In told us they sold out that first night. What were you hearing as people started coming into the parking lot? Uh, just the excitement, uh, just seeing their faces you know, lit up. They're, they're happy to be back here. When twilight came, the big screen lit up and the world and its problems faded away. In the cars and pickups, a mix of first-timers and regulars. The regular customers surely thinking, you just don't know what you've been missing. So this is exploding all over the country as these drive-in movie theaters open up again. And all kinds of restaurants now are changing their parking lots so they can deliver out to the people in their parking lot. And then they put a big screen up, too. It's just really quite amazing. Carson, are you, are you a big drive-in guy? Have you ever done one of those? No, but I love it. You know, I, I said it the other day. I think I said to Siri, I'm like, I, I hope that there's a resurgence in drive-in theaters in the, in the 1950s, there was over 4,000 drive-in theaters in the country. Now there's just a little over 300. If they're still up, this would be a great thing to sort of dust off and bring back. I would kill to take my kids to see Trolls uh, in a drive-in theater tonight. And by the way, they're especially, they're especially popular in places like Ohio and Pennsylvania. They're spread out in different parts of the country. I've talked to some of the people who run these things. Since they've been opening up again, many of them have been sold out every night. Wow. Harry Smith. And, oh, wait, wait, wait. One more thing. Carson was unbelievable last night. Yes. Carson, that show oh, was so good. Agreed. Kelly Clarkson, the Stop old car, car, archive stuff. Oh, my gosh, like this. Awesome. You crushed it. You were crushed it. I am oh, now you. your official <laughs> fanboy. No way. That's you, you, Harry, you are, the, you are the Yoda to my Skywalker, and you know it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. <laughs> Take care, guys. The love is real with these two. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability... Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America... And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Good morning. Breaking news. Flood emergency. Two dams in Michigan collapse overnight after days of heavy rain. The governor calling for mass evacuations. 10,000 forced to flee. To go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. One town warned it could soon be under nine feet of water. We'll have the very latest. State of play as Memorial Day approaches. All 50 states now open, at least partially. But experts warn of rising cases as Americans head out of their houses. And at the White House, the president doubles down on his decision to take a potentially dangerous malaria drug. On alert, the government expands its warning about that mysterious COVID-linked illness in children. Nearly half the states in the U.S. now reporting cases. Just ahead, the CDC's emergency call with doctors around the world and the treatments that appear to be working. Discontinued, Johnson & Johnson announces it will stop selling talc-based baby powder in the U.S. and Canada. Why the abrupt shift after years of lawsuits claiming it causes cancer? Those stories, plus the winner is... Todd Tillman, congratulations. <laughs> The Voice crowns a new champion after an incredible opening number from the contestants and coaches past and present. And Carson's up early to take us inside that special night. Today, Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. From NBC News, 
This is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. It's a Wednesday morning public service announcement. We're glad you're with us. And maybe you were up late watching The Voice last night. I can't believe they pulled it off, Hoda. That was incredible. They sure did. I don't know who was screaming louder, Todd Tillman, who won the thing, or Blake, his coach, because Blake was celebrating. He hadn't won since, I think, 2017. Apparently, Gwen planted a big one on Blake after he won, so it was a big celebration. We're going to get to all of that coming up in just a bit. But we will begin, though, with that breaking news, a really dangerous situation unfolding in Michigan, major flooding and dam failures leading to the overnight evacuation of thousands of residents. NBC's Tom Costello joins us now with the very latest. Hey, Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Two dams have failed, a flash flood emergency across much of the state. In fact, they're talking about some areas under nine feet of water today. Schools open now for evacuees, and we can tell you dozens of roads across the state are closed. This is serious, and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. Governor Gretchen Whitmer overnight declaring a state of emergency after heavy rainfall ruptured two dams Tuesday in central Michigan, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Rising waters forcing the evacuation of nearly 10,000 people. Today, the Edenville and Sanford dams in Midland County breached. If you have a relative or a friend somewhere else in the state that you can go and stay with, please go to their homes. If you don't, go to one of the many shelters that have been set up. The evacuations following days of heavy rains in parts of the Midwest that also brought flooding to parts of Illinois, Ohio, and other states. Katrina Conley evacuated with her family to a hotel in Bay City, Michigan. We quickly packed our two dogs a couple changes of clothes and ourselves. We had to do what we had to do as far as finding a place to stay. Otherwise, we would be sleeping in our vehicles. The devastating flooding complicated by the coronavirus. Evacuate the area. Authorities working to get residents out of harm's way, leaving many heading to emergency shelters to balance their safety with social distancing. We're still under the like stay home, stay safe order, but then um, it also feels like get out, stay safe. So it's like this weird, um, really weird uh, conflict. So do the coronavirus rules still apply or like what? what's the right way to be responding? This morning, families living along two lakes and a river forced to flee from one of the worst flood disasters currently hitting mid-Michigan. We're going to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis and we're going to help people get out. Yeah, real dangerous situation with rising waters. There is good news. They're going to get a bit of a reprieve today because the uh, forecast is for sunny and about 70 degrees today and tomorrow. But then after that, more rain may be coming. Savannah, back to you. Uh, to be going through all of that in the middle of this other crisis with yeah. the coronavirus. Tom, thank you very much on that breaking news. And let's turn now to the latest on the virus. All 50 states have now partially reopened, but this morning health officials remain vigilant, out looking out for new cases. President Trump, meanwhile, is on defense over the controversial drug he says he is taking as a precaution against the virus. NBC's White House correspondent Kristen Walker joins us now. Kristen, good morning. Hi, Savannah. Good morning to you. This morning, the president is increasingly defiant about his stated use of the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. It sparked a backlash and also a bitter back and forth between the president and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, raising the question, can Washington work together in this next phase of the crisis? This morning, the tensions are escalating between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president's use of hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. The president firing back at Pelosi after she criticized his decision to take the anti-malaria drug to protect against coronavirus, with no evidence yet that it prevents COVID-19. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. 
Mr. Trump is increasingly on defense about his decision to take the drug, claiming it has been used by workers on the front lines of the pandemic. Many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. But the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing those workers are taking the drug. Okay. Former President Joe Biden abortion. slamming the president overnight, president. comparing this to the moment Mr. Trump questioned whether disinfectants could be a treatment, a statement the president later called sarcastic. It's like saying maybe if you injected Clorox into your blood, you know, it may cure you. Come on, man. What is he doing? What in God's name is he doing? The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which uses data from patients at veterans medical centers, found more deaths among those treated with hydroxychloroquine than those treated with standard care. Researchers also reported finding no benefit to its use. The president taking aim. If you look at the one survey, the only bad survey, they were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a, a Trump enemy statement. Now, as for the president's claim that thousands of frontline workers are taking hydroxychloroquine preventatively, while the nation's largest medical association says it's unaware of data supporting that, overnight the White House pointed to about 12 known trials that are underway to study whether the drug can be effective in preventing the spread in frontline workers. It's worth noting those trials are in their preliminary stages. Meanwhile, Vice President Pence says he is not taking the drug even after his press secretary tested positive for the virus. Pence told Fox News his physician hasn't recommended it, but he wouldn't hesitate to take it if his doctor... Do have new information on that mysterious illness in children linked to the coronavirus with cases on the rise. Did. Hoda? All right. Kristen Welker for us at the White House. Kristen, thank you. All, All suits from customers linking them to cancer. Among them, 63-year-old Dean Berg, the first in her to stage 3 ovarian cancer. I am 100% certain that it caused my cancer. In 2013, a federal jury in South Dakota sided with Berg and found Johnson & Johnson negligent but did not award her any damages. In 2018, Reuters published a report saying that from at least 1971 to the early 2000s, the, co the company that have been through the appeals process have been overturned, adding that science is on their side, vowing to vigorously defend the safety of their product and the unfounded allegations against it as it starts to wind down production. This is what I wanted from the very beginning. No further people are going to be exposed to this. So while that talc-based baby powder will be... Savannah? All right, Morgan, thank you. This morning, former Today Show in North America, it will continue to be sold in other parts of the world, speaking out about what he calls flawed reporting by Ronan Farrow. Lauer presenting his own fact check on Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, as the best-selling author and former NBC News reporter comes under new scrutiny in a New York Times report this week. Here's NBC's Stephanie Gosk. Ronan Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, has sold millions. Now seven months after its release, one of his targets, former Today Show host Matt Lauer, is firing back, launching an attack on Farrow's reporting in an op-ed published on the website Mediaite. Among Lauer's accusations, Farrow abandoned common sense and true fact-checking in favor of salacious and deeply flawed material. He also says Farrow failed to confirm stories and used misleading language. So they turned kind of a crummy situation uh, into a pretty fantastic one, Savannah. You know what I say? That mm. is love. Yeah, up, right? yeah. Love in your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Time for our first check of the weather. And for that, we go to our friend Mr. Roker, looking like a sunny day in your neck of the woods. We can't hear him, <laughs> so it's as oh, basic no. But I as think we, if it is sunny. We know that. We know it's a sunny <laughs> day. we saw the map. <laughs> yes, we, we, yeah, yeah, we got a quick glimpse of it. It's not as good as seeing, seeing Al. Yeah. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. 
live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Come on, we're back, 7.30. What an impressive start to the season finale of The Voice. <clears throat> Current coaches, a few former ones, including Shakira and CeeLo, joining this year's contestants for a cover of the Pete Townsend hit, Let My Love Open the Door. Big night for Team Blake. Craig, I know you popped the popcorn. You're a fan of this show. We watched. We watched for a little bit. Our, <laughs> our guy didn't win, but uh, it was another big win for Team Blake last night. Todd Tillman. Yeah. There he is. Uh, we're going to talk to Carson about all of that. And Sam, what about masks? I mean, are some beaches requiring masks to be worn as well? Yeah, Savannah, it varies a lot. On this beach here in Delray Beach, masks are strongly recommended but not required. That is not the case in places like Los Angeles where it's a must. The county posting on its Instagram page, Beachbound, BYOM. We're not infectious and have antibodies. They also found that people have antibodies after recovery. Yeah, those findings are boosting confidence that some people have some level of immunity and they are not likely to spread the disease. Of course, we've heard tons about this antibody testing and its importance for the reopening of America. But a lot of questions do remain. So we had NBC's investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wen take a closer look. Vicki, what'd you find? Good morning, Hoda and Craig. Between antibody testing, diagnostic tests, and now new antigen tests, a lot of folks could be having coronavirus testing confusion. So this morning, we are taking a closer look at each of these tests and which one you may need to take. We had a team of NBC producers literally put their blood and sweat into finding out. This morning, Reuters reporting new plans for a nationwide study of more than 300,000 Americans to try and track the spread of the coronavirus. The CDC will test samples from blood donors in 25 cities looking for antibodies, which are created by the immune system after it fights off the virus. About to take the antibody testing. We first gave you an inside look at what it's like to take an antibody test last month. There's a huge line outside. Three NBC News producers, David, Michelle, and Lauren, all had different symptoms of COVID-19 over the last three months. Cough, fever, body aches, even nausea and loss of smell. But their workers, first responders, and people, like our producers, interested in donating their plasma for research. So we'll see if these test results are similar to the other ones. All of the tests involved a blood draw, and the results back in about 24 hours. For all four tests, the results were consistent. Lauren and Michelle, positive. David, negative. What do you take away from that? The fact that our producers took four different antibody tests and got the same results each and every time. Yeah, that's great. I think that hopefully over time we'll see which of these tests perform the best. There are a few that are FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations to be able to be used, and those tend to be more reliable, up to 100% reliability. Body test, check the FDA's website to see which ones are authorized and make sure you ask the lab or doc before taking any anti which one they use before you go. Is there anything someone should do differently if they know that they develop the antibody for this virus? We're really recommending that people proceed with caution, continue all the recommended things that everybody needs to do right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your surfaces. It's ideal to take an antibody test three to four weeks after feeling symptoms. While you're sick is a different test, now becoming more widely available. It's diagnostic. You take that test before or during symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo taking a diagnostic test on live TV. This one involves a very large swab that takes a sample from deep in the back of the throat. That's it? Some newer versions use saliva samples. The reliability of the diagnostic test depends on which test you're getting. The FDA says molecular or PCR tests are the most reliable and can take up to a week for results. Also, a new type of diagnostic test called an antigen test can diagnose COVID-19. It's Sunday. It's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulations. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room. This will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment. A lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, state of emergency evacuated overnight after a pair of dams ruptured and sent floodwaters toward towns. NBC's Tom Custer. Situation. We're talking about central Michigan. Two dams have now failed, and in fact, we have a flash flood emergencies. Latest on this breaking situation. Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Pretty across much of that area right now, about 140 miles north of Detroit, specifically in Midland County. The governor has declared a state of emergency uh, and warnings that we could have some areas there under nine feet of water today. Nine feet. Police have been ordering 10,000 people to evacuate, many going to area schools. That is a real challenge right now, of course, in trying to maintain social distancing during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, however, the good news, if there is any as the flood waters rise is that we're expecting sunshine today and tomorrow highs of about 70 degrees and then the potential for rain returns later in the week. Hold it back to you. All right, Tom Costello. Tom, thank you. This morning, all 50 states have eased their lockdown restrictions. and We're getting important new information about that mystery illness that's affecting mostly children. NBC's thing we are watching is just that, that all 50 states are now partially reopened despite many not meeting federal benchmarks. Look at what we're watching today. Hey, Kristen, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. The for reopening. With Memorial Day approaching, this weekend is going to be a big test. All eyes are going to be on beaches in Florida and other parts of the country. Important to point out, there are tough new rules in place as the country starts to slowly reopen. Also this morning, the CDC has outlined what it has learned about a COVID-related illness impacting children now found in at least 24 states and 10 countries all around the world. According to the briefing by the CDC, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID. Many of those children never showing any symptoms. The rain that's caused 10,000 to evacuate their homes, as Tom was just talking about. The president is threatening to withhold funds caused directly by the virus. And finally, as Michigan is co to the state over absentee ballots, tweeting, quote, Michigan sends absentee ballots to 7.7 .7 million people ahead of primaries in the general election. This was done illegally and without authorization by a rogue secretary of state. I will ask to hold up funding to Michigan if they want to go down this voter fraud path. Important to point out no evidence of that. Squaring and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, etc. Makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. Schools were supposed to start reopening last week, but that was delayed after a coronavirus outbreak linked to nightclubs in Seoul. Nearly 200 cases now linked to that cluster, and clubgoers are now facing public backlash, accused of being irresponsible. A member of the K-pop band BTS publicly apologizing for going against government advice to stay home. Zainab missed crossing paths with the infected clubber by an hour. And the clubs, when you enter, they take the time that you went in, your name, your, uh, if you had an answer. Face ...because of public anger. She tested negative, but still had to self-quarantine. A crucial... Uh, your temperature, everything they check. We're not showing strategy, which we experienced firsthand after flying in from London. Our 15-day quarantine finally ended on Monday. We feel really confident now that we're leaving that we're virus free. But this morning, a new battle for health officials after nurses at one of the country's biggest hospitals tested positive for COVID-19. But also another positive sign, a sign of progress today. U.S. troops here in South Korea can now go to restaurants and go shopping off base for the first time since February. The commander here in South Korea calling South Korea's response to the virus exceptional. Savannah? 
All right, Kelly Covier, I know you're happy to be out and about. Thank you. Annie Glenn, the longtime wife of astronaut and Senator John Glenn, has died at the age of 100 from COVID-19 complications. She and Senator Glenn were many years, and in her lifetime, Annie Glenn overcame a significant speech impediment and went on to advocate for others dealing with Senate for more than six years. Ann Thompson looks back at her remarkable life. Annie Glenn was every bit as heroic as her space pioneer husband, just more quiet, as was her way. I got it ever since I was, that I can remember. It was her speech impediment that would make Annie shun the spotlight, even as John Glenn embraced it, celebrated as the first American to orbit the Earth. Godspeed, John Glenn. The Glens going so far as to decline a visit to their home by then Vice President Johnson to protect Annie's privacy. The couple's bond so strong that neither war nor fame nor politics could weaken it. I have known my husband since I was two, and he and I were in love when we were in the eighth grade. And he promised me that life would never be dull. Watching the Today Show in 1973, they found a treatment that would help Annie overcome her stutter. When she finished the therapeutic program, Annie picked up the telephone she once feared. I called John. He cried. That was very emotional for me because I know what it was like for her before. Annie would use her voice to help her husband win four terms in the U.S. Senate, representing their native of Morning. Boosts, plural. I got a baby girl named Libby. She's almost a year old, but because of a hearing impairment, she'd never known the sound of her mom's voice, so all that changed recently when Libby's new cochlear implant was turned on. Libby. Lib. Libby girl. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear Mama? Can you hear Mama? Hi, Libby. I love you. <laughs> There's that smile. There's that smile. Wow, Libby. Boy, she's just captivated by that sound. Um, Mom is over the moon. I mean, can you imagine getting to tell your baby I love you and know she can hear it for the first time? <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> Your little smile says it all. I don't know how I'm supposed to go forward, but okay, here we go. This is a funny one. Here's a British dad who really went all in on a lockdown prank for his daughters. He turned their entire home into a giant ball pit. Yeah, he got a truckload. Wow. A truckload of those plastic balls, those little plastic balls. Hauled and dumped them in every room. 250,000. <laughs> Well, I think you saw girls walked in magic. <laughs> Prize to mom too, but she quickly joined in the fun. I mean, wow. I'm, I'm kind of just blown away by the whole yeah. thing. It's incredible. That's next level. But can you imagine picking up 250,000 balls? I was just thinking the same thing. The other end. Like that yeah. clean up, that's, that's going to be a yeah. nightmare. Not so much fun. Yeah. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. A report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really... There have been report much out of this anymore. President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this... I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Time to launch our countdown to summer because Memorial Day weekend is just a couple of days away. Of course, things will look and feel different this year. So when you're making your plans, you're probably wondering what is safe, what isn't. Well, we got our team of experts standing by to help you navigate the new normal. We're going to start with our medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres, we've got a question for you. This is from Becky on our Facebook page. Take a listen. If the virus is presumed to be transferred through the eyes, nose, and mouth, how safe is it to be in a pool or at the beach for me and my granddaughters? Big question. 
And Hoda, you're more likely to catch coronavirus from all the other people at the pool than you are from the water. It's a respiratory virus, doesn't live well in the water, so don't worry too much about that. But you need to do the things that you need to do to stay safe from all the other people there, meaning if they're outside your circle of trust, social distancing will be important. On top of that, don't share towels, don't share water bottles, don't share sunscreens because if somebody had coronavirus, again, the water itself, the risk is very, very low. So at the lake, at the beach, in the pool, mm -hmm. go ahead and enjoy the water. If the virus used them, they could transmit it to you. But so when you're outside at the beach or the pool. If you, if you can't social distance, you should wear masks. Okay. Uh, so people want to go to a barbecue. And I think some people might go and wonder, like, A, is the food going to be okay? Is that something they should be worried about? Not too much from the food because the food itself, the virus doesn't live well in meat, doesn't live well in the vegetables, but the person that prepared it, if they're sick, then there is a risk of them transmitting it. So make sure whoever's preparing the food, number one, is not sick. They're wearing gloves or at least washing their hands. But on top of that, just follow basic food safety handling tips. That means keeping the meat separate from the vegetables. And when you rinse the vegetables and the salad, just rinse them with water. You don't need any special cleaning products or okay. soap because that could get you your stomach upset. Just regular rinsing. All right, and be careful of touching the ketchup bottle and the mustard bottle. All right, we're going to move on to Vicki Wynn, Thank our you. investigative and consumer correspondent. Vic, a lot of people have put money down on vacation. Those things down. Can you bring wipes and wipe them down? All right, Vicki, thank you. Last but definitely not least, let's bring in Stephanie Rule. She's NBC's senior business correspondent. All right, Steph, a lot of people are making plans to travel, and Sherry from New Jersey has a big question for you. If I decide to fly this summer and I get on the flight and I see that it's overcrowded or that people are not wearing masks, am I allowed to get off the flight and get a refund or get a free rebooking? Good question, Steph. All right, we are seeing airlines change their policies every day to get closer to this. You know now they're requiring masks, but at the same time, you've seen the viral photos, packed planes, people not wearing masks. Well, United has changed their policy. If you're expecting to get on a packed flight, they're now allowing you to rebook on a different flight or get a credit. And across the board, most airlines are enhancing their cancellation policies. Let's say your gym membership or a pool membership and your gym isn't operational or your pool isn't. Are you eligible for a reef to help people who've got trips planned? Speaking of, of refunds, Steph, if you it completely depends. Where we're seeing this the most is people who live in buildings that have these uh. amenities. And in Washington, D.C., for example, they're now trying to push a bill where landlords will have to force uh, that landlords will have to refund mm -hmm. part of the rent to those tenants. You paid up for that fancy building. And if you don't get to use the amenities, other suggestions to those landlords. Can you offer possibly free Internet or other amenities? Because these things are expensive. Yeah, they sure are. Steph, before I let you go, I have to let you know that you're a viral sensation. OK, <laughs> there is a video of you and your cute son. I don't know if you all have seen this, but just look at it for a second. <laughs> Stephanie may be the hardest working woman in television, and the hashtag Mama Gets It Done is so on point for you, Steph. <laughs> Your son is calm. I mean, that thing has like three million hits. Gaming names like MGM. It, it, you know what? He was sitting next to me. He was preparing to answer some questions. I him off his seat, so I just laid him down. <laughs> by the way, very calming. It's a beautiful sight, by the way, and a bunch of moms were on. Economics for uh, Nightly News Kids, and I didn't realize... The cat, uh, it was my time to go, and it was too late for me to just line, giving you two thumbs up. So thank you so much, Steph. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back with Harry Smith goes to, and this time Harry goes to an old school form of entertainment that suddenly become quite popular again. Yeah, with families all cooped up and hoping for a little bit of an escape. Drive-in movie theaters, they're seeing a resurgence, and Harry paid a visit to one over the weekend. Hey, Harry. Morning, kids. I got, I got to you know, think back in the ancient times four months ago when we were all worried about screen time, especially for our kids. Well, that all went away. Now there's a big screen that is just the thing. You got to see this. Friday night, Amenia, New York. The four brothers drive in. You could sense the collective sigh coming from each car. A night out. 
Yes, a night out. So when you said, we're going to the... Bob, uh, open up the bottle of champagne and <laughs> seriously, jumping up and down, jumping up and down. Well, up and down. Yeah, up and down. Yeah. We're, 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 very excited, we're crazy very about it. It's kind of like letting everybody back into a, a little bit of normal. We'd like to think the heyday of drive-in movies was decades ago. <laughs> but with built-in social distancing, drive-ins provide both a way back to the future and a great escape. Food you can pick up or get delivered. And frankly, what's better than a pizza party in the back of the wagon? Here's the number one thing. How's the pizza? Good. Meet the jewel. So we gave ourselves titles. <laughs> They're doing their best to manage the COVID close down. We do a lot with them throughout the day. They're out on their bikes, so it's not like that they're not getting out. And truth be told. More for Erica and I, this is what we probably needed more than they needed tonight. Built-in social distancing, getting out of the house, big screen entertainment. But we wondered, what about the restrooms? We recommend that you hold yeah. it in. <laughs> what did you say? We recommend that you hold it in. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps the real heroine of the night, Faviola Fernandez, a dozen years with the company, who tidies up after every visitor. You want me to funny place? The two brothers at four. So this is exploding all over the country as these drive-in movie theaters open up again, and all kinds of restaurants now are changing their parking lots so they can deliver out to the people in their parking lot and then they put a big screen up too. It's just really quite amazing. Carson, are you you a big drive-in guy? Have you ever done one of those? No, but I love it. You know, I, I said it the other day. I think I said to Siri, I'm like, I, I hope that there's a resurgence in drive-in theaters. In the, in the 1950s, there was over 4,000 drive-in theaters in the country. Now there's just a little over 300. If they're still up, this would be a great thing to sort of dust off and bring back. I would kill to take my kids to see Trolls uh, in a drive-in theater tonight. And by the way, they're especially, they're especially popular in places like Ohio and Pennsylvania. They're spread out in different parts of the country. I've talked to some of the people who run these things since they've been opening up again. Many of them have been sold out every night. Wow. Harry Smith. And, oh, wait, wait, wait. One more thing. Carson was unbelievable last night. Yes. Carson, that show uh, was so good. Agreed. Kelly Clarkson, the Stop old car, car, archive stuff. Oh, my gosh, like this. Awesome. You crushed it. You were crushed it. I am oh, now you. your official fanboy. <laughs> no way. That's you, you, Harry, you are, the, you are the Yoda to my Skywalker, and you know it. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> Take care, guys. The love is real with these two. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final. The lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary smugglers using your Uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus. The enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until. The nightly news with Lester Holt. Body testing sites are popping up. And Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays. Situations. 10,000 forced to flee. To go through this in the midst of a global pandemic is almost unthinkable. One town warned it could soon be under nine feet of water. We'll have the very latest. <laughs>
And one since I think 2017. Apparently, Gwen planted a big one on Blake after he won, so it was a big celebration. We're going to get to all of that coming up in just a bit. But we will begin, though, with that breaking news a really dangerous situation unfolding in Michigan. Major flooding and dam failures leading to the overnight evacuation of thousands of residents. NBC's Tom Costello joins us now with the very latest. Hey, Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Two dams have failed, a flash flood emergency across much of the state. In fact, they're talking about some areas under nine feet of water today. Schools open now for evacuees, and we can tell you dozens of roads across the state are closed. This is serious, and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. Governor Gretchen Whitmer overnight declaring a state of emergency after heavy rainfall ruptured two dams Tuesday in central Michigan, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Rising waters forcing the evacuation of nearly 10,000 people. Today, the Edenville and Sanford dams in Midland County breached. If you have a relative or a friend somewhere else in the state that you can go and stay with, please go to their homes. If you don't, go to one of the many shelters that have been set up. The evacuations following days of heavy rains in parts of the Midwest but also brought flooding to parts of Illinois, Ohio, and other states. We're going to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis and we're going to help people get out. Yeah, real dangerous situation with rising waters. There is good news. They're going to get a bit of a reprieve today because the uh, forecast is for sunny and about 70 degrees today and tomorrow. But then after that, more rain may be coming. Savannah, back to you. Uh, to be going through all of that in the middle of this other crisis with the yeah. coronavirus. Tom, thank you very much on that breaking news. And let's turn now to the latest on the virus. All 50 states have now partially reopened, but this morning health officials remain vigilant, out looking out for new cases. President Trump, meanwhile, is on defense over the controversial drug he says he is taking as a precaution against the virus. NBC's White House correspondent Kristen Walker joins us now. Kristen, good morning. Hi, Savannah. Good morning to you. This morning, the president is increasingly defiant about his stated use of the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine. It sparked a backlash and also a bitter back and forth between the president and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, raising the question, can Washington work together in this next phase of the crisis? This morning, the tensions are escalating between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president's use of hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. The president firing back at Pelosi after she criticized his decision to take the anti-malaria drug to protect against coronavirus with no evidence. I'd rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially yet that it prevents COVID-19 in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Mr. Trump is increasingly on defense about his decision to take the drug, claiming it has been used by workers on the front lines of the pandemic. Many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. But the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing those workers are taking the drug. Okay. Former President Joe Biden slamming the president overnight, comparing this to the moment Mr. Trump questioned whether disinfectants could be a treatment, a statement the president later called sarcastic. It's like saying maybe if you injected Clorox into your blood, you know, it may cure you. Come on, man. What is he doing? What in God's name is he doing? The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which uses data from patients at veterans medical centers, found more deaths among those treated with hydroxychloroquine fit to its use. The president taking aim. If you look at the one survey, the only bad survey, they were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old almost dead. It was a, a Trump enemy. ...than those treated with standard care. Researchers also reported finding... Statement. 
Now, as for the president's claim that thousands of frontline workers are taking hydroxychloroquine preventatively, while the nation's largest medical association says it's unaware of data supporting that, overnight the White House pointed to about 12 known trials that are underway to study whether the drug can be effective in preventing the spread in frontline workers. It's worth noting those trials are in their preliminary stages. Meanwhile, Vice President Pence says he is not taking the drug even after his press secretary tested positive for the virus. Pence told Fox News his physician hasn't recommended it, but he wouldn't hesitate to take it if his doctor did. You Also this morning, we do have new information on that mysterious illness in children linked to the coronavirus. All right, Kristen Welker for us at the White House. Chris, with cases on the rise, the CDC held a worldwide call with doctors to address the dangers and what seems to be helping some patients recover. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren is following that story for us. Hey, Kristen, good morning. Good morning, Hoda. Yeah, a couple of big takeaways from that call. Doctors say that kids showing symptoms of this inflammatory syndrome need to seek help right away and they likely need to be hospitalized. That's so important, though, because they are seeing success with treating this if it's caught in time. The CDC call outlined what they've learned about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and 10 countries around the world. According to the briefing, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID-19. Many of those children never showing any symptoms caused directly by the virus. But weeks later, a majority of cases are presenting with a fever and gastrointestinal symptoms, believed to be caused by an abnormal immune response to the virus. 15-year-old Dariana Dyson developed stomach pain and a rash around Mother's Day. She tested positive for COVID antibodies. A few days later, she was dead. Now one of four children to die here in the U.S. People need to really understand that this kills people. In New York City alone, there are now 147 suspected cases. I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. But this morning, there is also hope. The CDC says hospitals are having success with some treatments, including immunotherapy and steroids used to calm an overactive immune response. It's what doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Nick into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. How dramatic was Juliet's turnaround? She came in, in you know, really near death. Um, within a matter of days, um, we we're able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own, get her out of the hospital within 10 days. Her family now hoping Juliet's story can help pave the way for others. So most children do go home. Which children might be at risk for this? That's why they say it is so important for all doctors and parents to know what to look out for. Back to you. All right, Kristen, thank you. And now to a bomb after a short time in the hospital. What they still don't know. I'm Shell announcement from Johnson & Johnson. After facing thousands of lawsuits questioning its safety, the company now says it will stop selling its talc-based baby powder in North America. NBC's Morgan Radford has more on that. Hi, Morgan. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. That's right. Johnson & Johnson's baby powder has been used by generations of people, but in recent years, they've come under attack, the target of several lawsuits by customers who believe it gave them cancer. Overnight, Johnson & Johnson announcing a major change to one of its iconic products. Pure Johnson's baby powder from Johnson & Johnson. It's a feeling you never outgrow. The pharmaceutical giant saying it will no longer use talc in its baby powder products sold in the U.S. and Canada. In a statement, the company blaming declining sales, fueled by misinformation around the safety of the product and a constant barrage of litigation advertising. According to the American Cancer Society, talc, a mineral known for its softness, can contain asbestos, a substance known to cause cancer. While Johnson & Johnson has long touted the safety of its talc-based products, the company has faced thousands of lawsuits from customers linking them to cancer. Among them, 63-year-old Dean Berg, the first to take on Johnson & Johnson in trial, alleging its talc-based baby powders led her to stage 3 ovarian cancer. I am 100% certain that it caused my cancer. 
In 2013, a federal jury in South Dakota sided with Berg and found Johnson & Johnson negligent but did not award her any damages. In 2018, Reuters published a report companies raw talc and finished powders sometimes tested positive for small amounts of asbestos. Information Johnson & Johnson reportedly failed to disclose to the public. The company denied, saying that from at least 1971 to the early 2000s, the report's allegations, but months later revealed it was at the center of several federal investigations over whether its talcum powders were linked to cancer-causing asbestos. In October, the company voluntarily recalled 33,000 bottles of baby powder in the U.S. after the FDA found traces out in a statement that all verdicts against the company that have been through the appeals process have been overturned, adding that science is on their side, vowing to vigorously defend the safety of their product and the unfounded allegations against it as it starts to wind down production. This is what I wanted from the very beginning. No further people are going to to be exposed to this. So while that talc-based baby powder will be discontinued here in North America, it will continue to be sold in other parts of the world. Savannah? All right, Morgan, thank you. This morning, former Today Show anchor Matt Lauer is speaking out about what he calls flawed reporting by Ronan Farrow. Lauer presenting his own fact check on Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, as the best-selling author and former NBC News reporter comes under new scrutiny in a New York Times report this week. Here's NBC's Stephanie Gosk. Ronan Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, has sold millions. Now, seven months after its release, one of his targets, former Today Show host Matt Lauer, is firing back, launching an attack on Farrow's reporting in an op-ed published on the website Mediaite. Among Lauer's accusations, Farrow abandoned common sense and true fact-checking in favor of salacious and deeply flawed material. He also says Farrow failed to confirm stories and used misleading language to manipulate readers. Catch and Kill accuses NBC News and NBC Universal of ignoring sexual harassment allegations against prominent men in the company, including Lauer, for years, and of deliberately burying Farrow's story on Harvey Weinstein to protect Lauer. NBC Universal has repeatedly denied both allegations. In Catch and Kill, Brooke Nevels, the woman whose allegations led to Lauer's firing, publicly accused him of raping her at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Lauer, who says the two had a consensual affair, again vigorously denied the rape allegation. He says Nevels didn't ever use the words assault or rape when she brought her claim to NBC in 2017. Lauer says Farrow took his accusers at their word and says he tracked down four people the author never interviewed. Their accounts, according to Lauer, cast doubt on some of the book's claims. In the book, Farrow writes that Nevels informed her former boss at Peacock Productions about Lauer. But Lauer says that supervisor was never contacted by Farrow. And another woman who ran the company at the time told Lauer, Nevels in no way conveyed the seriousness of what she now claims, the operators around the Lauer allegations described in the book, and more than a dozen around Brooke Nevels specifically. It was never a mention of assault or rape. In a statement to NBC News, Farrow writes, we called her response, an acronym for how abusers sometimes respond to accusations. Deny, attack, revert, nurse, victim, and offender. Lauer says he wanted to publish his article last fall after the book's release, but held it for personal reasons. The former morning show host says a recent article in the New York Times, critical of Ronan Farrow's reporting, prompted him to release it now. Among the criticisms in the Times article, that Farrow does not always follow the typical journalistic imperatives of corroboration and rigorous disclosure, or he suggests conspiracies that are tantalizing, but he cannot prove. In a statement to the Times, Farrow says he brings caution, rigor, and nuance to each of his stories. This morning, the publisher of Catch and Kill is standing by the book, writing in part, his commitment to the rights of victims and his impeccable attention to detail make us proud to be his publisher. NBC News has offered no comment on the Lauer piece. For Lauer's part, he says, the examples of shoddy journalism I've explored here are the tip of the iceberg. For today, Stephanie Gosk, New York. All right. It is now 717. We have a lot more to get to. A New Jersey couple was supposed to get married this past weekend, but they had to postpone it. So instead of a celebration of love, they turned it into a day of a show of support for their community. Take a look at this. The couple organized a campaign called With This Ring, You'll Be Fed. 
friends and family, all the people who would have been guests at their wedding, they showed up at the house. They donated, donate to the New Jersey Food Bank and all. They collected 600 pounds of food. And by the way, perishable items that the couple, the couple says they're going to reschedule that wedding and they're doing it mm. in October. So they turned kind of a crummy situation uh. into a pretty fantastic one, Savannah. You know what I say? That mm. is love. Yeah. Right. yeah. Loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Time for our first check of the weather. And for that, we go to our friend, Mr. Roker, looking like a sunny day in your neck of the woods. We can't hear him. <laughs> So it's as oh, basic no. But I as think we, it is sunny. We know that. We know it's a sunny <laughs> we day. we saw the map. <laughs> yes, we, we, yeah, we caught a quick glimpse of it. It's not as good as seeing Al. Yeah. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Come on, we're back, 7.30. What an impressive start to the season finale of The Voice. <clears throat> Current coaches, a few former ones, including Shakira and CeeLo, joining this year's contestants for a cover of the Pete Townsend hit, Let My Love Open the Door. Big night for Team Blake. Craig, I know you popped the popcorn. You're a fan of this show. We watched. We watched for a little bit. Our, our guy didn't win, but uh, it was another big win for Team Blake last night. Todd Tillman. Yeah. There he is. Uh, we're going to talk to Carson about all of that mm -hmm. last night. But again, it was quite the mm -hmm. feat to, to, to watch them pull that off from a technical standpoint. I know. I shouldn't say this, but they should get an Emmy for that. I really <laughs> think so. Uh, it's incredible, the technical feat. Let's uh, get started, guys. It's 730. Here are the headlines. U.S. birth rates fell again last year. The latest numbers were released just this morning by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There were just over 3.7 million births in 2019. That is the lowest number recorded in 35 years. The report reveals that teen mothers are having fewer babies. And the birth rate for women in their early 40s has gone up. And we got some big news for horse racing fans. The Belmont Stakes will serve as the first leg of the Triple Crown this year. Normally, it's the final leg. That event scheduled for June 20th. But Belmont will look a little different this year. The race will be three-eighths of a mile shorter than usual. The Kentucky Derby and the Preakness have been rescheduled for September and October. And, of course, all of this is because of the coronavirus. And now to the potential impact of the virus on Memorial Day plans. The weekend coming up, it's the unofficial start of summer, just days away now. And while beaches are traditionally packed with families, this year many states are taking precautions to ensure that doesn't happen. NBC's Sam Brock joins us from Florida's Delray Beach this morning. Hi, Sam. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. The Memorial Day weekend holiday obviously presents a very big test. Here in Florida, we've already seen beaches open and then close almost immediately because people were not practicing social distancing. Here at Delray Beach, some tight restrictions, no sunbathing on the sand here. Some tough new rules that we're seeing play out right now across the country. It's one of the surest signs of summer. This is freedom. I haven't had such a full, happy heart this whole time. Fresh sand under your feet and the ocean breeze in your hair. I just needed for my mental health to sit out here and look at the ocean and just 
kind of breathe. This Memorial Day holiday, many beachgoers seeking a break from coronavirus lockdowns. I don't feel like you're going to be as exposed to the corona as much as you would be in a confined space like a grocery store. But with officials keeping a keen eye on social distancing, on Florida's Delray Beach, swimming, walking and jogging are allowed, sunbathing and surfing are not. How do you stop people from flooding from South Florida into your neck of the woods? Well, I think that it's going to be less attractive to come to a beach when there are other beaches um, that allow all activities. We're looking at hopefully keeping the numbers and the crowds down uh, initially. Crowds already gathering elsewhere in the country. On the popular Jersey Shore, anticipation for the holiday palpable. We need this fresh air. We need to have a beach. We need to have a life. On New York's Coney Island, barricades along the boardwalk, though people can still jog and walk on the sand for now. New York's governor just announcing state beaches will open for the holiday with restrictions. Only 50% capacity, no active sports, picnic areas and playgrounds closed. It feels good, you know, it just feels like, it's like a relief. In Southern California, families finding solace in the newly opened Golden Coast. But this is what Manhattan and Newport beaches looked like before the holiday, stoking fears of more COVID-19 spread. Different counties reopening with different restrictions, from bans on chairs and canopies in LA to no building sandcastles in Orange County. Recognition some summer traditions will be broken. Any and all restrictions right now that um, prevent people from getting sick and spreading the, the disease are necessary. This year, celebrating the holiday with sunscreen and a dose of social distancing. And Sam, what about masks? I mean, are some beaches requiring masks be worn as well? Yes, yeah, Savannah, it varies a lot. On this beach here in Delray Beach, masks are strongly recommended but not required. That is not the case in places like Los Angeles where it's a must. The county posting on its Instagram page, Beachbound, BYOM, bring your own mask. Also the case in places like Cape Cod, Massachusetts as well. Guys, back to you. All right, Sam, thank you so much. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to... Well, we're back, 7.39 on this Wednesday morning with a search for solutions. Researchers in South Korea say they have found people who tested positive for coronavirus a second time after recovering were not infectious and have antibodies. They also found that people have antibodies after recovery. Yeah, those findings are boosting confidence that some people have some level of immunity and they are not likely to spread the disease. Of course, we've heard tons about this antibody testing and its importance for the reopening of America. But a lot of questions do remain. So we had NBC's investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn take a closer look. Vicki, what'd you find? Good morning, Hoda and Craig. Between antibody testing, diagnostic tests, and now new antigen tests, a lot of folks could be having coronavirus testing confusion. So this morning, we are taking a closer look at each of these tests and which one you may need to take. We had a team of NBC producers literally put their blood and sweat into finding out. This morning, Reuters reporting new plans for a nationwide study of more than 300,000 Americans to try and track the spread of the coronavirus. The CDC will test samples from blood donors in 25 cities looking for antibodies, which are created by the immune system after it fights off the virus. About to take the antibody testing. We first gave you an inside look at what it's like to take an antibody test last month. There's a huge line outside. Three NBC News producers, David, Michelle, and Lauren, all had different symptoms of COVID-19 over the last three months. Cough, fever, body aches, even nausea and loss of smell. But they never got a diagnostic test. If it's positive, it could mean I had the coronavirus back in March. So they volunteered to take an antibody test after they recovered. The results, Michelle and Lauren, positive. David, negative. But with more than 150 of these tests now on the market, many not authorized by the FDA, 
Health officials have sounded the alarm on their accuracy. So our producers volunteered to roll up their sleeves again to see how the tests compare. Let's see what Quest Laboratories find. Blood. They offer direct-to-consumer antibody testing. Simply sign up online and make an appointment with the lab. You just sign up on your own. You don't even need to go see a doctor. So then they used you. telemedicine. Um, so I had heard today that you guys were now going to be doing antibody tests. This time, the producers had a five-minute video visit with a doctor online who ordered the test through LabCorp. Last, they went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Let's head on in. Which developed its own test, available for healthcare workers, first responders, and people, like our producers, interested in donating their plasma for research. So we'll see if these test results are similar to the other ones. All of the tests involved a blood draw, and the results back in about 24 hours. For all four tests, the results were consistent. Lauren and Michelle, positive. David, negative. What do you take away from that? The fact that our producers took four different antibody tests and got the same results each and every time. Yeah, that's great. I think that hopefully over time we'll see which of these tests perform the best. There are a few that are FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations to be able to be used and those tend to be more reliable, up to 100% reliability. Before taking any antibody test, check the FDA's website to see which ones are authorized and make sure you ask the lab or doctor which one they use before you go. Is there anything someone should do differently if they know that they developed the antibody for this virus? We're really recommending that people proceed with caution, continue all the recommended things that everybody needs to do right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your surfaces. It's ideal to take an antibody test three to four weeks after feeling symptoms. While you're sick is a different test, now becoming more widely available. It's diagnostic. You take that test before or during symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo taking a diagnostic test on live TV. This one involves a very large swab that takes a sample from deep in the back of the throat. That's it. Some newer versions use saliva samples. The reliability of the diagnostic test depends on which test you're getting. The FDA says molecular or PCR tests are the most reliable and can take up to a week for results. Also, a new type of diagnostic test called an antigen test can diagnose COVID-19 in less than an hour. The FDA approved it for emergency use, but also warns it may not be accurate every time. It still can have false negatives, which means that they tell you you're negative when in fact you actually have the disease. And that's one of the concerning things. Because you could be spreading it to others unknowingly. Exactly. Remember, diagnostic tests are important to know whether you are infected right away so that you can isolate yourself and prevent spreading that virus. Antibody tests tell you whether you may be immune from being reinfected, but that has not been proven definitively yet. And by the way, the cost for these antibody tests can be all over the place, some ranging from a dollar out of pocket all the way up to $300 wow. for a test. These antibody tests, I'm sure they give people peace of mind. It's good to know that they are consistent, like in your report. Yes. But m I guess more importantly, too, businesses need this info when they talk about reopening. These antibody tests and the results are such an important piece of the puzzle, according to pu public health officials, knowing who has been infected and who has has antibodies will show what areas are lower risk of community spread. And if the data continues to show some sort of immunity when you have the antibodies, then it can also help us decide who can get back out into the community at a lower risk. All of this crucial information for officials as yeah. they decide who goes back to work and how do we reopen. But even if you do have those antibodies, like she said, you got to wear the mask, yep. you got to do all the same things. You want to still be careful yeah. at this point. Make sure the test is FDA approved. Mm -hmm. That's my yes. takeaway. What, yeah. about these places, uh, where, what about these places where the tests are being conducted? Are they all the same? They sort of run the gamut. Our producers told us some were really observing the social distancing guidelines, sanitizing one patient in, one patient out. Others were a little less Mm -hmm. uh, we're a little more lax on those regulations, so definitely bring your hand sanitizer, wear your mask. Thank you, Will. We'll see you next hour, by the way. Okay. How about we switch gears here at 746 now? Mr. Roker standing by for a check of the forecast. How are we looking, buddy? Well, looking okay. And in fact, this cooler weather in the eastern half of the country has been good news for tornadoes in that we've had so many fewer. The typical May pattern that's favorable for tornadoes brings a jet stream up from the southwest, warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico. Well, what we've had this May has been a jet stream down to the south, allowing cold Arctic air in an unseasonably cool pattern this month. And that Gulf warming has, has really stalled. And you look at we some states that normally see a decent amount 
amount of tornadoes, nothing so far this month. We like that because as you look at the averages, anywhere from 11 in Iowa to 43 in Texas, May is the most typically active month for tornadoes. We're not seeing those. Sunshine in the northeast today, a fire risk in the southwest, severe storms developing in the western plains, and heavy rain continues in the Appalachians and the mid-Atlantic states. This is serious, and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. Governor Gretchen Whitmer overnight declaring a state of emergency after heavy rainfall ruptured two dams Tuesday in central Michigan, about 140 miles north of Detroit, rising waters forcing the evacuation of nearly 10,000 people. Today, the Edenville and Sanford dams in Midland County breached. If you have a relative or a friend somewhere else in the state that you can go and stay with, please go to their homes. If you don't, go to one of the many shelters that have been set up. The evacuations following days of heavy rains in parts of the Midwest that also brought flooding to parts of Illinois, Ohio, and other states. Katrina Conley evacuated with her family to a hotel in Bay City, Michigan. We quickly packed our two dogs a couple changes of clothes and ourselves. We had to do what we had to do as far as finding a place to stay. Otherwise, we would be sleeping in our vehicles. The devastating flooding complicated by the coronavirus. Evacuate the area. Authorities working to get residents out of harm's way, leaving many heading to emergency shelters to balance their safety with social distancing. We're still under the like stay home, stay safe order, but then um, it also feels like get out, stay safe. So it's like this weird, um, really weird uh, conflict. So do the coronavirus rules still apply or like what? what's the right way to be responding? This morning, families living along two lakes and a river forced to flee from one of the worst flood disasters currently hitting mid-Michigan. We're going to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis and we're going to help people get out. This morning, the tensions are escalating between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president's use of hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. The president firing back at Pelosi after she criticized his decision to take the anti-malaria drug to protect against coronavirus, with no evidence yet that it prevents COVID-19. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Mr. Trump is increasingly on defense about his decision to take the drug, claiming it has been used by workers on the front lines of the pandemic. Many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. But the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing those workers are taking the drug. Okay. Former President Joe Biden, Biden slamming the president overnight, president. comparing this to the moment Mr. Trump questioned whether disinfectants could be a treatment, a statement the president later called sarcastic. It's like saying maybe if you injected Clorox into your blood, you know, it may cure you. Come on, man. What is he doing? What in God's name is he doing? The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which uses data from patients at veterans medical centers, found more deaths among those treated with hydroxychloroquine than those treated with standard care. Researchers also reported finding no benefit to its use. The president taking aim. If you look at the one survey, the only bad survey, they were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a, a Trump enemy statement. The CDC call outlined what they've learned about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and 10 countries around the world. According to the briefing, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID-19. Many of those children never showing any symptoms caused directly by the virus. 
But weeks later, a majority of cases are presenting with a fever and gastrointestinal symptoms, believed to be caused by an abnormal immune response to the virus. 15-year-old Dariana Dyson developed stomach pain and a rash around Mother's Day. She tested positive for COVID antibodies. A few days later, she was dead. Now one of four children to die here in the U.S. People need to really understand that this kills people. In New York City alone, there are now 147 suspected cases. I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. But this morning, there is also hope. The CDC says hospitals are having success with some treatments, including immunotherapy and steroids used to calm an overactive immune response. It's what doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. How dramatic was Juliet's turnaround? She came in, in you know, really near death. Um, within a matter of days, um, we were able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own, get her out of the hospital within 10 days. Her family now hoping Juliet's story can help pave the way for others. Overnight, Johnson & Johnson announcing a major change to one of its iconic products. Pure Johnson's baby powder from Johnson & Johnson. It's a feeling you never outgrow. The pharmaceutical giant saying it will no longer use talc in its baby powder products sold in the U.S. and Canada. In a statement, the company blaming declining sales, fueled by misinformation around the safety of the product and a constant barrage of litigation advertising. According to the American Cancer Society, talc, a mineral known for its softness, can contain asbestos, a substance known to cause cancer. While Johnson & Johnson has long touted the safety of its talc-based products, the company has faced thousands of lawsuits from customers linking them to cancer. Among them, 63-year-old Dean Berg, the first to take on Johnson & Johnson in trial, alleging its talc-based baby powders led her to stage 3 ovarian cancer. I am 100% certain that it caused my cancer. In 2013, a federal jury in South Dakota sided with Berg and found Johnson & Johnson negligent but did not award her any damages. In 2018, Reuters published a report saying that from at least 1971 to the early 2000s, the company's raw talc and finished powders sometimes tested positive for small amounts of asbestos. Information Johnson & Johnson reportedly failed to disclose to the public. The company denied the report's allegations, but months later revealed it was at the center of several federal investigations over whether its talcum powders were linked to cancer-causing asbestos. In October, the company voluntarily recalled 33,000 bottles of baby powder in the U.S. after the FDA found trace amount of asbestos in samples from a bottle purchased online. Johnson & Johnson points out in a statement that all verdicts against the company that have been through the appeals process have been overturned, adding that science is on their side, vowing to vigorously defend the safety of their product and the unfounded allegations against it as it starts to wind down production. This is what I wanted from the very beginning. No further people are going to be exposed to this. Ronan Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, has sold millions. Now, seven months after its release, one of his targets, former Today Show host Matt Lauer, is firing back, launching an attack on Farrow's reporting in an op-ed published on the website Mediaite. Among Lauer's accusations, Farrow abandoned common sense and true fact-checking in favor of salacious and deeply flawed material. He also says Farrow failed to confirm stories and used misleading language to manipulate readers. Catch and Kill accuses NBC News and NBC Universal of ignoring sexual harassment allegations against prominent men in the company, including Lauer, for years, and of deliberately burying Farrow's story on Harvey Weinstein to protect Lauer. NBC Universal has repeatedly denied both allegations. In Catch and Kill, Brooke Nevels, the woman whose allegations led to Lauer's firing, publicly accused him of raping her at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Lauer, who says the two had a consensual affair, again vigorously denied the rape allegation. He says Nevels didn't ever use the words assault or rape when she brought her claim to NBC in 2017.
Lauer says Farrow took his accusers at their word and says he tracked down four people the author never interviewed. Their accounts, according to Lauer, cast doubt on some of the book's claims. In the book, Farrow writes that Nevels informed her former boss at Peacock Productions about Lauer. But Lauer says that supervisor was never contacted by Farrow. And another woman who ran the company at the time told Lauer, Nevels in no way conveyed the seriousness of what she now claims. There was never a mention of assault or rape. In a statement to NBC News, Farrow writes, We called dozens of corroborators around the Lauer allegations described in the book, and more than a dozen around Brooke Nevels specifically. Nevels tweeting her response, an acronym for how abusers sometimes respond to accusations. Deny, attack, reverse, victim and offender. Lauer says he wanted to publish his article last fall after the book's release, but held it for personal reasons. The former morning show host says a recent article in the New York Times, critical of Ronan Farrow's reporting, prompted him to release it now. Among the criticisms in the Times article, that Farrow does not always follow the typical journalistic imperatives of corroboration and rigorous disclosure, or he suggests conspiracies that are tantalizing, but he cannot prove. In a statement to the Times, Farrow says he brings caution, rigor, and nuance to each of his stories. This morning, the publisher of Catch and Kill is standing by the book, writing in part, his commitment to the rights of victims and his impeccable attention to detail make us proud to be his publisher. NBC News has offered no comment on the Lauer piece. For Lauer's part, he says, the examples of shoddy journalism I've explored here are the tip of the iceberg. For today, Stephanie Gosk, New York. It's one of the surest signs of summer. This is freedom. I haven't had such a full, happy heart this whole time. Fresh sand under your feet and the ocean breeze in your hair. I just needed for my mental health to sit out here and look at the ocean and just kind of breathe. This Memorial Day holiday, many beachgoers seeking a break from coronavirus lockdowns. I don't feel like you're going to be as exposed to the corona as much as you would be in a confined space like a grocery store. But with officials keeping a keen eye on social distancing, on Florida's Delray Beach, swimming, walking, and jogging are allowed, sunbathing and surfing are not. How do you stop people from flooding from South Florida into your neck of the woods? Well, I think that it's going to be less attractive to come to a beach when there are other beaches um, that allow all activities. We're looking at hopefully keeping the numbers and the crowds down uh, initially. Crowds already gathering elsewhere in the country. On the popular Jersey Shore, anticipation for the holiday palpable. We need this fresh air. We need to have a beach. We need to have a life. On New York's Coney Island, barricades along the boardwalk, though people can still jog and walk on the sand for now. New York's governor just announcing state beaches will open for the holiday with restrictions. Only 50% capacity, no active sports, picnic areas and playgrounds closed. It feels good, you know, it it feels like, like a relief. In Southern California, families finding solace in the newly opened Golden Coast. But this is what Manhattan and Newport beaches looked like before the holiday, stoking fears of more COVID-19 spread. Different counties reopening with different restrictions, from bans on chairs and canopies in LA to no building sandcastles in Orange County. Recognition some summer traditions will be broken. Any and all restrictions right now that Um, prevent people from getting sick and spreading the the disease are necessary. This year, celebrating the holiday with sunscreen and a dose of social distancing. It is now time to launch our countdown to summer because Memorial Day weekend is just a couple of days away. Of course, things will look and feel different this year. So when you're making your plans, you're probably wondering what is safe, what isn't. Well, we got our team of experts standing by to help you navigate the new normal. We're going to start with our medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres, we've got a question for you. This is from Becky on our Facebook page. Take a listen. If the virus is presumed to be transferred through the eyes, nose, and mouth, How safe is it to be in a pool or at the beach for me and my granddaughters? Big question. 
And Hoda, you're more likely to catch coronavirus from all the other people at the pool than you are from the water. It's a respiratory virus, doesn't live well in the water, so don't worry too much about that. But you need to do the things that you need to do to stay safe from all the other people there, meaning if they're outside your circle of trust, social distancing will be important. On top of that, don't share towels, don't share water bottles, don't share sunscreens, because if somebody had coronavirus and used them, they could transmit it to you. But again, the water itself, the risk is very, very low. So at the lake, at the beach, in the pool, Mm -hmm. go ahead and enjoy the water. Masks, you say yes or no when you're outside at the beach or the pool? If you... If you can't social distance, you should wear masks. Okay. Uh, So people want to go to a barbecue. And I think some people might go and wonder, like, A, is the food going to be okay? Is that something they should be worried about? Not too much from the food because the food itself, the virus doesn't live well in meat, doesn't live well in the vegetables, but the person that prepared it, if they're sick, then there is a risk of them transmitting it. So make sure whoever's preparing the food, number one, is not sick. They're wearing a mask, they're wearing gloves, or at least washing their hands. But on top of that, just follow basic food safety handling tips. That means keeping the meat separate from the vegetables. And when you rinse the vegetables and the salad, just rinse them with water. You don't need any special cleaning products or soap because that could get you your stomach upset. Just regular rinsing. All right, and be careful of touching the ketchup bottle and the mustard bottle. All right, we're going to move on to Vicki Wynn, Thank our you. investigative and consumer correspondent. Vic, a lot of people have put money down on vacation rentals, okay? And maybe maybe they've heard, well, it's okay to come, but if you want to cancel, is that is that cool? Can you do that? This is the thing. You can always cancel, but the big question is how much is it going to cost you? Do you have to forfeit your security deposit? Did you pay in advance? But think about it. Take a step back. What's making you nervous? Are you worried about the cleaning? Just reach out to the leasing company. Ask them to email you in writing what are their cleaning protocols. Maybe once you get that information about how they're disinfecting, you'll feel calmer and safer. Airbnb is actually instituting a policy where it's asking some hosts to wait 72 hours before uh, between guests, which helps to limit uh, the spread of the infection. And if you want if you want extra cleaning, you can ask for that. You can always ask for it. It's really going to be up to the owner whether or not they do it. But when you talk about the big home share companies like Verbo and Airbnb, they've already announced they're going to enhance their cleaning policies. Okay. We're planning to get out at some point this summer. We're going to bring our own wipes, wipe down those high-touch surfaces, the remote controls, the light switches, the doorknobs. That'll give you some peace of mind, too. Sometimes there's stuff to rent, like a kayak or a jet ski. Would you say yes or no to that? Yeah, this is a great time. I mean, Memorial Day weekend is sort of the unofficial kickoff to the boating season. So the things you need to consider here, practice social distancing. This is not a time to get on a small boat with people right. you haven't been isolated with. So I hope you're not sick of your family because you're going to be <laughs> stuck with them for the rest of the summer. But if you have got a yacht and you can, you know, do yeah. a six foot, then you do you. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I want you to consider is the rental shack. Keep your mask on when you're in those small enclosed areas and ask what the company is doing between users of the paddle boards, the kayaks, the handles. Are they wiping those things down? Can you bring wipes and wipe them down? All right, Vicki, thank you. Last but definitely not least, let's bring in Stephanie Rule. She's NBC's senior business correspondent. All right, Steph, a lot of people are making plans to travel and Sherry from New Jersey has a big question for you. If I decide to fly this summer and I get on the flight and I see that it's overcrowded or that people are not wearing masks, am I allowed to get off the flight and get a refund or get a free rebooking? Good question, Steph. All right. We are seeing airlines change their policies every day to get closer to this. You know now they're requiring masks. But at the same time, you've seen the viral photos, packed planes, people not wearing masks. Well, United has changed their policy. If you're expecting to get on a packed flight, they're now allowing you to rebook on a different flight or get a credit. And across the board, most airlines are enhancing their cancellation policies to help people who've got trips planned. Speaking of of refunds, Steph, if you've been paying, let's say, your gym membership or a pool membership, and your gym isn't operational or your pool isn't, are you eligible for a refund? It completely depends. Where we're seeing this the most is people who live in buildings that have these Uh. amenities. And in Washington, D.C., for example, they're now trying to push a bill where landlords will have to force, uh, that landlords will have to refund Mm -hmm. part of the rent to those tenants. You paid up for that fancy building, and if you don't get to use the amenities, other suggestions to those landlords. Can you offer possibly free internet or other amenities? Because these things are expensive. Yeah, they sure are. Steph, before I let you go, I have to let you know that you're a viral sensation, okay? (laughs) There is a video of you and your cute son. I don't know if you all have seen this, but just look at it for a second. (laughs) 
Stephanie may be the hardest working woman in television, and the hashtag Mama Gets It Done is so on point for you, Steph. <laughs> your, your son is calm. I mean, that thing has like three million hits. It, you know what? He was sitting next to me. He was preparing to answer some questions about economics for uh, Nightly News Kids. And I didn't realize the ca- uh, it was my time to go. And it was too late for me to just push him off his seat. So I just laid him down. By the way, very calming. It's a beautiful sight, by the way. And a bunch of moms were online giving you two thumbs up. So thank you so much, Steph. Thank you. This morning, Reuters reporting new plans for a nationwide study of more than 300,000 Americans to try and track the spread of the coronavirus. The CDC will test samples from blood donors in 25 cities looking for antibodies, which are created by the immune system after it fights off the virus. About to take the antibody testing. We first gave you an inside look at what it's like to take an antibody test last month. There's a huge line outside. Three NBC News producers, David, Michelle, and Lauren, all had different symptoms of COVID-19 over the last three months. Cough, fever, body aches, even nausea and loss of smell. But they never got a diagnostic test. If it's positive, it could mean I had the coronavirus back in March. So they volunteered to take an antibody test after they recovered. The results, Michelle and Lauren, positive. David, negative. But with more than 150 of these tests now on the market, many not authorized by the FDA, health officials have sounded the alarm on their accuracy. So our producers volunteered to roll up their sleeves again to see how the tests compare. Let's see what Quest Laboratories finds in my blood. They offer direct-to-consumer antibody testing. Simply sign up online and make an appointment with the lab. You just sign up on your own. You don't even need to go see a doctor. Then they used telemedicine. Um, So I had heard today that you guys were now going to be doing antibody tests. This time, the producers had a five-minute video visit with a doctor online who ordered the test through LabCorp. Last, they went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Let's head on in. Which developed its own test, available for healthcare workers, first responders, and people, like our producers, interested in donating their plasma for research. So we'll see if these test results are similar to the other ones. All of the tests involved a blood draw and the results back in about 24 hours. For all four tests, the results were consistent. Lauren and Michelle positive, David negative. What do you take away from that? The fact that our producers took four different antibody tests and got the same results each and every time. Yeah, that's great. I think that hopefully Over time, we'll see which of these tests perform the best. There are a few that are FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations to be able to be used, and those tend to be more reliable, up to 100% reliability. Before taking any antibody test, check the FDA's website to see which ones are authorized and make sure you ask the lab or doctor which one they use before you go. Is there anything someone should do differently if they know that they developed the antibody for this virus. We're really recommending that people proceed with caution, continue all the recommended things that everybody needs to do right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your surfaces. It's ideal to take an antibody test three to four weeks after feeling symptoms. While you're sick is a different test, now becoming more widely available. It's diagnostic. You take that test before or during symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo taking a diagnostic test on live TV. This one involves a very large swab that takes a sample from deep in the back of the throat. That's it. Some newer versions use saliva samples. The reliability of the diagnostic test depends on which test you're getting. The FDA says molecular or PCR tests are the most reliable and can take up to a week for results. Also, a new type of diagnostic test called an antigen test can diagnose COVID-19 in less than an hour. The FDA approved it for emergency use, but also warns it may not be accurate every time. It still can have false negatives, which means that they tell you you're negative when in fact you actually have the disease. And that's one of the concerning things. Because you could be spreading it to others unknowingly. Exactly. Remember, diagnostic tests are important to know whether you are infected right away so that you can isolate yourself and prevent spreading that virus. 
Antibody tests tell you whether you may be immune from being reinfected, but that has not been proven definitively yet. And by the way, the cost for these antibody tests can be all over the place, some ranging from a dollar out of pocket all the way up to $300 wow. for a test. These antibody tests, I'm sure they give people peace of mind. It's good to know that they are consistent, like in your report. Yes. But m I guess more importantly, too, businesses need this info when they talk about reopening. These antibody tests and the results are such an important piece of the puzzle, according to pu public health officials, knowing who has been infected and who has as antibodies will show what areas are lower risk of community spread. And if the data continues to show some sort of immunity when you have the antibodies, then it can also help us decide who can get back out into the community at a lower risk. All of this crucial information for officials as yeah. they decide who goes back to work and how do we reopen. But even if you do have those antibodies, like she said, you got to wear the mask, yep. you got to do all the same thing. You want to still be careful yeah. at this point. Make sure the test is FDA approved. Mm -hmm. That's my yes. takeaway. What about, these Authorized. Places, uh, what about these places where the tests are being conducted? Are they all the same? They sort of run the gamut. Our producers told us some were really observing the social distancing guidelines, sanitizing one patient in, one patient out. Others were a little less, mm -hmm. uh, were a little more lax mm -hmm. on those regulations. So definitely bring your hand sanitizer, wear your mask. You win. We'll see you next hour, by the way. This morning in South Korea, a whole new way of going to school. This long line you see here is because of temperature checks. Every student, every staff member is getting a temperature check and a squirt of hand sanitizer. High school seniors are the first group back in a slow, staged return to classrooms. Are you happy to be back? Yes. Inside, they've sprayed down rooms, spaced desks farther apart, installed plastic dividers in the cafeteria. The private school for foreigners in Seoul, opening for the youngest students, too. American Paul Rader is the athletics director. Are you comfortable bringing your kids back to school? Knowing how Korea has handled it, knowing how important um, and actually significant protocols like mask wearing and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, etc., makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. Schools were supposed to start reopening last week, but that was delayed after a coronavirus outbreak linked to nightclubs in Seoul. Nearly 200 cases now linked to that cluster, and clubgoers are now facing public backlash, accused of being irresponsible. A member of the K-pop band BTS publicly apologizing for going against government advice to stay home. Zainab missed crossing paths with the infected clubber by an hour. And the clubs, when you enter, they take the time that you went in, your name, your, uh, if you had an asthma, your temperature, everything they check. We're not showing her face because of public anger. She tested negative, but still had to self-quarantine. A crucial piece of South Korea's strategy, which we experienced firsthand after flying in from London. Our 15-day quarantine finally ended on Monday. We feel really confident now that we're leaving that we're virus-free. But this morning, a new battle for health officials after nurses at one of the country's biggest hospitals tested positive for COVID-19. This morning, we have a look at how one of the largest food and beverage companies in the country is dealing with this pandemic. Stephen Williams, the CEO of PepsiCo Foods uh, North America, joins us with an exclusive announcement. Uh, thank you for talking with us this morning. Good morning, Janelle. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Let's uh, jump right in. Tell us about this initiative Good. that PepsiCo is announcing today. PepsiCo and the PepsiCo Foundation have launched a new uh, $7 million initiative to provide immediate relief and long-term recovery for Black and Latino communities. Uh, this initiative builds on uh, the $50 million global commitment to provide vital support uh, for those impacted by COVID-19. We've talked a lot about how some of those in the, in the communities are taking a harder hit because of COVID. Why is it so important to you guys to donate directly to uh, Black and Latino communities? Well, well, first, I would say, you know, the focus is really about raising awareness and uh, to encourage other companies and public sector agencies to step up to meet uh, these needs for the duration of the pandemic. And as you know, you know, these communities of color have a higher percentage of COVID-19 infections and then the national population. And uh, we believe we have an obligation uh, to have an impact. We're in these communities 
every day these communities are our employees, these communities also are our consumers. Uh, Steve, in order to get uh, the money directly to folks who need it, you're working with the National Urban League and Unidos U.S. Why right. these organizations? Uh, both uh, the National Urban League and Unidos U.S. are long-term partners of PepsiCo um, and the PepsiCo Foundation. We've worked with Urban League for over 40 years, and we've worked with Unidos for more than 35 years. We believe these partners are best suited uh, as they sit in the communities to help uh, provide direct, uh, direct assistance. Uh, in, in these partnerships, this money will go to the 14 hardest hit communities across the nation, places like Baltimore, Chicago, Dallas, New Orleans, uh, Los Angeles, and, and New York. And we believe they're best suited to reach deeply uh, in the communities, and they have, a, they have a track record of doing so. Steve, let's talk about food prices if we can. Folks have been talking about it. We've been reporting on it, how grocery store prices are on the rise. Difficult for folks in these times. Has PepsiCo raised its prices on products? And why now, if you have? You know, the, uh, I'll tell you, we have seen and we've obviously read a ton about grocery prices rising. We are trying our best to keep grocery prices low in the categories that we do business in. You know, operating in this environment is, uh, is extremely uh, costly, but we're trying our best not to pass on uh, the brunt of uh, the work we're doing to keep our people safe. But, but have you raised your prices? Raises, uh, modestly, but not, not significantly. I think a lot of people were a little frustrated, so we thought, you know, you could answer that because I think they feel like the grocery business is doing so well uh, yeah. during this pandemic. So they were wondering why the, the prices were, were yeah. you know, passed on to them. What would you say? Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough environment to operate in. Our, the safety and health and well-being of our employees is job number one. It is our number one focus and will continue to be. And to do that in this environment, uh, including providing uh, uh, PPE, making sure that we're deep cleaning factories every uh, night, making sure that we keep our employees that make, move, and sell our products safe has, uh, is, is very expensive. And yes, uh, sales are, are brisk, but it is a very difficult operating environment. And so as we work hard, to keep our prices down, and that's our, our commitment. Before you leave us this morning, this is getting a lot of yeah. attention. Uh, last week, PepsiCo unveiled a pair of direct-to-consumer websites, essentially yeah. cutting out the grocery store completely. Is this temporary for the times, or is this no. perhaps a new way of doing business for you? No, and one, it's not to, uh, to, to cut the grocery store out completely. It really is about building direct relationships with consumers. It's also about making sure that uh, consumers can find our products always, everywhere. Uh, it's, it, and it's a capability building, reach into the marketplace, and it's not temporary. We plan to continue uh, to build capability in this area. Definitely getting a lot of buzz because it's all about access. Stephen Williams, thank you. We know it's a busy time, so thank you for, for talking with us this morning and about that new thank initiative. You. Thank you.
into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour lives lost and they are all in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, you look at the entire experience, you see we're stabilized basically with where we were before we had this dramatic increase. Uh, and one of the things we've learned through this is uh, smart wins. It's not about politics, it's not about emotion. You're dealing with a virus. The virus doesn't respond to politics. The virus doesn't have an ideology. The virus isn't red or blue. It is a virus that is attacking people. It's about science. It's about numbers. It's about data. Uh, and SMART wins the battle. If you follow that guidance and that theory, uh, we're always looking at and researching the numbers. Where are the cases coming from? How do we reduce the numbers? You look all across the country, it's lower income communities, uh, predominantly minority, where we're still seeing an increase in the numbers. Uh, we looked at that in New York City. We did a very extensive research project, and it is true. You can look at where the cases are coming, look at the testing data by geographic area, by zip code, and find out where the cases are coming from. We asked Northwell Health, which is the largest health system in the state, to do a, an extensive test for us. We're in the midst of that test, uh, but we have back about 8,000 tests, which is a very large sample. And uh, the data is very powerful and informs what we're doing going forward. The test was done in New York City because that's where we have the highest predominance of cases. Uh, but in lower income communities, communities of color, we partnered with the faith-based community, with churches to conduct tests we found about 27% of the individuals testing positive. 27%, that's compared to the New York City general population of about 19%, okay? The Bronx had the highest percentage, 34%, again, compared to a citywide average of 19%. Then Brooklyn, then Manhattan, then Queens. Staten Island was right at the New York City uh, overall number. Uh, but you take a place like the Bronx, it's 34% compared to 19%, just to give you an idea. And the data shows not just a high positive, 
not just that a high number of people had the positive, uh, but the spread is continuing in those communities, and that's where the new cases are coming from, okay? And you can literally do that on a zip code basis. The, for example, Morrisania in the Bronx, 43% of the people tested positive, 43%, compared to New York City general average of 19%. Hospitalization rate, 3.2 people for every 100,000, compared to 1.8. It is double the hospitalization rate, okay? So be smart. Let's use the numbers. Let's research. Where are people who are infected? Where are the new cases coming from? Where is the spread continuing? Low-income communities, communities of color. Uh, they tend to be high Latino, high African-American population. And we're seeing that pattern continue in zip codes, lower income, predominantly minority. Brownsville, Brooklyn, 41%, double the city average. That happens to be 80% African-American, but again, uh, just about double the rate of hospitalization. So that's where the cases are still coming from. That's where the virus is still spreading. Uh, but again, you look at the data, you see it uh, over and over again by zip code, by select communities within the city. Uh, my old neighborhood, Hollis, Queens, 35% compared to 19%. So it's all across the city, less than Staten Island, higher in communities of color and lower income communities. Uh, I want to thank the con congressional delegation who uh, helped organize this partnership between Northwell and the faith-based community. Getting 8,000 tests in a short period of time is not easily done. Uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries uh, came up with this idea about uh, 10 days ago, organized it quickly. I want to thank uh, Hakeem. I also want to thank Congresswoman Velasquez and Congresswoman Clark uh, for helping us getting, getting it organized. The faith-based community has been uh, great here. Reverend Brawley uh, and Reverend Rivera organized those churches for us. So we have the data, we have the research, uh, and now we have to take the next step, okay? We did the research, we have the data, we know what's happening. Now, what do we do about it? That's always step two. And we're going to develop targeted strategies to these highly impacted communities. What we're seeing in New York City is going to be true across the state. Uh, Northwell Health is going to double the number of churches that they're working in, 44 total churches. Uh, we're going to partner with Somos Community Care, uh, and I want to thank them very much for stepping up. They're going to open 28 additional testing sites in uh, these zip codes that fit this profile. We're going to focus on public housing. When you think about everything we're talking about, socially distanced, et cetera, and then think about public housing and how hard it is in public housing to do the things we're talking about. Uh, I worked in public housing all across this uh, country when I was the Housing and Urban Development Secretary during the Clinton administration. Socially distance. How do you socially distance in an elevator in a public housing complex? How do you socially distance in the hallways of a public housing complex? How do you socially distance in the lobby? How do you socially distance in a, a small playground that is attached to public housing? So uh, we understand the challenge and ready responders are going to uh, increase the testing in 40 public housing developments in New York City. So this is going to be a very extensive effort between Northwell and Somos. You'll have 72 faith-based sites. Uh, you'll then have ready responders in public housing. And we want to now take the next step, which is outreach programs, getting the PPE into the community, getting the hand sanitizer into the community, explaining social distancing, and why that's so important. 
and explain how this virus spreads. It's a public health education effort. Uh, and, you know, I've been all across the state. You drive through some of these communities and you can see that social distancing isn't happening, PPE is not being used, and hence the virus spreads. Uh, and again, we did the research in New York City because that's where we have the predominance of cases. But it is going to be true in every community across this state and across this nation. You tell me the zip codes that have the predominantly minority community, lower income community, I will tell you the communities where you're going to have a higher positive and you're going to have increased spread and you're going to have increased hospitalization. Uh, I'm asking all local governments to do the same thing that we did in New York City. Focus on low income communities, do the testing and do the outreach. Do the testing and do the outreach. That's where the cases are coming from. That's where the new hospitalizations are coming from. That's what's going into the hospital system. That's where you're going to see the highest number of deaths. So that is our challenge. Uh, on reopening, which we're doing across the state, we do it on the numbers, we do it on the metrics. Every New Yorker can go to the website and find out where their community is. Capital District will reopen today. We're working with uh, religious institutions. Right now they can have up to 10 people with strict social distancing guidelines uh, at religious gatherings. We've asked them to consider drive-in and parking lot services for uh, religious ceremonies, but we're gonna be working with uh, our Interfaith Advisory Council. Um, our Interfaith Advisory Council has representatives of the religious community across the state, all different religions. I understand their desire to get back to religious ceremonies as soon as possible. As a former altar boy, I get it. Uh, I think it, even at this time of stress and when people are so anxious and so confused, I think those religious ceremonies can be very comforting. But we need to find out how to do it and do it safely and do it smartly. The last thing we want to do is have a religious ceremony that winds up uh, having more people infected. Uh, religious ceremony, by definition, is a gathering, right? It's a large number of people coming together. We know from New Rochelle, Westchester, the first hot spot, that religious ceremonies can be very dangerous. So. We all want to do the same thing. The question is, how do we do it? And how do we do it smartly and efficiently? And I'll be talking with members of the religious community uh, in doing just that. And I'm sure that we can come up with a way that uh, does it, but does it intelligently. People ask all the time, well, now we're reopening. What's going to happen? What's going to happen is what we make happen. There is no predestined course here. There is nothing that is preordained. What is going to happen is a consequence of our choices and a consequence of our action. It's that simple. If people are smart and if people are responsible and if the employers who are opening those businesses do it responsibly, if employees are responsible, if individuals are responsible, then you will see the infection rates stay low. If people get arrogant, if people get cocky, if people get casual, if people become undisciplined, you will see that infection rate go up. It is that simple. This has always been about what we do. It's never been about what government mandated. Government cannot mandate behavior of people. And it certainly can't mandate behavior of 19 million people. It can give you the facts. It can give you the facts that lead to an inevitable conclusion. And New Yorkers have been great about following the facts. But we're at another pivot point. Yes, we're reopening. Yes, the numbers are down. Yes, we can increase activity and increase economic activity. What is the consequence of that? It depends on what we do. Uh, do your part, wear a mask. Now, 
wearing a mask, I have been trying to communicate in a whole different set of ways. Uh, Mariah is heading up a project that she'll report on in a moment that's helping to communicate this message. But uh, it seems like a simple thing, wearing a mask. And it's apparently so simple that people think it's of no consequence. It happens to be of tremendous consequence. It is amazing how effective that mask actually is. And don't take my word for it. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a public health expert. Again, look at the facts. What shocks me to this day, and I would have lost a lot of money on this bet, how do frontline workers have a lower infection rate than the general population? If I said to you, who's going to have a higher infection rate? Nurses in an emergency room, doctors in an emergency room, or the general population who has a higher infection rate, I think most people would have said the nurses in the emergency room, the doctors in the emergency room, the hospital staff, they're going to have a higher infection rate because they're dealing with COVID po positive people all day long. Not true. How do nurses and doctors have a lower infection rate than the general population? How do transit workers who are on the buses and subways all day long have a lower infection rate than the general population. How does the NYPD, police officers who show up, who are dealing with people all day long, how do they have a lower infection rate? How does the NYPD have almost half the infection rate of New York City? How can it be? They're the police officers. They're wearing the mask. The mask works. Those surgical masks work. And it's in the data. It's not that I'm saying it. It's in the data. And it is, otherwise, it's inexplicable. Just look at that list. Transit workers are lower. Healthcare workers are lower. The police department is lower. The fire department is lower, which also has the EMTs who show up first and help a person get into an ambulance. They have a lower infection rate. The docs workers are the correction officials who are correction officers who are in a prison. They're at 7%. State police, 3%. They wear the masks. Wear a mask. Remember all those pictures of people in China always wearing masks? Oh, I wonder why they wear all those masks. They were right. The masks work. They are protective and they work. Wear a mask. So on May 5th, we launched the contest to come up with video messages prepared by New Yorkers to try to communicate the message of wear a mask better than I was communicating the message of wear a mask because my daughters were quick to point out that maybe it was my communication skills which were preventing the effective communication of the wear the mask message. Caveat is my daughters often say it is my communication skills which are the problem uh, in the home, in society at large. So uh, Mariah volunteered to uh, run a competition where we asked New Yorkers to do a 30-second ad, and the winner of the competition would be the ad that the state runs. With that, I will turn it over to Mariah for her update and her report. Um, today, we're excited to be sharing the five ad finalists that our team has selected for the New York State Wear a Mask ad contest. And these ad finalists, which we will be showing shortly, are in the running for winning this contest and being shown as a public service announcement. 
starting today, people can go to wearamask.ny.gov to vote for their favorite ad, and voting will be open through Memorial Day. On May 26th, we'll be announcing the final winning ad, and we're so grateful to all the New Yorkers who have submitted um, one of the over 600 submissions, and we will be sharing honorable mentions as well so that you can see even more of the great videos. Great, 600 submissions, and these are the five finalists that people can view and vote on. Okay, let's see the five finalists. I wear a mask for my fellow New Yorkers. My mama, who's a healthcare worker. Nurses and doctors. For my father. For the marginalized communities who don't have access to adequate healthcare. For my children. My community. Essential workers. Transit workers. The immunocompromised. I wear a mask so we can get back to work. Go to school. Share a meal. See a movie. Hug my friends. Dance together. Go to the theater. See our families. Continue to show support. Take care of each other. Save lives. Stay strong. We've been stuck inside our homes while our everyday heroes have been working overtime for New York to reopen and stay open. We all need to do our part and show that we care. Look, man, I wear a mask to protect you. You wear a mask to protect me. Let's all wear a mask to stop the spread of coronavirus and save lives. When we show up in the mask, we're showing up for each other. Show your love for New York because New York loves you. textbook says politicians lead. No, sometimes the people lead and the politicians follow. Follow the American people. They will do the right thing. There is still a right thing. Maybe right thing is a New York expression. Great. I know that guy, by the way. <laughs> I see him all the time. Uh, so those are the five finalists. People can vote. They go to the uh, coronavirus.health.ny.gov, wear mask to vote. Vote between now and May 25th. Winner announced May 26th. How many times can a person vote? Once. Once. No voter fraud on this election. No absentee ballots, no polling place. Is there early voting? I don't think so. All right, so that's great. Thank you very much for doing that. We'll announce that winner May 26th. Over 600 submissions though, and they are really great. I've seen a number of them. Uh, we're gonna post the honorable mentions also, uh, but all 600 will be available to look at. And they're really creative and they have different voices from all across the state. So I want to thank very much uh, everyone who, who participated uh, because they really are, they are special. And with that, we'll take any questions that you might have. Governor, will New York be testing every nursing home resident uh, and staff in our state like the White House is recommending? Um, they set up, you know, a sort of deadline by May 25th. Everybody, every state, wants to test every person in a nursing home. 
Every state wants to test every person in a congregate facility, every person in a prison, every person in the state. So it becomes a question of how fast can you get the testing up. You know that we have the most aggressive and ambitious nursing home testing program, testing uh, staff twice a week. Uh, and we're testing people in nursing homes now. Uh, could we ever get to, uh, we have about 180,000 people in nursing homes? That would have, right? 100, 180-ish. You wanna to speak to, do you know the testing protocol in nursing homes? We're doing, as the governor said last Sunday, we mandated twice a week testing for staff. Um, last Wednesday, the nursing homes had to turn in their proposals to be able to meet that mandate. The feedback we got back from many of them were that they were struggling, and so we arranged to, on Monday and Tuesday of this week, have kits sent to every single nursing home across the state to do the testing. We also paired nursing homes with commercial labs to be able to run the actual tests, so that is officially off the ground. That's, the, that's to help meet the mandate of the twice testing a week. Um, I believe there's about 100,000 residents in our nursing homes. It's about 180,000 staff between the adult care facilities and the nursing homes. Um, and so it's very aggressive. We are the, the leading the nation on this. And yes, we believe we're going to meet the goal. When, when will every single nursing home in New York get enough tests, free tests to test every single nursing They got the t kits on Monday and For Tuesday. I'm sorry? sorry? Oh, the residents. We sent the resident kits out last week, over the last week. Yeah. So this is separate from the from the staff. Is it enough to test every resident? Yes. Yes. Governor, the nation um, has a phase reopening plan for um, its casinos to resume gaming June tenth. Um, what do you think about the timing of that? Yeah, we are. Uh, we we don't have a date for opening up casinos. I spoke to the uh, Connecticut, Connecticut governor Lamont and the uh, New Jersey governor Phil Murphy. Uh, we agree that casinos are, by definition, a large gathering spot. A lot of people touching equipment, and then someone else touches the equipment. So uh, it poses real challenges. And we don't have a deadline, a date to open casinos. They would be in our phase four, our last phase. We don't have a date for that yet. Uh, tribal nations are just that, they're nations. Uh, so they are not bound by uh, state laws. Some of the tribes are. Some of them are federally recognized and are not bound by state laws. Governor, to the antibody testing, you're saying that the rate is significantly lower for first responders. Have we tested grocery store workers, delivery drivers, people that don't necessarily have access to medical grade um, masks or M95 masks or even surgical masks for that matter? Yeah, have we done select tests for? We've actually just started, to your point, Josefa, looking at people who work in pharmacies and people who work in grocery stores. Um, so that's just gotten underway, and we're very eager to get those results stores? as well. We're still in the process of doing that. So once we have that data back, we'll report it. But we wanted to get a random sample of grocery stores all across the state. So that's been underway. Workers, yes. workers. Yes, workers. Permit last week that would supply gas to Long Island. Do you see any new natural gas supply being needed in the state given the climate goals that we have in law? And then, given uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio's opposition to an alternative proposed by National Grid, how can the state ensure that there aren't any moratoriums in the future? Uh, the, the Long Island gas providers, the utility companies, said that they didn't need that gas supply, right? Because the demand has dropped. It was a warmer went, a winter. Uh, so the, the utility companies are the ones who say they don't need additional gas. Uh, on the alternatives, I haven't gone through them all. But uh, whatever we need to do, we will do. And, uh, but it's the utility companies themselves that said they didn't need the pipeline. <laughs> Avoid a moratorium, or do you think that we can yeah, need we to can't limit have, new gas supply to meet the climate? We can't have a mor moratorium. That doesn't work for anyone, right? The big question was where we were last year was we need that pipeline. If we don't get the pipeline, then the world is going to end as we know it, uh, and we have to have a new pipeline. Now we don't have to have a new pipeline, and the utility providers say they don't even think in the future we're going to need a new pipeline uh, because of the re reduced demand. That's actually good news. Uh, but 
what will we need? I don't know. We'll work with them on it, and we'll make sure that there's enough supply because there can't be a moratorium. Governor, there's limited reopenings starting on Friday. Of course, the capital region opens today. What, what has been the effect of that in these regions? Are infections picking up? We have not. On the data that has come in so far, we haven't seen any increases. You know, you have, Jimmy, a deviation every day, right? That's why I hate to repeat myself. Uh, but the day-to-day -day numbers you always have to take with a grain of salt. Because this whole reporting system, this does not come from the Old Testament, right? This is not gospel. This is a system we just put up. So you'll see a day-to-day -day bounce, but we have not seen anything significant anywhere that is worth mentioning. When do you think New York City, Long Island could, could open? There were questions for the mayor today. And then even things like Saratoga. I know Naira has banned or said it's going forward at Belmont without fans. Will there be fans at Saratoga? What's sort of the update there? There is no update. Watch the numbers, watch the data, watch the infection rate, then you will know just as well as I will know. Governor, you just said, Governor, you just said that uh, you've not seen anything significant uh, in terms of an increase in uh, the metrics in these regions that have reopened, but both the Finger Lakes and Central New York are at their highest number of hospitalizations at any point during this outbreak. Do you have any intention of rolling back their reopening process, slowing it down, stopping it because of that hospitalization? Yeah, no. any hospitalization you're seeing today, I don't know, I'll ask Jim if that, that's true. Not that I doubt your credibility, but your, your capacity to track the numbers. The, by definition, a hospitalization rate couldn't have anything to do with the opening because to be hospitalized, that means you had to get the virus, it had to incubate, you had to get symptoms, you had to get very ill, and then you go to the hospital. There's about a two-week lag on the hospitalization rate. So by definition, it couldn't be linked to the reopening. Uh, but those are the data that we will be looking at. Did you, have you seen anything there? We've seen, and we monitor it every day, it's not the highest point necessarily, but we have seen upticks. Next thing we do, because we have contact tracing and those other processes now, is it limited to a specific issue like the Madison County agriculture business where it's not a spread, we d identify a problem right away and then the Department of Health addresses it. We're looking at central New York, Finger Lakes, and those regions, so we've seen a little uptick, but nothing of note. The rate of transmission is still relatively low, but the next couple of days we'll know, and if there's something changes, then we'll how, how fast would you evaluate that? Like, is that a, a daily thing? I mean, we, over three days, we over do five it, days? We like, look at it daily, uh, Jesse, so if something pops significantly in a bunch of different areas, it's not just the hospitalization rate. We also look at the gross hospitalization rate, because that's net. Gross is who's walking in the door, which is a little different. That's people maybe transferring from one facility to another. The gross hospitalization rate in both of those regions right now are down. So that's a good sign. That means new people aren't walking in the door. So we look at all of these things together. And if you see a number of things pop in a real time, we do this on a 24-hour basis, then we'll note it to the Department of Health. And by the way, the positive testing rate is down in those regions as well. So that's also a good sign. So yeah, let me just give you a little context without getting you lost in the uh, details. The, you look at a number of indicators. The reason we uh, have global experts who help us is because this is not really a, a, it's new to us, but this has been this global experience with other countries, et cetera. The hospitalization rate, they will tell you, is actually the lagging indicator because there's a couple of weeks. You want to look at the number of new infections, your diagnostic testing rate, is that going up? The new cases walking in the door, uh, is that number going up? Your antibody testing, is that going up? They're very keen on looking at the nursing home staffing numbers, which is an interesting idea, because what they're saying is the nursing home staffing numbers, that is indicative of community spread because they're not getting it from the nursing home facility. So watching the nursing home staffing, which is twice a week, so you'd have two measures every week, right? Uh, but you look at the earlier indicators before the hospitalization, because their point is hospitalization, that's a two-week leg. If you, if you see a problem there, that's 
uh, indicative, but it's two weeks ago, and now you're going to have that wave from the past two weeks. So is that your right? Dashboards, your, dashboard, your dashboard is mostly based on hospitalizations with the thinking that there is no universe, you know, testing is spotty based on where you have tests available. I know that every day there are more tests, but are you now saying well, that testing is no testing isn't spotty at all. What's the number of tests per week? We're we're doing uh, it's we're up to upwards of forty thousand a day of testing right now. There's two different things, Jimmy. There's how do you start a reopening phase, and then how do you monitor in real time new infections to the governor's point, which is something now as locations are as regions are reopening. We're going to take a broader look at new infection rates, new positive tests, because that's real time. We don't want to be on a lag anymore. The reopening was, what were the problems that we have? How did those dissipate or not dissipate to reopen? Now that we've reopened regions, let's get the diagnostic testing right away. Let's see what's going on in specific areas. Hospitalization is a one component of it. But the gross hospitalization, people walking in, is more important. So some of those things carry more weight now because we're trying to do it in real time, not off of the APEX. What's the threshold then? This is, if this is the new system. For this year, you're talking about the dial back. Threshold yeah. is different than the open Yeah, threshold. well, let's just stay with the first point you raised first. It is not a spotty system. It is 250,000 tests per week. That is the largest percentage of tests done in the United States of America. That is the largest percentage done of any country on the globe. So that probably would not qualify as a spotty system, right? That would qualify as a a comprehensive, exhaustive look at what's going on. 250,000 tests. So you watch those 250,000 tests and that number. The experts are, have pointed to this, something that we didn't think about, the nursing home staffing tests, which will be twice weekly as opposed to just once weekly, right? And you look at that data, and basically what they're looking for is a shift in that data. If you see a shift, then they'll do a deeper dive on that data, more tests, where is it coming from? You know, you can increase tests overnight. You can say, we might have a problem in Buffalo, let's increase the number of tests, another 10,000 tests in Buffalo. So if you see a shift, then deeper dive, more attention and let them understand what's going on. They look for clusters uh, of activity. If you see a shift, you may have a cluster, you may have a hot spot, uh, or you may not have a hot spot and it may be just a dramatically increased community spread and that would trigger a more systemic issue. WDD group home policy. There are 7,200 group homes that house disabled people in the state. The staff are telling me that they're seeing cross-contamination because of how short-staffed these homes are. They fear that this is creating another situation like what we've seen in the nursing homes. They have seen 2,000 cases in these group homes. You said you would check the policy. Did you have a chance to check it? And will you make policy changes to protect people in these group homes? Yeah. The, who wants to speak to the group homes? The moving around of staff is something that they do if it's absolutely last resort, if there's a staff shortage, if people are out because they're sick and they need to have certain people with certain skill levels step in to be able to cover. And so that is something that has had to happen up until this point. However, after you raised the issue last week, we've been having internal discussions about supplementing with the volunteer portal so that we don't do that and we keep people more restricted to the homes that they work in to be able to address this very issue. We're also doing temperature checks. Um, and we're looking at a whole host of other things that we're going to implement. One more, Governor. Uh, there is a call for a federal probe into how the state handled the nursing home situation, specifically the March executive order allowing COVID positive patients back into the nursing homes. Um, in reflecting on comments, I was wondering why was that executive order made at the time? Yeah, you should tell your, look, this is a political season. I get it. Uh, I have refrained from politics. I'm not going to get into the back political back and forth. But uh, anyone who wants to ask why did the state uh, do that with COVID patients in nursing home, it's because the state followed 
President Trump's CDC guidance. So they should ask President Trump. I think, I think that will stop the conversation. Are you numbers? Because that's an accusation that you're facing, that you are changing the numbers to make. Well, let's, let's go back. Let's do one at a time. Okay. Your first point, why did the state do that? Because the state followed President Trump's CDC's guidance. Okay? That's that answer. Uh, no numbers were changed. You've shown a willingness to like thwart President Trump at other times. Why on that March 25th memo did you not thwart him? Why did you follow CDC guidance? And do you regret that? I mean, no, considering not the death at all. Toll. Well, you have to remember the facts. I know you're the New York Times, but facts are still facts, right? Even at the Times, okay? So here are the facts. Uh, the CDC guidance said a nursing home cannot discriminate against the COVID patient because at that time the issue was hospital capacity, right? Remember hospital capacity? And we were dramatically increasing hospital capacity. If a person doesn't need an urgent care bed in a hospital because they're not urgently ill and they have, it can take two weeks to test negative when you're no longer urgently ill is the best use of a hospital bed to have somebody sit there for two weeks in a hospital bed when they don't need the hospital bed because they're not urgently ill, they're just waiting to test negative on the antibody test, which can take two weeks. And you need that hospital bed for somebody who may die without it. Second fact, a nursing home cannot accept a patient who they are not qualified to handle. For a COVID patient, a nursing home must say, I can quarantine, I can isolate, I have the right staff, I have the right PPE, or else that nursing home should not take that patient. And third point, we always had alternative beds. Any nursing home that says, I can't take that COVID patient for whatever reason. I don't even care what the reason is. I don't have the staff. I don't have the time. I'm overstressed. I don't have the PPE. We always have alternative beds. We have had alternative beds all throughout this. We never got to a place where we were bumping up against uh, the capacity. So any nursing home could just say, I can't take, I can't handle a COVID person in my facility. Right, but in retrospect, do you think that was a bad decision, the, the March 25th memo? Do you think that that contributed to the death toll in this state, which is, even no. in nursing homes, is over 5,000 no. people? No, because you'd have to be saying the nursing homes were wrong in accepting COVID positive patients. That's what you would have to be saying. Why are you so resistant to an outside? That's what you would have to be saying. Why are you so resistant to an outside group? She shielded nursing homes from any most legal liability if they had a shortage. Do you believe a nursing home, I don't, do you believe a nursing home operator would accept a patient who they knew they couldn't care for? Why would a nursing home operator do that? Why? We always had alternative beds. If they didn't think that they could pay for, handle a COVID patient, they would say, I can't handle the COVID patient. So you, you would, in the past, you've used outside entities to investigate things when you were attorney general. You can be in Moreland Act commissions. Why are you so resistant to an outside probe here? I'm not happened? resistant, Jimmy. I said I'm just not playing politics. Well, I, I don't Why know do who the, I I have know nothing the politics to do. is. It's Democrats, it's Republicans, it's short people, tall people. I have nothing to do. If the federal government wants to start a probe, then they can start a probe. What do, you what do I have to do with whether or not a, a, uh, a federal probe happens or not? So you'd welcome an outside probe? Why do you think the no, death toll is so much higher? I, it is irrelevant to me. I have no role in determining a federal probe. I don't welcome, not welcome, it doesn't matter. President Trump does what he wants to do. He doesn't listen to a governor. Why do you think the death toll 
Manhattan so much higher in New York than it is in California? Yeah. Well, first of all, we're number 34 in terms of per capita deaths in nursing homes, right? Well, just, well, just you asked about nursing homes. You take 50 states, and you can put all 50. Where is New York? Number 34. Even though we had the highest number of cases, per capita we're number 34. You could say, wow, how come you're only number 34? But that's because you're the New York Times. Who hasn't asked the question? Students, teachers, and parents have said since the reimagined education uh, edict, I guess, came out, if you want to call it that, that they're concerned that distance learning is the primary objective here, integrating that more, and that could destroy the student-to-teacher ratio. A lot of teachers' unions will say things like a low student-to-teacher ratio is the best-case scenario for children to learn. And if you're expanding via distance learning, that could be counterproductive as far as the quality of the education. So I guess that's a two-part question. Is that true? And uh, the other half would be, are there other parts to reimagining that don't include distance learning? Yeah. Reimagine education means, let's go through, let's look at what happened. What can we learn that's positive? Uh, I would agree with the teachers who say there's no, there is no substitute for classroom teaching. There is no substitute. Saying a kid is going to be on the other side of a computer remotely, that is the classroom experience. It's not. Uh, there is no substitute for the teacher-student relationship. That's why we work so hard to reduce class sizes so the teacher has more time with each student. That is 100% right. Uh, what happened to us here was you couldn't do the classroom experience for, because of the coronavirus, et cetera. So you have to go to remote, remote learning. Uh, I don't believe every school district was ready for this abrupt shift to remote learning. And how could they be? Nobody was ready for this abrupt shift of this coronavirus. Uh, but uh, on this, with this abrupt shift, what did we learn? What skills do teachers need? What equipment do students need? You know, remote learning, that suggests every child has the equipment at home. Parents know how to do it. Uh, there's an internet signal for every student in every locale. None of these things existed. So uh, for this possibility, what can we learn? How can we do better? But Everybody wants the schools to open up as soon as possible. We just have to make sure when it's safe. And there is no way, in my opinion, that remote learning can ever be a replacement or a substitute for the classroom experience. So it's not to supplement what does reimagining education mean? Does it mean we need to be prepared if there's another spike in cases at some point or a second wave? Oh, yeah, what sure. Does, what does that mean? Yeah, I believe the only intelligent conclusion from this is you better be prepared. If you assume this is the last time something like this is going to happen, I think that's, that's a foolish assumption. I think it's, it's uh, wishful thinking, right? It reminds me of the first time we had these superstorms and floods and tornadoes, and everybody said, well, that, that'll never happen again. Yeah, except it did, again and again and again. Uh, I think having gone through this, we should say, let's prepare for something like this again. Uh, first, let's look at what happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. Where was the response system? Where was the early warning system here? Where the light went off, beep, 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 beep. China virus probably went to Europe. You know, by the time we did the European travel ban, we had three million Europeans come to this country. Uh, now we have a hospital capacity question. We have to quickly redesign the public health system with the hospitals to increase hospital capacity. Let's prepare for all of these things. And it may not be another coronavirus, maybe another virus, maybe some other uh, public health threat. Uh, maybe a terrorist threat, who knows? But the world is, is full of surprises now. 
and I think this was an eye-opener for all of us. But fool me once, you know, let's be prepared for the next one. Mark. So then Mark, and then Sorry. I see you right here. I will go to you right next. You will have the last question. Governor, thank you for the kind words on Sunday. I appreciate that. It's meant a lot. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to tell you. Um, regarding your interfaith advisory council, it seems to be my favorite topic these days. Um, when, do, when does the council report back to you? The number of congregants mentioned in your presentation, you said up to 10. When does that begin? And is that a statewide number, including Long Island and New York City? And just so that the council doesn't get caught up in something, Jewish Orthodox congregations need 10 men for a minion, and I'm sure a few women might want to attend services. It, uh, can you give any consideration to bump up the max number to 14? We have 14 reporters here, but 14 for Orthodox congregations. Your advisory council should be aware also that the Orthodox Union has a four-page guidance document on their website. Yeah, Mark, I, there is no uh, official report that the Interfaith Council is going to do. I'm going to speak with them myself. Uh, I want to talk it through with them. Everybody wants to get to the same place. Everybody wants to get to the same place. And by the way, they want to get to the same place safely also. Uh, I'm very close to the Orthodox community, as you know, for many, many years. I'm speaking to them already. Uh, I understand their issues. I'm... Uh, it's, it's complicated to set one number for one religion, another number for, you're going to set one, 14 for the Orthodox community, and, you know, uh, then I'll have the Roman Catholics say, well, how come they get 14? I don't get 14. So that's what we want to talk through, and uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, I'll do my best to try to figure it out. And the 10 is, uh, it goes into effect now, and it is statewide. Last question for you. Governor, so the legislature is proposing uh, legislation that would require you or any future governor to submit a weekly report to the legislature during an emergency declaration. It would also limit uh, an emergency declaration to 30 days. Also, uh, counties are hoping that you can give them an update on county fairs or any sort of guidance there. Okay. We have no update yet on fairs, right? Uh, when do fairs open? Uh, when does Saratoga open? When does any of these things open? It all depends on the numbers. Nobody can tell you what the numbers are. Uh, people who tried to make projections on the numbers, frankly, they were all wrong. So we watch the actual numbers. You can start to see a pattern in the numbers. We see a pattern now where the numbers are going down, and that's why we're taking the actions we're taking. Uh, so. But are we at a point where anyone can forecast when will phase four happen? Uh, no, not at this point. And what was the first part of the question? Um, so, are proposing uh, legislation that would require, like, a governor or you to uh, submit a weekly report. Yeah, whatever they want to propose, they can propose, and then I'll look at it. I haven't heard of anything, and I haven't seen anything. Uh, I think all through this, in terms of my updates or informing people. Uh, I probably have been the most informative uh, elected official all through this. As you know, I've done this for about 80 straight days, Saturday, Sunday. I briefed every day. Every person in this state knows exactly what we're doing, when we're doing it. I have people come up to me on the street who talk about rate of transmission and, you know, everything that we've done. So uh, I feel very good about how exhaustive uh, I have been in communicating. Uh, the news hasn't always been positive and, and uplifting, but I said from day one, I'm going to tell New Yorkers the facts every day, and I have every day. Uh, I don't know, I haven't watched what every other governor has done. I don't know if everyone has done it for 80 straight days. So I feel good about how much information we've communicated. And I don't think I can be any more public in the communication than I've been, right? Uh, we televise these for anybody who wants to watch. Uh, but whatever legislation they come up with, they can propose and we'll take a look at it.
I will see you tomorrow. I will see you tomorrow. Dr. Feluso Fakariti is a cardiologist on a mission. My work entails, um, you know, saving limbs and saving lives. He moved to the Mississippi Delta, one of the poorest areas in the country, to stop what he says are preventable surgeries, amputations resulting from diabetes, a condition both of his parents had. Some of these patients are given an option of an amputation first strategy, and that's what we're against. Research shows amputations happen more frequently among black patients with diabetes in the rural southeast, often three to four times the national average. 90% of the amputations that I see are preventable. It's a crisis, experts say, worsened by the coronavirus. Why are we seeing such a high prevalence of COVID-19 in African-American communities? Those high death rates have existed pre-COVID. COVID just expounded the problem and expose the problem to the rest of the country. ProPublica's Lizzie Presser spent more than a month covering the crisis in Mississippi. So what we're all seeing with COVID-19 is that the patients who are most likely to be killed by the disease and severely affected by the disease are Black patients and diabetics. That's the same population that's disproportionately affected by amputation. She says more needs to be done to educate patients about their options and by the government to care for the most vulnerable. Like 85-year-old Susie Robinson, the pandemic leaving her son especially concerned. So I, I became more protective of her. Dr. Fakariti says patients like her deserve a chance. A chance to be taught how to eat right, how to live right. So knowledge is power. Morgan Radford, NBC News, New York. Back now with a disturbing rise during the pandemic. As many people stay home to stay safe, that can be the worst place to be for victims of domestic violence. Here's Kate Snow. Like your heart has just, someone took a huge knife and just kept carving your heart out. The pain is still so raw for Lissa Weimelt and Bill Pugh, whose daughter Maria was murdered less than three weeks ago. They adopted Maria as a baby from Mexico and raised her in Minnesota. Both Bill and I thought we just won the parenting jackpot. Always smiling. She snowmobiled, she rode horses, she rode four-wheelers, she snowboarded, she skied, she was a cheerleader. She got married last year, a relationship her parents describe as controlling. I think it was, you know, pretty intense, really fast. And then coronavirus and orders to stay inside their house. You know, that was not a safe place for her to be. Do you think COVID-19 contributed to everything that happened? Oh, sure. I mean, it further isolated her. The criminal complaint says there was an argument on April 30th about Maria leaving. Her husband, Joshua Fury, eventually admitted killing her and burying her body in a small crawl space. Fury's lawyer declined to comment. You just think, why didn't I say all the things that I'm faulting myself for now? You know, run, my God, run. Why didn't I say that? <sighs> Home is not a safe place for victims and now you're forced to stay inside because outside is scary. Phone calls to the Center for Women and Families in Louisville, Kentucky, have actually decreased, in part, experts say, because victims are trapped with their abusers. But the center is getting more emails or victims calling friends using a code word for help. What are you telling women about whether they can leave because of the coronavirus rules? Well, what we're telling them is do leave, absolutely. One of the ways that perpetrators are um, manipulating, mentally abusing their victims is through the coronavirus, saying things like, if you walk out this door, you're going to get the coronavirus and die. NBC News reached out to 35 organizations in 19 states. In some places, hotline calls more than doubled, becoming shorter and more frantic. We know COVID-19 is a pandemic, but so is domestic violence. Lissa and Bill are starting a nonprofit called Maria's Voice to help victims find resources. There is something we can do. It's a call to action about domestic violence, and it's Maria's voice. We're just parents who have a broken heart. Um, but we can do something, and we're going to do something to stop domestic violence. 
hoping to stop a pandemic within the pandemic. Kate Snow, NBC News. If you or someone you know needs help, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or go to thehotline.org. Mexico City is the perfect COVID breeding ground, overcrowded with a health care system already overburdened. This week, the government began reopening many businesses, but with about half the population in poverty, for many, stopping work was never an option. Today, I went to Mexico City's De Abasto Market, the COVID epicenter. Guards check temperature. Many people inside are wearing masks, but with a half a million people buying and selling here every day, social distancing is impossible. This market has never shut, and people told me it can't. It's the city's heart, soul, stomach, and wallet. Lorenzo works here seven days a week to feed his wife and three children. I asked him if he's worried about the virus. Yes, but fear is better than hunger, he said. But for thousands, the forced gamble with the virus does not end well. Officially, around 1,300 people have died from COVID in Mexico City, but critics say the real number could be three times that. And in Brazil, the undercounting may be even higher. NBC's Bill Neely is there. Coronavirus is spreading faster here than anywhere on Earth. But health officials believe the true number of infections could be worse, perhaps 15 times worse than the official figures. Back in Mexico, the president says reopening guidelines are recommendations. Regions ultimately decide. Intervenir. It's an acknowledgement, as many supporters say, that this country must work to survive. Even as coffins are now wrapped in plastic and graves dug in waiting rows. It's hard to know the full scale of the problem here because Mexico does very little testing. Rissel Cardona is a single mom in the Bronx, and she's worried. It's stressful. There's times where I found myself having to close myself in the bathroom and cry. I feel like I'm living in a whole nightmare. When the pandemic hit, she quit her job to take care of her three kids. Two have special needs. For her, it's critical whether New York schools reopen this fall. What we're worried about, especially parents with students with disabilities, is regression. Across the country, the future of K-12 education is up in the air, especially with new reports out of France, where dozens of new coronavirus cases have been linked to possible classroom exposure shortly after schools there reopen. Should schools reopen this fall? I think they should make an attempt to reopen schools, but this is all going to be dependent upon what happens in the summer and what September looks like. School districts in Minnesota and Texas will be allowed to reopen for in-person classes this summer. Kansas is planning to restart them in August. Katrina Pickens has been taking care of her three kids at home there. It's just very hard to put them into a schedule at home, you know, where there's all these other distractions. Some states are considering whether to start the fall semester early to catch kids up. One Maryland lawmaker is floating the idea of year-round schooling. Many districts are scrambling to answer unprecedented questions. How do you socially distance on a bus? Uh, on a bus? What's it look like um, in gym class? What's a choir room look like? Hopefully not like this, say New York City authorities. This Brooklyn yeshiva has now been shut down after ignoring social distancing orders. Also today, New York City announced plans for virtual summer school. About one in six students are being asked to take more online classes because many have fallen behind. Tonight, President Trump increasingly defiant about his decision to take the controversial anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, despite no evidence yet that it prevents coronavirus. I think it gives you an additional level of safety, but you can ask many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. A point he doubled down on later in the day. Hydroxychloroquine is used by thousands and thousands of frontline workers but the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing frontline workers are taking the drug. 
The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And similar findings in another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which used data from patients at Veterans Medical Centers, a study which the president attacked today. They were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a a Trump enemy statement. The president's the stunning revelation Monday surprised taken. even some of his own to top advisors. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi reacting. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, but is morbidly obese, they say. Sparking a bitter back and forth today. Oh, I don't, I don't respond to her. I think she's a waste of time. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. His words weigh a ton. And the president revealing he started to take the drug after one of his staffers tested positive for the virus. A very nice young gentleman. He tested positive. Meantime, the vice president, whose press secretary tested positive, said he is not taking hydroxychloroquine. My physician has not recommended that, but I, w I wouldn't hesitate to take the counsel of my doctor or any American should do likewise. NBC's Dr. John Torres. Don't listen to other people when they tell you to take medicines like this because, again, the benefit might not be there, but the harm certainly could. And in a statement tonight, the FDA reiterated the decision to take any drug is ultimately one between a patient and their doctor. It's the kind of good news development that researchers have been hoping for. Preliminary findings from the South Korean Centers for Disease Control suggest patients who recovered from COVID-19 but then tested positive for the virus again were not infectious and were not spreading the virus to others. 447 South Koreans tested positive a second time, but those virus traces appeared to be dead, not alive. Could it be an indication of immunity? I think it's a little too soon to take that and say that we know for sure that people have immunity, but we have seen that people do mount a pretty good immune response to this, and we haven't yet seen reinfection. So I think taken together, that is encouraging. It felt like what I thought was one of the worst flus I had ever had. Back in early February, Erin Kirk Evans, her kids and husband, all became very sick. Now, after recently testing positive for the antibodies, she knows it was COVID-19, which means she could have some protection. It just felt like this empowering feeling that I can no longer live in the fear of it and the uncertainty of what it's going to do to my body or my kids or my husband. In South Korea, the findings have convinced health experts to loosen some quarantine restrictions. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul. They're greeting this new report here with optimism. It means officials will no longer require recovered COVID patients to test negative before being released from quarantine. And it comes just as high school seniors are headed back to school for the first time in weeks. And it could be critical in hard-hit U.S. states since early testing suggests one in five New Yorkers has antibodies for COVID-19, but many never knew they were sick. Having the antibodies does not automatically mean immunity, but the South Korean report is further evidence that people who have recovered and do have antibodies may be able to return to work without fear of infecting others. Dariana Dyson was just 15 when she started complaining about stomach pain and a rash. It happened so fast. I never thought that taking my daughter in the hospital for stomach pain, I wouldn't be walking out of there with her. Within days, the Baltimore teen was dead, the latest victim of the newly discovered multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Dariana had tested positive for COVID antibodies. I hope that can save another child. People need to really understand that this kills people. Today, the CDC held a briefing call with doctors on what it's learning about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and nine countries around the world. Cases seem to be peaking about a month behind COVID-19. Many of the children didn't know they had coronavirus, suggesting the illness comes from an overactive immune response. In New York City alone, there are now 147 cases. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. 
Long Island's Cohen's Children's Medical Center saw many of the early cases. Almost 80% had no underlying condition. Nearly all had gastrointestinal symptoms. And the hospital saw success with a plasma product called IVIG, which helps calm an overactive immune response. It's one of the things doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. They're saying that it looks pretty normal. She came in, in you know, really near death. And um, within a matter of days, um, we are able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own. It was one of those moments um, that you really want to celebrate. Hope tonight. I'm just so happy that she has a bright future. That treatments can work if doctors can catch it in time. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, New York. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You know, we were concerned with the virus, concerned the well-being of our customers' employees, but gaming has been essential to our livelihood. I just hope that we don't have an outbreak because... You know, the decisions that we made were, were really difficult and we realized that, that it could be a life or death situation. We opened March 20th, 1993. So it's kind of ironic that we closed March 20th, 2020. <laughs> when the Coeur d'Alene Casino Resort Hotel in Idaho was forced to close in March, its owners immediately began to think about what it would take to reopen. So originally we thought we were gonna be closed for two weeks and um, it ended up being over a month of paying our wages, the wages and benefits of the casino and tribal employees, millions of dollars. And it got to be, you know, very concerned, you know, we're really dipping into our reserves. And um, that really just, you know, put more emphasis as far as the importance of opening our doors. The casino finally did reopen on April 27th. And since then, its operations have looked very different. Guests have their temperatures taken, restaurants are at one-fourth their capacity, and yellow tape markings keep people six feet apart. First day back, it was a lot of wiping down, a lot of disinfecting, um, constant. The shutdown, they're cleaning from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. We have every other machine turned off, and we have on order some plexiglass to put between the machines, each machine, and we have had a few people removed because they refused to wear their mask. The casino is owned and operated by the Coeur d'Alene tribe, who felt the economic pressures to reopen. Last year, the casino generated tens of millions of dollars in revenue. We employ a lot of members of the tribe and also other tribes. Everything, all the dollars, and that's our biggest cash cow, comes from the casino. 
So our police department, our senior uh, programs, our youth programs, um, everything is supplemented by that casino. As of May 19th, more than 90 of the country's nearly 1,000 casinos have begun operating again, most of them owned by tribes. And as more move toward reopening, Coeur d'Alene offers a glimpse into what that might look like for other casinos around the country. Still, Stengar says she's not sure how the pandemic is going to affect business in the long run. The stimulus checks are out, and I think, you know, taxes were out, so we're kind of riding on that. Um, I am concerned with the economy in that it's going to level out, and with no um, tourists coming in, with the Canadian market being closed, a little concerned about that. Gaming has just been, it's been our livelihood, and so we are trying to uh, make up for lost revenue and continue to provide for our tribe. Friday night, Amenia, New York. The four brothers drive in. You could sense the collective sigh coming from each car. A night out. Yes, a night out. So when you said, we're going to the drive-in, what was the reaction? They were extremely excited. My son, who's over there, woke up this morning and kept asking all day long, when can we go, when can we go? He was just so over the moon excited. Cheryl DeGroote and her family and her neighbors in the next car got here plenty early. We got here, oh gosh, probably about a quarter after six. <laughs> We've been here for a little while. It's not gonna start for another hour and a half. I know, we don't care. And it mattered little what was showing, even to teenagers, Will and Ellie Poon. Are you excited about tonight's feature films? <laughs> I mean, we're just kind of excited to get out. I hear Trolls is... Top notch. Top notch. <laughs> we stopped by earlier in the week to talk to the two brothers who run Four Brothers Drive-In, Paul and John Stephanopoulos. When you guys heard you were good to go to open up again, what was your reaction? True excitement. Bottled, uh, open up the bottle of champagne and <laughs> seriously jumping up and down, jumping up and down. Oh, up and yeah, down. Yeah. We're, 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 excited, we're crazy excited. about it. It's kind of like letting everybody back into a, a little bit of normal. We'd like to think the heyday of drive in movies was decades ago. <laughs> but with built in social distancing, drive ins provide both a way back to the future and a great escape. Food you can pick up or get delivered. And frankly, what's better than a pizza party? in the back of a station wagon. Here's the number one thing. How's the pizza? Good. Meet the Jordans, Emma, Mackenzie, Allison, Dad Kevin, and Mom Erica. They got to say goodbye to their teachers today. Yeah. So it's, it's a, he's decided it's gotta be a positive, yep. not a negative. Yep. No crying, we're gonna go out and have a great day. Anyways. We had McDonald's for lunch, driving for the first time for dinner yeah. and for movies. Erica is a stay-at-home mom who's in charge of the girls' studies, while Kevin works from their bedroom. And... He's the phys ed teacher and the principal, so he so comes we down We gave ourselves for... titles. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing their best to manage the COVID close down. We do a lot with them throughout the day. They're out on their bikes, so it's not like that they're not getting up. And truth be told... More for Erica and I, this is what we probably needed more than they needed tonight. Built-in social distancing, getting out of the house, big screen entertainment. But we wondered, what about the restrooms? We recommend that you hold yeah. it in. <laughs> what did you say? We recommend that you hold it in. <laughs> Perhaps the real heroine of the night, Faviola Fernandez, a dozen years with the company, who tidies up after every visitor. Do you want me to find it first? The two brothers at Four Brothers Drive-In told us they sold out that first night. What were you hearing as people started coming into the parking lot? Uh, just the excitement, uh, just seeing their faces you know, lit up, they're, they're happy to be back here. When twilight came, the big screen lit up and the world and its problems faded away. In the cars and pickups, a mix of first-timers and regulars. The regular customers surely thinking, you just don't know what you've been missing. 
This is serious, and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. Governor Gretchen Whitmer overnight declaring a state of emergency after heavy rainfall ruptured two dams Tuesday in central Michigan, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Rising waters forcing the evacuation of nearly 10,000 people. Today, the Edenville and Sanford dams in Midland County breached. If you have a relative or a friend somewhere else in the state that you can go and stay with, please go to their homes. If you don't, go to one of the many shelters that have been set up. The evacuations following days of heavy rains in parts of the Midwest that also brought flooding to parts of Illinois, Ohio, and other states. Katrina Conley evacuated with her family to a hotel in Bay City, Michigan. We quickly packed our two dogs a couple changes of clothes and ourselves. We had to do what we had to do as far as finding a place to stay. Otherwise, we would be sleeping in our vehicles. The devastating flooding complicated by the coronavirus. Evacuate the area. Authorities working to get residents out of harm's way, leaving many heading to emergency shelters to balance their safety with social distancing. We're still under the like stay home, stay safe order, but then um, it also feels like get out, stay safe. So it's like this weird, um, really weird uh, conflict. So do the coronavirus rules still apply or like what? What's the right way to be responding? This morning, families living along two lakes and a river forced to flee from one of the worst flood disasters currently hitting mid-Michigan. We're going to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis and we're going to help people get out. This morning, the tensions are escalating between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president's use of hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. The president firing back at Pelosi after she criticized his decision to take the anti-malaria drug to protect against coronavirus, with no evidence yet that it prevents COVID-19. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Mr. Trump is increasingly on defense about his decision to take the drug, claiming it has been used by workers on the front lines of the pandemic. Many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. But the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing those workers are taking the drug. Former President Joe Biden slamming the president overnight, comparing this to the moment Mr. Trump questioned whether disinfectants could be a treatment, a statement the president later called sarcastic. It's like saying maybe if you injected Clorox into your blood, you know, it may cure you. Come on, man. What is he doing? What in God's name is he doing? The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which uses data from patients at veterans medical centers, found more deaths among those treated with hydroxychloroquine than those treated with standard care. Researchers also reported finding no benefit to its use. The president taking aim. If you look at the one survey, the only bad survey, they were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a, a Trump enemy statement. The CDC call outlined what they've learned about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and 10 countries around the world. According to the briefing, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID-19. Many of those children never showing any symptoms caused directly by the virus. But weeks later, a majority of cases are presenting with a fever and gastrointestinal symptoms, believed to be caused by an abnormal immune response to the virus. 15-year-old Dariana Dyson developed stomach pain and a rash around Mother's Day. She tested positive for COVID antibodies. A few days later, she was dead. Now one of four children to die here in the U.S. People need to really understand that 
this kills people. In New York City alone, there are now 147 suspected cases. I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. But this morning, there is also hope. The CDC says hospitals are having success with some treatments, including immunotherapy and steroids used to calm an overactive immune response. It's what doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. How dramatic was Juliet's turnaround? She came in, in you know, really near death. Um, within a matter of days, um, we are able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own, get her out of the hospital within 10 days. Her family now hoping Juliet's story can help pave the way for others. Overnight, Johnson & Johnson announcing a major change to one of its iconic products. Pure Johnson's baby powder from Johnson & Johnson. It's a feeling you never outgrow. The pharmaceutical giant saying it will no longer use talc in its baby powder products sold in the U.S. and Canada. In a statement, the company blaming declining sales, fueled by misinformation around the safety of the product and a constant barrage of litigation advertising. According to the American Cancer Society, talc, a mineral known for its softness, can contain asbestos, a substance known to cause cancer. While Johnson & Johnson has long touted the safety of its talc-based products, the company has faced thousands of lawsuits from customers linking them to cancer. Among them, 63-year-old Dean Berg, the first to take on Johnson & Johnson in trial, alleging its talc-based baby powders led her to stage 3 ovarian cancer. I am 100% certain that it caused my cancer. In 2013, a federal jury in South Dakota sided with Berg and found Johnson & Johnson negligent but did not award her any damages. In 2018, Reuters published a report saying that from at least 1971 to the early 2000s, the company's raw talc and finished powders sometimes tested positive for small amounts of asbestos. Information Johnson & Johnson reportedly failed to disclose to the public. The company denied the report's allegations, but months later revealed it was at the center of several federal investigations over whether its talcum powders were linked to cancer-causing asbestos. In October, the company voluntarily recalled 33,000 bottles of baby powder in the U.S. after the FDA found trace amount of asbestos in samples from a bottle purchased online. Johnson & Johnson points out in a statement that all verdicts against the company that have been through the appeals process have been overturned, adding that science is on their side, vowing to vigorously defend the safety of their product and the unfounded allegations against it as it starts to wind down production. This is what I wanted from the very beginning. No further people are going to be exposed to this. Ronan Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, has sold millions. Now, seven months after its release, one of his targets, former Today Show host Matt Lauer, is firing back, launching an attack on Farrow's reporting in an op-ed published on the website Mediaite. Among Lauer's accusations, Farrow abandoned common sense and true fact-checking in favor of salacious and deeply flawed material. He also says Farrow failed to confirm stories and used misleading language to manipulate readers. Catch and Kill accuses NBC News and NBC Universal of ignoring sexual harassment allegations against prominent men in the company, including Lauer, for years, and of deliberately burying Farrow's story on Harvey Weinstein to protect Lauer. NBC Universal has repeatedly denied both allegations. In Catch and Kill, Brooke Nevels, the woman whose allegations led to Lauer's firing, publicly accused him of raping her at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Lauer, who says the two had a consensual affair, again vigorously denied the rape allegation. He says Nevels didn't ever use the words assault or rape when she brought her claim to NBC in 2017. Lauer says Farrow took his accusers at their word and says he tracked down four people the author never interviewed. Their accounts, according to Lauer, cast doubt on some of the book's claims. In the book, Farrow writes that Nevels informed her former boss at Peacock Productions about Lauer. But Lauer says that supervisor was never contacted by Farrow. And another woman who ran the company at the time told Lauer, Nevels in no way conveyed the seriousness of what she now claims. There was never a mention of assault or rape. 
In a statement to NBC News, Farrow writes, we called dozens of corroborators around the Lauer allegations described in the book and more than a dozen around Brooke Neville's specifically. Neville's tweeting her response, an acronym for how abusers sometimes respond to accusations. Deny, attack, reverse, victim and offender. Lauer says he wanted to publish his article last fall after the book's release, but held it for personal reasons. The former morning show host says a recent article in the New York Times, critical of Ronan Farrow's reporting, prompted him to release it now. Among the criticisms in the Times article, that Farrow does not always follow the typical journalistic imperatives of corroboration and rigorous disclosure, or he suggests conspiracies that are tantalizing, but he cannot prove. In a statement to the Times, Farrow says he brings caution, rigor, and nuance to each of his stories. This morning, the publisher of Catch and Kill is standing by the book, writing in part, his commitment to the rights of victims and his impeccable attention to detail make us proud to be his publisher. NBC News has offered no comment on the Lauer piece. For Lauer's part, he says the examples of shoddy journalism I've explored here are the tip of the iceberg. For today, Stephanie Gosk, New York. It's one of the surest signs of summer. This is freedom. I haven't had such a full, happy heart this whole time. Fresh sand under your feet and the ocean breeze in your hair. I just needed for my mental health to sit out here and look at the ocean and just kind of breathe. This Memorial Day holiday, many beachgoers seeking a break from coronavirus lockdowns. I don't feel like you're going to be as exposed to the corona as much as you would be in a confined space like a grocery store. But with officials keeping a keen eye on social distancing, on Florida's Delray Beach, swimming, walking and jogging are allowed, sunbathing and surfing are not. How do you stop people from flooding from South Florida into your neck of the woods? Well, I think that it's going to be less attractive to come to a beach when there are other beaches um, that allow all activities. We're looking at hopefully keeping the numbers and the crowds down uh, initially. Crowds already gathering elsewhere in the country. On the popular Jersey Shore, anticipation for the holiday palpable. We need the fresh air. We need to have a beach. We need to have a life. On New York's Coney Island, barricades along the boardwalk, though people can still jog and walk on the sand for now. New York's governor just announcing state beaches will open for the holiday with restrictions. Only 50% capacity, no active sports, picnic areas and playgrounds closed. Yeah, it feels good, you know, it, it feels like, it's like a relief. In Southern California, families finding solace in the newly opened Golden Coast. But this is what Manhattan and Newport beaches looked like before the holiday, stoking fears of more COVID-19 spread. Different counties reopening with different restrictions, from bans on chairs and canopies in LA to no building sandcastles in Orange County. Recognition some summer traditions will be broken. Any and all restrictions right now that um, prevent people from getting sick and spreading the, the disease are necessary. This year, celebrating the holiday with sunscreen and a dose of social distancing. It's now time to launch our countdown to summer because Memorial Day weekend is just a couple of days away. Of course, things will look and feel different this year. So when you're making your plans, you're probably wondering what is safe, what isn't. Well, we got our team of experts standing by to help you navigate the new normal. We're going to start with our medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres, we've got a question for you. This is from Becky on our Facebook page. Take a listen. If the virus is presumed to be transferred through the eyes, nose, and mouth, how safe is it to be in a pool or at the beach for me and my granddaughters? Big question. And Hoda, you're more likely to catch coronavirus from all the other people at the pool than you are from the water. It's a respiratory virus, doesn't live well in the water, so don't worry too much about that. But you need to do the things that you need to do to stay safe from all the other people there, meaning if they're outside your circle of trust, social distancing will be important. On top of that, don't share towels, don't share water bottles, don't share sunscreens, because if somebody had coronavirus and used them, they could transmit it to you. But again, the water itself, the risk is very, very low. So at the lake, at the beach, in the pool, Mm -hmm. Go ahead and enjoy the water. Masks, you say yes or no when you're outside at the beach or the pool? If you, if you can't social distance, you should wear masks. Okay. Uh, so people want to go to a barbecue. And I think some people might go and wonder, like, A, is the food going to be okay? Is that something they should be worried about? 
Not too much from the food because the food itself, the virus doesn't live well in meat, it doesn't live well in the vegetables, but the person that prepared it, if they're sick, then there is a risk of them transmitting it. So make sure whoever's preparing the food, number one, is not sick. They're wearing a mask, they're wearing gloves, or at least washing their hands. But on top of that, just follow basic food safety handling tips. That means keeping the meat separate from the vegetables. And when you rinse the vegetables and the salad, just rinse them with water. You don't need any special cleaning products or okay. soap because that could get you your stomach upset. Just regular rinsing. All right, and be careful to touch the ketchup bottle and the mustard bottle. All right, we're going to move on to Vicki Wynn, exactly. our investigative and consumer correspondent. Vic, a lot of people have put money down on vacation rentals, okay? And maybe maybe they've heard, well, it's okay to come, but if you want to cancel, is that is that cool? Can you do that? This is the thing. You can always cancel, but the big question is how much is it going to cost you? Do you have to forfeit your security deposit? Did you pay in advance? But think about it. Take a step back. What's making you nervous? Are you worried about the cleaning? Just reach out to the leasing company. Ask them to email you in writing what are their cleaning protocols. Maybe once you get that information about how they're disinfecting, you'll feel calmer and safer. Airbnb is actually instituting a policy where it's asking some hosts to wait 72 hours before uh, between guests, which helps to limit uh, the spread of the infection. And if you want if you want extra cleaning, you can ask for that. You can always yeah. ask for it. It's really going to be up to the owner whether or not they do it. But when you talk about the big home share companies like Verbo and Airbnb, they've already announced they're going to enhance their cleaning policies. Okay. We're planning to get out at some point this summer. We're going to bring our own wipes, wipe down those high-touch surfaces, the remote controls, the light switches, the doorknobs. That'll give you some peace of mind, too. Sometimes there's stuff to rent, like a kayak or a jet ski. Would you say yes or no to that? Yeah, this this is a great time. I mean, Memorial Day weekend is sort of the unofficial kickoff to the boating season. So the things you need to consider here, practice social distancing. This is not a time to get on a small boat with people right. you haven't been isolated with. So I hope you're not sick of your family because you're going to be <laughs> stuck with them for the rest of the summer. But if you have got a yacht and you can, you know, do yeah. a six foot, then you do you. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I want you to consider is the rental shack. Keep your mask on when you're in those small enclosed yeah. areas and ask what the company is doing between users of the paddle boards, the kayaks, the handles. Are they wiping those things down? Can you bring wipes and wipe them down? All right, Vicki, thank you. Last but definitely not least, let's bring in Stephanie Rule. She's NBC's senior business correspondent. All right, Steph, a lot of people are making plans to travel and Sherry from New Jersey has a big question for you. If I decide to fly this summer and I get on the flight and I see that it's overcrowded or that people are not wearing masks, am I allowed to get off the flight and get a refund or get a free rebooking? Good question, Steph. All right, we are seeing airlines change their policies every day to get closer to this. You know now they're requiring masks, but at the same time, you've seen the viral photos, packed planes, people not wearing masks. Well, United has changed their policy. If you're expecting to get on a packed flight, they're now allowing you to rebook on a different flight or get a credit. And across the board, most airlines are enhancing their cancellation policies to help people who've got trips planned. Speaking of, of refunds, Steph, if you've been paying, let's say, your gym membership or a pool membership and your gym isn't operational or your pool isn't, are you eligible for a refund? It completely depends. Where we're seeing this the most is people who live in buildings that have these uh. amenities. And in Washington, D.C., for example, they're now trying to push a bill where landlords will have to force uh, that landlords will have to refund mm -hmm. part of the rent to those tenants. You paid up for that fancy building. And if you don't get to use the amenities, other suggestions to those landlords, can you offer possibly free internet or other amenities? Because these things are expensive. Yeah, they sure are. Steph, before I let you go, I have to let you know that you're a viral sensation, okay? <laughs> there is a video of you and your cute son. I don't know if y'all have seen this, but just look at it for a second. <laughs> Stephanie may be the hardest working woman in television, and the hashtag Mama Gets It Done is so on point for you, Steph. <laughs> Your son is calm. I mean, that thing has like three million hits. Gaming names like MGM. It, it, you know what? He was sitting next to me. He was preparing to answer some questions about economics for uh, Nightly News Kids, and I didn't realize the ca uh, it was my time to go, and it was too late for me to just push him off his seat. <laughs> I just laid him down. <laughs> By the way, very calming. It's a beautiful sight, by the way. And a bunch of moms were online giving you two thumbs up. So thank you so much, Steph. Thank you.
This morning, Reuters reporting new plans for a nationwide study of more than 300,000 Americans to try and track the spread of the coronavirus. The CDC will test samples from blood donors in 25 cities looking for antibodies, which are created by the immune system after it fights off the virus. We're about to take the antibody testing. We first gave you an inside look at what it's like to take an antibody test last month. There's a huge line outside. Three NBC News producers, David, Michelle, and Lauren, all had different symptoms of COVID-19 over the last three months. Cough, fever, body aches, even nausea and loss of smell. But they never got a diagnostic test. If it's positive, it could mean I had the coronavirus back in March. So they volunteered to take an antibody test after they recovered. The results, Michelle and Lauren, positive. David, negative. But with more than 150 of these tests now on the market, many not authorized by the FDA, health officials have sounded the alarm on their accuracy. So our producers volunteered to roll up their sleeves again to see how the tests compare. Let's see what Quest Laboratories finds in my blood. They offer direct-to-consumer antibody testing. Simply sign up online and make an appointment with the lab. You just sign up on your own. You don't even need to go see a doctor. Then they used telemedicine. Um, So I had heard today that you guys were now going to be doing antibody tests. This time, the producers had a five-minute video visit with a doctor online who ordered the test through LabCorp. Last, they went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Let's head on in. Which developed its own test, available for healthcare workers, first responders, and people, like our producers, interested in donating their plasma for research. So we'll see if these test results are similar to the other ones. All of the tests involved a blood draw and the results back in about 24 hours. For all four tests, the results were consistent. Lauren and Michelle positive, David negative. What do you take away from that? The fact that our producers took four different antibody tests and got the same results each and every time. Yeah, that's great. I think that hopefully over time, we'll see which of these tests perform the best. There are a few that are FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations to be able to be used, and those tend to be more reliable, up to 100% reliability. Before taking any antibody test, check the FDA's website to see which ones are authorized, and make sure you ask the lab or doctor which one they use before you go. Is there anything someone should do differently if they know that they developed the antibody for this virus. We're really recommending that people proceed with caution, continue all the recommended things that everybody needs to do right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your surfaces. It's ideal to take an antibody test three to four weeks after feeling symptoms. While you're sick is a different test, now becoming more widely available. It's diagnostic. You take that test before or during symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo taking a diagnostic test on live TV. This one involves a very large swab that takes a sample from deep in the back of the throat. That's it. Some newer versions use saliva samples. The reliability of the diagnostic test depends on which test you're getting. The FDA says molecular or PCR tests are the most reliable and can take up to a week for results. Also, a new type of diagnostic test called an antigen test can diagnose COVID-19 in less than an hour. The FDA approved it for emergency use, but also warns it may not be accurate every time. It still can have false negatives, which means that they tell you you're negative when in fact you actually have the disease. And that's one of the concerning things. Because you could be spreading it to others unknowingly. Exactly. Remember, diagnostic tests are important to know whether you are infected right away so that you can isolate yourself and prevent spreading that virus. Antibody tests tell you whether you may be immune from being reinfected, but that has not been proven definitively yet. And by the way, the cost for these antibody tests can be all over the place, some ranging from a dollar out of pocket all the way up to $300 wow. for a test. These antibody tests, I'm sure they give people peace of mind. It's good to know that they are consistent, like in your report. Yes. But I guess more importantly, too, businesses need this info when they talk about reopening. These antibody tests and the results are such an important piece of the puzzle, according to public health officials, knowing who has been infected and who has antibodies will show what areas are lower risk of community spread. And if the data continues to show some sort of immunity when you have the antibodies, then it can also help us decide who can get back out into the community at a lower risk 
all of this crucial information for officials as yeah. they decide who goes back to work and how do we reopen. But even if you do have those antibodies, like she said, you got to wear the mask, yep. you got to do all the same things. You want to still be careful yeah. at this point. Make sure the test is FDA approved. That's my yes. What about, these places, uh, where, what about these places where the tests are being conducted? Are they all the same? They sort of run the gamut. Our producers told us some were really observing the social distancing guidelines, sanitizing one patient in, one patient out. Others were a little less Mm -hmm. uh, we're a little more lax on those regulations, so definitely bring your hand sanitizer, wear your mask. You win. We'll see you next hour, by the way. This morning in South Korea, a whole new way of going to school. This long line you see here is because of temperature checks. Every student, every staff member is getting a temperature check and a squirt of hand sanitizer. High school seniors are the first group back in a slow, staged return to classrooms. Are you happy to be back? Yes. Inside, they've sprayed down rooms, spaced desks farther apart, installed plastic dividers in the cafeteria. The private school for foreigners in Seoul, opening for the youngest students too. American Paul Rader is the athletics director. Are you comfortable bringing your kids back to school? Knowing how Korea has handled it, knowing how important um, and actually significant protocols like mask wearing and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, etc. makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. Schools were supposed to start reopening last week, but that was delayed after a coronavirus outbreak linked to nightclubs in Seoul. Nearly 200 cases now linked to that cluster, and clubgoers are now facing public backlash, accused of being irresponsible. A member of the K-pop band BTS publicly apologizing for going against government advice to stay home. Zainab missed crossing paths with the infected clubber by an hour. And the clubs, when you enter, they take the time that you went in, your name, your, uh, if you had an asthma, your temperature, everything they check. We're not showing her face because of public anger. She tested negative, but still had to self-quarantine. A crucial piece of South Korea's strategy, which we experienced firsthand after flying in from London. Our 15-day quarantine finally ended on Monday. We feel really confident now that we're leaving that we're virus-free. But this morning, a new battle for health officials after nurses at one of the country's biggest hospitals tested positive for COVID-19. This morning, we have a look at how one of the largest food and beverage companies in the country is dealing with this pandemic. Stephen Williams, the CEO of PepsiCo Foods uh, North America, joins us with an exclusive announcement. Uh, thank you for talking with us this morning. Good morning, Janelle. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Let's uh, jump right in. Tell us about this initiative Good. that PepsiCo is announcing today. PepsiCo and the PepsiCo Foundation have launched a new uh, $7 million initiative to provide immediate relief and long-term recovery for Black and Latino communities. Uh, this initiative builds on uh, the $50 million global commitment to provide vital support uh, for those impacted by COVID-19. We've talked a lot about how some of those in the, in the communities are taking a harder hit because of COVID. Why is it so important to you guys to donate directly to uh, Black and Latino communities? Well, well, first, I would say, you know, the focus is really about raising awareness and it meant, uh, to encourage other companies and public sector agencies to step up to meet uh, these needs for the duration of the pandemic. And as you know, you know, these communities of color have a higher percentage of COVID-19 infections and then the national population. And uh, we believe we have an obligation uh, to have an impact. We're in these communities every day. These communities are our employees. These communities also are our consumers. Uh, Steve, in order to get uh, the money directly to folks who need it, you're working with the National Urban League and Unidos US. Why right. these organizations? Uh, both uh, the National Urban League and Unidos U.S. are long-term partners of PepsiCo um, and the PepsiCo Foundation. We've worked with Urban League for over 40 years, and we've worked with Unidos for more than 35 years. We believe these partners are best suited uh, as they sit in the communities to help uh, provide direct, uh, direct assistance. 
uh, in, in these partnerships, this money will go to the 14 hardest hit communities across the nation, places like Baltimore, Chicago, Dallas, New Orleans, uh, Los Angeles, and, and New York. And we believe they're best suited to reach deeply uh, in the communities and they have, a, they have a track record of doing so. Steve, let's talk about food prices if we can. Folks have been talking about it. We've been reporting on it, how grocery store prices are on the rise. Difficult for folks in these times. Has PepsiCo raised its prices on products? And why now, if you have? You know, the uh, yeah, I'll tell you, we have seen and we've obviously read a ton about grocery prices rising. We are trying our best to keep grocery prices low in the categories that we do business in. You know, operating in this environment is uh, is extremely uh, costly, but we're trying our best not to pass on uh, the brunt of uh, the work we're doing to keep our people safe. But but have you raised your prices? Uh, modestly, but not not significantly. I think a lot of people were a little frustrated, so we thought, you know, you could answer that because I think they feel like the grocery business is doing so well uh, yeah. during this pandemic. So they were wondering why the, the prices were, were yeah. you know, passed on to them. What would you say? Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough environment to operate in. Our, the safety and health and well-being of our employees is job number one. It is our number one focus and will continue to be. And to do that in this environment, uh, including providing uh, uh, PPE, making sure that we're deep cleaning factories every uh, night, making sure that we keep our employees that make, move, and sell our products safe has, uh, is, is very expensive. And yes, uh, sales are, are brisk, but it is a very difficult operating environment. And so as we work hard, to keep our prices down, and that's our, our commitment. Before you leave us this morning, this is getting a lot of yeah. attention. Uh, last week, PepsiCo unveiled a pair of direct-to-consumer websites, essentially yeah. cutting out the grocery store completely. Is this temporary for the times, or is this perhaps a new way of doing business for you? No, and one, it's not to, uh, to, to cut the grocery store out completely. It really is about building direct relationships with consumers. It's also about making sure that uh, consumers can find our products always everywhere. Uh, it's, it, and it's a capability building reach into the marketplace, and it's not temporary. We plan to continue uh, to build capability in this area. Definitely getting a lot of buzz because it's all about access. Stephen Williams, thank you. We know it's a busy time, so thank you for, for talking with us this morning and about that new thank initiative. You. Thank you. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays 
starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. As of the beginning of 2020, I had three fully functioning restaurants and the Pegu Club uh, is, was in its 15th year and, you know, we were still operating and no reason to, uh, you know, to be closing uh, those doors other than what's what's happened with this pandemic. In the past few months, small businesses have been clobbered by the coronavirus pandemic. Due to stay-at-home orders, a small online presence, or high overhead costs, many businesses have had to close their doors for good. We just looked at the numbers for that, and, and it became clear very quickly that that was not a business that was going to be able to recover. Uh, and so we just saved ourselves a lot of time and agony and gave it a very sad and unceremonious, you know, goodbye. And it makes us angry, you know, for, for not just the business that we had to close, but for the, the interruption of the success that we were experiencing from decades of hard work. And we were very good at what we do. And uh, it's, it's devastating and it's sad and it, it makes me angry to lose all of this overnight. Many others could face the same fate. According to a survey by Main Street America, 7.5 million small businesses are at risk of closing in the next five months. The four business owners we spoke to employed 30 people. Now they're out of work. Really, we're a boutique local brewery. We depended about 75% of our revenue on people coming into the tasting room and drinking beer there. It was pretty obvious to us, given the challenges that we already faced, that there was no way our business was going to survive this. It was a relatively easy decision for us to make. You know, e e even though um, everyone is either laid off or furloughed at this point, um, I'm keeping an eye open to see how I can help uh, them survive. Right? Regardless of whether I'm running the business, I want to make sure that everyone's okay. So I own an uh, Loopman and Small Wedding Company in Savannah, Georgia. We had a space called the Savannah Cozy Chapel, where we did very small weddings, um, license signings, um, groups of 20 or less, who wanted to celebrate um, in private in a specific kind of place. It wasn't necessarily just a financial decision. Um, it was about being able to uh, protect my entire business. But the saddest part about what will be lost is the space that we created. Have you processed this emotionally? 33 years of business and now your, your store has disappeared. Your business is gone in the blink of an eye. You know, if you ever had gone through, you know, losing a parent or anybody close to you where, you know, you have to then go and empty out the apartment. That was exactly how I felt. Small business layoffs are now showing signs of leveling off. Those layoffs spiked over 1,000 percent back in March, and furloughs jumped 138 percent from March to April. That's according to data from human resource provider Gusto. But Gusto says in the last two weeks of April, some small businesses started bringing their workers back. Here's what some of those business owners are going through in their own words. Between all three businesses, we're down almost 90% in sales and revenue, um, making it very difficult to 
proceed. We can't close the doors. It's a family-owned business. My brother, my dad, my little sister all work here, and we're trying to keep it going. We've been in the parking lot since 1992. So we've been around for 28 years. We don't want to lose it. Like many of you, we had to make the difficult decision to close our doors about two months ago. We actually made the decision before the orders were put in place by our um, our governor in the state of Pennsylvania. And we made that decision just because there were so many things out of our control. We've um, tried to hire back as many of our employees as possible. Um, some don't want to come back yet. They feel it's uh, too soon. They're, they don't feel safe enough. We've uh, added curbside pickup where we have contact free pickup to, for people to get food to go to try to build our sales. But even with all these efforts, um, we are still operating at 90% below our typical revenue. I do have some concerns. I mean, something is, and I don't think this is minor, but something as simple as, as disinfecting our office, the way our office is set up, we're going to have to pivot and transition and change the way that we offer services to our clients. Mental health is a very intimate experience and having to bring clients in and, and really provide services with masks on and not be able to see as many people in one day because we have to make sure the offices are sterilized. So we're going to have to change the whole structure of our business. COVID didn't end. It didn't go away. And the people aren't coming back out. Uh, for us to be back to 100% um, revenue, that would be 100% revenue going forward today. That does not make up for the 186% uh, of revenue that we've lost since March 8th. So we need a, you know, a, a broader vision, a bigger vision of how to actually bring this back together and truly save the small business. Without it, the small businesses are going to disappear. Parents in ICE detention facilities are refusing to be separated from their children. Officers presented parents with the option of separating from their kids or remaining together in detention indefinitely, and not one of the 366 families agreed to separate. NBC News Justice Correspondent Julia Ainsley joins me now. And Julia, first, why is the administration giving parents this option right now? Well, Allison, they explained to us, I talked to a senior ICE official who said this is in response mm -hmm. to a lawsuit. Now, the lawsuit was brought on behalf of families in detention because the lawyers are making the case that these children shouldn't be kept in there on what is an average of six months during the coronavirus pandemic. Instead, they think they should be released and monitored with their parents. Now, instead, what the government decided to do was offer this form to the parents to say, look, you can release your children, but you can't go with them, to then go show the judge that these parents are choosing to keep their children in detention. So the lawyers say this isn't at all what they intended with the lawsuit. And they say that these parents were completely caught by surprise. And a lot of them were very disturbed and very intimidated that the U.S. government was going to take their children away, because, of course, that is what happened in the summer of 2018. Oh, such a scary situation. Uh, Julia, ICE is drafting a new form that would ask parents to waive their rights under the Flores settlement. Can you explain what all that means? Yeah, let me explain that. So the Flores settlement goes back decades and basically protects the rights of immigrant children okay. in ICE custody. And what it really says is that they shouldn't be there longer than 20 days. Now, these families have been there for an average of six months because the U.S. government has tightened asylum to the point that there are really no other options for these people. So they're waiting to see if they can appeal and go through a long legal process, while the government is waiting to see if any of these barriers can be removed so that they can just deport them as a family. In the process, the judge who oversees this Flores settlement that protects their rights says that these families have to, the, the government is not in compliance because of the family. So now what ICE is going to do and what they told us exclusively is that they are working on a new form that would ask the parents to waive the rights that are granted to them by the courts, which would include uh, keeping their children for under 20 days, which obviously is not happening. So it's just another dead end for a lot of these families that are trying to seek asylum here and have some kind of protection for their health, uh, for their families. Yeah. Julia, these families are obviously dealing with so much. I know you have reported on this extensively. Uh, what are you hearing? How are they handling all of this? 
it's hard because there are so many confusing pieces, even for journalists who know this system, yeah. have been covering it for years, who speak English. Yeah. It's so hard to imagine what it's like for a family like this. So I speak most of the time through their lawyers to them. And a lot of people were very caught off guard. I mean, one of the lawyers represents families who have infants who are in a facility in Pennsylvania who were afraid that they would take the infants away from them. Um, these people might have a cousin somewhere, but certainly no one who can raise the child without the parent involved. And the other thing that the parents may not even understand, which would be devastating to them, is once they're separated from the child, the government then treats them like a single adult and makes it a lot easier for them to be deported, which would only separate even further the parent and child. So there are a lot of uh, pretty confusing and heartbreaking pieces to this whole story. This is one segment of it. We're also covering what's happening to families and immigrants trying to get in at the border who are being sent back to wait in, in poverty and in unsafe conditions in northern Mexico. But this piece particularly caught my eye, and it's something that I think might very easily be covered up while we're all focused on this pandemic. It's just a heartbreaking situation for so many of the folks that you've been reporting on. Uh, Julie Ainsley, thank you so much. Always appreciate it. Thank you. For some, staying at home during a pandemic carries its own dangers. That's because for victims of intimate partner and sexual violence, the threat is in their own home. Survivors are feeling a heightened sense of fear, being cut off from their normal support networks and safety nets. And some are reporting an increase in their frequency and severity of the abuse that they're experiencing while in that situation. And yet the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization, RAIN, is finding that some survivors are choosing to live with danger rather than go out. So when folks are reaching out to us for support, many of them are highlighting concerns around their own health as uh, considerations about whether or not they feel safe enough to access support right. out in the world or whether they feel like they need to stay at home, even though the risk to them um, could be life-threatening. It's more complicated than ever for survivors to see their doctor, their lawyer, or even get to a police station. And an immediate ride, especially in the aftermath of a sexual assault, can be vital. To be able to freely um, ride, particularly in this moment, to um, a doctor's office to collect evidence to prosecute a case, uh, which tends to happen within a particular time frame after a, a sexual violent event, is critically important. Without that evidence, that person could have a harder time making the case to law enforcement and certainly having a successful case in court. Now, when someone calls the RAIN hotline for help, the local person they talk to may be able to offer a free lift ride wherever they need to go. We've committed to funding over a thousand rides as a start. This is a pilot program. So at this time, if someone feels like they're in danger, if they have been um, a survivor at this point of sexual assault or any domestic violence, then that's why we worked with RAIN to provide um, service providers in cities across the country. RAIN says they anticipate reports of intimate partner and sexual violence will increase as shelter in place orders lift and victims are able to head back out into the world. But help is available now. I want survivors to know that RAIN is here to listen and support them during this difficult time and at all times. And if you or someone you know has been affected by sexual violence, please contact RAIN's National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-HOPE or online.rain.org. This morning, ER doctors are asking, where are the patients? We're seeing real legitimate emergency patients um, delaying care of coming in because of fear, the fear of catching COVID. Stacy Simpson is one of those patients. She's battled heart disease for 15 years, but a recent scare in the emergency room has her afraid to go back. I'm thinking, OK, I'm having a heart attack. And now I've been exposed to COVID, essentially, by being in this room. And it really made me feel like, you know, I'm going to die. A survey from the American College of Emergency Physicians found that nearly a third of American adults say they've delayed or avoided medical care because they're concerned about contracting coronavirus. At the peak of the virus, Ascension Health Systems, with 150 hospitals in 20 states, says patient visits to the ER were down 48 percent. 
Doctors say that can be deadly. So we've seen heart attacks and strokes and surgical issues that would have been a relatively benign procedure or something that we could have acted on that are coming in too late for us to do much with it. One cardiac physician says some patients are coming in critically ill because they've delayed needed visits. There's a lot of patients who uh, are uh, basically uh, dead on arrival by paramedics because they've waited too long. Minister, what's the address of the emergency? But now, with new safety protocols in place at hospitals around the country, doctors stress the danger of an untreated heart attack or stroke is much greater than the risk of catching COVID-19 in the hospital. You are much more likely to die of a cardiac issue without appropriate medical care than you are to die of the coronavirus at this point. And Carrie joins me now from outside a hospital in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Carrie, you spoke with the doctor at that hospital who said patients are basically dead on arrival because they are simply waiting too long to call 911. How on earth are hospitals trying to convince people that it is safe to go to the emergency room? Well, Dr. Osmond here at Broward Health in Fort Lauderdale, as well as the first responders, are trying to get the word out to people to understand that when they arrive at a hospital in an emergency room like this, that their perceptions are wrong. The misperception is that the hospital ambulance arrives here, you're taken out on a stretcher, and you go through what people believe is like a cloud of coronavirus that somehow may infect them. But in emergency rooms here and across the nation, they have separated as people come in. So coronavirus patients are isolated over here. Others are taken over here, so there's no cross-contamination. But a lot of it is because initially, when this first happened, especially back in the early days of March, Hospitals were encouraging people to perhaps delay going to the hospital. They weren't talking about emergencies. They were mm -hmm. talking about electric surgeries. But as you can imagine, people get confused. And Allison, there is a real fear. Nobody wants to get exposed to the virus. But as the doctors say, sure. that's not the case here. The fight for a coronavirus vaccine is a global effort. Dozens of pharmaceutical companies and biotech firms now working simultaneously on a cure. There are scientists around the world, each working on their own way to create a vaccine. We may wind up having more than one. That would be wonderful. Traditional vaccines introduce what's called an imitation infection into humans through an agent that in some way resembles the disease, triggering the body into producing certain blood cells and antibodies to fight off the infection. Typically, the vaccine is tested over the course of years, first in animals to determine whether a vaccine prevents infection. Just last week, researchers at Oxford University successfully prevented pneumonia caused by the virus in monkeys. But due to the urgent need to find a vaccine, animal trials are being skipped in many projects. Human trials are now already underway, carried out in three phases. The first human trials will soon enter phase two, following promising early results, adding more healthy volunteers in an effort to see how it can affect a more diverse group. Typically, uh, phase one is for safety, phase two is to figure out the dose, and phase three is a very large trial where you figure out the efficacy and the safety of a vaccine. That usually takes several years. But rather than trying to manipulate the live virus, some companies, such as Moderna, are looking at a new kind of vaccine, one that attempts to genetically modify the virus itself, specifically reprogramming the genetic code known as messenger RNA, which instructs the cells to make the proteins associated with the coronavirus, but without making someone sick. The hope is that the immune system will then kick in to create the antibodies to fight off COVID-19. One of the benefits of messenger RNA is just how quickly uh, these different candidates can be generated. So how long will a vaccine take to develop? Last month, Savannah pressed Dr. Anthony Fauci about whether a 12 to 18 month timeline for a vaccine is realistic. Do you feel that's in the realm of possibility? Yeah, yeah, I do, Savannah. We want to go quickly, but we want to make sure it's safe and it's effective. I think that is doable. 
Once a vaccine is proven effective and licensed by the FDA, the CDC will determine how best to administer it. Some companies are already looking ahead to what the next challenge might be, ramping up manufacturing capabilities in the hopes of being able to more widely distribute a vaccine, which could take months to produce on a massive scale. A high stakes gamble that could lead to a big public health payoff. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14 day national shutdown? Yeah. If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hey, I'm Stephanie Rule, and I am with you today. As we know, the unemployment numbers from the past two months have been skyrocketing. But as several states begin to reopen, there may be jobs out there for the taking. So here are my tips to best position yourself in your new job search. I know there's a lot going on right now and it can be scary, but put aside a few hours to focus and clean up your resume. If your industry is heavily impacted by the COVID shutdowns, think about your skills and how they could transfer across different sectors. This is especially important with soft skills like customer interaction, time management, and teamwork. Make sure to highlight those things on your resume. Remember, demand hasn't disappeared, it has shifted. Look at what's happened, think about your skills, Think about the new businesses, the new needs because of Corona and try to pair the two. Next, let's get some new skills. There are a lot of free ways to learn right now online. So if you've got the time and the ability and hopefully some Wi-Fi, use tools like LinkedIn Learning or even YouTube videos to expand your knowledge. In addition to helping you learn something new, the routine of taking a class could be a huge help if things are feeling out of control, getting yourself on a schedule with a program helps you regain that control. Next, consider both your short and long-term career goals. If you need to put food on the table right now, looking for that job is really different than looking for that next step in your career. Do you see the difference? If you need something right now, that job might be with some of the companies that are still selling essential things like grocery stores, pharmacies, big box stores. If you can tolerate that risk, or you can reach out to those companies and look for remote work. Lots of different industries are still hiring and they're accepting remote workers. You can also try doing freelance work to try to stay afloat right now. For the long-term solution, look at where you can start targeting for potential opportunities. Even if companies are not hiring right now, you can also think about how to translate your short-term job into a long-term one by moving to a full-time position down the line. If there's a company that you know you would love to work with, work for one day, see what they're hiring for immediately and maybe take that short-term position. And do not forget to network. Network more than ever. You would be surprised. Making a cold call, writing a cold email right now, you might get a response. People are looking at their phone. We were looking at their phones a lot more. People are answering calls. They want to help. 
So reach out. You might not be able to grab a coffee with someone, but someone might have the time to let you pick their brain. At a time like this, it is important. If you need help, ask for it. And if you can give help, give it. And that applies to those who are looking for work and those who maybe have the ability to hire some more freelance workers. Finally, stay persistent. Do not give up. And please be patient. Everything is taking longer. Everything is a process. It's not you. It's the time we're living in. There is so much uncertainty out there right now and everybody is doing the best they can. So please keep your head in the game, keep up the good work, write to me if you need to, take a walk around the block and take a deep breath, but we're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this together. This is serious, and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. Governor Gretchen Whitmer overnight declaring a state of emergency after heavy rainfall ruptured two dams Tuesday in central Michigan, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Rising waters forcing the evacuation of nearly 10,000 people. Today, the Edenville and Sanford dams in Midland County breached. If you have a relative or a friend somewhere else in the state that you can go and stay with, please go to their homes. If you don't, go to one of the many shelters that have been set up. The evacuations following days of heavy rains in parts of the Midwest that also brought flooding to parts of Illinois, Ohio, and other states. Katrina Conley evacuated with her family to a hotel in Bay City, Michigan. We quickly packed our two dogs a couple changes of clothes and ourselves. We had to do what we had to do as far as finding a place to stay. Otherwise, we would be sleeping in our vehicles. The devastating flooding complicated by the coronavirus. Evacuate the area. Authorities working to get residents out of harm's way, leaving many heading to emergency shelters to balance their safety with social distancing. We're still under the like stay home, stay safe order, but then um, it also feels like get out, stay safe. So it's like this weird, um, really weird uh, conflict. So do the coronavirus rules still apply or like what? what's the right way to be responding? This morning, families living along two lakes and a river forced to flee from one of the worst flood disasters currently hitting mid-Michigan. We're going to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis and we're going to help people get out. This morning, the tensions are escalating between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president's use of hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. The president firing back at Pelosi after she criticized his decision to take the anti-malaria drug to protect against coronavirus, with no evidence yet that it prevents COVID-19. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Mr. Trump is increasingly on defense about his decision to take the drug, claiming it has been used by workers on the front lines of the pandemic. Many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. But the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing those workers are taking the drug. Okay. Former President Joe Biden slamming the president overnight, comparing this to the moment Mr. Trump questioned whether disinfectants could be a treatment, a statement the president later called sarcastic. It's like saying maybe if you injected Clorox into your blood, you know, it may cure you. Come on, man. What is he doing? What in God's name is he doing? The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which uses data from patients at veterans medical centers, found more deaths among those treated with hydroxychloroquine than those treated with standard care. Researchers also reported finding no benefit to its use. The president taking aim. If you look at the one survey, the only bad survey, they were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a 
a Trump enemy statement. The CDC call outlined what they've learned about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and 10 countries around the world. According to the briefing, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID-19. Many of those children never showing any symptoms caused directly by the virus. But weeks later, a majority of cases are presenting with a fever and gastrointestinal symptoms, believed to be caused by an abnormal immune response to the virus. 15-year-old Dariana Dyson developed stomach pain and a rash around Mother's Day. She tested positive for COVID antibodies. A few days later, she was dead. Now one of four children to die here in the U.S. People need to really understand that this kills people. In New York City alone, there are now 147 suspected cases. I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. But this morning, there is also hope. The CDC says hospitals are having success with some treatments, including immunotherapy and steroids used to calm an overactive immune response. It's what doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. How dramatic was Juliet's turnaround? She came in, in, you know, really near death. Um, Within a matter of days, um, we were able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own, get her out of the hospital within 10 days. Her family now hoping Juliet's story can help pave the way for others. Overnight, Johnson & Johnson announcing a major change to one of its iconic products. Pure Johnson's baby powder from Johnson & Johnson. It's a feeling you never outgrow. The pharmaceutical giant saying it will no longer use talc in its baby powder products sold in the U.S. and Canada. In a statement, the company blaming declining sales, fueled by misinformation around the safety of the product and a constant barrage of litigation advertising. According to the American Cancer Society, talc, a mineral known for its softness, can contain asbestos, a substance known to cause cancer. While Johnson & Johnson has long touted the safety of its talc-based products, the company has faced thousands of lawsuits from customers linking them to cancer. Among them, 63-year-old Dean Berg, the first to take on Johnson & Johnson in trial, alleging its talc-based baby powders led her to stage 3 ovarian cancer. I am 100% certain that it caused my cancer. In 2013, a federal jury in South Dakota sided with Berg and found Johnson & Johnson negligent but did not award her any damages. In 2018, Reuters published a report saying that from at least 1971 to the early 2000s, the company's raw talc and finished powders sometimes tested positive for small amounts of asbestos. Information Johnson & Johnson reportedly failed to disclose to the public. The company denied the report's allegations, but months later revealed it was at the center of several federal investigations over whether its talcum powders were linked to cancer-causing asbestos. In October, the company voluntarily recalled 33,000 bottles of baby powder in the U.S. after the FDA found trace amount of asbestos in samples from a bottle purchased online. Johnson & Johnson points out in a statement that all verdicts against the company that have been through the appeals process have been overturned, adding that science is on their side, vowing to vigorously defend the safety of their product and the unfounded allegations against it as it starts to wind down production. This is what I wanted from the very beginning. No further people are going to be exposed to this. Ronan Farrow's book, Catch and Kill, has sold millions. Now, seven months after its release, one of his targets, former Today Show host Matt Lauer, is firing back, launching an attack on Farrow's reporting in an op-ed published on the website Mediaite. Among Lauer's accusations, Farrow abandoned common sense and true fact-checking in favor of salacious and deeply flawed material. He also says Farrow failed to confirm stories and used misleading language to manipulate readers. 
Catch and Kill accuses NBC News and NBC Universal of ignoring sexual harassment allegations against prominent men in the company, including Lauer, for years, and of deliberately burying Farrow's story on Harvey Weinstein to protect Lauer. NBC Universal has repeatedly denied both allegations. In Catch and Kill, Brooke Nevels, the woman whose allegations led to Lauer's firing, publicly accused him of raping her at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. Lauer, who says the two had a consensual affair, again vigorously denied the rape allegation. He says Nevels didn't ever use the words assault or rape when she brought her claim to NBC in 2017. Lauer says Farrow took his accusers at their word and says he tracked down four people the author never interviewed. Their accounts, according to Lauer, cast doubt on some of the book's claims. In the book, Farrow writes that Nevels informed her former boss at Peacock Productions about Lauer. But Lauer says that supervisor was never contacted by Farrow. And another woman who ran the company at the time told Lauer, Nevels in no way conveyed the seriousness of what she now claims. There was never a mention of assault or rape. In a statement to NBC News, Farrow writes, We called dozens of corroborators around the Lauer allegations described in the book, and more than a dozen around Brooke Nevels specifically. Neville's tweeting her response, an acronym for how abusers sometimes respond to accusations. Deny, attack, reverse, victim and offender. Lauer says he wanted to publish his article last fall after the book's release, but held it for personal reasons. The former morning show host says a recent article in the New York Times, critical of Ronan Farrow's reporting, prompted him to release it now. Among the criticisms in the Times article, that Farrow does not always follow the typical journalistic imperatives of corroboration and rigorous disclosure, or he suggests conspiracies that are tantalizing but he cannot prove. In a statement to the Times, Farrow says he brings caution, rigor, and nuance to each of his stories. This morning, the publisher of Catch and Kill is standing by the book, writing in part, his commitment to the rights of victims and his impeccable attention to detail make us proud to be his publisher. NBC News has offered no comment on the Lauer piece. For Lauer's part, he says, the examples of shoddy journalism I've explored here are the tip of the iceberg. For today, Stephanie Gosk, New York. It's one of the surest signs of summer. This is freedom had such a full happy heart this whole time. Fresh sand under your feet and the ocean breeze in your hair. I just needed for my mental health to sit out here and look at the ocean and just kind of breathe. This Memorial Day holiday, many beachgoers seeking a break from coronavirus lockdowns. I don't feel like you're going to be as exposed to the corona as much as you would be in a confined space like a grocery store. But with officials keeping a keen eye on social distancing, on Florida's Delray Beach, swimming, walking, and jogging are allowed, sunbathing and surfing are not. How do you stop people from flooding from South Florida into your neck of the woods? Well, I think that it's going to be less attractive to come to a beach when there are other beaches um, that allow all activities. We're looking at hopefully keeping the numbers and the crowds down uh, initially. Crowds already gathering elsewhere in the country, on the popular Jersey Shore, anticipation for the holiday palpable. We need the fresh air. We need to have a beach. We need to have a life. On New York's Coney Island, barricades along the boardwalk, though people can still jog and walk on the sand for now. New York's governor just announcing state beaches will open for the holiday with restrictions. Only 50% capacity, no active sports, picnic areas and playgrounds closed. It feels good, you know, it just feels like, it's like a relief. In Southern California, families finding solace in the newly opened Golden Coast. But this is what Manhattan and Newport beaches looked like before the holiday, stoking fears of more COVID-19 spread. Different counties reopening with different restrictions, from bans on chairs and canopies in LA to no building sandcastles in Orange County. Recognition some summer traditions will be broken. Any and all restrictions right now that um, prevent people from getting sick and spreading the, the disease are necessary. This year, celebrating the holiday with sunscreen and a dose of social distancing.
It is now time to launch our countdown to summer because Memorial Day weekend is just a couple of days away. Of course, things will look and feel different this year. So when you're making your plans, you're probably wondering what is safe, what isn't. Well, we got our team of experts standing by to help you navigate the new normal. We're going to start with our medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres, we've got a question for you. This is from Becky on our Facebook page. Take a listen. If the virus is presumed to be transferred through the eyes, nose, and mouth, how safe is it to be in a pool or at the beach for me and my granddaughters? Big question. And Hoda, you're more likely to catch coronavirus from all the other people at the pool than you are from the water. It's a respiratory virus, doesn't live well in the water, so don't worry too much about that. But you need to do the things that you need to do to stay safe from all the other people there, meaning if they're outside your circle of trust, social distancing will be important. On top of that, don't share towels, don't share water bottles, don't share sunscreens, because if somebody had coronavirus and used them, they could transmit it to you. But again, the water itself, the risk is very, very low. So at the lake, at the beach, in the pool, Mm -hmm. Go ahead and enjoy the water. Masks, you say yes or no when you're outside at the beach or the pool? If you, if you can't social distance, you should wear masks. Okay. Uh, so people want to go to a barbecue. And I think some people might go and wonder, like, A, is the food going to be okay? Is that something they should be worried about? Not too much from the food because the food itself, the virus doesn't live well in meat, doesn't live well in the vegetables, but the person that prepared it, if they're sick, then there is a risk of them transmitting it. So make sure whoever's preparing the food, number one, is not sick. They're wearing a mask, they're wearing gloves, or at least washing their hands. But on top of that, just follow basic food safety handling tips. That means keeping the meat separate from the vegetables. And when you rinse the vegetables and the salad, just rinse them with water. You don't need any special cleaning products or soap because that could get you your stomach upset. Just regular rinsing. All right, and be careful to touch the ketchup bottle and the mustard bottle. All right, we're going to move on to Vicki Wynn, mm-hmm. our investigative and consumer correspondent. Vic, a lot of people have put money down on vacation rentals, okay? And maybe maybe they've heard, well, it's okay to come, but if you want to cancel, is that is that cool? Can you do that? This is the thing. You can always cancel, but the big question is how much is it going to cost you? Do you have to forfeit your security deposit? Did you pay in advance? But think about it. Take a step back. What's making you nervous? Are you worried about the cleaning? Just reach out to the leasing company. Ask them to email you in writing what are their cleaning protocols. Maybe once you get that information about how they're disinfecting, you'll feel calmer and safer. Airbnb is actually instituting a policy where it's asking some hosts to wait 72 hours before uh, between guests, which helps to limit the spread uh, of the infection. And if you want if you want extra cleaning, you can ask for that. You can always yeah. ask for it. It's really going to be up to the owner whether or not they do it. But when you talk about the big home share companies like Verbo and Airbnb, they've already announced they're going to enhance their cleaning policies. Okay. We're planning to get out at some point this summer. We're going to bring our own wipes, wipe down those high-touch surfaces, the remote controls, the light switches, the doorknobs. That'll give you some peace of mind, too. Sometimes there's stuff to rent, like a kayak or a jet ski. Would you say yes or no to that? Yeah, this is a great time. I mean, a Memorial Day weekend is sort of the unofficial kickoff to the boating season. So the things you need to consider here, practice social distancing. This is not a time to get on a small boat with people right. you haven't been isolated with. So I hope you're not sick of your family because you're going to be <laughs> stuck with them for the rest of the summer. But if you've got a yacht and you can, you know, do yeah. a six foot, then you do you. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I want you to consider is the rental shack. Keep your mask on when you're in those small enclosed yeah. areas and ask what the company is doing between users of the paddle boards, the kayaks, the handles. Are they wiping those things down? Can you bring wipes and wipe them down? All right, Vicki, thank you. Last but definitely not least, let's bring in Stephanie Rule. She's NBC's senior business correspondent. All right, Steph, a lot of people are making plans to travel and Sherry from New Jersey has a big question for you. If I decide to fly this summer and I get on the flight and I see that it's overcrowded or that people are not wearing masks, am I allowed to get off the flight and get a refund or get a free rebooking? Good question, Steph. All right, we are seeing airlines change their policies every day to get closer to this. You know now they're requiring masks, but at the same time, you've seen the viral photos, packed planes, people not wearing masks. Well, United has changed their policy. If you're expecting to get on a packed flight, they're now allowing you to rebook on a different flight or get a credit. And across the board, most airlines are enhancing their cancellation policies to help people who've got trips planned. Speaking of of refunds, Steph, if you've been paying, let's say, your gym membership or a pool membership and your gym isn't operational or your pool isn't, are you eligible for a refund? 
It completely depends. We're, we're seeing this the most is people who live in buildings that have these uh. amenities. And in Washington, D.C., for example, they're now trying to push a bill where landlords will have to force uh, that landlords will have to refund mm -hmm. part of the rent to those tenants. You paid up for that fancy building. And if you don't get to use the amenities, other suggestions to those landlords, can you offer possibly free internet or other amenities? Because these things are expensive. Yeah, they sure are. Steph, before I let you go, I have to let you know that you're a viral sensation, okay? <laughs> there is a video of you and your cute son. I don't know if y'all have seen this, but just look at it for a second. <laughs> Stephanie may be the hardest working woman in television and the hashtag mama gets it done is so on point for you, Steph. <laughs> Your son is calm. I mean, that thing has like three million hits. Gaming names like MGM. It, it, you know what? He was sitting next to me. He was preparing to answer some questions about economics for uh, Nightly News Kids. And I didn't realize the ca uh, it was my time to go and it was too late for me to just push him off his seat. <laughs> I just laid him down. <laughs> By the way, very calming. It's a beautiful sight, by the way. And a bunch of moms were online giving you two thumbs up. So thank you so much, Steph. Thank you. This morning, Reuters reporting new plans for a nationwide study of more than 300,000 Americans to try and track the spread of the coronavirus. The CDC will test samples from blood donors in 25 cities looking for antibodies, which are created by the immune system after it fights off the virus. About to take the antibody testing. We first gave you an inside look at what it's like to take an antibody test last month. There's a huge line outside. Three NBC News producers, David, Michelle, and Lauren, all had different symptoms of COVID-19 over the last three months. Cough, fever, body aches, even nausea and loss of smell. But they never got a diagnostic test. If it's positive, it could mean I had the coronavirus back in March. So they volunteered to take an antibody test after they recovered. The results, Michelle and Lauren, positive. David, negative. But with more than 150 of these tests now on the market, many not authorized by the FDA, health officials have sounded the alarm on their accuracy. So our producers volunteered to roll up their sleeves again to see how the tests compare. Let's see what Quest Laboratories finds in my blood. They offer direct-to-consumer antibody testing. Simply sign up online and make an appointment with the lab. You just sign up on your own. You don't even need to go see a doctor. Okay, so then they used you. telemedicine. Um, so I had heard today that you guys were now going to be doing antibody tests. This time, the producers had a five-minute video visit with a doctor online who ordered the test through LabCorp. Last, they went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Let's head on in. Which developed its own test, available for healthcare workers, first responders, and people, like our producers, interested in donating their plasma for research. So we'll see if these test results are similar to the other ones. All of the tests involved a blood draw and the results back in about 24 hours. For all four tests, the results were consistent. Lauren and Michelle positive, David negative. What do you take away from that? The fact that our producers took four different antibody tests and got the same results each and every time. Yeah, that's great. I think that hopefully over time, we'll see which of these tests perform the best. There are a few that are FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations to be able to be used, and those tend to be more reliable, up to 100% reliability. Before taking any antibody test, check the FDA's website to see which ones are authorized, and make sure you ask the lab or doctor which one they use before you go. Is there anything someone should do differently if they know that they developed the antibody for this virus. We're really recommending that people proceed with caution, continue all the recommended things that everybody needs to do right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your surfaces. It's ideal to take an antibody test three to four weeks after feeling symptoms. While you're sick is a different test, now becoming more widely available. It's diagnostic. You take that test before or during symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo taking a diagnostic test on live TV. This one involves a very large swab that takes a sample from deep in the back of the throat. That's it. Some newer versions use saliva samples. The reliability of the diagnostic test depends on which test you're getting. The FDA says molecular or PCR tests are the most reliable and can take up to a week for results. Also, a new type of diagnostic test called an antigen test can diagnose COVID-19 in less than an hour. The FDA approved it for emergency use, but also warns 
it may not be accurate every time. It still can have false negatives, which means that they tell you you're negative when in fact you actually have the disease. And that's one of the concerning things. Because you could be spreading it to others unknowingly. Exactly. Remember, diagnostic tests are important to know whether you are infected right away so that you can isolate yourself and prevent spreading that virus. Antibody tests tell you whether you may be immune from being reinfected, but that has not been proven definitively yet. And by the way, the cost for these antibody tests can be all over the place, some ranging from a dollar out of pocket all the way up to $300 wow. for a test. These antibody tests, I'm sure they give people peace of mind. It's good to know that they are consistent, like in your report. Yes. But m I guess more importantly, too, businesses need this info when they talk about reopening. These antibody tests and the results are such an important piece of the puzzle, according to pu public health officials, knowing who has been infected and who has has antibodies will show what areas are lower risk of community spread. And if the data continues to show some sort of immunity when you have the antibodies, then it can also help us decide who can get back out into the community at a lower risk. All of this crucial information for officials as yeah. they decide who goes back to work and how do we reopen. But even if you do have those antibodies, like she said, you got to wear the mask, yep. you got to do all the same things. You want to still be careful yeah. at this point. Make sure the test is FDA approved. That's my yes. What about, these places, where, what about these places where the tests are being conducted? Are they all the same? They sort of run the gamut. Our producers told us some were really observing the social distancing guidelines, sanitizing one patient in, one patient out. Others were a little less, mm -hmm. uh, were a little more lax on mm -hmm. those regulations. So definitely bring your hand sanitizer, wear your mask. Thank you, win. We'll see you next time, by the way. This morning in South Korea, a whole new way of going to school. This long line you see here is because of temperature checks. Every student, every staff member is getting a temperature check and a squirt of hand sanitizer. High school seniors are the first group back in a slow, staged return to classrooms. Are you happy to be back? Yes. Inside, they've sprayed down rooms, spaced desks farther apart, installed plastic dividers in the cafeteria. The private school for foreigners in Seoul, opening for the youngest students, too. American Paul Rader is the athletics director. Are you comfortable bringing your kids back to school? Knowing how Korea has handled it, knowing how important um, and actually significant protocols like mask wearing and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, etc., makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. Schools were supposed to start reopening last week, but that was delayed after a coronavirus outbreak linked to nightclubs in Seoul. Nearly 200 cases now linked to that cluster, and clubgoers are now facing public backlash, accused of being irresponsible. A member of the K-pop band BTS publicly apologizing for going against government advice to stay home. Zainab missed crossing paths with the infected clubber by an hour. And the clubs, when you enter, they take the time that you went in, your name, your, uh, if you had an asthma, your temperature, everything they check. We're not showing her face because of public anger. She tested negative, but still had to self-quarantine. A crucial piece of South Korea's strategy, which we experienced firsthand after flying in from London. Our 15-day quarantine finally ended on Monday. We feel really confident now that we're leaving that we're virus-free. But this morning, a new battle for health officials after nurses at one of the country's biggest hospitals tested positive for COVID-19. This morning, we have a look at how one of the largest food and beverage companies in the country is dealing with this pandemic. Stephen Williams, the CEO of PepsiCo Foods uh, North America, joins us with an exclusive announcement. Uh, thank you for talking with us this morning. Good morning, Janelle. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Let's uh, jump right in. Tell us about this initiative Good. that PepsiCo is announcing today. PepsiCo and the PepsiCo Foundation have launched a new uh, $7 million initiative to provide immediate relief and long-term recovery for Black and Latino communities. Uh, this initiative builds on uh, the $50 million global commitment to provide vital support uh, for those impacted by COVID-19. We've talked a lot about how some of those in the, in the communities are taking a harder hit because of COVID. Why is it so important to you guys to donate directly to uh, Black and Latino communities? Well, well, first, I would say, you know, the focus is really about raising awareness and it meant, uh, to encourage other companies and public sector agencies to step up. 
to meet uh, these needs for the duration of the pandemic. And as you know, you know, these communities of color have a higher percentage of COVID-19 infections and than the national population. And uh, we believe we have an obligation uh, to have an impact. We're in these communities every day. These communities are our employees. These communities also are our consumers. Uh, Steve, in order to get uh, the money directly to folks who need it, you're working with the National Urban League and Unidos U.S. Why right. these organizations? Uh, both uh, the National Urban League and Unidos U.S. are long-term partners of PepsiCo um, and the PepsiCo Foundation. We've worked with Urban League for over 40 years, and we've worked with Unidos for more than 35 years. We believe these partners are best suited uh, as they sit in the communities to help uh, provide direct uh, direct assistance. Uh, in, in these partnerships, this money will go to the 14 hardest hit communities across the nation, places like Baltimore, Chicago, Dallas, New Orleans, uh, Los Angeles, and, and New York. And we believe they're best suited to reach deeply uh, in the communities and they have a, they have a track record of doing so. Steve, let's talk about food prices if we can. Folks have been talking about it. We've been reporting on it, how grocery store prices are on the rise. Difficult for folks in these times. Has PepsiCo raised its prices on products? And why now, if you have? You know, the, uh, I'll tell you, we have seen and we've obviously read a ton about grocery prices rising. We are trying our best to keep grocery prices low in the categories that we do business in. You know, operating in this environment is, uh, is extremely uh, costly, but we're trying our best not to pass on uh, the brunt of uh, the work we're doing to keep our people safe. But, but have you raised your prices? Uh, modestly, but not, not significantly. I think a lot of people were a little frustrated, so we thought, you know, you could answer that because I think they feel like the grocery business is doing so well uh, yeah. during this pandemic. So they were wondering why the, the prices were, were yeah. you know, passed on to them. What would you say? Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough environment to operate in. Our, the safety and health and well-being of our employees is job number one. It is our number one focus and will continue to be. And to do that in this environment, uh, including providing uh, uh, PPE, making sure that we're deep cleaning factories every uh, night, making sure that we keep our employees that make, move, and sell our products safe has, uh, is, is very expensive. And yes, uh, sales are, are brisk, but it is a very difficult operating environment. And so as we work hard, to keep our prices down, and that's our, our commitment. Before you leave us this morning, this is getting a lot of yeah. attention. Uh, last week, PepsiCo unveiled a pair of direct-to-consumer websites, essentially yeah. cutting out the grocery store completely. Is this temporary for the times, or is this no. perhaps a new way of doing business for you? No, and one, it's not to, uh, to, to cut the grocery store out completely. It really is about building direct relationships with consumers. It's also about making sure that uh, consumers can find our products always everywhere. Uh, it's, it, and it's a capability building, reach into the marketplace, and it's not temporary. We plan to continue uh, to build capability in this area. Definitely getting a lot of buzz because it's all about access. Stephen Williams, thank you. We know it's a busy time, so thank you for, for talking with us this morning and about that new thank initiative. You. Thank you.
We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability... Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America... And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Dr. Feluso Fakariti is a cardiologist on a mission. My work entails, um, you know, saving limbs and saving lives. He moved to the Mississippi Delta, one of the poorest areas in the country, to stop what he says are preventable surgeries, amputations resulting from diabetes, a condition both of his parents had. Some of these patients are given an option of an amputation first strategy, and that's what we're against. Research shows amputations happen more frequently among black patients with diabetes in the rural southeast, often three to four times the national average. 90% of the amputations that I see are preventable. It's a crisis experts say worsened by the coronavirus. Why are we seeing such a high prevalence of COVID-19 in African-American communities? Those high death rates have existed pre-COVID. COVID just expounded the problem and expose the problem to the rest of the country. ProPublica's Lizzie Presser spent more than a month covering the crisis in Mississippi. So what we're all seeing with COVID-19 is that the patients who are most likely to be killed by the disease and severely affected by the disease are Black patients and diabetics. That's the same population that's disproportionately affected by amputation. She says more needs to be done to educate patients about their options and by the government to care for the most vulnerable. Like 85-year-old Susie Robinson, the pandemic leaving her son especially concerned. So I, I became more protected of her. Dr. Fakariti says patients like her deserve a chance. A chance to be taught how to eat right, how to live right. So knowledge is power. Morgan Radford, NBC News, New York. Back now with a disturbing rise during the pandemic. As many people stay home to stay safe, that can be the worst place to be for victims of domestic violence. Here's Kate Snow. Like your heart has just, someone took a huge knife and just kept carving your heart out. The pain is still so raw for Lissa Weimelt and Bill Pugh, whose daughter Maria was murdered less than three weeks ago. They adopted Maria as a baby from Mexico and raised her in Minnesota. Both Bill and I thought we just won the parenting jackpot. Always smiling. She snowmobiled, she rode horses, she rode four-wheelers, she snowboarded, she skied, she was a cheerleader. She got married last year, a relationship her parents describe as controlling. I think it was, you know, pretty intense, really fast. And then coronavirus and orders to stay inside their house. You know, that was not a safe place for her to be. Do you think COVID-19 contributed to everything that happened? Oh, sure. I mean, it further isolated her. 
The criminal complaint says there was an argument on April 30th about Maria leaving. Her husband, Joshua Fury, eventually admitted killing her and burying her body in a small crawl space. Fury's lawyer declined to comment. You just think, why didn't I say all the things that I'm faulting myself for now? You know, run, my God, run. Why didn't I say that? <sighs> Home is not a safe place for victims. And now you're forced to stay inside because outside is scary. Phone calls to the Center for Women and Families in Louisville, Kentucky, have actually decreased, in part, experts say, because victims are trapped with their abusers. But the center is getting more emails or victims calling friends using a code word for help. What are you telling women about whether they can leave because of the coronavirus rules? Well, what we're telling them is do leave, absolutely. One of the ways that perpetrators are... Um, manipulating, mentally abusing their victims is through the coronavirus, saying things like, if you walk out this door, you're going to get the coronavirus and die. NBC News reached out to 35 organizations in 19 states. In some places, hotline calls more than doubled, becoming shorter and more frantic. We know COVID-19 is a pandemic, but so is domestic violence. Lissa and Bill are starting a nonprofit called Maria's Voice to help victims find resources. There is something we can do. It's a call to action about domestic violence, and it's Maria's voice. We're just parents who have a broken heart. Um, but we can do something, and we're going to do something to stop domestic violence. Hoping to stop a pandemic within the pandemic. Kate Snow, NBC News. If you or someone you know needs help, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or go to thehotline.org. Mexico City is the perfect COVID breeding ground, overcrowded with a health care system already overburdened. This week, the government began reopening many businesses. But with about half the population in poverty, for many, stopping work was never an option. Today, I went to Mexico City's De Abasto Market, the COVID epicenter. Guards check temperature. Many people inside are wearing masks. But with a half a million people buying and selling here every day, social distancing is impossible. This market has never shut. And people told me it can't. It's the city's heart soul, stomach, and wallet. Lorenzo works here seven days a week to feed his wife and three children. I asked him if he's worried about the virus. Yes, but fear is better than hunger, he said. But for thousands, the forced gamble with the virus does not end well. Officially, around 1,300 people have died from COVID in Mexico City, but critics say the real number could be three times that. And in Brazil, the undercounting maybe even higher. NBC's Bill Neely is there. Coronavirus is spreading faster here than anywhere on Earth. But health officials believe the true number of infections could be worse, perhaps 15 times worse than the official figures. Back in Mexico, the president says reopening guidelines are recommendations. Regions ultimately decide. Intervenir. It's an acknowledgement, as many supporters say, that this country must work to survive. Even as coffins are now wrapped in plastic and graves dug in waiting rows. It's hard to know the full scale of the problem here because Mexico does very little testing. Rachel Cardona is a single mom in the Bronx, and she's worried. It's stressful. There's times where I found myself having to close myself in the bathroom and cry. I feel like I'm living in a whole nightmare. When the pandemic hit, she quit her job to take care of her three kids. Two have special needs. For her, it's critical whether New York schools reopen this fall. What we're worried about, especially parents with students with disabilities, is regression. Across the country, the future of K-12 education is up in the air, especially with new reports out of France, where dozens of new coronavirus cases have been linked to possible classroom exposure shortly after schools there reopen. Should schools reopen this fall? I think they should make an attempt to reopen schools, but this is all going to be dependent upon what happens in the summer and what September looks like. School districts in Minnesota and Texas will be allowed to reopen for in-person classes this summer. Kansas is planning to restart them in August. 
Katrina Pickens has been taking care of her three kids at home there. It's just very hard to put them into a schedule at home, you know, where there's all these other distractions. Some states are considering whether to start the fall semester early to catch kids up. One Maryland lawmaker is floating the idea of year-round schooling. Many districts are scrambling to answer unprecedented questions. How do you socially distance on a bus? Uh, on a bus? What's it look like um, in gym class? What's a choir room look like? Hopefully not like this, say New York City authorities. This Brooklyn yeshiva has now been shut down after ignoring social distancing orders. Also today, New York City announced plans for virtual summer school. About one in six students are being asked to take more online classes because many have fallen behind. Tonight, President Trump increasingly defiant about his decision to take the controversial anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, despite no evidence yet that it prevents coronavirus. I think it gives you an additional level of safety, but you can ask many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. A point he doubled down on later in the day. Hydroxychloroquine is used by thousands and thousands of frontline workers but the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing frontline workers are taking the drug. The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And similar findings in another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which used data from patients at Veterans Medical Centers, a study which the president attacked today. They were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a a Trump enemy statement. The president's the stunning revelation Monday surprised taken. even some of his own to top advisors. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi reacting. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Sparking a bitter back and forth today. Oh, I don't, I don't respond to her. I think she's a waste of time. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. His words weigh a ton. And the president revealing he started to take the drug after one of his staffers tested positive for the virus. A very nice young gentleman, he tested positive. Meantime, the vice president, whose press secretary tested positive, said he is not taking hydroxychloroquine. My physician has not recommended that, but I, w I wouldn't hesitate to take the counsel of my doctor or any American should do likewise. NBC's Dr. John Torres. Don't listen to other people when they tell you to take medicines like this because, again, the benefit might not be there, but the harm certainly could. And in a statement tonight, the FDA reiterated the decision to take any drug is ultimately one between a patient and their doctor. It's the kind of good news development that researchers have been hoping for. Preliminary findings from the South Korean Centers for Disease Control suggest patients who recovered from COVID-19 but then tested positive for the virus again were not infectious and were not spreading the virus to others. 447 South Koreans tested positive a second time, but those virus traces appear to be dead, not alive. Could it be an indication of immunity? I think it's a little too soon to take that and say that we know for sure that people have immunity, but we have seen that people do mount a pretty good immune response to this, and we haven't yet seen reinfection. So I think taken together, that is encouraging. It felt like what I thought was one of the worst flus I had ever had. Back in early February, Erin Kirk Evans, her kids and husband, all became very sick. Now, after recently testing positive for the antibodies, she knows it was COVID-19, which means she could have some protection. It just felt like this empowering feeling that I can no longer live in the fear of it and the uncertainty of what it's going to do to my body or my kids or my husband. In South Korea, the findings have convinced health experts to loosen some quarantine restrictions. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul. They're greeting this new report here with optimism. It means officials will no longer require recovered COVID patients to test negative before being released from quarantine. And it comes just as high school seniors are headed back to school for the first time in weeks. 
And it could be critical in hard-hit U.S. states since early testing suggests one in five New Yorkers has antibodies for COVID-19, but many never knew they were sick. Having the antibodies does not automatically mean immunity, but the South Korean report is further evidence that people who have recovered and do have antibodies may be able to return to work without fear of infecting others. Dariana Dyson was just 15 when she started complaining about stomach pain and a rash. It happened so fast. I never thought that taking my daughter in the hospital for stomach pain, I wouldn't be walking out of there with her. Within days, the Baltimore teen was dead, the latest victim of the newly discovered multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Dariana had tested positive for COVID antibodies. I hope that can save another child. People need to really understand that this kills people. Today, the CDC held a briefing call with doctors on what it's learning about the illness, now found in at least 24 states and nine countries around the world. Cases seem to be peaking about a month behind COVID-19. Many of the children didn't know they had coronavirus, suggesting the illness comes from an overactive immune response. In New York City alone, there are now 147 cases. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. Long Island's Cohen's Children's Medical Center saw many of the early cases. Almost 80% had no underlying condition. Nearly all had gastrointestinal symptoms. And the hospital saw success with a plasma product called IVIG, which helps calm an overactive immune response. It's one of the things doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. They're saying that it looks pretty normal. She came in, in you know, really near death. And um, within a matter of days, um, we we're able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own. It was one of those moments um, that you really want to celebrate. Hope tonight. I'm just so happy that she has a bright future. That treatments can work if doctors can catch it in time. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, New York. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You know, we were concerned with the virus, concerned the well-being of our customers, employees, but gaming has been essential to our livelihood. I just hope that we don't have an outbreak because... You know, the decisions that we made were, were really difficult and we realized that, that it could be a life or death situation. We opened March 20th, 1993. So it's kind of ironic that we closed March 20th. 
2020. <laughs> when the Coeur d'Alene Casino Resort Hotel in Idaho was forced to close in March, its owners immediately began to think about what it would take to reopen. So originally we thought we were going to be closed for two weeks and um, it ended up being over a month of paying our wage, the wages and benefits of the casino and tribal employees, millions of dollars. And it got to be, you know, very concerned, you know, we're really dipping into our reserves. And um, that really just, you know, put more emphasis as far as the importance of opening our doors. The casino finally did reopen on April 27th. And since then, its operations have looked very different. Guests have their temperatures taken, restaurants are at one fourth their capacity, and yellow tape markings keep people six feet apart. First day back, it was a lot of wiping down, a lot of disinfecting, um, constant. The shutdown, the cleaning from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. We have every other machine turned off, and we have on order some plexiglass to put between the machines, each machine. And we have had a few people removed because they refused to wear their mask. The casino is owned and operated by the Coeur d'Alene tribe, who felt the economic pressures to reopen. Last year, the casino generated tens of millions of dollars in revenue. We employ a lot of members of the tribe and also other tribes. Everything, all the dollars, and that's our biggest cash cow, comes from the casino. So our police department, our senior uh, programs, our youth programs, um, everything is supplemented by that casino. As of May 19th, more than 90 of the country's nearly 1,000 casinos have begun operating again, most of them owned by tribes. And as more move toward reopening, Coeur d'Alene offers a glimpse into what that might look like for other casinos around the country. Still, Stengar says she's not sure how the pandemic is going to affect business in the long run. The stimulus checks are out, and I think, you know, taxes were out, so we're kind of riding on that. Um, I am concerned with the economy in that it's going to level out. And with no um, tourists coming in, with the Canadian market being closed, a little concerned about that. Gaming has just been, it's been our livelihood. And so we are trying to uh, make up for lost revenue and continue to provide for our tribe. Friday night, Amenia, New York. The four brothers drive in. You could sense the collective sigh coming from each car. A night out. Yes, a night out. So when you said, we're going to the drive-in, what was the reaction? They were extremely excited. My son, who's over there, woke up this morning and kept asking all day long, when can we go, when can we go? He was just so over the moon excited. Cheryl DeGroat and her family and her neighbors in the next car got here plenty early. We got here, oh gosh, probably about a quarter after six. <laughs> We've been here for a little while. It's not gonna start for another hour and a half. I know, we don't care. And it mattered little what was showing, even to teenagers, Will and Ellie Poon. Are you excited about tonight's feature films? <laughs> sure. I mean, we're just kind of excited to get out. I hear Trolls is... Top notch. Top notch. <laughs> we stopped by earlier in the week to talk to the two brothers who run Four Brothers Drive-In, Paul and John Stephanopoulos. When you guys heard you were good to go to open up again, what was your reaction? True excitement. Bottled, uh, open up the bottle of champagne and <laughs> seriously celebrated. jump it up and down, oh, jump it up yeah, and down. Yeah. We're, 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 excited, we're crazy excited. about it. It's kind of like letting everybody back into a little bit of normal. We'd like to think the heyday of drive in movies was decades ago. <laughs> but with built in social distancing, drive ins provide both a way back to the future and a great escape. Food you can pick up or get delivered. And frankly, what's better than a pizza party? in the back of a station wagon. Here's the number one thing. How's the pizza? Good. Meet the Jordans, Emma, Mackenzie, Allison, Dad Kevin, and Mom Erica. They got to say goodbye to their teachers today. Yeah. So it's, it's a, he's decided it's gotta be a positive, yep. not a negative. Yep. No crying, we're gonna go out and have a great day. Anyways. We had McDonald's for lunch, 
driving for the first time for dinner and for movies. Erica is a stay-at-home mom who's in charge of the girls' studies, while Kevin works from their bedroom. And... He's the phys ed teacher and the principal, so he so comes we down We gave ourselves for... titles. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing their best to manage the COVID close down. We do a lot with them throughout the day. They're out on their bikes, so it's not like if they're not getting up. And truth be told. More for Erica and I, this is what we probably needed more than they needed tonight. Built-in social distancing, getting out of the house, big screen entertainment. But we wondered, what about the restrooms? We recommend that you hold yeah. it in. <laughs> what did you say? We recommend that you hold it in. <laughs> Perhaps the real heroine of the night, Faviola Fernandez, a dozen years with the company, who tidies up after every visitor. You want me to funny first? The two brothers at Four Brothers Drive-In told us they sold out that first night. What were you hearing as people started coming into the parking lot? Uh, just the excitement, uh, just seeing their faces, you know, lit up. They're, they're happy to be back here. When twilight came, the big screen lit up and the world and its problems faded away. In the cars and pickups, a mix of first-timers and regulars. The regular customers surely thinking, you just don't know what you've been missing. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability... Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America... And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour.
this is serious and it is time for people to take action to keep themselves safe. Governor Gretchen Whitmer overnight declaring a state of emergency after heavy rainfall ruptured two dams Tuesday in central Michigan, about 140 miles north of Detroit. Rising waters forcing the evacuation of nearly 10,000 people. Today, the Edenville and Sanford dams in Midland County breached. If you have a relative or a friend somewhere else in the state that you can go and stay with, please go to their homes. If you don't, go to one of the many shelters that have been set up. The evacuations following days of heavy rains in parts of the Midwest but also brought flooding to parts of Illinois, Ohio, and other states. Katrina Conley evacuated with her family to a hotel in Bay City, Michigan. We quickly packed our two dogs, a couple changes of clothes, and ourselves. We had to do what we had to do as far as finding a place to stay. Otherwise, we would be sleeping in our vehicles. The devastating flooding complicated by the coronavirus. Evacuate the area. Authorities working to get residents out of harm's way, leaving many heading to emergency shelters to balance their safety with social distancing. We're still under the like stay home, stay safe order, but then um, it also feels like get out, stay safe. So it's like this weird, um, really weird uh, conflict. So do the coronavirus rules still apply or like what? What's the right way to be responding? This morning, families living along two lakes and a river forced to flee from one of the worst flood disasters currently hitting mid-Michigan. We're going to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis, and we're going to help people get out. This morning, the tensions are escalating between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over the president's use of hydroxychloroquine. Pelosi is a sick woman. She's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental problems. I didn't know that he would be so sensitive. He's always talking about other people's avoir de poids, their weight, their pounds. The president firing back at Pelosi after she criticized his decision to take the anti-malaria drug to protect against coronavirus, with no evidence yet that it prevents COVID-19. I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientist, especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. Mr. Trump is increasingly on defense about his decision to take the drug, claiming it has been used by workers on the front lines of the pandemic. Many doctors are in favor of it. Many frontline workers won't go there unless they have the hydroxy. But the country's largest medical association says it is not aware of any data showing those workers are taking the drug. Okay. Former President Joe Biden slamming the president overnight, comparing this to the moment Mr. Trump questioned whether disinfectants could be a treatment, a statement the president later called sarcastic. It's like saying maybe if you injected Clorox into your blood, you know, it may cure you. Come on, man. What is he doing? What in God's name is he doing? The FDA has warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of a hospital setting due to a risk of serious heart problems and in some cases even death. And another study funded by the University of Virginia and the NIH, which uses data from patients at veterans medical centers, found more deaths among those treated with hydroxychloroquine than those treated with standard care. Researchers also reported finding no benefit to its use. The president taking aim. If you look at the one survey, the only bad survey, they were giving it to people that were in very bad shape. They were uh, very old, almost dead. It was a, a Trump enemy statement. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
everyone. I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's head over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Leoto. She has the very latest coronavirus headlines from NBCNews.com. Alexa, what's going on today? Hey, Allison, there's lots of news in this hour. First, all 50 states are now starting to reopen in some way or another as officials try to weigh the economic damage caused by coronavirus with public health concerns. That's the latest from NBC's Alexander Smith. Connecticut was the last state to still have a statewide stay-at-home order in place, but that expired today. Now the only area not relaxing lockdown restrictions quite yet is Washington, D.C., where the stay-at-home order expires on June 8th. Now, President Trump, in a series of tweets today, blasted Michigan and Nevada for expanding their mail-in voting ahead of upcoming elections. He went so far as threatening to withhold federal funding. Now, earlier this morning, the president falsely claimed Michigan was sending absentee ballots to its residents. Instead, Michigan's Secretary of State said all registered voters would be mailed applications for absentee ballots, not the actual absentee ballots themselves. Meanwhile, Nevada is planning an all-mail vote for its election, uh, for its state primary in June because of the pandemic. New York City's low-income neighborhoods are emerging as the hardest hit by coronavirus. That's from NBC's David Lee. 8,000 antibody tests were administered in the city, revealing an average of a 19.9 positive result and indicating the rate of infection. But several neighborhoods in the Bronx, Queens, and in Brooklyn had a rate of at least 35 percent. Governor Andrew Cuomo had this to say. It is going to be true in every community across this state and across this nation. You tell me the zip codes that have the predominantly minority community, lower income community, I will tell you the communities where you're going to have a higher positive and you're going to have increased spread and you're going to have increased hospitalization. The World Health Organization today announcing that more than 100,000 cases had been reported in the last 24 hours, indicating the largest ever daily increase in reported COVID-19 cases so far. The director general said that nearly two-thirds of those cases were reported by just four countries alone. He added, quote, we still have a long way to go in this pandemic. Now, from NBC's Sarah Miller, two studies published in the journal Science suggests evidence that a coronavirus infection could lead to immunity. In one of the studies, scientists used monkeys to see how their bodies responded to a natural infection. All nine of the monkeys exposed to to COVID-19 developed antibodies and had, quote, near complete protection when they were re-exposed after a month. More research is still ahead to determine whether these findings apply to humans, but promising signs nonetheless. And those are the latest headlines for this hour. We'll be back a little later with more as always. Allison, back to you. All right, Alexa, certainly a good sign indeed. And we look forward to seeing you again in about an hour. You can, of course, visit our live blog. It's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We will always have the very latest updates there. Dallas just reported a record number of coronavirus deaths a day after the governor announced plans to keep lifting restrictions across Texas. The Dallas area reported 14 more deaths on Tuesday. The total there now 191 with nearly 8000 positive cases. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joins me now from Dallas. And Priscilla, what are both state and local officials saying about these new numbers? Allison, we've spent the day here in Dallas County, and local officials have been, of course, encouraging folks to continue to wear those masks, but they're also asking people to stay inside if they can until the county sees that 14-day decline in terms of the number of positive cases. You mentioned they've seen around 200 to 250 cases each day for a while now, so they're hitting a plateau, but it's not yet hitting that decline that the federal government has recommended. Now, the governor here, for his part, has said that as long as hospitalizations remain low, he feels comfortable continuing to open up the economy here. But the local judge here says that it's about more than just those hospitalization numbers. Take a listen to what he told me. The challenge is not just to not overwhelm the hospital. The challenge also is to save human life and to uh, get the economy moving again in a sustainable way. Remember, it's not just what the governor says you can do, it's what you should do, but it's also what consumers will do. 
And Allison, that is the big question. What will people do? I can say we've spent the day here in the Bishop Arts District where we've seen a steady stream of folks coming out to grab food and also just walking through the neighborhood. And we haven't seen a whole lot of those masks. Yeah, you mentioned the part of Dallas where you are. It's home to a lot of businesses. How do people there feel about the state lifting its restrictions even further? I know you said you haven't seen a whole lot of masks today. Yeah, I mean, so we've spoken to more than or nearly a dozen folks out here today, and all of them said that they're concerned about the increased numbers that we're seeing here, mm -hmm. but they still still feel like this phased reopening is the right move. I actually spoke to one woman who was a grocery store clerk, and she tells me that she feels safer now that more businesses are open because for a while there, it felt like folks were just going to the grocery store to get that social interaction, and now they have more businesses where they can mm. go to and sort of have that feeling. Um, and I also spoke to a number of other folks who have basically said that the government has done all that they can do, but now it's really on businesses and individuals to sort of figure out what's next. Take a listen uh, to what some of those folks told me. Uh, the only thing that we can do at this point is take advantages of the opportunity to open that's been extended to us and try to do that in such a manner where people feel very safe and comfortable coming into the store. I mean, we do have to take our directives from the government, but also you run your own business. So you run it as you see fit. If you feel like, you know, you need to put a table in between, then you do that. But I think it's, it's just a juggling act between the both. And for the most part, folks do feel like these businesses are operating with the necessary safety protocols, but their bigger concern is the other individuals around them that may not be wearing those masks or practicing that social distancing that's going to be key to preventing this from spreading, Allison. Yeah. Priscilla, we know restaurants, gyms, and hair salons are allowed to be open, at least in some capacity in Texas. What would be part of the next phase of the state's reopening plan? Yeah, so the governor made that announcement this week, and he said that child care facilities could open immediately. But also this weekend, we're going to begin to see bars, bingo halls uh, also begin to reopen. Uh, and restaurants are going to be operating at 50 percent capacity. But those bars are going to look a little bit differently. They're trying to keep people seated at their tables, so not a whole lot of mingling. They're discouraging folks from trying to hit that dance floor in order to really keep folks separated with their groups that they came in with. And to prevent any of that possible virus transmission that could occur. All right, Priscilla Thompson in Dallas, thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. Beach going is a big business in Florida, and Memorial Day weekend usually draws big crowds. But will Floridians follow social distancing guidelines this holiday weekend? NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Delray Beach with a preview. Allison, good afternoon. I'm in Delray Beach today, standing on a stretch of sand that was closed until about two days ago. Parts of Florida now reopening their beaches with restrictions. If you look over my shoulder right here, you'll see some folks hanging out. Most of them are standing up and just walking along the beach. Swimming, walking, jogging, all of that is allowed. But when you see people sitting down, lying down in some cases on their towels, that is actually against the rules. It says no sunbathing and no surfing at the beach. One of the restrictions, and there are actually drones right now that are be, uh, being operated by the police that are coming down, looking aerially at what people are doing and warning them through loudspeaker if they're breaking the rules. Now, this is a little bit kind of a hopscotch situation because if you go a couple miles just in the other direction north of where I'm standing, it's Palm Beach County proper. There are no rules as to what you can and cannot do at the beach, generally speaking. So it depends where in Florida you are. Now, Miami-Dade and Broward County, they have huge metropolitan areas with Miami Beach and Fort Lauderdale. They have not reopened their beaches yet. They're not going to do that until after Memorial Day, knowing that there's going to be huge crowds in general, because, of course, it is one of the favorite holidays of this country. People want to be able to get outside and get back to the beach who have been stuck inside for so long. The other big news from down here today, Allison, is the business is opening. They opened in Palm Beach County, where I am, about a week and a half ago. But in Miami Beach, today marks the very first start of their staged reopen. 600-plus stores when it comes to Retail and grooming services are opening today. At least they have the ability to. And then next week, it's going to be the restaurants next Wednesday. So we're seeing parts of South Florida now that have been clamped up and shut down for so long, starting to reopen, whether that's beaches or stores or other sorts of businesses. 
But the one caveat to that, Allison, in Miami Beach, no hotels are open. So in an industry that has generated some $18 billion a year from visitors coming here, largely to see the beaches and stay at hotels, that is not an option still for the time being. I'm in Delray Beach. Allison, let me send it back to you. All 50 states are lifting their stay-at-home orders in some capacity today. Meanwhile, the CDC has quietly released its detailed guidelines for reopening. The 60-page document is similar to one the White House shelved last week for being too specific. It has guidance for reopening schools, mass transit, and non-essential businesses. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. And Dr. John, what's in this 60-page document? Give us the uh, Reader's Digest version, if you will. And Allison, this is a more specific document than what they released earlier, where the earlier guidelines were basically giving you basic principles on what you should be doing in order to open things up safely. This one goes into more details, and specifically it goes into details concerning contact tracing, looking at that 14-day decrease in numbers and what that means, even how to calculate the numbers of cases you have based on negatives and positive of the cases in the community. So it goes into a lot more detail for very specific groups, but it's not as detailed as the page that the White House said they couldn't put out. This is the one that's a little watered down, but not much. It's going to give people and organizations some mm-hmm. very good guidelines on what they need to do in order to get these things set up. And again, its main purpose is to say, hey, we know things are going to open up. Let's do it as safe as we can. And it even has recommendations on what to do if things start getting a little bit out of control in cases start going up again. Yeah. And the main thing, again, that contact tracing, that testing, those are the important parts, Allison. So having looked at those guidelines, Dr. John, and as we've reported, 50 states opening in some capacity today, based on that guidance, are these states ready to reopen? You know, Allison, some of the states are ready to open. Some of the states are not ready to open. But you can imagine the pressure on a governor saying these other states are opening. We need to open as well. So I think the main message here is even if your state is opening, you need to be very careful. And that means you need to do the social distancing. You need to listen to the authorities when they tell you that, hey, we're going to close certain things down. And that's one of the things they talked about in this guideline of at a certain point, they might have to close down certain venues in order to keep people safe. As people, as a community, we just need to understand that and listen to that because the main objective here is to make sure we're all safe. And if we waited till every state was prepared to open, it'd be a long while. And I don't think people would be able to um, tolerate that for much longer. Yeah. Dr. John, let's head across the pond, if you don't mind. An EU back study out today suggests a 50 days on, 30 days off lockdown strategy. C- could you explain what that is? And do you think something like that could actually work? You know, it was based on modeling. We've seen modeling in the past, Allison, where you know they've mm-hmm. given us these huge predictions. At one point, if you remember, they were talking about 2.2 million deaths, and, and then the model got watered down to 240,000 right. and 100,000. So models change constantly, and so that's what they're looking at here is the modeling and what that means for people. What they looked at is they said, okay, the, the optimum strategy, if we did three months of strict lockdown, nobody left their houses, that would get things under control very quickly, but they realized that people aren't going to tolerate that either. And so they said, well, let's look at different scenarios. Scenarios, and a scenario that proved best was a 50-day mitigation strategy where essentially they, over 50 days, they social distance, close schools, close large venues, those types of things that can keep people healthy. And then for 30 days, they opened it up again, only to close it down for 50 days again, open it up for 30 days. And this was a rolling measure they did over time until they got things under control with the idea being that people will be able to tolerate those mitigation strategies for 50 days, almost two months, and then the relaxation of those for a month and keep going back and forth. Uh, Of course, time will tell and patience will tell if people truly will be able to do that because once things open up, it's harder to get the genie back in the bottle, basically, and get people to go back to those mitigation strategies. Yeah, I was just thinking it's got to be really difficult once you let people go a little bit more freely, trying to reel them back in again. Uh, Dr. John, we also got some more vaccine news today, a study showing that monkeys can develop immunity to the coronavirus. What does that mean uh, for humans? You know, this is good news to a certain extent, and we've had some pretty good news mm-hmm. about vaccines, again, to a certain extent, that seem to be working in humans, seem to be working in monkeys. But the thing you have to remember is, number one, these are very preliminary studies on very small, small numbers of people. With the monkey vaccine, it's fantastic because their immune system is a lot like ours, but it's not exactly like ours. So this is a step mm-hmm. in the right direction. Okay. And it still looks like that time schedule of 12 to 18 months is probably realistic. And Allison, I think that's what we're looking at still. 
Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this on Monday. Uh, we had some other good news. Drug maker Moderna reporting positive results from a phase one vaccine study. Uh, but Dr. John, now scientists are questioning whether the company actually released enough data. What should our viewers know about this? study it was a phase one study and we only got partial results from the phase one and a lot of scientists are saying wait a minute usually we wait till we get all the results to make any mention of this but it's one of those things that's so much in the press and investors are looking at this so the company put out the information 45 patients were tested. They gave us the results on eight patients. And that's what a lot of scientists are saying. Wait, wait, we need the results on all 45 patients to make a good understanding of what happened because it's possible it worked on 45. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work on the other ones. So uh, again, you know, we have data. It's pretty decent data. It gives us some good information, but it doesn't give us all the information. And it's a very early trial still with a long ways to go. So again, we're making headway. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet, Allison. All right, Dr. John, always great to have you on. Thank you so much. You bet. The CDC put out its own report on coronavirus cases in the U.S., breaking down that data by race and ethnicity. In it, CDC Director Robert Redfield acknowledged a, quote, disproportionate burden of COVID-19 illness and death among racial and ethnic minority groups. That entire report, though, just four pages. NBC News correspondent Jeff Bennett joining us now. And Jeff, walk us through this report, if you will. It's just four pages long. Does it offer much detail? Uh, not really, Allison. And look, the CDC, the Trump yeah. administration, is required by Congress to present uh, disaggregated COVID-19 data. So to present the data specific to race and, and ethnicity. And we know across the country, the, sa the story is the same. It's the same slow rolling tragedy in Philadelphia, New York, Milwaukee, Chicago, New Orleans. In right. all of those communities, Communities of color have a higher incidence of COVID-19. There's a higher incidence, higher rate of hospitalization, and a higher rate of death. There are, are a few reasons for that. One is that black and brown folks tend to be overrepresented in groups of essential workers, frontline workers. It's also true that the legacy of systemic inequity is that uh, communities of color have higher levels right. of those comorbidities, those underlying uh, uh, diseases that make COVID-19 particularly deadly. And the reason we know that there are higher rates in these major cities in, in, in certain states is because of local data. Right now, there is no national data broken out by race and ethnicity the same way it's broken out by age, gender, and location. And that's the thing that public health experts, that policymakers have been clamoring for since really February. And now here we are, May going into June, and the federal government still doesn't have it. Jeff, you mentioned Congress required this report from the CDC. Uh, what kind of a reaction is it getting on Capitol Hill so far? Well, congressional Democrats, to say the least, are unimpressed. Uh, Patty Murray, who is the senator yeah. who leads one of the relevant committees, she said that what Congress required was a comprehensive report on health disparities related to the COVID-19 pandemic. What we got from President Trump, in her words, was a lazy four-page copy and paste project that links to a handful of limited previously available data sets. Frank Pallone, the congressman who, who heads a different committee in the House side, he says much of the same. He says, we know that, that communities of color bear a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 illness and death. Uh, he says, but the administration fails to offer new or original information and data. And so this report that the CDC offered, the compilation of links, it linked to information that was already on its website. There is no new information no new data, nothing of, of use that can be used in a new way by public health yeah. experts to really pinpoint the problem, target it, and address it, Allison. Yeah, Jeff, let's talk about that a little bit more, uh, because uh, this is this is important data. And the more detailed the data is, the more it can help those public officials better serve their communities. Uh, you know, what kind of what kind of things can they then do? How important is it to have more specific information so they can make some changes? Well, as one public health expert I spoke to in Maryland put it, he said, without this information, communities are flying colorblind. And he says, you have to take those color blinds off to know how to you know, target public yeah. health messages, how to do specific interventions. If you know, and I'm in Northwest Washington, DC right now, if you know that there's an outbreak mm -hmm. in Northwest Washington, DC among a certain group of people, then that really informs how you address it, how you roll out testing, 
uh, you know, what churches or barbershops you might go to uh, to get the word out. But without any of that information, what you have are public health officials and, and state and city leaders guessing. Uh, and that really is not something that they can do right now, given the fact that you have thousands upon thousands right. of people dying each day. And as we mentioned, those deaths and those, and those cases are overrepresented in, in black and brown communities. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, before you go, uh, I'd like to ask you about something else going on in our nation's capital. The president's threat to withhold funding to the state of Michigan if it keeps expanding its vote by mail efforts. Michigan's secretary of state responded to President Trump earlier on MSNBC. Here's that clip. Well, every Michigan citizen has a right to vote by mail. It's a right that was enshrined in our state constitution by our voters in November of 2018. And so I have a responsibility as the chief election officer for the state of Michigan to ensure everyone knows how to exercise the right to vote. What's going on here, Jeff? Well, a couple of things. The tweet that President Trump sent out about Michigan and Nevada, both are factually inaccurate from out applications, voter applications, which is a very different thing. The president said he's thinking about cutting federal funding for these states. Constitutionally, it's not clear that he can do that. There are also political questions about why he's picking a fight in Michigan, a state that he would need to keep and, and win in 2020 if he wants to uh, you know, retain his position uh, in the White House. What we know yeah. is that this is one of the issues that President Trump likes to talk about when he tries to rally his base, this notion uh, that there are people who would try to, you know, mis mis misrepresent themselves and, and commit all sorts of acts of voter fraud at the polls when there is no information, there's no evidence to back that up. Remember when the president was elected, he said he was going to stand up this voter fraud commission. The commission, such that it existed, found no evidence of, of voter fraud. So this is something that the president likes to talk about, even though it is divorced entirely from the facts, Allison. All right, Jeff Bennett in D.C., thank you so much. Always great to see you. You too. Two dam breaches in Michigan have forced some 10,000 people to evacuate. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer declaring a state of emergency in Midland County, saying that nearby communities could be under nine feet of water. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is live from Midland. And Kathy, what's happening there? Allison, good afternoon to you. So we are in Midland, Michigan, which is about two hours outside of Detroit. And behind me is the Titawasabi River. And uh, you can see it has uh, overflowed and it's because of several inches of rain that has come over the past couple of days and has led to the significant flooding behind me. Two dams, as you mentioned, has failed. Also, the governor issued an evacuation order last night. 10,000 people in the community of Midland were told to evacuate. And a lot of those people have heeded those warnings. And we were just at a local high school just a few minutes from here. That is just one of the many shelters that is now open to the public for those evacuees who need a place to, to shelter while the water continues to recede. But right now, that's not the case. The water continues to rise. We are told that is supposed to crest later on this evening and hit the 38 feet mark. And if that's a case, that would be historic because back wow. in 1986, that is the last time that the river reached just 33.9 feet. So we're talking about several more feet of, of uh, water because of the, the inundation that the community has seen in just the past two days. Kathy, it's just unbelievable what's going on there in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, if you could tell us uh, what you know about the challenge that emergency responders were dealing with, I mean, trying to get 10,000 people to evacuate so quickly. Yeah, I mean, there are dual emergencies going on right now. We are dealing with the ongoing crisis of the coronavirus. So people are hunkered in place at those shelters and, and social distancing. Um, they're wearing their masks. Um, but that is a big concern because they feel like they're putting their, their health at risk, being surrounded by so many other evacuees. So you have that one crisis. And then the other crisis, of course, is the flooding. So thousands of people have left their homes, a lot of them in the community of Sanford. It's, we're told that it's a smaller community, uh, several hundred people. Uh, but they had to evacuate. And a lot of those people have been impacted because 
of the flooding there. So you have two emergencies. It continues to go on and it really is a difficult situation out here, Allison. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, Kathy Park in, in Midland County, Michigan, thank you so very much. And please stay safe out there. Yep. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. More news in the Michael Flynn saga. The former national security advisor wants to force the judge in his criminal case to drop it. He has asked a federal appeals court for an order to do just that. NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams joining me now from Washington. Pete, earlier this month, the Justice Department filed a motion to dismiss this case. So what is this order now all about? Well, the judge hasn't done it yet. And what the Justice Department said is, yeah. <laughs> look, Judge Sullivan, you don't really have any discretion here. You just have to rubber stamp what we filed because we're the prosecutors. That's an executive branch function, and you can't tell us what to do. Uh, but the judge hasn't done that yet. So, in, in fact, he's done just the opposite. He appointed a retired federal judge to come in and argue why the Justice Department is wrong in its analysis. Remember, what the Justice Department said was, Yes, it may be true that when Michael Flynn was questioned shortly after Trump was inaugurated and he was national security advisor about his uh, discussions with the Russian ambassador to the U.S., it, it may be that he lied, but his lies weren't a crime because they weren't material to any open investigation. So for that reason, the Justice Department said, there's no crime here and we're going home, there's no case. Uh, what the judge has done is, is appoint this retired federal judge to come in and argue, no, the Justice Department is wrong about that. And the judge has also said he wants this retired judge to argue whether Flynn should instead be prosecuted for contempt of court, for saying uh, he pleaded guilty and now saying, I didn't do anything wrong, I shouldn't plead guilty, I want to withdraw my plea. So what Flynn's lawyers have said to the Court of Appeals here is, hey, the judge can't do this, make him stop. And the Court of Appeals hasn't acted on that yet. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly at this point what's going on because the judge has gone ahead and set a <laughs> schedule for uh, this uh, retired judge to, to submit legal briefs. And he's called for oral argument in early July on this case. Uh, so briefing all during June. So he's in no hurry to act on this. Um, it does seem at this point premature to ask the Court of Appeals to act to, to uh, this, this is what's mm -hmm. called a writ of mandamus, because the judge hasn't done anything for them to stop yet. He hasn't, he hasn't denied the government's motion. 
If he did that, then I could see Flynn's lawyers doing what they've done. But in any event, they're saying to the Court of Appeals, hey, get, make the judge knock this off. Make him grant the Justice Department's motion to dismiss so we can all go home. Pete, I would normally uh, wrap up a conversation with you by asking you what you think is next, but it sounds like from what you said, it's just not entirely clear. Right. And, and you know, it, so for now, n normally when somebody appeals something to a court of appeals, it takes the case out of the hands of the district judge. That's not the case here because this mm -hmm. isn't an appeal. A writ of mandamus is something different. So the case is still in Emmett yeah. Sullivan's hands. He's the district judge. So I can tell you what's going to happen next. Right now, he is calling for this retired judge to submit his briefs. He's saying he'll entertain other friend of court briefs from other parties. And we know that they are all okay. at the starting gates ready to go. There's a group of state attorneys, a Republican state attorney general, who are going to weigh in on the Justice Department side. There's a group of retired uh, uh, Justice Department lawyers who are going to weigh in on the other side. So th there's going to be a, a lot of action here, uh, I would guess, in the next several weeks. I don't think this case is going to go away anytime soon. And so the Flynn saga continues. Pete Williams, thank you so right. much. You bet. The coronavirus outbreak in Brazil is so bad that President Trump is considering a travel ban. The country just had its deadliest day on record with more than a thousand people dying of COVID-19 yesterday. NBC News chief global correspondent Bill Neely spoke with the governor of Brazil's largest city about this ongoing battle. We have two different positions right now in Brazil. The positions of the governors in favor to the quarantine, in favor to the social distance, in favor to the isolation, and the president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, against that. I'm very sad as a Brazilian, uh, as a governor of Sao Paulo State, to fight against the virus and against the bad orientation and the wrong orientation of the president of Brazil. Bill Neely joins us now from Sao Paulo. And uh, Bill, tell us more, if you will, about this tension between the local and the federal governments there in Brazil. Yes, Alison, you can call it tension. You could even call it anger, because the other thing the governor said to me is that there yeah. are two viruses in Brazil, coronavirus and Bolsonaro virus, referring to the president. Yes, I mean, the basic problem is that the president has one position, which is uh, coronavirus is just like a cold. Uh, the lockdown is unnecessary. You don't need to social distance. Get, out, get back to work. Get out on the street. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, and he was at a rally at the weekend hugging his supporters. He did wear a mask, which was unusual. But basically, he's tried to downplay the virus right from the beginning. And the governors and many mayors who want lockdowns, who want social distancing. So, you know, people are listening to two different messages. And it's almost... Yeah. Like in the United States, it's almost like if you support President Trump, you're going to do what he says. If you don't like President Trump, you're going to listen to Governor Cuomo. So the two country situations do mirror themselves to some degree. But Brazil, look, it's a huge crisis. As you said, a record number of deaths in the last 24 hours. The coronavirus is now spreading more quickly here than anywhere on Earth. And that crisis simply made worse by the as you say, the divisions at the very top of government and the lack of a, a clear strategy, Alison. Bill, what are residents there saying about that mixed messaging? It just has to be incredibly confusing for all of them. Yes, and, you know, a quarter of Brazil's population live in dire poverty. In this city, millions live in favelas, overcrowded slums where access to running water, never mind soap, is an absolute luxury. So that they do want some guidance from the top. They also have a problem that they need money. So they need to go out to work. They need to earn money to feed their families. So they're, they're caught in the middle and they don't know who to listen to, really. So they go out to earn money to survive. And many of them, sadly, catch coronavirus and die. We were at uh, Brazil's biggest cemetery this morning. There are dozens of burials there every day. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of open graves at that cemetery 
waiting for the next day's deaths to arrive and to be buried. So it's a desperate situation for people here and really no guidance, no clear strategy from the top. Bill, we know President Trump's considering a travel ban on Brazil. What else do you know about that potential ban? Yeah, well, he said this at the, uh, at the White House yesterday. He said, uh, you know, Brazil was, as he put it, uh, having problems. He said Brazil was aiming for herd immunity. By the way, there is absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. So he said we're considering a travel ban on people from Brazil. Uh, and he talked about the governor of Florida uh, because the majority of people from Brazil come in there. Around two million people a year uh, at least come from Brazil to the United States. So this would be uh, quite a thing. But look, he's looking at the numbers. And right now, Brazil, uh, yesterday, for example, in, in deaths, Brazil was just below the United States as number two. In terms of overall cases, it's number three in the world now. Uh, but the official figures, uh, I think, hide something else. Uh, testing here is almost non-existent in many places. It's got one of the worst testing records in the world. So a doctor this morning told me that he believes the real rate of cases is 15 times higher than the official numbers. So it's those kinds of numbers that the CDC is looking at, that President Trump is looking at, and therefore, as you say, considering a travel ban from Brazil. All right, Bill Neely, thank you so much. What do classrooms in South Korea look like now after nearly three months without students or teachers? NBC News correspondent Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul to show us their new normal. Well, the South Korean government is being really cautious about this. They're bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages according to age groups. And they actually had to close some schools today shortly after opening because two students tested positive. But the vast majority of high school seniors did go back to school today and they experienced a different kind of first day at school. They were greeted in many cases by staff with thermometers, taking temperatures, handing out masks and hand sanitizer. Masks are now mandatory at schools unless, of course, you're eating in the cafeteria. But even that has changed. In some schools, uh, school lunch times have been sta staggered, so there are fewer people in the cafeteria. There are plastic partitions in some cafeterias and classrooms and desks, of course, spaced apart to observe social distancing. Also, rules about what happens if a, a student comes down with a fever. They're told to report it immediately and get evaluated. At some schools, some private schools, they also brought back young kids, preschool and kindergartners. Take a listen. Knowing how Korea has handled it, knowing how important um, and actually significant protocols like mask wearing and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, etc. And knowing that those do have a really big effect on um, halting the spread of the virus, I think, makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. The government and health officials really are still on high alert here, watching for clusters. In fact, they're just now investigating a possible cluster at one of the country's biggest hospitals, where four nurses have tested positive for COVID-19. Allison. Delayed symptoms, longer recovery, new clusters of the coronavirus are popping up in parts of China, and the virus is behaving differently this time around. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Frere explains the changes that doctors are seeing. Allison, in a lot of ways, China is getting back on track. The economy is coming back to life. Most kids will be back in school by the end of the month. But China is not out of the woods just yet. There are cities along the northern border with Russia that are completely locked down right now. And the worrying part is that Chinese experts who are there say the virus is somehow 
different. They say it's taking longer for symptoms to show. It's taking longer for people who are infected to recover. Doctors say they're seeing more damage to lungs as opposed to heart and kidney damage uh, that they saw in patients in Wuhan, where they continue to test every single person in the city. 11 million people are going to be tested in Wuhan. They're about halfway done right now. China has been moving pretty aggressively to stem any spread of the virus, especially before the big political meetings being held in Beijing. They start tomorrow. The National People's Congress is largely a ceremonial thing. They rubber stamp stuff. They give the party's outlook for the economy and development. It was supposed to be held in March, but it was postponed because it was the height of the outbreak here. And that had never happened before. Normally, it's a chance to get a read on what the leadership is thinking. This time, it, that it's going ahead is important for optics, that China is confident in its stability right now. And consider the issues. The global economy is stalled. Millions around the world have lost jobs, including here. And the U.S.-China relationship is probably at its worst point ever as the Trump administration continues to blame China for the pandemic. China has a pretty advanced system of detection and testing in place here, but authorities are still struggling to contain the virus. There are still restrictions in place in places like Beijing. The borders are still closed to foreigners, and daily life is ruled by temperature checks and health codes. Scientists also admit that they still don't know what they're looking for in terms of these changes in the behavior of the virus and the cases in the north, uh, but it is keeping this risk of a second wave very much alive here. Allison. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. By the end of the week, dentists in 40 states will be allowed to see non-emergency patients again. Today, dentists in Connecticut are telling people to open wide. MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jansing shows us the safety precautions they're taking. Yeah. Connecticut orthodontist Dr. Gary Open is back in business, fully reopening his office today. We do have quite a backlog. We have been closed for six weeks. The new normal means keeping patients safe in the age of COVID. We are wearing higher level masks, N95s. We are wearing face shields also, and we're wearing disposable gowns. He's overhauled his office, investing in a new air filtration system, significantly reducing the number of patients he'll see each day and revamping waiting room procedures. Their temperature will be checked. Once everything is deemed okay, we will escort the patient to the chair where we'll be working. 
Dental practices are by nature invasive, and preliminary research suggests the coronavirus survives airborne for hours. That's why some industry insiders like hygienist Megan Zadrowski worry dental offices are reopening before it's safe. Aerosols generated in the dental office are unavoidable, whether it's by dentist drills, whether it's by hygienist instruments, or even the patients themselves who may need to cough. The American Dental Association has issued national guidelines, including hygienists using hand tools instead of automated devices and limiting drills, suggestions that Zadrowski worries not all dentists will follow. Would you go to a dentist right now for a non-emergent problem? I would absolutely avoid going to the dental office with a non-emergent service. A recent national survey by the American Dental Association found three in 10 dentist offices didn't have any supply of N95 masks and nearly 18% had no face shields. Connecticut dentist Dr. David Fantarella says it has been a challenge. We do have what we need, it has not been easy. He's invested beyond the guidelines, including a fogger to clean rooms and a mobile UVC unit to reduce pathogens. You understand why people are nervous? For sure, I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm also nervous on the flip side of that. If we don't do anything, what about that patient? That they get really sick. That they get really sick. All dentists facing the new reality that being afraid of the dentist means something different now. I wanted to make sure my child was safe and comfortable in a setting outside the home. What are you looking forward to most when all this is uh, over? Well, getting my teeth straight, definitely. The challenge of reopening a business when it's anything but business as usual. And Chris Jansen joins me now. Chris, let's talk for a minute about the economics here. I mean, this is an, an industry that's taken quite a hit, and it is not cheap to put all of this these new safety procedures in place. Uh, what kind of challenges are they dealing with there? Yeah, you're right about that. Not cheap at all. And the couple of practices that we went to in Connecticut, they are both longstanding. They've been in operation for decades. They're successful practice practices. If you're a smaller practice, if you're a rural practice, if you're a new practice, first of all, there is the financial consideration, right? The second part of this really, I think there is a comparison to be made to remember how difficult it was for so many hospitals and still is with to to get that bottom line where they want it to be, given that they're not doing elective surgeries. They're not doing any kind of electric right. uh, elective office calls. So that's the other issue. And there was a survey that was just done, Allison. 46% of dentists said that if they aren't back up and operating by the end of August, they're not sure that they can stay open. And often the big concern is Those will be the practices in rural areas, already underserved areas, places where people don't have other options. So that's why the ADA is keeping an eye on all of this to see how this rollout works, what are sort of the red flags and how they can help some of these practices that aren't open yet reopen safely. And Chris, how about the patients? I never thought I'd say this, but last week I said to my husband, I'm dying for a a teeth cleaning. It would feel so great. I know so (laughs) many people are skittish about going to the dentist to begin with. Uh, Is there a concern that may be even worse now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a very different kind of concern, right? Uh, I think a lot of the concerns that people had a decade, two decades ago, simply about pain, the fear, the noise of the drill, uh, there have been technological advances that have calmed a lot of those fears. But for the average person, when you're told, don't even go out of the house, and now you're being told, hey, you can go have your teeth cleaned, and like you were just saying, you feel like, my gosh, I really want to have this done. There are several things you really should think about doing. First of all, call your dentist. These offices are already getting the calls. They're ready for them. You should ask them what kind of PPE are they wearing? What kind of air filtration system do they have? That was the number one concern for the hygienist. Do you have the right kind of air filtration yeah. system? And then you have to ask a personal question. It's, it's really about Is this necessary? Do I feel comfortable? If you don't feel comfortable and it's not an emergency, there's no reason right now not to stay home. Allison? Chris, great questions to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
President Trump's feud with the World Health Organization is heating up. He threatened to permanently cut off U.S. funding unless the WHO commits to, quote, major substantive improvements in the next 30 days. Today, the head of the organization's emergency program urged people to stay away from the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, which President Trump is taking. At this stage, uh, hydroxychloroquine, nor chloroquine have been as yet found to be effective <clears throat> in the treatment uh, of COVID-19 or in the prophylaxis against uh, uh, coming down with the disease. Um, in fact, the opposite uh, in, in that uh, warnings have been issued by many authorities regarding the potential side effects of the drug. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons joining me now from London. Keir, the WHO director general started his briefing by thanking member nations, leaving the U.S. off that list. What is the organization saying or, or not saying, I guess, about Trump's letter? <laughs> well, Dr. Tedros has had a rough time in recent months uh, at the hands of uh, President Trump. Dr. Tedros, of course, is the director general of the World Health Organization. I mean, this is the letter that President Trump wrote to him questioning uh, the World Health Organization's relationship with China. Uh, it ha raises some important questions. It raises some good questions, Alison. So, for example, it asks about the relationship, the role of Taiwan. Now, of course, you'll know that Taiwan is considered by China to be part of one China. And China has resisted again and again, mm -hmm. including during this assembly over the past few days, for Taiwan to be involved in the World, World Health Organization. There are many who think if Taiwan had had a voice, it would have raised concerns about the coronavirus earlier. President Trump makes that point. So it's a good point. But there are lots of other issues, uh, claims in here and accusations that just don't stand up. So, for example, he accuses the leader of the World Health Organization of praising China for its transparency. President Trump himself earlier this year praised China for its transparency. And another issue which is going to really uh, make it challenging for America's allies around the world is this letter gives uh, the World Health Organization 30 days, Alison, uh, to come up with a, a plan uh, to do things differently and not be so china orientated. Uh, but it doesn't really give any proposals on how to do that. So it's very difficult. If America did uh, leave the World Health Organization, uh, it would be very difficult for our allies to, to, to follow. Uh, and, and it would therefore be a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty difficult diplomatic position, frankly. How are the other member nations responding? What kind of reaction are, are they giving? Well, it's just another example on the world stage of major yeah. countries around the world, nations that consider themselves to be allies of the United States, really just having to kind of take leadership. So what we saw on Monday at the beginning of this this summit that's been described as perhaps the most important in the history of the World Health Organization, we saw yeah. Angela Merkel of Germany, Macron of France speak uh, to the assembly. We saw President Xi of China speak to the assembly. Who we didn't see, we didn't see President Trump. Instead, you saw the Health and Human Services Secretary leading the American delegation. The thing is, though, Trump could have spoken. He could have said all the things that he said in this letter at that forum and also did some other things, you know, kind of stand behind other allies. And he didn't do that. And many people think that that was a lost diplomatic opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Keir Simmons in London, thanks so much for being with us. You bet. Department stores hoping to woo back customers as they reopen their doors. Retail sales plunged a record 16 percent in April. So will those shoppers come back and, and what will the in-store shopping experience be like when they do? NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta uh, taking an NBC exclusive look inside Macy's to show us reopening what reopening looks like for the country uh, company. Rather, Blaine, what is Macy's plan specifically? What are the new safety measures uh, that they're putting in place in store. 
Allison, it's going to certainly look different. You know, when you walk into Macy's, uh, one big thing that people yeah. usually go inside for uh, is the makeup counter. I know that you've done it. I'm sure that it, a lot of people have done it. You go inside, yep. <laughs> you want to try on makeup, try on lipstick. Of course, given everything that's going on right now, that's not a possibility. So that was my biggest question. I actually stopped by a makeup counter and had what will be kind of the new demo uh, for makeup counters. So instead of kind of putting foundation on your face, they have these pads that actually have a face drawn onto them and they take, you know, essentially oh, wow. what the, the, the uh, person is going to do is going to eyeball you. She says, you know what, if you're looking for foundation, I'm going to eyeball you, see maybe two or three shades that might work for you. And then she's going to put them down on this pad the way that she would apply them to your face. So not only are you going to see what it looks like, but you're also going to kind of see how to do it. And she actually demonstrated for me taking a Q-tip, spreading that product on the paper. It's certainly not what we are used to at all, but this is what they're doing to get back up and running. You know, there are plenty of safety measures that they're talking about, things that we've seen in stores all over. So employees required to wear masks. We're talking about plexiglass around cash registers, social distancing, of course, but the things that are unique to department stores, like trying on clothes. So I asked, can we still go in and try on a dress or a pair of pants? They said yes, but once you decide that maybe you're not going to purchase that item, it goes on a special rack, and that is then put away for at least 24 hours. It's kept off the floor, off the public racks, and then it's slowly kind of rotated back into service. So that's what happens when you try on. The same thing, Allison, happens when you uh, return items, if you do decide to return something to the stores. Okay. So different, Blaine, all of those things. Uh, you mentioned some of the safety uh, measures in place for the employees. What else do we know about the employees who are coming back to work? What can you tell us about them uh, and their safety concerns here? Well, we do know that Macy's, just like many other retail places, have really been hit hard by this pandemic, right? So we know that Macy's Incorporated had to furlough many of its 130,000 employees. So a lot of them are going to be coming back to work, uh, certainly, you know, looking forward to getting back to work and kind of welcoming customers back into the stores. But there were a number of people who continued to work during this pandemic because Macy's was focused on digital sales. You know, we know that one of the stores, some of the stores kind of remained up and running in terms of getting that product out, shipping them to people who were ordering on online. But with the stores opening now, we know that employees are, again, required to wear masks. They're coming in. They have plexiglass around the cash registers. And we're also seeing kind of staggered shifts and staggered openings as well. So you're not seeing as many people in there at the same time. I do have to say that we went in there. Our crew, our small crew went in there before the store opened this morning and people were very much spread out. And when you kind of see, you know, you get ready for a sales floor to open, you may see more than one person mm -hmm. in a section folding places or, or straightening things up. We we only saw one person per area, so it certainly looked like there was a great deal of distancing going on as much as could be done uh, on the sales floor. Allison. Blaine, it is certainly going to be very different shopping in stores again. Thanks for giving us a glimpse of the new normal. An Idaho casino isn't gambling with its guest safety. If you want to hit the slots, you will have to wear a mask. Here's a look at how it's operating during the pandemic. You know, we were concerned with the virus, concerned the well-being of our customers' employees, but gaming has been essential to our livelihood. I just hope that we don't have an outbreak because, you know, the decisions that we made were, were really difficult and we realized that, that it could be a life or death situation. We opened March 20th, 1993, so it's kind of ironic that we closed March 20th, 2020. <laughs> When the Coeur d'Alene Casino Resort Hotel in Idaho was forced to close in March, its owners immediately began to think about what it would take to reopen. So originally we thought we were going to be closed for two weeks, and um, it ended up being over a month of paying our wage, the wages and benefits of the casino and tribal employees, millions of dollars. And it got to be, you know, very concerned, you know, we're really dipping into our reserves. And um, that really just, you know, put more emphasis as far as the importance of opening our doors. The casino finally did reopen on April 27th. And since then, its operations have looked very different. Guests have their temperatures taken, restaurants are at one-fourth their capacity, and yellow tape markings keep people six feet apart. First day back, it was a lot of wiping down, a lot of disinfecting, um, constant. The shutdown, the cleaning from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. We have every other machine turned off, and we have on order some plexiglass to put between the machines, each machine, and we have had a few people removed. 
because they refused to wear their mask. The casino is owned and operated by the Coeur d'Alene tribe, who felt the economic pressures to reopen. Last year, the casino generated tens of millions of dollars in revenue. We employ a lot of members of the tribe and also other tribes. Everything, all the dollars, and that's our biggest cash cow, comes from the casino. So our police department, our senior uh, program, our youth programs, um, everything is supplemented by that casino. As of May 19th, 82 of the country's nearly 1,000 casinos have begun operating again, most of them owned by tribes. And as more move toward reopening, Coeur d'Alene offers a glimpse into what that might look like for other casinos around the country. Still, Stengar says she's not sure how the pandemic is going to affect business in the long run. The stimulus checks are out, and I think, you know, taxes were out, so we're kind of riding on that. Um, I am concerned with the economy in that it's going to level out, and with no um, tourists coming in, with the Canadian market being closed, a little concerned about that. Gaming has just been, it's been our livelihood, and so we are trying to uh, make up for lost revenue and continue to provide for our tribe. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's head over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Leoto. She has the very latest coronavirus headlines from NBCNews.com. Alexa, what's going on today? Hey, Allison, there's lots of news in this hour. First, all 50 states are now starting to reopen in some way or another as officials try to weigh the economic damage caused by coronavirus with public health concerns. That's the latest from NBC's Alexander Smith. Connecticut was the last state to still have a statewide stay-at-home order in place, but that expired today. Now the only area not relaxing lockdown restrictions quite yet is Washington, D.C., where the stay-at-home order expires on June 8th. Now, President Trump, in a series of tweets today, blasted Michigan and Nevada for expanding their mail-in voting ahead of upcoming elections. He went so far as threatening to withhold federal funding. Now, earlier this morning, the president falsely claimed Michigan was sending absentee ballots to its residents. Instead, Michigan's Secretary of State said all registered voters would be mailed applications for absentee ballots, not the actual absentee ballots themselves. Meanwhile, Nevada is planning an all-mail vote for its election, uh, for its state primary in June because of the pandemic. New York City's low-income neighborhoods are emerging as the hardest hit by coronavirus. That's from NBC's David Lee. 8,000 antibody tests were administered in the city, revealing an average of a 19.9 positive result and indicating the rate of infection. But several neighborhoods in the Bronx, Queens, and in Brooklyn had a rate of at least 35 percent. Governor Andrew Cuomo had this to say. It is going to be true in every community across this state and across this nation. You tell me the zip codes that have the predominantly minority community, lower income community, I will tell you the communities where you're going to have a higher positive and you're going to have increased spread and you're going to have increased hospitalization. The World Health Organization today announcing that more than 100,000 cases had been reported in the last 24 hours, indicating the largest ever daily increase in reported COVID-19 cases so far. The director general said that nearly two thirds of those cases were reported by just four countries alone. He added, quote, we still have a long way to go in this pandemic. Now from NBC's Sarah Miller, two studies published in the journal Science suggests evidence that a coronavirus infection could lead to immunity. In one of the studies, scientists used monkeys to see how their bodies responded to a natural infection. All nine of the monkeys exposed to, exposed to COVID-19 developed antibodies and had, quote, near complete protection when they were re-exposed after a month. More research is still ahead to determine whether these findings apply to humans, but promising signs nonetheless. And those are the latest headlines for this hour. We'll be back a little later with more as always. Allison, back to you. All right, Alexa, certainly a good sign indeed. And we look forward to seeing you again in about an hour. You can, of course, visit our live blog. It's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We will always have the very latest updates there. 
Dallas just reported a record number of coronavirus deaths a day after the governor announced plans to keep lifting restrictions across Texas. The Dallas area reported 14 more deaths on Tuesday. The total there now 191 with nearly 8,000 positive cases. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joins me now from Dallas. And Priscilla, what are both state and local officials saying about these new numbers? Allison, we've spent the day here in Dallas County, and local officials have been, of course, encouraging folks to continue to wear those masks, but they're also asking people to stay inside if they can until the county sees that 14-day decline in terms of the number of positive cases. You mentioned they've seen around 200 to 250 cases each day for a while now, so they're hitting a plateau, but it's not yet hitting that decline that the federal government has recommended. Now, the governor here, for his part, has said that as long as hospitalizations remain low, he feels comfortable continuing to open up the economy here. But the local judge here says that it's about more than just those hospitalization numbers. Take a listen to what he told me. The challenge is not just to not overwhelm the hospital. The challenge also is to save human life and to uh, get the economy moving again in a sustainable way. Remember, it's not just what the governor says you can do, it's what you should do, but it's also what consumers will do. And Allison, that is the big question. What will people do? I can say we've spent the day here in the Bishop Arts District where we've seen a steady stream of folks coming out to grab food and also just walking through the neighborhood. And we haven't seen a whole lot of those masks. Yeah, you mentioned the part of Dallas where you are. It's home to a lot of businesses. How do people there feel about the state lifting its restrictions even further? I know you said you haven't seen a whole lot of masks today. Yeah, I mean, so we've spoken to more than or nearly a dozen folks out here today, and all of them said that they're concerned about the increased numbers that we're seeing here, Mm -hmm. but they still still feel like this phased reopening is the right move. I actually spoke to one woman who was a grocery store clerk, and she tells me that she feels safer now that more businesses are open because for a while there, it felt like folks were just going to the grocery store to get that social interaction, and now they have more businesses where they can Mm. go to and sort of have that feeling. Um, And I also spoke to a number of other folks who have basically said that the government has done all that they can do, but now it's really on businesses and individuals to sort of figure out what's next. Take a listen uh, to what some of those folks told me. Uh, The only thing that we can do at this point is take advantages of the opportunity to open that's been extended to us and try to do that in such a manner where people feel very safe and comfortable coming into the store. I mean, we do have to take our directives from the government, but also you run your own business. So you run it as you see fit. If you feel like, you know, you need to put a table in between, then you do that. But I think it's it's just a juggling act between the both. And for the most part, folks do feel like these businesses are operating with the necessary safety protocols. But their bigger concern is the other individuals around them that may not be wearing those masks or practicing that social distancing that's going to be key to preventing this from spreading, Allison. Yeah. Priscilla, we know restaurants, gyms and hair salons are allowed to be open, at least in some capacity in Texas. What would be part of the next phase of the state's reopening plan? Yeah, so the governor made that announcement this week, and he said that child care facilities could open immediately. But also this weekend, we're going to begin to see bars, bingo halls uh, also begin to reopen. uh, And restaurants are going to be operating at 50 percent capacity. But those bars are going to look a little bit differently. They're trying to keep people seated at their tables, so not a whole lot of mingling. They're discouraging folks from trying to hit that dance floor in order to really keep folks separated with their groups that they came in with and to prevent any of that possible virus transmission that could occur. All right, Priscilla Thompson in Dallas, thank you so much. Beach going is a big business in Florida, and Memorial Day weekend usually draws big crowds. But will Floridians follow social distancing guidelines this holiday weekend? NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Delray Beach with a preview. Allison, good afternoon. I'm in Delray Beach today, standing on a stretch of sand that was closed until about two days ago. 
Parts of Florida now reopening their beaches with restrictions. If you look over my shoulder right here, you'll see some folks hanging out. Most of them are standing up and just walking along the beach. Swimming, walking, jogging, all of that is allowed. But when you see people sitting down, lying down in some cases on their towels, that is actually against the rules. It says no sunbathing and no surfing at the beach. One of the restrictions, and there are actually drones right now that are be, uh, being operated by the police that are coming down, looking aerially at what people are doing and warning them through loudspeaker if they're breaking the rules. Now, this is a little bit kind of a hopscotch situation because if you go a couple miles just in the other direction north of where I'm standing, it's Palm Beach County proper. There are no rules as to what you can and cannot do at the beach, generally speaking. So it depends where in Florida you are. Now, Miami-Dade and Broward County, they have huge metropolitan areas with Miami Beach and Fort Lauderdale. They have not reopened their beaches yet. They're not going to do that until after Memorial Day, knowing that there's going to be huge crowds in general, because, of course, it is one of the favorite holidays of this country. People want to be able to get outside and get back to the beach who have been stuck inside for so long. The other big news from down here today, Allison, is the businesses opening. They opened in Palm Beach County, where I am, about a week and a half ago. But in Miami Beach, today marks the very first start of their staged reopen. 600-plus stores when it comes to Retail and grooming services are opening today. At least they have the ability to. And then next week, it's going to be the restaurants next Wednesday. So we're seeing parts of South Florida now that have been clamped up and shut down for so long, starting to reopen, whether that's beaches or stores or other sorts of businesses. But the one caveat to that, Allison, in Miami Beach, no hotels are open. So in an industry that has generated some $18 billion a year from visitors coming here, largely to see the beaches and stay at hotels, that is not an option still for the time being. I'm in Delray Beach. Allison, let me send it back to you. All 50 states are lifting their stay-at-home orders in some capacity today. Meanwhile, the CDC has quietly released its detailed guidelines for reopening. The 60-page document is similar to one the White House shelved last week for being too specific. It has guidance for reopening schools, mass transit, and non-essential businesses. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. And Dr. John, what's in this 60-page document? Give us the uh, Reader's Digest version, if you will. And Allison, this is a more specific document than what they released earlier, where the earlier guidelines were basically giving you basic principles on what you should be doing in order to open things up safely. This one goes into more details, and specifically it goes into details concerning contact tracing, looking at that 14-day decrease in numbers and what that means, even how to calculate the numbers of cases you have based on negatives and positive of the cases in the community. So it goes into a lot more detail for very specific groups, but it's not as detailed as the page that the White House said they couldn't put out. This is the one that's a little watered down, but not much. It's going to give people and organizations some mm -hmm. very good guidelines on what they need to do in order to get these things set up. And again, its main purpose is to say, hey, we know things are going to open up. Let's do it as safe as we can. And it even has recommendations on what to do if things start getting a little bit out of control and cases start going up again. Yeah. And the main thing, again, that contact tracing, that testing, those are the important parts, Allison. So having looked at those guidelines, Dr. John, and as we've reported, 50 states opening in some capacity today, based on that guidance, are these states ready to reopen? You know, Allison, some of the states are ready to open. Some of the states are not ready to open. But you can imagine the pressure on a governor saying these other states are opening. We need to open as well. So I think the main message here is even right. if your state is opening, you need to be very careful. And that means you need to do the social distancing. You need to listen to the authorities when they tell you that, hey, we're going to close certain things down. And that's one of the things they talked about in this guideline of at you know, certain points, they might have to close down certain venues in order to keep people safe. As people, as a community, we just need to understand that and listen to that because the main objective here is to make sure we're all safe. And if we waited until every state was prepared to open, it'd be a long while. And I don't think people would be able to um, tolerate that for much longer. Yeah. Dr. John, let's head across the pond, if you don't mind. An EU back study out today suggests a 50 days on, 30 days off lockdown strategy. C could you explain what that is? And do you think something like that could actually work? You know, it was based on modeling. We've seen modeling in the past, Allison, where you know they've mm -hmm. given us these huge predictions. At one point, if you remember, they were talking about 2.2 million deaths, and, and then the model got watered down to 240,000 right. and then 100,000. So models change constantly, and so that's what they're looking at here is the modeling and what that means for people. What they looked at is they said, okay, the, the optimum strategy, if we did three months of strict lockdown, nobody left their houses, that would get things under control very quickly, but they realized that people aren't going to tolerate that either. And so they said, well, let's look at different scenarios 
scenarios. And the scenario that proved best was a 50-day mitigation strategy, where essentially they, over 50 days, they social distance, close schools, close large venues, those types of things that can keep people healthy. And then for 30 days, they opened it up again, only to close it down for 50 days again, open it up for 30 days. And this was a rolling measure they did over time until they got things under control, with the idea being that people will be able to tolerate those mitigation strategies for 50 days, almost two months, and then the relaxation of those for a month and keep going back and forth. Of course, time will tell and patience will tell if people right. truly will be able to do that because once things open up, it's harder to get the genie back in the bottle, basically, and get people to go back to those mitigation strategies. Yeah, I was just thinking it's got to be really difficult once you let people go a little bit more freely, trying to reel them back in again. Uh, Dr. John, we also got some more vaccine news today, a study showing that monkeys can develop immunity to the coronavirus. What does that mean uh, for humans? You know, this is good news to a certain extent, and we've had some pretty good news mm -hmm. about vaccines, again, to a certain extent, that seem to be working in humans, seem to be working in monkeys. But the thing you have to remember is, number one, these are very preliminary studies on very small numbers of people. With the monkey vaccine, it's fantastic because their immune system is a lot like ours, but it's not exactly like ours. So this is a step mm -hmm. in the right direction. Okay. And it still looks like that time schedule of 12 to 18 months is probably realistic. And Allison, I think that's what we're looking at still. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this on Monday. Uh, we had some other good news. Drug maker Moderna reporting positive results from a phase one vaccine study. Uh, but Dr. John, now scientists are questioning whether the company actually released enough data. What should our viewers know about this? study it was a phase one study and we only got partial results from the phase one and a lot of scientists are saying wait a minute usually we wait till we get all the results to make any mention of this but it's one of those things that's so much in the press and investors are looking at this so the company put out the information 45 patients were tested. They gave us the results on eight patients. And that's what a lot of scientists are saying. Wait, wait, we need the results on all 45 patients to make a good understanding of what happened because it's possible it worked on 45. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work on the other ones. So uh, again, you know, we have data. It's pretty decent data. It gives us some good information, but it doesn't give us all the information. And it's a very early trial still with a long ways to go. So again, we're making headway. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet, Allison. All right, Dr. John, always great to have you on. Thank you so much. You bet. The CDC put out its own report on coronavirus cases in the U.S., breaking down that data by race and ethnicity. In it, CDC Director Robert Redfield acknowledged a, quote, disproportionate burden of COVID-19 illness and death among racial and ethnic minority groups. That entire report, though, just four pages. NBC News correspondent Jeff Bennett joining us now. And Jeff, walk us through this report, if you will. It's just four pages long. Does it offer much detail? Uh, not really, Allison. And look, the CDC, the Trump yeah. administration, is required by Congress to present uh, disaggregated COVID-19 data. So to present the data specific to race and, and ethnicity. And we know across the country, the, sa the story is the same. It's the same slow rolling tragedy in Philadelphia, New York, Milwaukee, Chicago, New Orleans. Right. In all of those communities, Communities of color have a higher incidence of COVID-19. There's a higher incidence, higher rate of hospitalization, and a higher rate of death. There are, are a few reasons for that. One is that black and brown folks tend to be overrepresented in groups of essential workers, frontline workers. It's also true that the legacy of systemic inequity is that uh, communities of color have higher levels right. of those comorbidities, those underlying uh, uh, diseases that make COVID-19 particularly deadly. And the reason we know that there are higher rates in these major cities and in, in, in certain states is because of local data. Right now, there is no national data broken out by race and ethnicity the same way it's broken out by age, gender, and location. And that's the thing that public health experts, that policymakers have been clamoring for since really February. And now here we are, May going into June, and the federal government still doesn't have it. Jeff, you mentioned Congress required this report from the CDC. Uh, what kind of a reaction is it getting on Capitol Hill so far? Well, congressional Democrats, to say the least, are unimpressed. Uh, Patty Murray, who is the senator yeah. who leads one of the relevant committees, she said that what Congress required was a comprehensive report on health disparities related to the COVID-19 pandemic. What we got from President Trump, in her words, was a lazy four-page copy and paste project 
that links to a handful of limited previously available data sets. Frank Pallone, the congressman who, who heads a different committee in the House side, he says much of the same. He says, we know that, that communities of color bear a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 illness and death. Uh, he says, but the administration fails to offer new or original information and data. And so this report that the CDC offered, the compilation of links, it linked to information that was already on its website. There is no new information, no new data, nothing of, of use that can be used in a new way by public health yeah. experts to really pinpoint the problem, target it, and address it, Allison. Yeah, Jeff, let's talk about that a little bit more, uh, because uh, this is this is important data. And the more detailed the data is, the more it can help those public officials better serve their communities. Uh, you know, what kind of what kind of things can they then do? How important is it to have more specific information so they can make some changes? Well, as one public health expert I spoke to in Maryland put it, he said, without this information, communities are flying colorblind. And he says you have to take those color blinds off to know how to, you know, target public yeah. health messages, how to do specific interventions. If you know, and I'm in Northwest Washington, D.C. right now, if you know that there's an outbreak mm -hmm. in Northwest Washington, D.C. among a certain group of people, then that really informs how you address it, how you roll out testing, uh, you know, what churches or barbershops you might go to uh, to get the word out. But without any of that information, what you have are public health officials and, and state and city leaders guessing. Uh, and that really is not something that they can do right now, given the fact that you have thousands upon thousands right. of people dying each day. And as we mentioned, those deaths and those and those cases are overrepresented in, in black and brown communities. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, before you go, uh, I'd like to ask you about something else going on in our nation's capital. The president's threat to withhold funding to the state of Michigan if it keeps expanding its vote by mail efforts. Michigan's secretary of state responded to President Trump earlier on MSNBC. Here's that clip. Well, every Michigan citizen has a right to vote by mail. It's a right that was enshrined in our state constitution by our voters in November of 2018. And so I have a responsibility as the chief election officer for the state of Michigan to ensure everyone knows how to exercise the right to vote. What's going on here, Jeff? Well, a couple of things. The tweet that President Trump sent out about Michigan and Nevada, both are factually inaccurate from out applications, voter applications, which is a very different thing. The president said he's thinking about cutting federal funding for these states. Constitutionally, it's not clear that he can do that. There are also political questions about why he's picking a fight in Michigan, a state that he would need to keep and, and win in 2020 if he wants to uh, you know, uh, retain his position uh, in the White House. What we know yeah. is that this is one of the issues that President Trump likes to talk about when he tries to rally his base. This notion uh, that there are people who would try to, you know, mis mis misrepresent themselves and, and commit all sorts of acts of voter fraud at the polls when there is no information, there's no evidence to back that up. Remember when the president was elected, he said he was going to stand up this voter fraud commission. The commission, such that it existed, found no evidence of, of voter fraud. So this is something that the president likes to talk about, even though it is divorced entirely from the facts, Allison. All right, Jeff Bennett in D.C., thank you so much. Always great to see you. You too. Two dam breaches in Michigan have forced some 10,000 people to evacuate. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer declaring a state of emergency in Midland County, saying that nearby communities could be under nine feet of water. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is live from Midland. And Kathy, what's happening there? Allison, good afternoon to you. So we are in Midland, Michigan, which is about two hours outside of Detroit. And behind me is the Titawasabi River. And uh, you can see it has uh, overflowed and it's because of several inches of rain that has come over the past couple of days and has led to the significant flooding behind me. Two dams, as you mentioned, has failed. Also, the governor issued an evacuation order last night. 10,000 people in the community of Midland were told to evacuate. And a lot of those people have heeded those warnings. And we were just at a local high school just a few minutes from here. That is just one of the many shelters that is now open to the public for those evacuees who need 
a place to, to shelter while the water continues to recede. But right now, that's not the case. Water continues to rise. We are told that it's supposed to crest later on this evening and hit the 38 feet mark. And if that's the case, that would be historic because back wow. in 1986, that is the last time that the river reached just 33.9 feet. So we're talking about several more feet of, of uh, water because of the, the inundation that the community has seen in just the past two days. Kathy, it's just unbelievable what's going on there in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, if you could tell us uh, what you know about the challenge that emergency responders were dealing with, I mean, trying to get 10,000 people to evacuate so quickly. Yeah, I mean, there are dual emergencies going on right now. We are dealing with the ongoing crisis of the coronavirus. So people are hunkered in place at those shelters and, and social distancing. Um, they're wearing their masks. Um, but that is a big concern because they feel like they're putting their, their health at risk, being surrounded by so many other evacuees. So you have that one crisis. And then the other crisis, of course, is the flooding. So thousands of people have left their homes, a lot of them in the community of Sanford. It's, we're told that it's a smaller community, uh, several hundred people, uh, but they had to evacuate. And a lot of those people have been impacted because of the flooding there. So you have two emergencies. It continues to go on. And it really is a difficult situation out here, Allison. Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, Kathy Park in, in Midland County, Michigan, thank you so very much. And please stay safe out there. Yep. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. President Trump's feud with the World Health Organization is heating up. He threatened to permanently cut off U.S. funding unless the WHO commits to, quote, major substantive improvements in the next 30 days. Today, the head of the organization's emergency program urged people to stay away from the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, which President Trump is taking. At this stage, uh, hydroxychloroquine, norchloroquine have been as yet found to be effective <clears throat> in the treatment uh, of COVID-19 or in the prophylaxis against uh, uh, coming down with the disease. Um, in fact, the opposite uh, in, in that uh, warnings have been issued by many authorities regarding the potential side effects of the drug. 
NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons joining me now from London. Keir, the WHO director general started his briefing by thanking member nations, leaving the U.S. off that list. What is the organization saying or, or not saying, I guess, about Trump's letter? <laughs> Well, Dr. Tedros has had a rough time in recent months uh, at the hands of uh, President Trump. Dr. Tedros, of course, is the director general of the World Health Organization. I mean, this is the letter that President Trump wrote to him questioning uh, the World Health Organization's relationship with China. Uh, it ha raises some important questions. It raises some good questions, Alison. So, for example, it asks about the relationship, the role of Taiwan. Now, of course, you'll know that Taiwan is considered by China to be part of one China. I mean, China has resisted again and again, yeah. including during this assembly over the past few days, for Taiwan to be involved in the World, World Health Organization. There are many who think if Taiwan had had a voice, it would have raised concerns about the coronavirus earlier. President Trump makes that point. So it's a good point. But there are lots of other issues, uh, claims in here and accusations that just don't stand up. So, for example, he accuses the leader of the World Health Organization of praising China for its transparency. President Trump himself earlier this year praised China for its transparency. And another issue which is going to really uh, make it challenging for America's allies around the world is this letter gives uh, the World Health Organization 30 days, Alison, uh, to come up with a, a plan uh, to do things differently and not be so china orientated. Uh, but it doesn't really give any proposals on how to do that. So it's very difficult. If America did uh, leave the World Health Organization, uh, it would be very difficult for our allies to, to, to follow. Uh, and, and it would therefore be a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty difficult diplomatic position, frankly. How are the other member nations responding? What kind of reaction are, are they giving? Well, it's just another example on the world stage of major yeah. countries around the world, nations that consider themselves to be allies of the United States, really just having to kind of take leadership. So what we saw on Monday at the beginning of this this summit that's been described as perhaps the most important in the history of the World Health Organization, we saw yeah. Angela Merkel of Germany, Macron of France speak uh, to the assembly. We saw President Xi of China speak to the assembly. Who we didn't see, we didn't see President Trump. Instead, instead you uh, saw the Health and Human Services Secretary uh, leading the American delegation. The thing is, though, Trump could have spoken. He could have said all the things that he said in this letter uh, at that forum and also did some other things, you know, kind of uh, stand behind other allies. Uh, and he didn't do that. And many people think that that was a lost diplomatic opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Keir Simmons in London, thanks so much for being with us. You bet. The coronavirus outbreak in Brazil is so bad that President Trump is considering a travel ban. The country just had its deadliest day on record, with more than a thousand people dying of COVID-19 yesterday. NBC News chief global correspondent Bill Neely spoke with the governor of Brazil's largest city about this ongoing battle. We have two different positions right now in Brazil. The positions of the governors in favor to the quarantine, in favor to the social distance, in favor to the isolation, and the president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, against that. I'm very sad as a Brazilian, uh, as a governor of Sao Paulo State, to fight against the virus and against the bad orientation and the wrong orientation of the president of Brazil. Bill Neely joins us now from Sao Paulo. And uh, Bill, tell us more, if you will, about this tension between the local and the federal governments there in Brazil. Yes, Alison, you can call it tension. You could even call it anger, because the other thing the governor said to me is that there yeah. are two viruses in Brazil, coronavirus and Bolsonaro virus, referring to the president. Yes, I mean, the basic problem is that the president has one position, which is uh, coronavirus is just like a cold. Uh, the lockdown is unnecessary. You don't need to social distance. Get, out, get back to work. Get out on the street. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, and he was at a rally at the weekend hugging his supporters. He did wear a mask, which was unusual. But basically, he's tried to downplay the virus right from the beginning. And the governors and many mayors 
who want lockdowns, who want social distancing. So, you know, people are listening to two different messages and it's almost yeah. like in the United States, it's almost like if you support President Trump, you're going to do what he says. If you don't like President Trump, you're going to listen to Governor Cuomo. So the two country situations do mirror themselves to some degree. But Brazil, look, it's a huge crisis. As you said, a record number of deaths in the last 24 hours. The coronavirus is now spreading more quickly here than anywhere on earth. And that crisis simply made worse by the, as you say, the divisions at the very top of government and the lack of a, a clear strategy, Alison. Bill, what are residents there saying about that mixed messaging? It just has to be incredibly confusing for all of them. Yes, and, you know, a quarter of Brazil's population live in dire poverty. In this city, millions live in favelas, overcrowded slums where access to running water, never mind soap, is an absolute luxury. So that they do want some guidance from the top. They also have a problem that they need money. So they need to go out to work. They need to earn money to feed their families. So they're, they're caught in the middle and they don't know who to listen to, really. So they go out to earn money to survive. And many of them, sadly, catch coronavirus and die. We were at uh, Brazil's biggest cemetery this morning. There are dozens of burials there every day. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of open graves at that cemetery waiting for the next day's deaths to arrive and to be buried. So it's a desperate situation for people here and really no guidance, no clear strategy from the top. Bill, we know President Trump's considering a travel ban on Brazil. What else do you know about that potential ban? Yeah, well, he said this at the, uh, at the White House yesterday. He said, uh, you know, Brazil was, as he put it, uh, having problems. He said Brazil was aiming for herd immunity. By the way, there is absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. So he said we're considering a travel ban on people from Brazil. Uh, and he talked about the governor of Florida uh, because the majority of people from Brazil come in there. Around two million people a year. Uh, at least come from Brazil to the United States. So this would be uh, quite a thing. But look, he's looking at the numbers. And right now, Brazil, uh, yesterday, for example, in, in deaths, Brazil was just below the United States as number two in terms of overall cases. It's number three in the world now. Uh, but the official figures, uh, I think, hide something else. Uh, testing here is almost non-existent in many places. It's got one of the worst testing records in the world. So a doctor this morning told me that he believes the real rate of cases is 15 times higher than the official numbers. So it's those kinds of numbers that the CDC is looking at, that President Trump is looking at, and therefore, as you say, considering a travel ban from Brazil. All right, Bill Neely, thank you so much. What do classrooms in South Korea look like now after nearly three months without students or teachers? NBC News correspondent Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul to show us their new normal. Well, the South Korean government is being really cautious about this. They're bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages according to age groups. And they actually had to close some schools today shortly after opening because two students tested positive. But the vast majority of high school seniors did go back to school today and they experienced a different kind of first day at school. They were greeted in many cases by staff with thermometers, taking temperatures, handing out masks and hand sanitizer. Masks are now mandatory at schools unless, of course, you're eating in the cafeteria. But even that has changed. In some schools, uh, school lunch times have been sta staggered, so there are fewer people in the cafeteria. There are plastic partitions in some cafeterias and classrooms and desks, of course, spaced apart to observe social distancing. Also rules about what happens if a, a student comes down with a fever. They're told to report it 
immediately and get evaluated. At some schools, some private schools, they also brought back young kids, preschool and kindergartners. Take a listen. Knowing how Korea has handled it, knowing how important um, and actually significant protocols like mask wearing and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, et cetera, and, and knowing that those do have a really big effect on um, halting the spread of the virus, I think makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. The government and health officials really are still on high alert here, watching for clusters. In fact, they're just now investigating a possible cluster at one of the country's biggest hospitals, where four nurses have tested positive for COVID-19. Allison. Delayed symptoms, longer recovery, new clusters of the coronavirus are popping up in parts of China, and the virus is behaving differently this time around. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Frere explains the changes that doctors are seeing. Allison, in a lot of ways, China is getting back on track. The economy is coming back to life. Most kids will be back in school by the end of the month. But China is not out of the woods just yet. There are cities along the northern border with Russia that are completely locked down right now. And the worrying part is that Chinese experts who are there say the virus is somehow different. They say it's taking longer for symptoms to show. It's taking longer for people who are infected to recover. Doctors say they're seeing more damage to lungs as opposed to heart and kidney damage uh, that they saw in patients in Wuhan, where they continue to test every single person in the city. 11 million people are going to be tested in Wuhan. They're about halfway done right now. China has been moving pretty aggressively to stem any spread of the virus, especially before the big political meetings being held in Beijing. They start tomorrow. The National People's Congress is largely a ceremonial thing. They rubber stamp stuff. They give the party's outlook for the economy and development. It was supposed to be held in March, but it was postponed because it was the height of the outbreak here. And that had never happened before. Normally, it's a chance to get a read on what the leadership is thinking. This time, it, that it's going ahead is important for optics, that China is confident in its stability right now. And consider the issues. The global economy is stalled. Millions around the world have lost jobs, including here. And the U.S.-China relationship is probably at its worst point ever, as the Trump administration continues to blame China for the pandemic. China has a pretty advanced system of detection and testing in place here, but authorities are still struggling to contain the virus. There are still restrictions in place in places like Beijing. The borders are still closed to foreigners, and daily life is ruled by temperature checks and health codes. Scientists also admit that they still don't know what they're looking for in terms of these changes in the behavior of the virus in the cases in the north. Uh, but it is keeping this risk of a second wave very much alive here. Allison. More news in the Michael Flynn saga. The former national security advisor wants to force the judge in his criminal case to drop it. He has asked a federal appeals court for an order to do just that. NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams joining me now from Washington. Pete, earlier this month, the Justice Department filed a motion to dismiss this case. So what is this order now all about? Well, the judge hasn't done it yet. And what the Justice Department said is, yeah. <laughs> look, Judge Sullivan, you don't really have any discretion here. You just have to rubber stamp what we filed because we're the prosecutors. That's an executive branch function, and you can't tell us what to do. Uh, but the judge hasn't done that yet. So, in, in fact, he's done just the opposite. He appointed a retired federal judge to come in and argue why the Justice Department is wrong in its analysis. Remember, what the Justice Department said was, Yes, it may be true that when Michael Flynn was questioned shortly after Trump was inaugurated and he was national security advisor about his uh, discussions with the Russian ambassador to the U.S., it, it may be that he lied, but his lies weren't a crime because they weren't material to any open investigation. So for that reason, the Justice Department said, there's no crime here and we're going home, there's no case. Uh, what the judge has done is, is appoint this retired federal judge to come in and argue, no, the Justice Department is wrong about that. And the judge has also said he wants this retired judge to argue whether Flynn should instead be prosecuted for contempt of court, for saying uh, he pleaded guilty and now saying, I didn't do anything wrong, I shouldn't plead guilty, I want to withdraw my plea. So what Flynn's lawyers have said to the Court of Appeals here is, hey, the judge can't do this, make him stop. And the Court of Appeals hasn't acted on that yet. Um, you know, 
I'm not sure exactly at this point what's going on because the judge has gone ahead and set a <laughs> schedule for uh, this uh, retired judge to, to submit legal briefs, and he's called for oral argument in early July on this case. Uh, so briefing all during June. So he's in no hurry to act on this. Um, it does seem at this point premature to ask the Court of Appeals to act to to uh, this. This is what's mm -hmm. called a writ of mandamus because the judge hasn't done anything for them to stop yet. He hasn't he hasn't denied the government's motion. If he did that, then I could see Flynn's lawyers doing what they've done. But in any event, they're saying to the Court of Appeals, hey, get, make the judge knock this off. Make him grant the Justice Department's motion to dismiss so we can all go home. Pete, I would normally uh, wrap up a conversation with you by asking you what you think is next, but it sounds like from what you said, it's just not entirely clear. Right. And, and you know, it, so for now, n normally when somebody appeals something to a court of appeals, it takes the case out of the hands of the district judge. That's not the case here because this mm -hmm. isn't an appeal. A writ of mandamus is something different. So the case is still in Emmett yeah. Sullivan's hands. He's the district judge. So I can tell you what's going to happen next. Right now, he is calling for this retired judge to submit his briefs. He's saying he'll entertain other friend of court briefs from other parties. And we know that they are all okay. at the starting gates ready to go. There's a group of state attorneys, a Republican state attorney general, who are going to weigh in on the Justice Department side. There's a group of retired uh, uh, Justice Department lawyers who are going to weigh in on the other side. So th there's going to be a, a lot of action here, uh, I would guess, in the next several weeks. I don't think this case is going to go away anytime soon. And so the Flynn saga continues. Pete Williams, thank you so That's much. Right. You bet. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. By the end of the week, dentists in 40 states will be allowed to see non-emergency patients again. Today, dentists in Connecticut are telling people to open wide. MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jansing shows us the safety precautions they're taking. Yeah. Connecticut orthodontist Dr. Gary Open is back in business, fully reopening his office today. We do have quite a backlog. We have been closed for six weeks. The new normal means keeping patients safe in the age of COVID. 
We are wearing higher level masks, N95s. We are wearing face shields also, and we're wearing disposable gowns. He's overhauled his office, investing in a new air filtration system, significantly reducing the number of patients he'll see each day and revamping waiting room procedures. Their temperature will be checked. Once everything is deemed okay, we will escort the patient to the chair where we'll be working. Dental practices are by nature invasive, and preliminary research suggests the coronavirus survives airborne for hours. That's why some industry insiders like hygienist Megan Zadrowski worry dental offices are reopening before it's safe. Aerosols generated in the dental office are unavoidable, whether it's by dentist drills, whether it's by hygienist instruments, or even the patients themselves who may need to cough. The American Dental Association has issued national guidelines, including hygienists using hand tools instead of automated devices and limiting drills. Suggestions that Zadrowski worries not all dentists will follow. Would you go to a dentist right now for a non-emergent problem? I would absolutely avoid going to the dental office with a non-emergent service. A recent national survey by the American Dental Association found three in 10 dentist offices didn't have any supply of N95 masks and nearly 18% had no face shields. Connecticut dentist Dr. David Fantarella says it has been a challenge. We do have what we need. It has not been easy. He's invested beyond the guidelines, including a fogger to clean rooms and a mobile UVC unit to reduce pathogens. You understand why people are nervous? For sure. I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm also nervous on the flip side of that. If we don't do anything, what about that patient? That they get really sick. That they get really sick. All dentists facing the new reality that being afraid of the dentist means something different now. I wanted to make sure my child was safe and comfortable in a setting outside the home. What are you looking forward to most when all this is uh, over? Well, getting my teeth straight, definitely. The challenge of reopening a business when it's anything but business as usual. And Chris Jansing joins me now. Chris, let's talk for a minute about the economics here. I mean, this is an, an industry that's taken quite a hit, and it is not cheap to put all of this these new safety procedures in place. Uh, what kind of challenges are they dealing with there? Yeah, you're right about that. Not cheap at all. And the couple of practices that we went to in Connecticut, they are both longstanding. They've been in operation for decades. They're successful practice practices. If you're a smaller practice, if you're a rural practice, if you're a new practice, first of all, there is the financial consideration, right? The second part of this really, I think there is a comparison to be made to remember how difficult it was for so many hospitals and still is with to to get that bottom line where they want it to be, given that they're not doing elective surgeries. They're not doing any kind of electric right. uh, elective office calls. So that's the other issue. And there was a survey that was just done, Allison. 46% of dentists said that if they aren't back up and operating by the end of August, they're not sure that they can stay open. And often the big concern is Those will be the practices in rural areas, already underserved areas, places where people don't have other options. So that's why the ADA is keeping an eye on all of this to see how this rollout works, what are sort of the red flags and how they can help some of these practices that aren't open yet reopen safely. And Chris, how about the patients? I never thought I'd say this, but last week I said to my husband, I'm dying for a a teeth cleaning. It would feel so great. I know so (laughs) many people are skittish about going to the dentist to begin with. Uh, Is there a concern that may be even worse now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a very different kind of concern, right? Uh, I think a lot of the concerns that people had a decade, two decades ago, simply about pain, the fear, the noise of the drill, uh, there have been technological advances that have calmed a lot of those fears. But for the average person, when you're told, don't even go out of the house, and now you're being told, hey, you can go have your teeth cleaned, and like you were just saying, you feel like, my gosh, I really want to have this done. There are several things you really should think about doing. First of all, call your dentist. These offices are already getting the calls. They're ready for them. You should ask them what kind of PPE are they wearing? What kind of air filtration system do they have? That was the number one concern for the hygienist. Do you have the right kind of air filtration system? And then you have to ask a personal question. It's, It's really about, is this necessary? Do I feel comfortable? If you don't feel comfortable and it's not an emergency, there's no reason right now not to stay home. Allison? 
Chris, great questions to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you. Department stores hoping to woo back customers as they reopen their doors. Retail sales plunged a record 16 percent in April. So will those shoppers come back and and what will the in-store shopping experience be like when they do? NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta uh, taking an NBC exclusive look inside Macy's to show us reopening what reopening looks like for the country uh, company. Rather, Blaine, what is Macy's plan specifically? What are the new safety measures uh, that they're putting in place in store. Allison, it's going to certainly look different. You know, when you walk into Macy's, uh, one big thing that people yeah. usually go inside for uh, is the makeup counter. I know that you've done it. I'm sure that it, a lot of people have done it. You go inside, yep. <laughs> you want to try on makeup, try on lipstick. Of course, given everything that's going on right now, that's not a possibility. So that was my biggest question. I actually stopped by a makeup counter and had what will be kind of the new demo uh, for makeup counters. So instead of kind of putting foundation on your face, they have these pads that actually have a face drawn onto them and they take, you know, essentially oh, wow. what the, the, the uh, person is going to do is going to eyeball you. She says, you know what, if you're looking for foundation, I'm going to eyeball you, see maybe two or three shades that might work for you. And then she's going to put them down on this pad the way that she would apply them to your face. So not only are you going to see what it looks like, but you're also going to kind of see how to do it. And she actually demonstrated for me taking a Q-tip, spreading that product on the paper. It's certainly not what we are used to at all, but this is what they're doing to get back up and running. You know, there are plenty of safety measures that they're talking about, things that we've seen in stores all over. So employees require to wear masks. We're talking about plexiglass around cash registers, social distancing, of course, but the things that are unique to department stores, like trying on clothes. So I asked, can we still go in and try on a dress or a pair of pants? They said yes. But once you decide that maybe you're not going to purchase that item, it goes on a special rack and that is then put away for at least 24 hours. It's kept off the floor or off the public racks, and then it's slowly kind of rotated back into service. So that's what happens when you try on. The same thing, Allison, happens when you uh, return items, if you do decide to return something to the stores. Okay. So different, Blaine, all of those things. Uh, you mentioned some of the safety uh, measures in place for the employees. What else do we know about the employees who are coming back to work? What can you tell us about them uh, and their safety concerns here? Well, we do know that Macy's, just like many other retail places, have really been hit hard by this pandemic, right? So we know that Macy's Incorporated had to furlough many of its 130,000 employees. So a lot of them are going to be coming back to work, uh, certainly, you know, looking forward to getting back to work and kind of welcoming customers back into the stores. But there were a number of people who continued to work during this pandemic because Macy's was focused on digital sales. You know, we know that one of the stores, some of the stores kind of remained up and running in terms of getting that product out, shipping them to people who were ordering online. Line. But with the stores opening now, we know that employees are, again, required to wear masks. They're coming in. They have plexiglass around the cash registers. And we're also seeing kind of staggered shifts and staggered openings as well. So you're not seeing as many people in there at the same time. I do have to say that we went in there. Our crew, our small crew went in there before the store opened this morning, and people were very much spread out. And when you kind of see, you know, you get ready for a sales floor to open, you may see more than one mm -hmm. person in a section folding places or, or straightening things up. We only saw one person per area. So it certainly looked like there was a great deal of distancing going on as much as could be done uh, on the sales floor. Allison. Blaine, it is certainly going to be very different shopping in stores again. Thanks for giving us a glimpse of the new normal. An Idaho casino isn't gambling with its guest safety. If you want to hit the slots, you will have to wear a mask. Here's a look at how it's operating during the pandemic. You know, we were concerned with the virus, concerned the well-being of our customers' employees, but gaming has been essential to our livelihood. I just hope that we don't have an outbreak because, you know, the decisions that we made were, were really difficult and we realized that, that it could be a life or death situation. We opened March 20th, 1993. So it's kind of ironic that we closed March 20th, 2020. <laughs> When the Coeur d'Alene Casino Resort Hotel in Idaho was forced to close in March, its owners immediately began to think about what it would take to reopen. So originally we thought we were going to be closed for two weeks, and um, it ended up being over a month of paying our wages, the wages and benefits of the casino and tribal employees, millions of dollars. And it got to be, you know, very concerned, you know, we're really dipping into our reserves, and um, that really just 
you know, put more emphasis as far as the importance of opening our doors. The casino finally did reopen on April 27th. And since then, its operations have looked very different. Guests have their temperatures taken, restaurants are at one-fourth their capacity, and yellow tape markings keep people six feet apart. First day back, it was a lot of wiping down, a lot of disinfecting, um, constant. The shutdown, the cleaning from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. We have every other machine turned off, and we have on order some plexiglass to put between the machines, each machine, and we have had a few people removed because they refused to wear their mask. The casino is owned and operated by the Coeur d'Alene tribe, who felt the economic pressures to reopen. Last year, the casino generated tens of millions of dollars in revenue. We employ a lot of members of the tribe and also other tribes. Everything, all the dollars, and that's our biggest cash cow, comes from the casino. So our police department, our senior uh, program, our youth programs, um, everything is supplemented by that casino. As of May 19th, 82 of the country's nearly 1,000 casinos have begun operating again, most of them owned by tribes. And as more move toward reopening, Coeur d'Alene offers a glimpse into what that might look like for other casinos around the country. Still, Stengar says she's not sure how the pandemic is going to affect business in the long run. The stimulus checks are out, and I think, you know, taxes were out, so we're kind of riding on that. Um, I am concerned with the economy in that it's going to level out. And with no um, tourists coming in, with the Canadian market being closed, a little concerned about that. Gaming has just been, it's been our livelihood. And so we are trying to uh, make up for lost revenue and continue to provide for our tribe. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She's following the latest news and coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Hey there, Alexa. How about an update? Hey, Allison. So we're starting off with some news from the CDC. The CDC released reopening guidelines this week, including guidance for businesses and schools. That's the latest from NBC's Elizabeth Chuck. Now, among a number of measures, the 60-page document encourages restaurants to install sneeze guards and partitions, stagger employee shifts, and ask customers to wait in their cars before being seated. The CDC warned that not all businesses and schools should necessarily begin reopening just yet, depending on the number of COVID-19 infections in the local area. And from NBC's Dara Gregorian, hundreds rallied against Michigan's stay-at-home order today, but this time the demonstration looked a little different. Several barbers and hairstylists offered free trims as part of, quote, Operation Haircut. Some protesters did not wear masks or follow social distancing guidelines. Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer offered this warning. If people protest, I ask that they wear masks. I ask that they observe the six feet apart. And if they don't, uh, we will have to take some action here. Whitmer also spoke about the heavy rainfall and two breached dams, which led to record-setting flooding in central Michigan over the last day. About 11,000 people have evacuated so far, with rising water expected to continue until 8 p.m. tonight. And the president, uh, President Trump now says he doesn't think it'll be necessary to withhold funding from Michigan over their vote by mail efforts. This morning, the president blasted Michigan and Nevada for expanding their mail in voting ahead of upcoming elections, going so far as to threaten to withhold federal funds. He now appears to be walking back on that. And the American Nurses Association is refuting pr President Trump's claim that many health workers are taking hydroxychloroquine to prevent a coronavirus infection. The president told reporters earlier in the week he had been taking the drug and said thousands of frontline workers were as well. In a statement to NBC News, the Nurses Association said it, quote, has not received reports from nurses or other frontline health care workers utilizing hydroxychloroquine as a preventative treatment for COVID-19. Furthermore, to date, research has not shown clear evidence that hydroxychloroquine has a preventative effect for COVID-19. Now, a cyclone expected to hit India and Bangladesh this week has forced the region to frantically organize evacuations all under the threat of coronavirus. More than 2.6 million people were moved into shelters, according to this, the Associated Press, as this like cyclone began to hit. The evacuations, of course, were made all the more difficult by the pandemic and the attempt to keep safety measures in place. Authorities have warned of extensive damage to houses and the possibility of serious flooding in several cities. Those are the latest headlines for this hour. Lots of news there. Allison, back to you. 
All right, Alexa, thank you so much. And you can visit our live blog. It's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We'll always have the latest updates there. The three trillion dollar House approved coronavirus relief package facing an uphill battle in the Senate. Today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi responded to critics who say the bill is partisan. Let me ask you this. As the Speaker of the House, a woman, uh, when I put forth the bill, people say, oh, it's not bipartisan. But when the leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, puts forth the bill, a good first start. And then we negotiate and we make it bipartisan. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins me now from Capitol Hill. Leanne, Republican lawmakers not happy with this package at all. I can only imagine how negotiations are going so far. <laughs> yeah, Allison. Well, these are the negotiations that aren't happening at all. Even the decision to start negotiations <laughs> is partisan. You have Democrats who are saying they want to start talking to Republicans to get a bill passed immediately. Republicans, on the other hand, They're saying they aren't ready. They want to see where all the money from the last uh, coronavirus relief bill goes first. Our colleague Garrett Hake, he asked House Speaker Nancy Pelosi about this today. And and listen to this exchange. Talk about this being a negotiation. Has there been any movement from the other side to the negotiating table? Um, There will be. There's nothing from the Treasury Secretary or the leader or anybody actually reaching out to you to have these discussions? Well, we'll see. I think public opinion uh, will be uh, very much our friend in all of this. Well, public opinion, perhaps, but Republicans also think that public opinion is on their side, that they want to slow down for now. We know that uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell had a meeting earlier in the week with Secretary Mnuchin and others in the White House, and they didn't emerge from that meeting saying that they wanted to get to negotiations. Instead, their position was the same, that they wanted to slow down and wait a while, Allison. Leanne, the president was on Capitol Hill yesterday. Has he said what he wants to see in this next relief bill? of how anxious Republicans are not to move forward on a bill. This, uh, this, this, what they talked about, what the president talked about anyway, was not a lot of policy and a lot of politics. He talked about his reelection. He talked about Joe Biden. He talked about the uh, President Obama. What didn't come up a lot was coronavirus and what the Congress should do next. There was one small policy detail that did come out of that meeting that we're told, and that was about an extension of this enhanced unemployment benefit. Uh, We're told that the president said that he didn't support that. Republicans are on the same page. They don't support it either. Um, Democrats, though, that is something that they want in the next coronavirus relief bill. They think that the plus up the additional $600 a week for unemployment benefit recipients was successful. They'd like to see that extended while this uh, while this pandemic continues to ra- rage on and while people are still unemployed. But the details, they are so far apart, Allison. And like we said, negotiations are not even starting. Leanne, I know there's a vote next week to potentially loosen some restrictions on the Paycheck Protection Program. This program has had so many issues. What do we know about that vote? Uh, we know that it is actually something that's bipartisan. We're hearing from both Republicans and Democrats that they do want changes to this Paycheck Protection Program. One of the things that they want changed is this ratio of how small businesses can spend the money. The way it's written now is that 75% of the funds have to go to people's pay, to their payroll. And 25% can be used on other expenses like rent and utilities, et cetera. Well, small businesses say that it's not a ratio that works for them, especially when they don't need all of their employees at this moment, that they have other expenses they need to pay their bills to keep them afloat. And they also want the extension, um, the timeline extended. They have to, small businesses have to use that money within eight weeks. They want that expanded perhaps to the end of the year. That's a vote that's likely to happen in the House of Representatives next week. And uh, our colleagues spoke to a lot of senators today on Capitol Hill who also support 
that measure as well. So that is a shift that that is a slight change in a program that was already passed that actually could be a bipartisan move forward. Great news there, Leanne. Great potential news for small business owners. Uh, Another big story on the Hill today, the Senate Homeland Security Committee voting to subpoena Democratic consulting firm Blue Star Strategy as part of their probe into Hunter and Joe Biden. Uh, I just have to ask the question, why now in the middle of a pandemic? That's the same question that a lot of Democrats are asking as well, Allison. They're saying, why is the Uh, Why are Senate Republicans focused on an investigation into the president's political rival, Joe Biden, and his son, Hunter, at this moment? Well, we do know that um, the president is obsessed with his own reelection, as mentioned earlier, how he spoke to Senate Republicans yesterday in this closed door lunch. And he if you look at his Twitter feed, he is focused on the election, his predecessor and his opponent as well. So. The Republicans are doing a lot of the bidding of the president who they want to see reelected. Here is the top Republican on the Senate Homeland Security Committee, Ron Johnson, and how he put it. But the Democrats are are objecting, and I I think uh, maybe they're protesting too much. It it actually raises my suspicion level of what is is to be found out uh, in these documents. So Republicans have given no indication that they're going to hold back on this investigation. They're going to plow forward, and we can bet that we're going to see a lot more of this before Election Day, Allison. All right, Leanne Caldwell on Capitol Hill, thank you so much. And moments ago, the president met with the governors of Arkansas and Kansas at the White House. Let's listen in. in an area that, frankly, was not expected to go Republican. First time in 22 years that it's happened. They flipped from Democrat to Republican California. The first time in 22 years that it happened. And uh, they actually put machines in there in the last three days because they thought, meaning the Democrats, because they thought that might happen, but it didn't. But uh, that was a case that was a positive case. But uh, mail-in ballots are very dangerous. There's tremendous fraud involved and tremendous illegality. But there are many Republicans. Secretaries of State that are also moving to mail-in ballots because of the pandemic, and people are scared to move about. Well, we're going to see how it all works out. But uh, they had 7.7 million applications sent out. They have, uh, in the state of Nevada, they have a tremendous. Uh, they have a tremendous drive-in where you just mail in your ballots. You can't do that. You got to go and vote. People have to check you. They have to see that it's you. They're supposed to look at you and check you and make sure that. I mean, when you get thousands of ballots and they put them in a bag and they just bring them in and people start, who knows where they come from? It's so obvious. I mean, frankly, they should have voter ID. That's what they should have. You really want to know what the country wants. The country wants voter ID. Otherwise, it's going to be it's going to be subject to tremendous illegality and fraud. From, from Michigan. He's threatened to keep funding away from uh, Michigan. Yeah, well, I have very specific funding. I just spoke with the governor. We didn't discuss that. We really discussed more the uh, topic at hand plus the dams breaking. So we didn't. But we'll let you know if it's necessary. You'll be finding out. They'll be finding out very soon if it's necessary. I don't think it's going to be necessary because mail-in ballots are a very dangerous thing. They're, they're subject to massive fraud. And by the way, I, you know, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. If you have anything to say about it, Asa or Laura, but uh, how, how can you do that? You have people signing ballots. Who knows who's signing these ballots? They have a ballot. They pick the ballot. They take them out of mailboxes. They go around and accumulate them. They harvest. I guess the word is harvest them. And uh, it was especially prevalent in California, and it's just not a fair situation. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I do. Of course, Arkansas supported a voter ID law. Good. Uh, but in terms of the election in November, uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, how we can make uh, the vote uh, accessible if there is continued worry from a health standpoint. And we want to be able to use um, uh, no, excuse abs- no excuse absentee voting 
as a way to do it, but it's still a person-to-person -person identification right. of the individual sure. versus the male in variety that, as you said, uh, can be uh, manipulated. So we're looking at that, but uh, we, we believe in the uh, identification of the voter. I think just common sense would tell you that it's massive manipulation can take place. Massive. They, uh, and you do, you have cases of uh, fraudulent ballots where they actually print them and they give them to people to sign. Maybe the same person signs them with different writing, different pens. I don't know, There's a lot of things can happen. No, if you can, you should go and vote. Voting is an honor. It shouldn't be something where they send you a pile of stuff and you send it back. Another thing that happens, a lot of people in certain districts, this is historically, a lot of people in certain districts don't ever get their ballot. They keep calling, where's my vote? Where's my ballot? Then election day passes and they forget about it. And that can happen in the thousands. I'm not saying it does, but it can and probably has. Just to okay. follow up on that, sir, are you concerned about the message that you're sending of saying you may withhold funding from Michigan when it's also going through these issues with the water? No, I'm not. Uh, no, no, I'm not concerned at all. We're going to help Michigan. Michigan is a great state. I've gotten tremendous business to go to Michigan. Michigan's one of the reasons I ran. I was honored in Michigan long before I thought about I was honored as the man of the year in Michigan at a big event. And I got up and I remember so well I spoke probably five, six years before I even thought about running for president. And I got up and I spoke and I said, why are you allowing them to steal your car business? You know, we lost 32 percent of our car business to Mexico. And a lot of it came out of Michigan. And I said, why did you allow that to happen? And I posed many questions to Michigan that night. I think it made it quite an impression. And now we have those same car factories that are coming back, except in a brand newer and bigger form. So uh, I think we're going to do very well in Michigan. I guess we just got a poll that's very good right here, a very good poll about how we're doing in Michigan and other swing states and just generally in the election. But I won't show you. I'm sure you can get it. I won't flip this over. Everyone is saying, could you flip it over? Um, but no, I think we're doing very well in Michigan. Very great place. And I'll be there tomorrow. And I guess it's tomorrow, but I'll be there tomorrow, the Ford plant. And I'm maybe going to do the double stop or I'll go back on the dams. But we have to take care of that problem. Mr. President, with 4% of the world's population and 30% of the, uh, the outbreak, what would you have done differently facing this uh, crisis? Well, nothing. If you take New York and New Jersey, which were very hard hit, we were very, very low. And in terms of morbidity and in terms of uh, uh, you look at the death, relatively speaking, we're at the lowest level along with Germany. And Germany, us, there could have been some smaller countries too, perhaps. I'd like to ask you maybe about that, uh, if I could, Deborah. We've done, you know, amazing well. I, I, think, I think the biggest thing we did is stopping the inflow from China into our country. And Deborah was a big, a big supporter of that. I mean, in terms of uh, how important it turned out to be. And so was uh, Tony Fauci. They were very, very uh, — Tony said we saved thousands and thousands of lives. That was a great decision that was made, and that was made very early. Please, Deborah. Yeah, I think it's always confusing, um, and particularly confusing to the American people when we don't emphasize the size of our country. We're the third largest country in the world. But every country has a different experience with this virus. And so you have to adjust everything to population size. And so when you look at Spain and Italy, our attack rates to this virus are identical to other countries that have experienced the type of epidemic that we have experienced. And so every country is different. That's why you really need to always report data normalized per population. And then you look at the mortality by population, and it's true. We have, compared to our European colleagues, some of the lowest mortality, about half of Italy and Spain. And so I think it's really important that, and in these two states represent what we've been asking states to do. Uh, in Kansas, they found 50% of their clusters were in specific meatpacking, nursing homes. They identified their clusters. They found their clusters. They took care of those clusters. And that was 50% of all of their cases. In Arkansas, 80% of, of the Arkansas individuals have recovered 
with less than a 2% mortality. And so these are the, it's really important. We're a big country, but each state is different. But as a country, we're different than other countries around the world. We'll be asking questions later about, you know, why were certain countries completely spared? And I think that's, that's always a question that we have. Um, epidemiology is like that. But if your country has never had significant infections, you can't compare it to a global number. There's multiple countries in Africa where there's really almost no outbreak. And then South Africa has a very different outbreak. So each of these outbreaks are different. And that's why it has to be really granular to understand it and, and to respond to it. And you can see these two states have done exactly what we asked them to do. Um, find cases, contact trace, contain outbreaks, um, and ensure that their citizens um, do as well as possible. And that's what these states illustrate. And just to finish your question, though, I mean, so we're in that category along with Germany as the lowest. And I think that's a great, uh, it's a great honor. And that's including New York and New Jersey, which have had a very, uh, they had a very high number. So uh, if you include New York, New Jersey, do everything. If you don't include New York and New Jersey, we're just about in a class by ourselves. Now, with all of, well, China, you tell me about it. You think they're right numbers? Do you think China's giving the right number? I don't think so. I don't think so. Take a look at the numbers. They gave numbers that were so low. I mean, I saw more problem on television than they were reporting just by looking at a picture. So uh, I'm not including China in any numbers because uh, those numbers weren't correct, obviously. And it, that's been easily shown and easily proven. But uh, no, our people have done a fantastic job. Uh, Deborah, I always talk about the fact that our testing is so far advanced that we're close to 14 million in testing. 14 million. And would you say China's at, uh, not China, if you would say uh, Germany would be at maybe three or four? Three. And South, <laughs> South Korea is at a number. You tell us what that number is. Well, we're way, we've been way ahead of South Korea for a, a long time. We have um, everybody. Germany's done 3 million tests, Italy 3 million tests, the UK about 2.7 million, right. Spain 3 million. And I think to us, it's not just the number of tests, it's how those tests are utilized. Well, and I think in both of these states, you can see they focus testing where they knew the outbreaks were. And now they're proactively testing in nursing homes where they think the outbreaks were, are, could go next mm -hmm. and finding the asymptomatic cases. I think we've just, we've only learned in the last couple of months how many asymptomatic cases there are. And I think a lot of people at the beginning wanted to approach this like flu. And you know, most of the people who get flu are symptomatic. So really, I think our, our, our thoughts have evolved, our understanding has evolved, and the states have evolved with us, really working in partnership to really change how we look for cases. And I think that's really remarkable. We're not waiting for people to get sick to find cases now. And you know what you're doing with testing and what you're doing with testing in a proactive way is the way we're moving as a, as a country. And because we can do nearly 14 million tests, we have the luxury to be able to be proactive in our testing now. But when you do 14 million tests, you're gonna find more cases. If instead of 14 million tests, we did 3 million, like Germany's at about 3 million, uh, South Korea's at 3 million, and they've done a very good job. It's not a knock, but we're at, almost 14 million. We're going to be passing 14 million very soon. So you're going to have more tests. If we did 3 million, everyone would say, oh, we're doing great, you know, in terms of cases. We're going to have more cases. If we did 3 million, maybe that's what we should have done. I said, if I would have done 3 million, they said, oh, they have very few cases. The United States is doing well. We're finding a lot of people. By doing testing, you're finding people. So we're doing 14. Germany's doing 3. South Korea's doing 3. And I think they're number two and three. So we're way ahead of everybody. But when you do that, you have more cases. So a lot of times the fake news media will say, you know, uh, there are a lot of cases in the United States. Well, if we didn't do testing at a level that nobody's ever dreamt possible, uh, you wouldn't have very many cases. So we're finding a lot of cases, and we're doing a great job once we find them. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. How does it compare to per capita basis? Obviously, the United States is much larger than a lot of these European countries. Yeah. How does our testing compare per capita? Sure. You want to do that, uh, Deborah? Per yeah, capita. Our, you know, our 
are testing now, we're, all, we're almost up to 4%. So um, some, of the state, some of the European countries are at 4 to 5%. And I think our goal is to ensure that we can find the asymptomatics. And I think that's really our focus right now, working with every state to really help them identify where these clusters came from historically, and then proactively going for those clusters, identifying them early, and finding the asymptomatic individuals before. And no one's intending to spread the virus. I always want to be very clear about that. Asymptomatic patients, pa people don't know they're infected. And so together, we're really working to find them. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a unique challenge. And I think together, we're really making progress. And you know, when you say per capita, there's many per capita, it's like per capita relative to what? But you can look at just about any category and we're really at the top, meaning positive on a per capita basis too. They've done a great job. Please, Caitlin. Yesterday, the Republican launch that you were complaining about the CDC and the delayed rollout of testing. Do you no, think that- No, I wasn't complaining. I don't know who gave you that, it's fake news. Do you think Robert Redfield is doing a good job? Like yeah, I do, CDC? I do. Uh, it's fake news, Caitlin, fake news. Therefore, you can report it on <laughs> CNN. It's perfect for CNN. You didn't complain about the CDC? No, not at all, no, no, no. Do you think no, they did a good no, job no. with testing at the beginning? Well, you know, you're asking me a wise guy question at, at the beginning. And again, I didn't put CDC there. CDC has been there long before the Trump administration came in. But uh, they had a test that was, uh, was some, something happened to it. It was soiled. It was, it was soiled and or foiled. Uh, but it was a problem, a short-term problem. It lasted for about a week. And then they got that solved and frankly the end result is and, and this was done outside of cdc this was done by private companies and people that we got involved and uh, we've done you know you look at the numbers i know you don't like to talk about the numbers and what we've done but yeah for the first week they had a problem cdc because something went wrong with one of the tests and that can happen i'm not blaming cdc for it no i think he's done a very good job i think I think that my whole team has done a very good job. I think the whole, and it's not really my team. They were there. CDC has been there for a long time. There's some great talent in CDC. I deal with them. Uh, so now what you're saying is, okay, we've done 14 million tests, so we can't hit the president on that. So let's go back to the first week. Uh, CDC has done, a, I think, a really good job. Now, and I didn't say anything bad about CDC at the meeting. We actually had a very good meeting. The Republican Party, the uh, senators, I think virtually everyone was there. I think you had 53 there. And uh, we had a great meeting. We're looking to do great things for the country. Uh, we're helping people with stimulus. We're getting pe money to people. They need it. And we're going to open up very big. We're going to open up, I, I call it transition to greatness. That's what it is. It's a transition to greatness. And when Larry Kudlow tells you the numbers, those are really uh, surprisingly good numbers this early in. I mean, we're doing very well. I think it's going to be something special. These are two governors that uh, we invited. They've both done a fantastic job. One happens to be a Democrat, one happens to be a Republican. But I think I've worked out, you've been on most of those calls, Laura, and I think uh, we can say the Democrats have been as nice about what we've done as the Republicans. I mean, it's been terrific. And, you know, Laura, uh, I know she will speak her mind and so will some of the others. And if she was unhappy, she'd be letting you know. Now, we've done a really great job. We've gotten along great with Democrats, the Democrat governors, and uh, we've gotten along great with the Republicans. It's been, uh, it's been a tremendous thing to witness. Uh, and we are, we're, we're doing a fantastic job with and you have been fantastic, Deborah, I have to say. You've been working 24 hours a day, and I hope people appreciate what you're doing, but I do. I do. Thank you very much. All right, Travis, let's go. Come on, Caitlin, we're done. Let's go. Thank go you. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're finished. Ready? Right? So I'm going to make our go. The president met with the governors of Kansas and Arkansas today and talked about everything from coronavirus testing to his visit to Michigan tomorrow to his hydroxychloroquine regimen. NBC News correspondent Hans Nichols joins me now. And Hans, uh, why don't you hit us with the highlights here? Well, the president gave a clear vote of support uh, to the director of the CDC, Dr. Redfield. Uh, there's been some reporting out there that, uh, that the president was unhappy with Redfield. He wrapped it up in his broader sort of praise of his own administration's response on coronavirus, but that was a president who didn't want to put any distance between himself and the CDC. 
that's interesting given all the reporting that we've been doing where the White House a lot of times thinks the CDC is getting out in front of things. The president also said he's only going to take hydroxychloroquine for another two days and his regimen is going to be over. That strongly suggests that the timeline on this was for the incubation potential period, potential incubation period of COVID-19. And so the president is using it and as a prophylactic for which there's very little medical advice. There's some treatment, there's some suggesting out there that it's decent on, on treatment. Um, Wade into this back and forth on Michigan. He clearly thinks that there's some sort of fraud taking place in Michigan, and he has a big problem with absentee voting. I would just point out that the president himself is an absentee voter, so it's unclear what he's driving at there. Uh, the governor of Nevada, in some ways, is being challenged by Democrats for doing what he's doing in terms of uh, absentee voting, trying to get more people involved that way. Michigan, the governor there, she's in a different position. She's a Democrat. Uh, there's something that is... I don't want to say conspiracy theory, but there's something, there's some misinformation cue that's getting to the president on what he thinks is happening in these states because uh, he himself is an absentee voter and absentee voting works fine across the country. It's not flawless, but it's a system that works. So the president's very upset about that. He did so back off on his threat to withhold funds, though. So we'll see if there's any softening there. And in general, the president thinks he's doing a great job. Uh, yet another briefing where the president is giving himself high marks. Allison? Hans, uh, sticking with the Michigan theme here, the president said to visit a Ford plant there tomorrow. Uh, the state's attorney general has asked President Trump to wear a mask during that visit. Uh, has the president said anything about that? We'll see where he comes down on that ultimately. I mean, his general view is he doesn't like masks. Yeah. I didn't hear anything explicit in there. It's a promise to wear a mask, but sometimes he promises to abide by local rules. There has been some reporting that he's worn masks behind the scenes, just not masks in front of okay. the camera. And he's also suggesting another trip to Michigan to view the damage of those breach dams. Uh, so the president may be going back yeah. to Michigan at, at, at a later date. But uh, president clearly keen to get out to the country. And you look at the places he's visited. They're all swing states that are crucial to his reelection. Yep. Hans, the Associated Press reporting uh, Republican political operatives are recruiting pro-Trump doctors to urge reopening yeah. without meeting the CD safety guideline, a uh, CDC rather safety guidelines. What is the White House saying about that? Well, so when you ask when you ask White House officials about sort of what the metrics and the gating criteria should be, they fall back on the task force gating. Now, they are always willing to put a little distance between themselves and the CDC because they think the CDC is too prescriptive uh, in the terms of White House officials. It did not, denies Americans to do the ability to do too many things. Here, it seems to be an end run, according to the Associated Press, and that is that there is an effort to get Republican-leading doctors to give people the confidence uh, and, and the wherewithal to go out and, mm -hmm. and to maybe start opening up before things are fully ready to open up. Allison? All right, Hans Nichols, thanks so much for that recap of that meeting at the White House. Appreciate it. You bet. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo not backing down from his recommendation to fire the State Department's watchdog. President Trump removed Inspector General Steve Linick last week at Pompeo's request. Here's the secretary at a press briefing earlier today. First, uh, the president has the uh, unilateral right to choose who he wants to be his inspector general at every agency in the federal government. Uh, they are presidentially confirmed positions, and those persons, just like all of us, serve at the pleasure of the president of the United States. In this case, I recommend it to the president that Steve Linick be terminated. I frankly should have done it some time ago. Pompeo is also facing fresh scrutiny today after an NBC News exclusive report found that Pompeo and his wife were holding private, lavish dinners at the White House funded with taxpayer dollars. State Department officials involved in these Madison dinners tell NBC News their purpose was to bolster Pompeo's political ambitions. NBC News national political reporter Josh Letterman is one of the reporters who broke this story, and he is joining me now. Josh, tell us more about these Madison dinners. How many were there? Who was on the guest list? What do you know? Well, they were in honor of James Madison, the 
former president at the start of our country, who was also secretary of state and held these kinds of salons where he would exchange ideas with foreign diplomats and ambassadors. Uh, but that's not exactly what was happening here in these some two dozen dinners that Secretary Pompeo held, Allison. NBC News obtained a master list of everyone who was invited to all of these dinners, and we crunched the numbers and found only about 14 percent were actually diplomats. The others were a lot of bold names that had more political connotations, uh, including big Republican donors, uh, several politicians, all Republicans, uh, large business owners, uh, as well as some celebrity types. Reba McIntyre was invited to one, Dale Earnhardt Jr., the race car driver, as well wow. as Supreme Court Justices Alito uh, and Gorsuch. I know, Josh, that you spoke with State Department officials who said that they raised concerns internally. What did they tell you? Yeah, there's been concerns at the State Department about this, really dating back to when these dinners started in 2018. And what officials we spoke with told us, Allison, was that they were concerned that they are essentially using government resources to create a donor Rolodex for Pompeo in the future. Because as they were sending out all these invitations, Every single piece of contact information, cell phone numbers for people's personal assistance and their addresses was all being bounced back to Pompeo's wife's personal Gmail address, meaning she could ostensibly carry all of that forward uh, into the future. They were concerned that this was not an appropriate use of taxpayer dollars uh, and wanted to know how high up in the government people even knew that these dinners were taking place. Speaking of how high up, did the president know about these dinners? Do we have any idea? It's a great question. We don't know whether the president himself knew, but it would not have been hard for him to know about it because on the list of people who were either invited or attended were several cabinet secretaries, including the Treasury Secretary, the Defense Secretary, the Agricultural Secretary, a lot of people who are around the president quite a bit were in on these dinners as well. Uh, Josh, back to Inspector General Steve Linick's firing. NBC News learned that Linick had been investigating Pompeo. Here's what the Secretary of State said about that during his briefing. Let's be clear. There are claims that this was for retaliation, for some investigation that the Inspector General's office here was engaged in. It's patently false. I have no sense of what investigations were taking place inside the Inspector General's office couldn't possibly have retaliated for all the things. I've seen the various stories that like, someone was walking my dog to sell arms to my dry cleaner. I mean, I mean it's all just crazy. Josh, did Pompeo say then why he wanted Linux fired? He did not, except in very general terms. Quick fact check for you on Pompeo himself saying there that he had no idea what investigations the inspector general was doing. Well, a day ago, he said he did know of at least one investigation, which was into this Saudi arms deal. So he at least knew about that one. But every day that this story goes on, Allison, we're learning about more and more of what the inspector general was looking into, that he was also looking into this issue about whether Pompeo enlisted a political appointee to run personal errands, like walking his dog, making dinner reservations for him and his wife. Uh, but as far as the actual reason, the, uh, the administration is required to tell Congress why they remove an inspector general. So far, the only thing they've said and the only thing Pompeo has said is that he wasn't doing a good job, they weren't happy with him, that he should have been out of there sooner, but they will not put any meat on the bone, no specifics about what Linick did wrong that merited removing him from the office on Friday night. Still so many questions there. Josh Letterman, thank you so much for your reporting. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. 
This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. The CDC out with new guidance on treating a coronavirus-linked inflammatory illness in children. More than 200 kids have been affected in 24 states. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren has the story. The CDC at least 24 states and 10 countries around the world. According to the briefing, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, is thought to develop about four weeks after exposure to COVID-19. Many of those children never showing any symptoms caused directly by the virus. But weeks later, a majority of cases are presenting with a fever and gastrointestinal symptoms, believed to be caused by an abnormal immune response. The iceberg. But this morning, there is also hope. The CDC says hospitals are having success with some treatments, including immunotherapy and steroids used to calm an overactive immune response. It's what doctors in Louisiana used on 12-year-old Juliet Daly, who went into cardiac arrest before responding to treatment. She's now out of the hospital and at her latest checkup showed no signs of permanent heart damage. How dramatic was Juliet's turnaround? She came in, in you know, really near death. Um, within a matter of days, um, we were able to get her off the ventilator, breathing on her own, get her out of the hospital within 10 days. Her family now hoping Juliet's story can help pave the way for others. And Kristen joins me live now. Uh, Kristen, this is just uh, has been a terrifying story for parents learning about this illness over the past few weeks. Just a reminder for them, what should they be looking out for here? Right. And this is key is recognizing the symptoms and getting your child help if you see them. And doctors say this isn't subtle. This is a prolonged fever. A lot of kids also present with some type of rash and then a biggie is abdominal pain, some type of gastrointestinal issue. They looked at some of the kids that have been diagnosed with this early on. And at one hospital in Long Island, 97 percent of them had GI symptoms. And again, you will notice that something is wrong with your child. They'll be listless, not responding, not wanting to eat and really complaining about pain. So you should be able to tell, you know, it's, it's still very rare, even though we are seeing cases build, but the problem is it's yeah. so random. These are not kids that have pre-existing conditions. They're not kids that showed that they had COVID-19. And so that's the scariest part for parents and why this, there's this really yeah. big push for doctors and parents to, to recognize it because there is help. They do do have treatments for this. Yeah. And would you just run us through that? What is the latest guidance for treating kids uh, if they do, in fact, have this illness? 
Right, so this is believed to be an overactive inflammatory response to COVID-19. It usually shows up between four and six weeks after. So what they're doing is they're treating this inflammation. They're treating the body's immune system, trying to tamp it down. They're using things like immunotherapies that quiet the body's immune system. They're using steroids that do the same thing. And so with that, you saw Juliet in that story, they are able to turn these kids around really quickly if they get to the hospital, if they get these treatments in time, most go home within a few days. So that's very good news. But again, it's just getting there, getting the treatment, because you saw in that other case, it could end quite terribly. Yeah, uh, really a scary situation uh, for parents there. Kristen, thank you so much. You bet. Antibody tests, diagnostic tests, and now antigen tests. Which coronavirus test is right for you? NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn takes a look. This morning, Reuters reporting new plans for a nationwide study of more than 300,000 Americans to try and track the spread of the coronavirus. The CDC will test samples from blood donors in 25 cities looking for antibodies, which are created by the immune system after it fights off the virus. About to take the antibody testing. We first gave you an inside look at what it's like to take an antibody test last month. There's a huge line outside. Three NBC News producers, David, Michelle, and Lauren, all had different symptoms of COVID-19 over the last three months. Cough, fever, body aches, even nausea and loss of smell. But they never got a diagnostic test. If it's positive, it could mean I had the coronavirus back in March. So they volunteered to take an antibody test after they recovered. The results, Michelle and Lauren, positive. David, negative. But with more than 150 of these tests now on the market, many not authorized by the FDA, health officials have sounded the alarm on their accuracy. So our producers volunteered to roll up their sleeves again to see how the tests compare. Let's see what Quest Laboratories finds in my blood. They offer direct-to-consumer antibody testing. Simply sign up online and make an appointment with the lab. You just sign up on your own. You don't even need to go see a doctor. Okay, so then they used you. telemedicine. Um, so I had heard today that you guys were now going to be doing antibody tests. This time, the producers had a five-minute video visit with a doctor online who ordered the test through LabCorp. Last, they went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, Let's head on it. which developed its own test available for healthcare workers, first responders, and people like our producers interested in donating their plasma for research. So we'll see if these test results are similar to the other ones. All of the tests involved a blood draw and the results back in about 24 hours. For all four tests, the results were consistent. Lauren and Michelle positive, David negative. What do you take away from that? The fact that our producers took four different antibody tests and got the same results each and every time. Yeah, that's great. I think that hopefully over time, we'll see which of these tests perform the best. There are a few that are FDA authorized under emergency use authorizations to be able to be used, and those tend to be more reliable, up to 100% reliability. Before taking any antibody test, check the FDA's website to see which ones are authorized and make sure you ask the lab or doctor which one they use before you go. Is there anything someone should do differently if they know that they developed the antibody for this virus. We're really recommending that people proceed with caution, continue all the recommended things that everybody needs to do right now. Wear a mask, wash your hands, clean your surfaces. It's ideal to take an antibody test three to four weeks after feeling symptoms. While you're sick is a different test, now becoming more widely available. It's diagnostic. You take that test before or during symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo taking a diagnostic test on live TV. This one involves a very large swab that takes a sample from deep in the back of the throat. That's it. Some newer versions use saliva samples. The reliability of the diagnostic test depends on which test you're getting. The FDA says molecular or PCR tests are the most reliable and can take up to a week for results. Also, a new type of diagnostic test called an antigen test can diagnose COVID-19 in less than an hour. The FDA approved it for emergency use, but also warns it may not be accurate every time. It still can have false negatives, which means that they tell you you're negative when in fact you actually have the disease. And that's one of the concerning things. Because you could be spreading it to others unknowingly. Exactly. 
And Vicky joins me live now. All right, Vicky, three NBC News producers took different antibody tests. They're all with consistent results. How accessible are these tests? How much do they cost? Good news here, Alex, and they're even more accessible now than they were about a month ago when we took the first test with those producers. Great. They were very easy to get appointments, and they spent as little as a dollar out of pocket. We have seen these tests going for up to $300 wow. per test, but I will say it's not a situation of you get what you pay for. It really is call around, okay. figure out if it's better for you to do it through the lab, through your insurance company, through your doctor's office. Yeah, I have seen some doctor's offices saying they have, and the prices looked a little high. Good to know that it's it, you don't have to pay more to get more. Uh, in terms exactly. of businesses, Vicky, how are they looking at these antibody tests and, and thinking of incorporating them as they start to reopen? It's a really interesting question. It came up on a call today. It's still too early. We know that these um, antibodies mm -hmm. sh showing up means that you've recovered. That is what the research is showing so far. It's very promising. But there is more data needed so that they can understand how much immunity it confers and how long does it last. So I think in the next month and two months, as we see more of these tests with consistent results like the ones that we saw in this story, employers will be more confident. That may be one factor in what they're considering when deciding which of their workers comes back to the office, for example. So that is the value in having this information. Yeah. And as we're seeing with so many tests out there and more people taking them and more results coming in and more research being done, those pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together, Allison. Yeah, Vicki, we are learning so much more every day. Great info there, Vicki Wynn. Thank you so much. Good to see you. You too. All 50 states are partially easing their coronavirus restrictions today, but many areas are still seeing increases in coronavirus cases. So how can you stay safe? Joining me now, Dr. Clyde Yancey, Chief of Cardiology at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, of course. Dr. Yancey, wonderful to have you back. Uh, the CDC released detailed guidelines this week for the states. Uh, one of the recommendations there, 14 days of decline in coronavirus cases, we are not really seeing that in many places. So how can people stay safe as their communities begin to reopen? Well, Allison, it's wonderful to be back with you. And these are important questions. The CDC is based on a model that says if these circumstances are met, we can be reasonably certain that it is safe to reengage. But they are guidance statements, guidelines, if you will, and there will be a context that has to be applied to this. But in general, I think the guidance is spot on, and we should follow that guidance. But in local areas, there may be the necessity to modify that depending on prevailing circumstances. What about people who have to be at work, Dr. Yancey? I know a Ford plant in Chicago had to shut down twice in 24 hours after two workers there tested positive. That plant just reopened a few days ago. What is your best advice for workers who simply cannot stay home right now? So this is an unbelievably important conversation, right? Because we started with what are the guidance statements from the CDC about whether or not you can re-engage? And so those are some big statements that have to do with population dynamics. Now we're talking about the individual dynamic and what is it that the person can do to know that it's safe to re-engage? Guess what? It's what we've been talking about over and over again. Are you able to practice social distancing, physical distancing, at least a six foot perimeter? Do you have personal PPE? Are you able to wear a mask? Do you have access to appropriate hand hygiene? And can you maintain clean surfaces around you? If all of those things can be done, and particularly for essential workers, then with some notable risk, it is reasonable to re-engage. And so this is really a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Think about what's happening at the population level, but also thinking about what's happening at the individual level. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yancey, the CDC is now saying coronavirus does not spread easily on contaminated surfaces. For those of us who maybe have been wiping down packages and groceries for months now or waiting before we bring things into our house, do we still need to be worried about that? You know, I think being prudent is always going to be correct. I mean, would you really want to back away mm -hmm. from something that seemingly has given you protection? This is a very dynamic environment. We're learning new things, new facts, new 
observations on a regular basis. I think it is reasonable to continue to be cognizant, aware of the surfaces around you, and let the information continue mm -hmm. to flow in. But if you've gotten accustomed to keeping your surrounding area clean, I don't think I would change that right now. Dr. Yancey, I have to say it's comforting just to say the least. Washing hands, wiping stuff down, at least it makes me feel like uh, I'm making an effort to keep my home clean, to keep things yes. safe. Yes. If it does nothing more than that. Yes. Uh, confirmed again this week, this life. time by the... Oh. I, I, I have to say, I have the cleanest hands ever. My mother is so proud. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Dr. Yancey, con confirmed again this week, this time by the CDC, minority communities in our country are being hit the very hardest by this disease. We have talked a bit about why that is, but if we could delve into that again, uh, and, and what kind of change, even if it's just small incremental change, do we need to start with to start bringing some relief to these communities uh, who are suffering so greatly under the weight of COVID-19? So let's be very explicit here. Let's break this down into three quick statements. Why does this occur? It occurs mostly because of the life and living circumstances of many underrepresented minorities that live in this country. That exposes them to a high risk of infection. Second, why are the outcomes so troublesome? We know that high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease leads to more complications, so that's clear. But then the important question that you just raised is, how do we approach this now, now that the curtain has been pulled back and we see the extent of these disparities, these differences, what can we do about this? How can we make life different? First, we can reinvest in these communities. We can really make certain that health is the top priority. And we can understand that these communities remain today at risk. And so as we think about deploying what many are calling ubiquitous testing, these are the communities where we should deploy that test, that procedure, those kinds of activities. So we can identify who already has a condition and how we can help them self-isolate to reduce the spread. Because once the infection gets into those communities, it really seems to be quite malignant. That's a dangerous word to use, but I intend to use it. We really have to understand the malignancy of this infection in certain communities, take every step as a precaution, increase the testing there, and long-term, think about reinvesting in those communities to raise the level of health. Dr. Yancey, thank you so much for your expertise, your thoughtful advice always. It's, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to have you on. Thank right. you. Same here. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Thank you.
NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. A Las Vegas Costco employee is being applauded for handling an angry customer who refused to wear a mask. I just put you on my 3,000 follower Instagram feed, mostly local. Hi everyone, I work for Costco and I'm asking this member to put on a mask because that is our company policy. So either wear the mask And or... I'm not doing it because I woke up in a free country. Have a great day. So you're going to take this car from me. Sir, have a great Pull day. You are no longer welcome here in our warehouse. You need to leave. NBC News business and tech correspondent Joe Lynn Kent joins me now. And Joe, what did Costco have to say about that incident? You know, Costco is very reluctant to talk about anything ever, and they declined to comment on this particular incident. They said uh, nothing on the matter. In fact, it seems that their employee is speaking for himself. He did tweet out last night. He said, thank you for all the support. And he said he was, you know, working on behalf of members of Costco. So that was basically the reaction on the official front. But a lot of people saw this video. And Allison, I think what this really underscores here is a new reality that so many retail frontline workers are facing, right? They are working in these environments. Yeah. They are putting themselves at risk. They are hoping to be able to be paid and compensated fairly. And yet they also have a new job to enforce health and safety regulations despite the fact that they have not necessarily been fully trained on these things while they are still needing that critical PPE that they've been looking for. So it's a widespread issue across the board. It's not the first time we've seen a customer act out in such a way, but certainly you can see there's a little yeah. bit of politics uh, driving that, that statement there that you just saw. Yeah, Joe, earlier this week, Target had said that it's extending its temporary pay increase for its employees who are working during the pandemic. Any other major companies or, or companies for that matter following suit here? Yeah, so Kroger was the first uh, Kroger was the first one to come under fire and they eliminated last weekend their hazard or hero pay as they called it. But they did add an additional up to $400 for full-time workers uh, for them to have thank you pay. And then you saw Target extend that till July. The others have not yet acted, but there is time, Allison. We're looking at a time horizon of about the end of the month. So probably through next week, you may start, see some start to see some changes on this front. But this comes as today the UFCW, which is the biggest union representing grocery workers, uh, is putting out new data saying deaths from COVID-19 have doubled in the past five weeks. Well, it's just incredible, Joe, what those workers are doing day in and day out. Uh, that hero, that hazard pay, certainly, certainly well-deserved. Uh, Joe, thanks so much for your reporting. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She's following the latest news and coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Hey there, Alexa. How about an update? Hey, Allison. So we're starting off with some news from the CDC. The CDC released reopening guidelines this week, including guidance for businesses and schools. That's the latest from NBC's Elizabeth Chuck. Now, among a number of measures, the 60-page document encourages restaurants to install sneeze guards and partitions, stagger employee shifts, and ask customers to wait in their cars before being seated. The CDC warned that not all businesses and schools should necessarily begin reopening just yet, depending on the number of COVID-19 infections in the local area. And from NBC's Dara Gregorian, hundreds rallied against Michigan's stay-at-home order today, but this time the demonstration looked a little different. Several barbers and hairstylists offered free trims as part of, quote, Operation Haircut. Some protesters did not wear masks or follow social distancing guidelines. Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer offered this warning. If people protest, I ask that they wear masks. I ask that they observe the six feet apart. And if they don't, uh, we will have to take some action here. Whitmer also spoke about the heavy rainfall and two breached dams, which led to record-setting flooding in central Michigan over the last day. About 11,000 people have evacuated so far, with rising water expected to continue until 8 p.m. tonight.
And the president, uh, President Trump now says he doesn't think it'll be necessary to withhold funding from Michigan over their vote by mail efforts. This morning, the president blasted Michigan and Nevada for expanding their mail in voting ahead of upcoming elections, going so far as to threaten to withhold federal funds. He now appears to be walking back on that. And the American Nurses Association is refuting pr President Trump's claim that many health workers are taking hydroxychloroquine to prevent a coronavirus infection. The president told reporters earlier in the week he had been taking the drug and said thousands of frontline workers were as well. In a statement to NBC News, the Nurses Association said it, quote, has not received reports from nurses or other frontline healthcare workers utilizing hydroxychloroquine as a preventative treatment for COVID-19. Furthermore, to date, research has not shown clear evidence that hydroxychloroquine has a preventative effect for COVID-19. Now, a cyclone expected to hit India and Bangladesh this week has forced the region to frantically organize evacuations all under the threat of coronavirus. More than 2.6 million people were moved into shelters, according to this, the Associated Press, as this like, cyclone began to hit. The evacuations, of course, were made all the more difficult by the pandemic and the attempt to keep safety measures in place. Authorities have warned of extensive damage to houses and the possibility of serious flooding in several cities. Those are the latest headlines for this hour. Lots of news there. Allison, back to you. All right, Alexa, thank you so much. And you can visit our live blog. It's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We'll always have the latest updates there. Dallas just reported a record number of coronavirus deaths a day after the governor announced plans to keep lifting restrictions across Texas. The Dallas area reported 14 more deaths on Tuesday. The total there now 191 with nearly 8000 positive cases. NBC News reporter Priscilla Thompson joins me now from Dallas. And Priscilla, what are both state and local officials saying about these new numbers? Allison, we've spent the day here in Dallas County, and local officials have been, of course, encouraging folks to continue to wear those masks, but they're also asking people to stay inside if they can until the county sees that 14-day decline in terms of the number of positive cases. You mentioned they've seen around 200 to 250 cases each day for a while now, so they're hitting a plateau, but it's not yet hitting that decline that the federal government has recommended. Now, the governor here, for his part, has said that as long as hospitalizations remain low, he feels comfortable continuing to open up the economy here. But the local judge here says that it's about more than just those hospitalization numbers. Take a listen to what he told me. The challenge is not just to not overwhelm the hospital. The challenge also is to save human life and to uh, get the economy moving again in a sustainable way. Remember, it's not just what the governor says you can do, it's what you should do, but it's also what consumers will do. And Allison, that is the big question. What will people do? I can say we've spent the day here in the Bishop Arts District where we've seen a steady stream of folks coming out to grab food and also just walking through the neighborhood, and we haven't seen a whole lot of those masks. Yeah, you mentioned the part of Dallas where you are. It's home to a lot of businesses. How do people there feel about the state lifting its restrictions even further? I know you said you haven't seen a whole lot of masks today. Yeah, I mean, so we've spoken to more than or nearly a dozen folks out here today, and all of them said that they're concerned about the increased numbers that we're seeing here, mm -hmm. but they still still feel like this phased reopening is the right move. I actually spoke to one woman who was a grocery store clerk, and she tells me that she feels safer now that more businesses are open because for a while there, it felt like folks were just going to the grocery store to get that social interaction, and now they have more businesses where they can mm. go to and sort of have that feeling. Um, and I also spoke to a number of other folks who have basically said that the government has done all that they can do, but now it's really on businesses and individuals to sort of figure out what's next. Take a listen uh, to what some of those folks told me. Uh, the only thing that we can do at this point is take advantages of the opportunity to open that's been extended to us and try to do that in such a manner where people feel very safe and comfortable coming into the store. I mean, we do have to take our directives from the government, but also you run your own business. So you run it as you see fit. If you feel like, you know, you need to put a table in between, then you do that. But I think it's, it's just a juggling act between the both. 
And for the most part, folks do feel like these businesses are operating with the necessary safety protocols. But their bigger concern is the other individuals around them that may not be wearing those masks or practicing that social distancing that's going to be key to preventing this from spreading, Allison. Yeah. Priscilla, we know restaurants, gyms and hair salons are allowed to be open, at least in some capacity in Texas. What would be part of the next phase of the state's reopening plan? Yeah, so the governor made that announcement this week, and he said that child care facilities could open immediately. But also this weekend, we're going to begin to see bars, bingo halls uh, also begin to reopen. Uh, and restaurants are going to be operating at 50 percent capacity. But those bars are going to look a little bit differently. They're trying to keep people seated at their tables, so not a whole lot of mingling. They're discouraging folks from trying to hit that dance floor in order to really keep folks separated with their groups that they came in with and to prevent any of that possible virus transmission that could occur. All right, Priscilla Thompson in Dallas, thank you so much. Beach going is a big business in Florida and Memorial Day weekend usually draws big crowds. But will Floridians follow social distancing guidelines this holiday weekend? NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Delray Beach with a preview. Allison, good afternoon. I'm in Delray Beach today, standing on a stretch of sand that was closed until about two days ago. Parts of Florida now reopening their beaches with restrictions. If you look over my shoulder right here, you'll see some folks hanging out. Most of them are standing up and just walking along the beach. Swimming, walking, jogging, all of that is allowed. But when you see people sitting down, lying down in some cases on their towels, that is actually against the rules. It says no sunbathing and no surfing at the beach. One of the restrictions, and there are actually drones right now that are be, uh, being operated by the police that are coming down, looking aerially at what people are doing and warning them through loudspeaker if they're breaking the rules. Now, this is a little bit kind of a hopscotch situation because if you go a couple miles just in the other direction north of where I'm standing, it's Palm Beach County proper. There are no rules as to what you can and cannot do at the beach, generally speaking. So it depends where in Florida you are. Now, Miami-Dade and Broward County, they have huge metropolitan areas with Miami Beach and Fort Lauderdale. They have not reopened their beaches yet. They're not going to do that until after Memorial Day, knowing that there's going to be huge crowds in general, because, of course, it is one of the favorite holidays of this country. People want to be able to get outside and get back to the beach who've been stuck inside for so long. The other big news from down here today, Allison, is the business is opening. They opened in Palm Beach County, where I am, about a week and a half ago. But in Miami Beach, today marks the very first start of their staged reopen. 600-plus stores when it comes to retail and grooming services are opening today. At least they have the ability to. And then next week, it's going to be the restaurants next Wednesday. So we're seeing parts of South Florida now that have been clamped up and shut down for so long, starting to reopen, whether that's beaches or stores or other sorts of businesses. But the one caveat to that, Allison, in Miami Beach, no hotels are open. So in an industry that has generated some $18 billion a year from visitors coming here, largely to see the beaches and stay at hotels, that is not an option still for the time being. I'm in Delray Beach. Allison, let me send it back to you. All 50 states are lifting their stay-at-home orders in some capacity today. Meanwhile, the CDC has quietly released its detailed guidelines for reopening. The 60-page document is similar to one the White House shelved last week for being too specific. It has guidance for reopening schools, mass transit, and non-essential businesses. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. And Dr. John, what's in this 60-page document? Give us the uh, Reader's Digest version, if you will. And Allison, this is a more specific document than what they released earlier, where the earlier guidelines were basically giving you basic principles on what you should be doing in order to open things up safely. This one goes into more details, and specifically it goes into details concerning contact tracing, looking at that 14-day decrease in numbers and what that means, even how to calculate the numbers of cases you have based on negatives and positive of the cases in the community. So it goes into a lot more detail for very specific groups, but it's not as detailed as the page that the White House said they couldn't put out. This is the one that's a little watered down, but not much. It's going to give people and organizations some mm -hmm. very good guidelines on what they need to do in order to get these things set up. And again, its main purpose is to say, hey, we know things are going to open up. Let's do it as safe as we can. And it even has recommendations on what to do if things start getting a little bit out of control and cases start going up again. Yeah. And the main thing, again, that contact tracing, that testing, those are the important parts, Allison. So having looked at those guidelines, Dr. John, and as we've reported, 50 states opening in some capacity today, based on that guidance, are these states ready to reopen? 
you know, Allison, some of the states are ready to open. Some of the states are not ready to open. But you can imagine yeah. the pressure on a governor saying these other states are opening. We need to open as well. So I think the main message here is even right. if your state is opening, you need to be very careful. And that means you need to do the social distancing. You need to listen to the authorities when they tell you that, hey, we're going to close certain things down. And that's one of the things they talked about in this guideline of at a certain point, they might have to close down certain venues in order to keep people safe. As people, as a community, we just need to understand that and listen to that because the main objective here is to make sure we're all safe. And if we waited till every state was prepared to open, it'd be a long while. And I don't think people would be able to um, tolerate that for much longer. Yeah. Dr. John, let's head across the pond, if you don't mind. An EU back study out today suggests a 50 days on, 30 days off lockdown strategy. C could you explain what that is? And do you think something like that could actually work? You know, it was based on modeling. We've seen modeling in the past, Allison, where you know they've mm -hmm. given us these huge predictions. At one point, if you remember, they were talking about 2.2 million deaths, and, and then the model got watered down to 240,000 right. and then 100,000. So models change constantly, and so that's what they're looking at here is the modeling and what that means for people. What they looked at is they said, okay, the the optimum strategy if we did three months of strict lockdown, nobody left their houses, that would get things under control very quickly. But they realized that people aren't going to tolerate that either, and so they said, well, let's look at different scenarios. Scenarios and the scenario that proved best was a 50 day mitigation strategy where essentially they, over 50 days they social distance, close schools, close large venues, those types of things that can keep people healthy. And then for 30 days they opened it up again, only to close it down for 50 days again, open it up for 30 days. And this was a rolling measure they did over time until they got things under control, with the idea being that people will be able to tolerate those mitigation strategies for 50 days, almost two months, and then the relaxation of those for a month and keep going back and forth. Uh, of course, time will tell and patience will tell if people right. truly will be able to do that because once things open up, it's harder to get the genie back in the bottle, basically, and get people to go back to those mitigation strategies. Yeah, I was just thinking it's got to be really difficult once you let people go a little bit more freely, trying to reel them back in again. Uh, Dr. John, we also got some more vaccine news today, a study showing that monkeys can develop immunity to the coronavirus. What does that mean uh, for humans? You know, this is good news to a certain extent, and we've had some pretty good news mm -hmm. about vaccines, again, to a certain extent, that seem to be working in humans, seem to be working in monkeys. But the thing you have to remember is, number one, these are very preliminary studies on very small, small numbers of people. With the monkey vaccine, it's fantastic because their immune system is a lot like ours, but it's not exactly like ours. So this is a step mm -hmm. in the right direction, okay. and it still looks like that time schedule of 12 to 18 months is probably realistic. And Allison, I think that's what we're looking at still. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this on Monday. Uh, we had some other good news. Drug maker Moderna reporting positive results from a phase one vaccine study. Uh, but Dr. John, now scientists are questioning whether the company actually released enough data. What should our viewers know about this? study was a phase one study, and we only got partial results from the phase one. And a lot of scientists are saying, wait a minute, usually we wait till we get all the results to make any mention of this. But it's one of those things that's so much in the press and investors are looking at this. So the company put out the information. 45 patients were tested. They gave us the results on eight patients. And that's what a lot of scientists are saying. Wait, wait, we need the results on all 45 patients to make a good understanding of what happened because it's possible it worked on 45. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work on the other ones. So uh, again, you know, we have data. It's pretty decent data. It gives us some good information, but it doesn't give us all the information. And it's a very early trial still with a long ways to go. So again, we're making headway. We're getting there, but we're not quite there yet, Allison. All right, Dr. John, always great to have you on. Thank you so much. You bet. The CDC put out its own report on coronavirus cases in the U.S., breaking down that data by race and ethnicity. In it, CDC Director Robert Redfield acknowledged a, quote, disproportionate burden of COVID-19 illness and death among racial and ethnic minority groups. That entire report, though, just four pages. NBC News correspondent Jeff Bennett joining us now. And Jeff, walk us through this report, if you will. It's just four pages long. Does it offer much detail? Uh, not really, Allison. And look, the CDC, the Trump yeah. administration, is required by Congress to present uh, disaggregated COVID-19 data. So to present the data specific to race and, and ethnicity. And we know across the country, the, sa the story is the same. It's the same slow rolling tragedy in Philadelphia, 
New York, Milwaukee, Chicago, New Orleans, in all of those communities, communities of color have a higher incidence of COVID-19. There's a higher incidence, higher rate of hospitalization, and a higher rate of death. There are, are a few reasons for that. One is that black and brown folks tend to be overrepresented in groups of essential workers, frontline workers. It's also true that the legacy of systemic inequity is that uh, communities of color have higher levels right. of those comorbidities, those underlying uh, uh, diseases that make COVID-19 particularly deadly. And the reason we know that there are higher rates in these major cities and in, in, in certain states is because of local data. Right now, there is no national data broken out by race and ethnicity the same way it's broken out by age, gender, and location. And that's the thing that public health experts, that policymakers have been clamoring for since really February. And now here we are, May going into June, and the federal government still doesn't have it. Uh Jeff, you mentioned Congress required this report from the CDC. Uh, what kind of a reaction is it getting on Capitol Hill so far? Well, congressional Democrats, to say the least, are unimpressed. Uh, Patty Murray, who is the senator yeah. who leads one of the relevant committees, she said that what Congress required was a comprehensive report on health disparities related to the COVID-19 pandemic. What we got from President Trump, in her words, was a lazy four-page copy and paste project that links to a handful of limited previously available data sets. Frank Pallone, the congressman who, who heads a different committee in the House side, he says much of the same. He says, we know that, that communities of color bear a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 illness and death. Uh, he says, but the administration fails to offer new or original information and data. And so this report that the CDC offered, the compilation of links, it linked to information that was already on its website. There is no new information, no new data nothing of, of use that can be used in a new way by public health yeah. experts to really pinpoint the problem, target it, and address it, Allison. Yeah, Jeff, let's talk about that a little bit more, uh, because uh, this is this is important data. And the more detailed the data is, the more it can help those public officials better serve their communities. Uh, you know, what kind of what kind of things can they then do? How important is it to have more specific information so they can make some changes? Well, as one public health expert I spoke to in Maryland put it, he said, without this information, communities are flying colorblind. And he says, you have to take those color blinds off to know how to you know, target public yeah. health messages, how to do specific interventions. If you know, and I'm in Northwest Washington, D.C. right now, if you know that there's an outbreak mm -hmm. in Northwest Washington, D.C. among a certain group of people, then that really informs how you address it, how you roll out testing, uh, you know, what churches or barbershops you might go to uh, to get the word out. But without any of that information, what you have are public health officials and, and state and city leaders guessing. Uh, and that really is not something that they can do right now, given the fact that you have thousands upon thousands right. of people dying each day. And as we mentioned, those deaths and those, and those cases are overrepresented in, in black and brown communities. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, before you go, uh, I'd like to ask you about something else going on in our nation's capital. The president's threat to withhold funding to the state of Michigan if it keeps expanding its vote by mail efforts. Michigan's secretary of state responded to President Trump earlier on MSNBC. Here's that clip. Well, every Michigan citizen has a right to vote by mail. It's a right that was enshrined in our state constitution by our voters in November of 2018. And so I have a responsibility as the chief election officer for the state of Michigan to ensure everyone knows how to exercise the right to vote. What's going on here, Jeff? Uh, well, a couple of things. The tweet that President Trump sent out about Michigan and Nevada, both are factually inaccurate from out applications, voter applications, which is a very different thing. The president said he's thinking about cutting federal funding for these states. Constitutionally, it's not clear that he can do that. There are also political questions about why he's picking a fight in Michigan, a state that he would need to keep and, and win in 2020 if he wants to uh, you know, uh, retain his position uh, in the White House. What we know yeah. is that this is one of the issues that President Trump likes to talk about when he tries to rally his base, this notion uh, that there are people who would try to, you know, mis mis misrepresent themselves and, and commit all sorts of acts of voter fraud at the polls when there is no information, there's no evidence to back that up. Remember when the president was elected, he said he was going to stand up this voter fraud commission. 
The commission, such that it existed, found no evidence of, of voter fraud. So this is something that the president likes to talk about, even though it is divorced entirely from the facts, Allison. All right, Jeff Bennett in D.C., thank you so much. Always great to see you. You too. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up we hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together i'm lester holt and for all my colleagues at nbc news take care if it's asking the tough questions would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown if it's asking for accountability respirators and ventilators has the federal government stepped up enough if it's navigating the new normal in america and if it's sunday it's meet the press the coronavirus outbreak what's next nbc news has in-depth coverage answers to your questions insight from medical experts and up to the minute live blog updates for continuing coverage turn to the networks and platforms of nbc news President Trump's feud with the World Health Organization is heating up. He threatened to permanently cut off U.S. funding unless the WHO commits to, quote, major substantive improvements in the next 30 days. Today, the head of the organization's emergency program urged people to stay away from the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, which President Trump is taking. At this stage, uh, hydroxychloroquine, norchloroquine have been as yet found to be effective <clears throat> in the treatment uh, of COVID-19 or in the prophylaxis against uh, uh, coming down with the disease. Um, in fact, the opposite uh, in, in that uh, warnings have been issued by many authorities regarding the potential side effects of the drug. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons joining me now from London. Keir, the WHO director general started his briefing by thanking member nations, leaving the U.S. off that list. What is the organization saying or, or not saying, I guess, about Trump's letter? <laughs> well, Dr. Tedros has had a rough time in recent months uh, at the hands of uh, President Trump. Dr. Tedros, of course, is the director general of the World Health Organization. I mean, this is the letter that President Trump wrote to him 
questioning uh, the World Health Organization's relationship with China. Uh, it ha raises some important questions. It raises some good questions, Alison. So, for example, it asks about the relationship, the, the role of Taiwan. Now, of course, you'll know that Taiwan is considered by China to be part of one China, and China has resisted again and again, mm -hmm. including during this assembly over the past few days, for Taiwan to be involved in the World, World Health Organization. There are many who think if Taiwan had had a voice, it would have raised concerns about the coronavirus earlier. President Trump makes that point, so it's a good point. But there are lots of other issues, uh, claims in here and accusations that just don't stand up. So, for example, he accuses the leader of the World Health Organization of praising China for its transparency. President Trump himself, earlier this year, praised China for its transparency. And another issue which is going to really uh, make it challenging for America's allies around the world is this letter gives uh, the World Health Organization 30 days, Alison, uh, to come up with a, a plan uh, to do things differently and not be so china orientated. Uh, but it doesn't really give any proposals on how to do that. So it's very difficult if America did uh, leave the World Health Organization, uh, it would be very difficult for our allies to, to, to follow. Uh, and, and it would therefore be a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty difficult diplomatic position, frankly. How are the other member nations responding? What kind of reaction are, are they giving? Well, it's just another example on the world stage of major yeah. countries around the world, nations that consider themselves to be allies of the United States, really just having to kind of take leadership. So what we saw on Monday at the beginning of this this summit that's been described as perhaps the most important in the history of the World Health Organization, we saw yeah. Angela Merkel of Germany, Macron of France speak uh, to the assembly. We saw President Xi of China speak to the assembly. Who we didn't see, we didn't see President Trump. Instead, you saw the Health and Human Services Secretary leading the American delegation. The thing is, though, Trump could have spoken. He could have said all the things that he said in this letter at that forum and also did some other things, you know, kind of stand behind other allies. And he didn't do that. And many people think that that was a lost diplomatic opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Keir Simmons in London, thanks so much for being with us. You bet. The coronavirus outbreak in Brazil is so bad that President Trump is considering a travel ban. The country just had its deadliest day on record, with more than 1,000 people dying of COVID-19 yesterday. NBC News chief global correspondent Bill Neely spoke with the governor of Brazil's largest city about this ongoing battle. We have two different positions right now in Brazil. The positions of the governors in favor to the quarantine, in favor to the social distance, in favor to the isolation, and the president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, against that. I am very sad as a Brazilian, uh, as a governor of Sao Paulo state, to fight against the virus and against the bad orientation and the wrong orientation of the president of Brazil. Bill Neely joins us now from Sao Paulo. And Bill, tell us more, if you will, about this tension between the local and the federal governments there in Brazil. Yes, Alison, you can call it tension. You could even call it anger, because the other thing the governor said to me is that there yeah. are two viruses in Brazil, coronavirus and Bolsonaro virus, referring to the president. Yes, I mean, the basic problem is that the president has one position, which is uh, coronavirus is just like a cold. Uh, the lockdown is unnecessary. You don't need to social distance. Get, out, get back to work. Get out on the street. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, and he was at a rally at the weekend hugging his supporters. He did wear a mask, which was unusual. But basically, he's tried to downplay the virus right from the beginning. And the governors and many mayors who want lockdowns, who want social distancing. So, you know, people are listening to two different messages. And it's almost... Yeah. Like in the United States, it's almost like if you support President Trump, you're going to do what he says. If you don't like President Trump, you're going to listen to Governor Cuomo. So the two country situations do mirror themselves to some degree. But Brazil, look, it's a huge crisis. As you said, a record number of deaths in the last 
24 hours. The coronavirus is now spreading more quickly here than anywhere on earth. And that crisis simply made worse by the, as you say, the divisions at the very top of government and the lack of a, a clear strategy, Alison. Bill, what are residents there saying about that mixed messaging? It just has to be incredibly confusing for all of them. Yes, and, you know, a quarter of Brazil's population live in dire poverty. In this city, millions live in favelas, overcrowded slums where access to running water, never mind soap, is an absolute luxury. So that they do want some guidance from the top. They also have a problem that they need money. So they need to go out to work. They need to earn money to feed their families. So they're, they're caught in the middle and they don't know who to listen to, really. So they go out to earn money to survive. And many of them, sadly, catch coronavirus and die. We were at uh, Brazil's biggest cemetery this morning. There are dozens of burials there every day. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of open graves at that cemetery waiting for the next day's deaths to arrive and to be buried. So it's a desperate situation for people here and really no guidance, no clear strategy from the top. Bill, we know President Trump's considering a travel ban on Brazil. What else do you know about that potential ban? Yeah, well, he said this at the, uh, at the White House yesterday. He said, uh, you know, Brazil was, as he put it, uh, having problems. He said Brazil was aiming for herd immunity. By the way, there is absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. So he said we're considering a travel ban on people from Brazil. Uh, and he talked about the governor of Florida uh, because the majority of people from Brazil come in there. Around two million people a year. Uh, at least come from Brazil to the United States. So this would be uh, quite a thing. But look, he's looking at the numbers. And right now, Brazil, uh, yesterday, for example, in, in deaths, Brazil was just below the United States as number two. In terms of overall cases, it's number three in the world now. Uh, but the official figures, uh, I think, hide something else. Uh, testing here is almost non-existent in many places. It's got one of the worst testing records in the world. So a doctor this morning told me that he believes the real rate of cases is 15 times higher than the official numbers. So it's those kinds of numbers that the CDC is looking at, that President Trump is looking at, and therefore, as you say, considering a travel ban from Brazil. All right, Bill Neely, thank you so much. What do classrooms in South Korea look like now after nearly three months without students or teachers? NBC News correspondent Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul to show us their new normal. Well, the South Korean government is being really cautious about this. They're bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages according to age groups. And they actually had to close some schools today shortly after opening because two students tested positive. But the vast majority of high school seniors did go back to school today and they experienced a different kind of first day at school. They were greeted in many cases by staff with thermometers, taking temperatures, handing out masks and hand sanitizer. Masks are now mandatory at schools unless, of course, you're eating in the cafeteria. But even that has changed. In some schools, uh, school lunch times have been sta staggered, so there are fewer people in the cafeteria. There are plastic partitions in some cafeterias and classrooms and desks, of course, spaced apart to observe social distancing. Also, rules about what happens if a, a student comes down with a fever. They're told to report it immediately and get evaluated. At some schools, some private schools, they also brought back young kids, preschool and kindergartners. Take a listen. Knowing how Korea has handled it, knowing how important um, and actually significant protocols like mask wearing and hand washing and um, extra vigilant cleaning of surfaces, etc. And knowing that those do have a really big effect on um, halting the spread of the virus, I think makes me feel a lot more comfortable with starting school again. 
The government and health officials really are still on high alert here, watching for clusters. In fact, they're just now investigating a possible cluster at one of the country's biggest hospitals, where four nurses have tested positive for COVID-19. Allison. Delayed symptoms, longer recovery, new clusters of the coronavirus are popping up in parts of China, and the virus is behaving differently this time around. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Frere explains the changes that doctors are seeing. Allison, in a lot of ways, China is getting back on track. The economy is coming back to life. Most kids will be back in school by the end of the month. But China is not out of the woods just yet. There are cities along the northern border with Russia that are completely locked down right now. And the worrying part is that Chinese experts who are there say the virus is somehow different. They say it's taking longer for symptoms to show. It's taking longer for people who are infected to recover. Doctors say they're seeing more damage to lungs as opposed to heart and kidney damage uh, that they saw in patients in Wuhan, where they continue to test every single person in the city. 11 million people are going to be tested in Wuhan. They're about halfway done right now. China has been moving pretty aggressively to stem any spread of the virus, especially before the big political meetings being held in Beijing. They start tomorrow. The National People's Congress is largely a ceremonial thing. They rubber stamp stuff. They give the party's outlook for the economy and development. It was supposed to be held in March, but it was postponed because it was the height of the outbreak here. And that had never happened before. Normally, it's a chance to get a read on what the leadership is thinking. This time, it, that it's going ahead is important for optics, that China is confident in its stability right now. And consider the issues. The global economy is stalled. Millions around the world have lost jobs, including here. And the U.S.-China relationship is probably at its worst point ever as the Trump administration continues to blame China for the pandemic. China has a pretty advanced system of detection and testing in place here, but authorities are still struggling to contain the virus. There are still restrictions in place in places like Beijing. The borders are still closed to foreigners and daily life is ruled by temperature checks and health codes. Scientists also admit that they still don't know what they're looking for in terms of these changes in the behavior of the virus and the cases in the north. Uh, but it is keeping this risk of a second wave very much alive here. Allison. More news in the Michael Flynn saga. The former national security advisor wants to force the judge in his criminal case to drop it. He has asked a federal appeals court for an order to do just that. NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams joining me now from Washington. Pete, earlier this month, the Justice Department filed a motion to dismiss this case. So what is this order now all about? Well, the judge hasn't done it yet. And what the Justice Department said is, yeah. <laughs> look, Judge Sullivan, you don't really have any discretion here. You just have to rubber stamp what we filed because we're the prosecutors. That's an executive branch function, and you can't tell us what to do. Uh, but the judge hasn't done that yet. So, in, in fact, he's done just the opposite. He appointed a retired federal judge to come in and argue why the Justice Department is wrong in its analysis. Remember, what the Justice Department said was, Yes, it may be true that when Michael Flynn was questioned shortly after Trump was inaugurated and he was national security advisor about his uh, discussions with the Russian ambassador to the U.S., it, it may be that he lied, but his lies weren't a crime because they weren't material to any open investigation. So for that reason, the Justice Department said, there's no crime here and we're going home. There's no case. Uh, what the judge has done is, is appoint this retired federal judge to come in and argue, no, the Justice Department is wrong about that. And the judge has also said he wants this retired judge to argue whether Flynn should instead be prosecuted for contempt of court, for saying uh, he pleaded guilty and now saying, I didn't do anything wrong, I shouldn't plead guilty, I want to withdraw my plea. So what Flynn's lawyers have said to the Court of Appeals here is, hey, the judge can't do this, make him stop. And the Court of Appeals hasn't acted on that yet. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly at this point what's going on because the judge has gone ahead and set a <laughs> schedule for uh, this uh, retired judge to, to submit legal briefs. And he's called for oral argument in early July on this case. Uh, so briefing all during June. So he's in no hurry to act on this. Um, it does seem at this point premature to ask the Court of Appeals to act to, to uh, this, this is what's mm -hmm. called a writ of mandamus, because the judge hasn't done anything for them to stop yet. He hasn't, he hasn't denied the government's motion. 
if he did that, then I could see Flynn's lawyers doing what they've done. But in any event, they're saying to the Court of Appeals, hey, get, make the judge knock this off. Make him grant the Justice Department's motion to dismiss so we can all go home. Pete, I would normally uh, wrap up a conversation with you by asking you what you think is next, but it sounds like from what you said, it's just not entirely clear. Right. And, and you know, it, so for now, n normally when somebody appeals something to a court of appeals, it takes the case out of the hands of the district judge. That's not the case here because this mm -hmm. isn't an appeal. A writ of mandamus is something different. So the case is still in Emmett yeah. Sullivan's hands. He's the district judge. So I can tell you what's going to happen next. Right now, he is calling for this retired judge to submit his briefs. He's saying he'll entertain other friend of court briefs from other parties. And we know that they are all okay. at the starting gates ready to go. There's a group of state attorneys, a Republican state attorney general, who are going to weigh in on the Justice Department side. There's a group of retired uh, uh, Justice Department lawyers who are going to weigh in on the other side. So... There's going to be a, a lot of action here, uh, I would guess, in the next several weeks. I don't think this case is going to go away anytime soon. And so the Flynn saga continues. Pete Williams, thank you so That's much. Right. You bet. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. By the end of the week, dentists in 40 states will be allowed to see non-emergency patients again. Today, dentists in Connecticut are telling people to open wide. MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jansing shows us the safety precautions they're taking. Yeah. 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 Connecticut orthodontist Dr. Gary Open is back in business, fully reopening his office today. We do have quite a backlog. We have been closed for six weeks. The new normal means keeping patients safe in the age of COVID. We are wearing higher level masks, N95s. We are wearing face shields also, and we're wearing disposable gowns. He's overhauled his office, investing in a new air filtration system, significantly reducing the number of patients he'll see each day and revamping waiting room procedures. Their temperature will be checked. Once everything is deemed OK, we will escort the patient to the chair where we'll be working. Dental practices are by nature invasive, and preliminary research suggests the coronavirus survives airborne for hours. That's why some industry insiders like hygienist Megan Zadrowski worry dental offices are reopening before it's safe. 
aerosols generated in the dental office are unavoidable, whether it's by dentist drills, whether it's by hygienist instruments, or even the patients themselves who may need to cough. The American Dental Association has issued national guidelines, including hygienists using hand tools instead of automated devices and limiting drills. Suggestions that Zadrowski worries not all dentists will follow. Would you go to a dentist right now for a non-emergent problem? I would absolutely avoid going to the dental office with a non-emergent service. A recent national survey by the American Dental Association found three in 10 dentist offices didn't have any supply of N95 masks and nearly 18 percent had no face shields. Connecticut dentist Dr. David Fantarella says it has been a challenge. We do have what we need. It has not been easy. He's invested beyond the guidelines, including a fogger to clean rooms and a mobile UVC unit to reduce pathogens. You understand why people are nervous? For sure. I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm also nervous on the flip side of that. If we don't do anything, what about that patient? That they get really sick. That they get really sick. All dentists facing the new reality that being afraid of the dentist means something different now. I wanted to make sure my child was safe and comfortable in a setting outside the home. What are you looking forward to most when all this is Uh, over? Well, getting my teeth straight, definitely. The challenge of reopening a business when it's anything but business as usual. And Chris Jansing joins me now. Chris, let's talk for a minute about the economics here. I mean, this is an, an industry that's taken quite a hit, and it is not cheap to put all of this these new safety procedures in place. Uh, what kind of challenges are they dealing with there? Yeah, you're right about that. Not cheap at all. And the couple of practices that we went to in Connecticut, they are both longstanding. They've been in operation for decades. They're successful practice practices. If you're a smaller practice, if you're a rural practice, if you're a new practice, first of all, there is the financial consideration, right? The second part of this really, I think there is a comparison to be made to remember how difficult it was for so many hospitals and still is with to to get that bottom line where they want it to be, given that they're not doing elective surgeries. They're not doing any kind of electric, uh, elective office calls. So that's the other issue. And there was a survey that was just done, Allison. 46% of dentists said that if they aren't back up and operating by the end of August, they're not sure that they can stay open. And often the big concern is Those will be the practices in rural areas, already underserved areas, places where people don't have other options. So that's why the ADA is keeping an eye on all of this to see how this rollout works, what are sort of the red flags and how they can help some of these practices that aren't open yet reopen safely. And Chris, how about the patients? I never thought I'd say this, but last week I said to my husband, I'm dying for a a teeth cleaning. It would feel so great. I know so (laughs) many people are skittish about going to the dentist to begin with. Uh, Is there a concern that may be even worse now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a very different kind of concern, right? Uh, I think a lot of the concerns that people had a decade, two decades ago, simply about pain, the fear, the noise of the drill, uh, there have been technological advances that have calmed a lot of those fears. But for the average person, when you're told, don't even go out of the house, and now you're being told, hey, you can go have your teeth cleaned, and like you were just saying, you feel like, my gosh, I really want to have this done. There are several things you really should think about doing. First of all, call your dentist. These offices are already getting the calls. They're ready for them. You should ask them what kind of PPE are they wearing? What kind of air filtration system do they have? That was the number one concern for the hygienist. Do you have the right kind of air filtration system? And then you have to ask a personal question. It's, It's really about, is this necessary? Do I feel comfortable? If you don't feel comfortable and it's not an emergency, there's no reason right now not to stay home. Allison? Chris, great questions to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you. All 50 states are now reopening their economies to some extent, but many small businesses are still struggling to survive. We spoke to two store owners who say they might be at a dead end. As a a small business owner, we've had to do things that we don't normally do, but it's definitely pushed us in Uh, a direction that I may not have even known that we were able to do. We still have our application still pending. So 
it's it's been a very frustrating uh, process being able to stay in business has a lot to do with the support that we would expect to be getting from our landlord in uh, either abating the rents for the, the, the period that the store has been closed or uh, uh, most uh, uh, majority of it to be uh, deferred. 98% of our sales prior to COVID-19 were directly um, direct sales. So in-person sales, whether it be at our storefront or whether it be at a vending event. So we had to transition solely to an online business. Uh, we, we might be at a dead end that we cannot move forward after being in business for so many years. Uh, we, we, it, it, may, uh, we, we, it, it may be the, the end of the road for us. Like so many other people with children, I am now a uh, homeschooler. So that has caused me to shift the way I do business, um, you know, before I was able to handle things during the day, I've had to pivot and do things, you know, whenever the kids don't have school. You know, sometimes I just have to take a breath and take a moment, go take a walk with my kids outside. We are definitely going to, like so many other people, we're going to get through this. Department stores hoping to woo back customers as they reopen their doors. Retail sales plunged a record 16 percent in April. So will those shoppers come back and, and what will the in-store shopping experience be like when they do? NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta uh, taking an NBC exclusive look inside Macy's to show us reopening what reopening looks like for the country uh, company. Rather, Blaine, what is Macy's plan specifically? What are the new safety measures uh, that they're putting in place in store. Allison, it's going to certainly look different. You know, when you walk into Macy's, uh, one big thing that people yeah. usually go inside for uh, is the makeup counter. I know that you've done it. I'm sure that it, a lot of people have done it. You go inside, yep. <laughs> you want to try on makeup, try on lipstick. Of course, given everything that's going on right now, that's not a possibility. So that was my biggest question. I actually stopped by a makeup counter and had what will be kind of the new demo uh, for makeup counters. So instead of kind of putting foundation on your face, they have these pads that actually have a face drawn onto them and they take, you know, essentially oh, wow. what the, the, the uh, person is going to do is going to eyeball you. She says, you know what, if you're looking for foundation, I'm going to eyeball you, see maybe two or three shades that might work for you. And then she's going to put them down on this pad the way that she would apply them to your face. So not only are you going to see what it looks like, but you're also going to kind of see how to do it. And she actually demonstrated for me taking a Q-tip, spreading that product on the paper. It's certainly not what we are used to at all, but but this is what they're doing to get back up and running. You know, there are plenty of safety measures that they're talking about, things that we've seen in stores all over. So employees require to wear masks. We're talking about plexiglass around cash registers, social distancing, of course, but the things that are unique to department stores, like trying on clothes. So I asked, can we still go in and try on a dress or a pair of pants? They said yes, but once you decide that maybe you're not going to purchase that item, it goes on a special rack, and that is then put away for at least 24 hours. It's kept off the floor or off the public racks, and then it's slowly kind of rotated back into service. So that's what happens when you try on. The same thing, Allison, happens when you uh, return items, if you do decide to return something to the stores. Okay. So different, Blaine, all of those things. Uh, you mentioned some of the safety uh, measures in place for the employees. What else do we know about the employees who are coming back to work? What can you tell us about them uh, and their safety concerns here? Well, we do know that Macy's, just like many other retail places, have really been hit hard by this pandemic, right? So we know that Macy's Incorporated had to furlough many of its 130,000 employees. So a lot of them are going to be coming back to work, uh, certainly, you know, looking forward to getting back to work and kind of welcoming customers back into the stores. But there were a number of people who continued to work during this pandemic because Macy's was focused on digital sales. You know, we know that one of the stores, some of the stores kind of remained up and running in terms of getting that product out, shipping them to people who were ordering online 
online. But with the stores opening now, we know that employees are, again, required to wear masks. They're coming in. They have plexiglass around the cash registers. And we're also seeing kind of staggered shifts and staggered openings as well. So you're not seeing as many people in there at the same time. I do have to say that we went in there. Our crew, our small crew went in there before the store opened this morning and people were very much spread out. And when you kind of see, you know, you get ready for a sales floor to open, you may see more than one person mm-hmm. in a section folding places or, or straightening things up. We only saw one person per area. So it certainly looked like there was a great deal of distancing going on as much as could be done uh, on the sales floor. Allison. Blaine, it is certainly going to be very different shopping in stores again. Thanks for giving us a glimpse of the new normal. An Idaho casino isn't gambling with its guest safety. If you want to hit the slots, you will have to wear a mask. Here's a look at how it's operating during the pandemic. You know, we were concerned with the virus, concerned the well-being of our customers' employees, but gaming has been essential to our livelihood. I just hope that we don't have an outbreak because, you know, the decisions that we made were were really difficult and we realized that, that it could be a life or death situation. We opened March 20th, 1993. So it's kind of ironic that we closed March 20th, 2020. (laughs) When the Coeur d'Alene Casino Resort Hotel in Idaho was forced to close in March, its owners immediately began to think about what it would take to reopen. So originally we thought we were gonna be closed for two weeks and um, it ended up being over a month of paying our wages, the wages and benefits of the casino and tribal employees, millions of dollars. And it got to be, you know, very concerned. You know, we're really dipping into our reserves. And um, that really just, you know, put more emphasis as far as the importance of opening our doors. The casino finally did reopen on April 27th. And since then, its operations have looked very different. Guests have their temperatures taken, restaurants are at one-fourth their capacity, and yellow tape markings keep people six feet apart. First day back, it was a lot of wiping down, a lot of disinfecting, um, constant. The shutdown, the cleaning from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. We have every other machine turned off, and we have on order some plexiglass to put between the machines, each machine, and we have had a few people removed because they refused to wear their mask. The casino is owned and operated